Guess I have to put the camera up. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Welcome to today's Law of Self-Defense show as professional as always. Thank you all for being here. For those who don't know, I am attorney Andrew Branca. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's so humbling. It's so very, very humbling. It's going to be a long day today, folks. We're going to live stream the Dean Cummings trial all day, and we are doing it live now uh, as the trial is occurring. We're not doing catch up anymore. So unfortunately, I can't speed through the breaks and so forth. We'll just talk about other stuff or whatever during those periods. If it seems appropriate, depending on how the court goes, maybe during the lunch break, I'll do a response video to the Legal Bites video from last week on Alec Baldwin. I, sh I ought to do that as a separate show if I was a YouTube professional, but if we have a good chunk of time to fill, I'll do that respon response video here with all of you. We'll see. She asked for a response. She said, give her feedback in the video. So I'm happy to do that. Uh, if not today, I'll do it as a separate show, maybe next week when I'm on my motorcycle trip down to Austin. We will see. Uh, so uh, the state rested last Friday. Uh, the state started this case with four criminal charges um, against Dean Cummings. I guess I should start with the facts. Dean Cummings is a uh, formerly famous skier, I guess. I don't follow skiing, but that's his reputation. And uh, he had uh, he had lived in Alaska for many years doing a helicopter skiing concession thing. Recently moved back to New Mexico a couple of years ago. Was looking to buy land from Guillermo. Ariola, a local resident, had 16 acres of land to sell. They were in negotiations. During the negotiations, Cummings was allowed to stay in a trailer or cabin on Ariola's property, and the two men had a confrontation. Not sure exactly why, uh, but Ariola came into the cabin, the bedroom of the cabin where uh, Cummings was staying. The two men apparently had a verbal confrontation, escalated to a physical confrontation, and Cummings uh, shot and killed Ariola with a rifle. Uh, and then would uh, end up calling 911 shortly thereafter. This was a very remote part of New Mexico. There was no cell reception right at the ranch where this occurred. Um, and the police came out and all the other stuff happened. That usually happens. A killing and, and Cummings is claiming that he shot in self-defense. He's claiming that Ariola had a pepper spray canister. Looks a lot like this pepper spray canister was banging him on the head with it, that there was uh, he felt he was sprayed with some kind of, uh, he called it a neurological agent. Um, Frankly, in my opinion, what probably happened is just an incidental discharge from the impact uh, of the pepper spray would put some, actually, they, they're calling it mace, would put some mace in the air, uh, which a little bit of mace goes a long way, folks. You feel that burning in your eyes and your throat, even though it's not a direct spray in the face. Um, and it was during this part of the confrontation that Cummings grabbed his rifle. Then the two men fought over the rifle, according to the defense, and ultimately Cummings shot. As the defense described it in their opening statement, one man was leaving that room alive. Whoever got control of the rifle, the other person was going to die. And Cummings won the fight in the defense narrative. Uh, so uh, the four charges against Cummings. Before I get to those, though, I have invited uh, friends of law self-defense uh, attorneys and others I respect uh, and enjoy their company to come on the show as guests from time to time as their interest and schedule allows. And we have one. Hey, sir, good morning. Hey, good brother. Morning. How you doing? How's Korea? It's uh, it's still here. That's good. Yeah. Is it cold there? <laughs> What's it like this time of year? It's getting chilly. It's uh, get get down in the in the uh, low fifties today. So we're starting starting uh, to cool uh, off. Thirty two degrees coming into the office today. <laughs> Winter nice. is coming. Yeah, uh, uh, just got the leaves just just kind of about mid change right now. All right. Well, I'm glad you could be here. Stay as long as you like. Come and yeah. go as you need to. It's uh, we won't take any offense. Uh, uh, please tell the audience about yourself for those who may not. Know. You've been to the show before, <laughs> obviously, but yeah, uh, Jeff from Legal Vices. Uh, live here in Korea. Do mainly maritime and corporate related stuff. Uh, we just finished doing a beautiful, beautiful show about the Shackleton expedition in the early 1900s. Great, great I thing to watch. I presume that'll go into your book. This would be this would be the basis for a good book. It definitely mm -hmm. would. And so that I, I was thinking about it. I was thinking about why we're doing it. We're going to be doing Sovereign Citizens later this week because they're always a bundle of fun. All right. Uh, O.J. Simpson trial coming up where we're we're, we're uh, reviewing the F. Lee Bailey cross examination of Mark Furman. That's the kind of stuff we do. And we just want to sh show you legends, legends at what they do, the best of the best, which is why we have Law of Self-Defense here, the best of the best. Of what <laughs> very kind, very humbling. And folks can find you at just, just search Legal Vices on YouTube. Yep. 
All right. Awesome. All right. So uh, we started with four charges against this uh, defendant Cummings by the state of New Mexico. Uh, this event, by the way, happened February 29th, 2020. So we're two and a half years after the event. Uh, the criminal ch charges are murder, just intentional, cold blooded, unlawful killing, manslaughter, voluntary manslaughter, uh, which is a mitigated form of murder done in the heat of passion, the heat of passion arising from the physical fight they were having. It's a it's a hot blooded killing. It's still an unlawful killing, but it's mitigated for murder. So murder, generally speaking, life in prison without possibility of early release. Manslaughter might be 10 or 20 years in prison. Maybe you get out after a third of that on parole. Uh, I'm not a sentencing expert, so those are just generalities. But obviously, murder is a much more serious uh, crime, much lengthier sentence than for manslaughter. Manslaughter sucks, by the way, but it's <laughs> it's it's not a bad deal if the alternative is murder. Better than murder. There were two other charges. There was a uh, tampering with evidence charge because Dean Cummings had told police, he told the police, it's hard to characterize this as tampering, but he told the police that he was sprayed with a uh, mace uh, and it was burning his face and it was on his clothing. So he had washed his face and clothing and taken his clothing off and told the police where to find the clothing. They, they character characterize this as tampering with evidence. Uh, and, uh, uh, concealing identity because although he identified himself on the 911 call he made to the police uh, later he was his talking, phone number including his phone number later he he was talking to a, another officer and i guess at that point he was like wondering whether he should be talking to the cops all this much uh, and just gave his first name and not his last name and that cop decided to charge him with uh, concealment of identity both those charges the tampering and the concealment were dismissed uh, by the judge on a directed verdict motion by the defense uh, once the state rested on Friday afternoon. Frankly, I think a good argument can be made that the murder and manslaughter charges also ought to have been dismissed, given the catastrophic failure this uh, state case in chief is, has been. But those are continuing. So the defense is going to start with their case in chief this morning. Uh, the state case so far has been, keep in mind, folks, the legal defense here, Cummings defense, is self-defense of which there are, of course, multiple elements, up to five, really in this context, only four elements of a self-defense claim, innocence, imminence, proportionality, and reasonableness. The state has to disprove any one of those beyond a reasonable doubt. If they do that, self-defense collapses and they have an easy conviction because Cummings isn't saying it wasn't me, he's saying it was me, I shot the guy, but I have the legal defense of self-defense. So the state's burden here is to disprove one of those elements, innocence, imminence, proportionality, or reasonableness, avoidance is off the table because New Mexico is a stand your ground state and it's it was in Cummings residence anyway, so Castle Doctrine would cover that. The state has to disprove one of those four elements beyond a reasonable doubt. And they introduced, as near as I can tell, zero evidence mm. capable of doing that over their case in chief. They raised a lot of ambiguities and uncertainties. And if this were kind of a preponderance of the evidence case, do you think it's more likely than not it was self-defense? Do you have substantial doubt? It, maybe it was an unlawful killing. I'd say those are all reasonable perceptions. Dean Cummings is not pure as the driven snow, but that's not the legal standard. The legal standard is disproving self-defense beyond any reasonable doubt. And if I have one gripe with the defense, and the defense has done a, a very good job, if I have one gripe is that they didn't drive that home during their opening statement. They did. They, they should have beat that with a bat in front of the jury, made them emotionally commit to that threshold, that burden on the state. Because if you don't do that, in my experience, often the jury will default to normal, typical decision making of lay people in our normal lives. They'll say, well, do I believe it or not? Is it likely or not? Less likely, more likely? That's preponderance of the evidence. That's not the standard here. The standard is much, much higher for the state. And I, I always feel, especially in self-defense cases, you really need to drive that home. Because if you wait until closing argument to say that, it's too late. The, the jurors have really made up their mind by that point. They, they filtered everything they've heard through what they feel would be a normal uh, threshold of evidence, which we normally do preponderance. Do I want to eat that apple or not? We don't say, well, I got to be 95% certain I want to eat that apple before I eat it. That, that's not how we go about our normal lives. Uh, but that's what a jury will do uh, if if you don't hold them to the proper legal standard. So I, I, I wish the defense had done that. Otherwise, the defense has done a great job. Of course, it's been the state's case in chief. So the state calls the witnesses. The state asks the questions. They choose the issues to question that witness about. And then the defense is limited to cross-examination, cross-examination of those witnesses 
on the specific issues that the states raised in their own questioning. So it's it's very limited, but the state's done a, a tremendous job. For, uh, the defense has done a tremendous job, I should say. Fortunately for the defense, the state's witnesses have been horrible, especially there are many, many law enforcement witnesses who are unprepared on the stand, uh, didn't do simple things like uh, uh, test evidence, can't remember what they did or didn't do because Oh, it was two and a half years ago, and they haven't refreshed a recollection about the case. And then Friday's last witness, the lead oh investigator God. on the case, this poor guy, and believe me, on a human level, I'm sympathetic, but apparently after the investigation and after he testified to the grand jury, I would suggest in a very misleading way, by the way, but after he testified to the grand jury, apparently something happened to him, and he was in a coma for nine days, and as a result, he's lost all memory of it. He couldn't even remember if he testified before the grand jury, and he had. Um, and it's it's not his fault. It's not a personal failing. But holy shit, when your lead investigator can't remember a damn thing about what he did in the case, and, and you have the feeling that the few things he said he did remember, he didn't really remember. He's just yeah. – he, he knows from the records that those things happened. Like he knows from the record what other officers were on the scene. But I don't believe for a moment that's really from his memory. He's just well, going – the whole week – I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I spent the whole weekend trying to think if they could have introduced what he had offered in any way without having to make him testify. And I can't come up with anything Re in that situation. I don't think they had any choice but to call him because he was the lead investigator. Yeah, right. And he testified at the grand jury. Well, the defense would have called them. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> the state hadn't. Right. Uh, the defense certainly would have. Um and it was uh, it was it was it was it was terrible. Actually, I feel so bad for that guy. But but on the other hand, we have a defendant who's looking at life in prison if he gets convicted off this guy's investigation. I mean, it, it's just it's it's unbelievable that this, the state decided to proceed with this. Obviously, the state knew this guy had been through the coma and had the memory loss, and they're still prosecuting for someone for murder on that. It's not like the state has a ton of other good evidence of murder here. Uh, it's not like they have a ton of other evidence of uh, proving, uh, disproving self-defense beyond a reasonable doubt. And then you bring this guy in and you're like, well, listen, we wish he could add to the mountain of evidence we have. But, you know, he had a coma, blah, blah, blah. They had nothing when they brought this guy in. And well, that's that the only important thing to note. It was two guys literally 200 miles away from the nearest other human being when this happened. Mm. Right. And remember, folks, no, nobody knows what really happened in that room. We'll never know. Uh, we can never know with absolute certainty, maybe not even with a lot of certainty. But that's not the legal question here. And are there reasons to doubt Cummings? Yes. Apparently the guy now I'm going off media reports here. I don't know if any of this is true, but it's been widely reported um, this because this guy was a famous skier. So he got some media coverage long before this event that he had some mental health issues of his own. <clears throat> He'd become uh, paranoid. Uh, he believed that conspiracy theories against him. Maybe those things were actually happening against him. I don't know. Um, but there's suggestions of maybe he wasn't fully mentally balanced himself. Uh, but none of that has been admitted to trial, presumably because it's been excluded as character evidence, which would be appropriate. But to the public, if you read about that, might you think, oh, I don't know, maybe this makes me doubt this guy's claim of self-defense. Yeah, I, it, there's nothing wrong with you for thinking that. But you doubting self-defense is not the legal question. The legal question How? for the jury is, has self-defense been disproven beyond any reasonable doubt? And so far, the state's not even been close. Now, why are we continuing if it's not even close? Because, and the defense did ask for the charges to be dismissed on a directed verdict when the state rested. Uh, but the legal standard is for the judge to look at all the evidence in the light most favorable to the state, meaning the defense perception of the evidence or presentation of the evidence means nothing. If, if we were to imagine the jury 100% believed everything that the state said, would this be a murder? If there's even 1% of evidence for the jury to consider, well, then it's, then it's a finder of fact question. And it's, that's what the jury's role is, to be finder of fact. So I, I expect if you were to ask the judge in his chambers, you, you think they're anywhere close to disproving self-defense beyond a reasonable doubt, and they just rested? He'd say, no, but it's not his call to make. It's a jury's call to make at this point. So the murder and the manslaughter continue. The tampering with evidence, the concealment of identity are gone. I mean, it was really ridiculous, especially the tampering with evidence, because the state's claim of tampering with evidence is actually inconsistent with their other theory of the case. Their, their theory of the case mm -hmm. is that the defendant's lying about being maced. 
Well, if he's lying about being maced, when he took off his clothes and washed his face, he wasn't washing anything away <laughs> because he's he wasn't actually maced, according to the state. So what evidence was was tampered with? There, according to the state, there was no mace. There was no evidence. So it's just internally inconsistent. It's the kind of, you know, I should look. I wonder if either of those charges, that's bad of me. I should have checked this out ahead of time. If either of those charges are felonies. So if they got a conviction on that, they'd be arguing for a felony murder uh, conviction at the oh, end. Yeah. That would be interesting. They might be tampering with evidence in a murder case. That, I don't know, becomes kind of circular reasoning, really. But um, maybe that's what they were going for, because the charges were ridiculous. He clearly identified himself on the 911 call. <laughs> he wasn't trying to hide or run away. Uh, and he and asked him to test he, his clothes. Right. And he asked him to test the clothing uh, for and a neurological agent, and they didn't do it. Of course. And uh, as usual, the DNA testing of the rifle was very happenstance and not done in a very coordinated and, and uh, ambiguous and undecided. They, they had no definite DNA results. Cummings DNA was on the rifle. So was someone else's DNA, but they couldn't match it to uh, the victim here. But uh, the defense narrative is two men were fighting over the gun. Two sets of DNA looks like a fight to me. So, you know, the defense does not have to prove self-defense. If the evidence is consistent with self-defense, it's consistent with a, a reasonable hypothesis of innocence. That's the opposite of guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. And that's what we're looking at here. And now it's, that's, the, that's the state of this case with the defense about to take the theater and call their witnesses and lead the questioning and decide what issues are going to be discussed. The defense case is not going to get any weaker from this point, folks. And it's already wow, damn man. strong enough to warrant an acquittal in this case. By the way, I just want to mention okay. quickly. Uh, so over the weekend, I was on uh, Farron's show, Farron Balanced on YouTube, uh, talking about relationships. I had great fun. Uh, I hear maybe Farron was unhappy with me on, on our locals channel afterwards. I, I don't know. And I don't care, folks. Farron, I'm fine with Farron. I don't know if she's fine with me, but I'm fine with her. She invited me on. I was just me it's not for everybody. <laughs> it's okay. Um, I don't care what you had to say about me afterwards. I don't even care if it was insulting. It doesn't make any difference to me, but this is not the shit on Farron channel. So if you're upset with Farron for some reason, go talk with her about it. Uh, don't do it here. If you do it here, I'm going to have Shane just mute you or whatever it is that moderators do for that kind of stuff. That's not what we're here to talk about today. All right. Just wanted to get that out of the way. Cause I saw a lot of earlier comments just, uh, you know, we don't like Farron stuff and, I don't if that's how you feel, it's fine with me. You do whatever you want, but not on this channel. All right. So uh, I was thinking I was thinking we might start. Let's see. What time is it? So court is expected to come into session at the top of the hour. So that's about 40 minutes away. And uh, I was thinking we might go through the opening statements again at 1.25 speed just to refresh our recollection on um, what it is that each party promised the other. I wonder if there's a way. Oh, I don't really know. Well, while we're do doing that, I have a question for you. What of, of the four elements, what do you think is the weakest for the defense? Uh, well, so it can be a little hard to separate reasonableness from the others because reasonableness is kind of an umbrella element that, yeah. that's over all the others, right? Uh, so you have to believe the elements, the other elements exist. Innocence, you're not mm -hmm. the unlawful aggressor. Imminence, you're, you're defending yourself against a fight that's happening right now or immediately about to occur. Uh, proportionality, that you're not using deadly force against unless you're facing a deadly force threat. Uh, avoidance, whether there's a duty to retreat, which wouldn't apply here. And then all those things that you believe to be true, you have to reasonably believe they're true. It's not enough that you just had a genuine good faith belief in those things. So it, with that context, um, I think the, the most likely avenue of attack here for the prosecution is proportionality, that at worst, the victim had pepper spray uh, and the defendant went to a gun uh, or mace. We don't really know what the stuff is, by the way, folks. Yeah. They keep calling it mace. Uh, but mace is a company and it's a chemical, specific chemical agent. And the mace company makes defensive products with mace, the chemical in it. And they also make defensive products with pepper spray in it. And they keep calling it mace, but that may be because it says mace the company on the container. Uh, I've yet hear anyone specify exactly what the chemical composition was in the canister, uh, but whatever, let's call it mace. Normally we think of mace as non-deadly force when it's used in a defensive manner because it's not likely to cause death or serious bodily injury. 
Um, and I'm sure that's the argument that the state's going to make. Hey, mate, because they already had officers testify that it's non-deadly force. When officers carry it, it's non-deadly force. I would suggest it's different when you're using mace defensively and when you're using it offensively. When you're using it defensively, you're trying to stop someone else's aggression or compel compliance mm-hmm. with lawful orders. And you're not going to then escalate your use of force on that person once they're neutralized. You're, you're going to go away or call the police if you're a civilian or you're going to cuff the suspect up if you're a cop. But it's not like you're macing them so then you can beat them with a nightstick or shoot them. But if you're using mace in an offensive capacity, it's reasonable to infer that it's one step in a continuing act of unlawful force against you. You're being maced so someone can rob you or hopefully not rape you. That would burn uh, or <laughs> kidnap your kid or something. You know, it's it's an initial step. They the Bad guys use mace all the time for robberies, for bank robberies in particular. They love to go in and spray the tellers down. They're not spraying the tellers down and then running out of the bank. They're, they're spraying the tellers down to facilitate their robbery of the bank. When police, when they lose their taser, also non-deadly force, or their pepper spray, and it it comes with into the control of the suspect they're fighting, the cop goes to his gun because he can reasonably infer that he'll be disabled by his own pepper spray or taser now in the hands of the violently resisting suspect and then be subject to having his service pistol taken from him and killed. Most cops who are shot dead by suspects are killed with their own guns, folks. They get in a fight, close in fight with the with the suspect. Suspect achieves control of the officer's firearm and kills him with it. Cops know this. Um, so I would suggest that the offensive use of mace can readily be characterized as a deadly force attack, especially when there's a gun in play. And there was a gun in play because Cummins picked up his rifle to defend himself. uh, And then the two men were fighting over the rifle. And once they're doing that, it's just a gunfight, folks. Then it's a gunfight. It's no different than if the victim had been picking up his own rifle off a table. In fact, it's worse because in this scenario, he's simultaneously arming himself while disarming uh, the defendant. Uh, Now, that's my understanding, which you may may correct or not, but... The second there's two pairs of hands on that, they are both considered to be armed with that weapon. The moment the other person's reaching for your gun, they are attempting to arm themselves with a gun. It's an imminent deadly Mm -hmm. force threat at that point. Um, Assuming, of course, that you were not the unlawful aggressor to begin with. If you're the unlawful actor and someone's reaching for your gun, they're just defending themselves. But if they were the unlawful actor, you have a gun and now they're fighting you for your gun, That's just the bad guy reaching for a gun, just as if it were in his waistband or a holster or the console of his car or on a table or anywhere else. It's no different. It's just the gun happens to be in your hands. He's still reaching for a gun. So that's where we are here. Now, I'm going to play the the opening statements at like one and a quarter speed because I've already played it a couple times in the series of shows on this case. But I just want you to listen for what the state has to say and how little what they're what they're saying is actually directly targeted at meeting their burden of proof here, of disproving self-defense beyond a reasonable doubt. A lot of what they say is not inconsistent with self-defense. A lot of it is just kind of chatter, the criminal charges the jury is considering. None of it is a compelling argument that they're prepared to disprove self-defense beyond a reasonable doubt. And then compare that, contrast that, with how much more concrete the defense opening statement is. So let me pull that up and I'll play it again a little faster than normal. So, you know, the the state's pretty slow speaking, so that shouldn't hurt anybody. Um, and we'll get through it in like twenty minutes, and we have, uh, yeah, almost forty minutes before the uh, before the before things actually start up. So let me see if I can manage to pull up the right tab. It looks like it's this one. I guess I should do this. Uh, oh, and for those who are wondering, I had I had suggested to Nick that he pick up this coverage and I would just appear on his show because obviously his audience is what I don't know, 200 times larger than mine is. He he just has other obligations today. So he said he may hop in on this show as a guest from time to time as time and circumstance allows. So we may see him here, um, but that's why he's not covering. He, he just other other obligations he's got to take care of today. But I, I don't consider myself a real YouTuber. So if I can be on someone else's show and, and do the same talking that I do here, I'd rather do it to a larger audience, of course. But that's where we are. All right, here we go. The prosecuting attorney may now make an opening statement. The defendant's attorney may make an opening statement or may wait until later in the trial to do so. What is said in opening statement is not evidence. 
The opening statement is simply the lawyer's... By the way, that's important, folks. What is said in an opening statement is not evidence. ...an opportunity to tell you what the lawyer expects the evidence will show. State, you may make your opening statement. So again, this is from last Tuesday, folks. This is not a today's live stream from the court. This is, oh, let me speed it up. This is just to catch everybody up to what each of the parties promised they would do. And see, hear how little the state promised. Now that you ate lunch, hopefully we won't put you to sleep. So thank you though for being honest in your answer so that we can pick the most fair and impartial jury for this trial. Um, this is a criminal trial, as you heard, commenced against the state of New Mexico against Dean Cummings. And I'm going to play for you a phone call from a 911 operator to the Sandoval County Sheriff's Office dispatch that was made on February 29th of 2020. Okay, so they don't, the 911 call recording doesn't work. She can't play it here. So they'll just fumble around for a couple of minutes. Uh, but I do want to point out, just listen to her tone. It's like, it's like she's an, a junior high school student pretending to be a prosecutor in a case for some kind of class project. She's very hesitant. She sounds like she's reading. Maybe she is reading, but it's it's not the kind of she's had the case. You know, they've had the case for two and a half years. It's not the kind of conversational mastery of your narrative of guilt that you would expect a prosecutor to bring. And she speaks to the jury first among the parties. Right. The state goes first mm -hmm. in opening. That's a very powerful advantage because in theory, the, the jury is a blank sheet of paper. They don't know anything. And. The first words they hear are from the state. Folks, if you let me, if you invite me to a debate and you let me speak first, I'm 90% of the way there to winning that debate because I get to set the battlefield. I get to frame the arguments and the issues. And that's what she gets to do with this opening. It's such a powerful advantage for the prosecution. And by the way, it's also who the jury hears last at the end of the trial before they're instructed by the judge and go into deliberations. A tremendous advantage for the, for the state that's given to them because of the very high legal burden they have in proving someone guilt guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. But this is not how you leverage that advantage in this very stilted, reading, uh, uh, boring uh, kind of way. It's, 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 I mean, I wonder how long she's been a prosecutor or maybe her heart's just not in this case. Maybe she knows it's a dog of a case, but her boss assigned it to her. That's her job. That's how she pays her mortgage. So she's here to do her job. I don't know, but it's not very compelling. I'm surprised by the number of, of prosecutors that are terrible orators. You know, I'm convinced it's because prosecutors don't have to be good. Many of them are good, but they don't have to be good because most of the people they're prosecuting are criminals and they're guilty and they're stupid. And it's not that hard to prove them guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. So they don't they, they don't need the same level of creativity that the defense needs, mm. because for the defense, it's their client who's the criminal, who's guilty, who's stupid, who said all kinds of things to the cops. Their job is hard. So they better be good if they want to win. For prosecutors, let's face it, no matter how bad they are, they'll probably win at least 80 percent of their cases just because of the nature of the defendant. Mm -hmm. Let me see. I bet my no, my audio is on. Nothing like. Electricity. Yeah, I don't know how to do a banner, folks. Um, oh wait, is maybe I can do it this way. Pardon me. On the like podium thing, because I have it plugged in. There we go. <laughs> That's okay. I'll proceed without it. Though. I'll proceed without it. Technical wizard. Okay, if you need it, I'll, I'll keep coming in. Will you make it for me? She's facing away from the because she's facing the jury, folks. Uh, by the way, when it comes to, uh, as always, comments and questions, we will answer um, comments and questions from Super Chats, over five bucks on YouTube. That's okay. I'll proceed with that. And in the Thank Law Chat member and chat, if you're like a Law Science member, we'll answer all your comments and questions right? there. No um, charge. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, as you heard, or you can guess from what, what I hear, this case isn't about who did it or how it was done. This case 
The facts for you to decide are whether or not this homicide was committed in self-defense or whether it was committed with or without sufficient provocation. A second degree murder is a homicide that was committed without. Hey, Kurt, I'll send you a link. Give me just a second. Having been sufficiently provoked, whereas a voluntary manslaughter is a homicide committed after having been sufficiently provoked. And the judge is going to give you the definitions to all of these things and what that law means. Um, this case, ladies and gentlemen, is a case about reasonableness. And you, ladies and gentlemen, are the finders of the facts. The state has the burden of proof of showing that Dean Cummings, the defendant in this case, committed this homicide beyond a reasonable doubt. And the Welcome. state will also show that the defendant, Mr. Cummings, also committed the crime of tampering with evidence. And that is because he washed his face, his hands, and changed his clothing after committing that homicide. And the state will also show that he committed the crime of concealing identity. Because when law enforcement came and interacted with him, he didn't give his identity to them. The evidence is going to show, ladies and gentlemen, that on... Ms. Walker, February. Ms. Walker, IT person to search you on that. That's okay. I'll just search you. It's fine. Okay, Thank fine. you. Thank you. It wouldn't have been helpful. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, the evidence is going to show that on February 29th of 2020, at Guillermo Adiola's ranch, which is way out past Cabazon Peak in the far remote area of Sandoval County, New Mexico, a ranch that is so remote that there is no cell phone service out there. And a ranch that is so remote that law enforcement had to use GPS coordinates on the search warrant. The evidence is going to show that the defendant killed Guillermo Adiola in his trailer. And the evidence will show that Mr. Adiola had been contemplating selling this ranch to Dean Cummings. He had his realtor, Christine Landers, draft up a real estate contract to sell this property to Mr. Cummings. Mr. Cummings had time to contemplate the purchase of this property and had not yet signed the real estate contract at the time of the homicide. On February 29th, 2020, Guillermo Adiola drove out to his ranch out in Sandoval County to meet with Mr. Cummings. Mr. Cummings shot and killed Mr. Adiola with a Sig Sauer AR-15 rifle. This rifle had a 30 round magazine and a scope on it. Mr. Adiola was 47 years old at the time of his death and he was shot two times that day. Kurt, I sent you a guest link, uh, a Twitter DM. Nothing so far, by the way, that this uh, prosecutor is saying is inconsistent with self-defense at all. Nothing. He was shot once in the head and once in the chest. Law enforcement came and processed the scene and they recovered 10 casings, spent casings from that bedroom where he was shot. In Mr. Adiola's right hand was a can of mace. And that can of mace was facing Mr. Adiola, not outwards towards any attacker, but facing him and his body. You will be asked to determine whether the reasonableness of Mr. Cummings' actions when he committed this homicide. Were his actions reasonable when he shot and killed Mr. Adiola with an AR-15? Initially, when law enforcement went, Mr. Cummings hey, refused hey. to identify himself. And the deputies made contact hey, with him. Hey, Kurt. Long time and no Mr. See. Cummings told the Sandoval <laughs> County Sheriff's deputies that he killed Mr. Adiola in self-defense because he was sprayed with a neurological agent, presumably the mace. Mr. Cummings told deputies that he washed himself off to get the rid of the neurological agent and that he changed his clothing. Now let's talk about the evidence that's going to be presented to you over the next week, week and a half. I just You're love how it's sped up and sounds Ms. normal. Ms. Landers is going to tell you that she drafted that real estate contract for Mr. Audiola to sell the land to Mr. Cummings. She's going to tell you that she met Mr. Cummings and Mr. Audiola about a month before the homicide to go over this real estate contract. She's going to tell you that Mr. Cummings had his fifth will parked on the ranch property. And you're also going to hear testimony from David McCullough. All right. So Mr. McCullough, the first witness was the real estate agent lady who was uh, negotiating the transaction between the, the, the defendant and the victim. Nothing. This prosecutor just said she was going to uh, extract his testimony from that real estate lady is inconsistent with self-defense. It literally has nothing to do with self-defense at all. So completely irrelevant. Uh, it has nothing to do with the murder either. No, nothing. It's completely pointless. I <laughs> will tell you that on February 29th, 2020, which is a leap day, he was out riding his ATV next out witness. in the middle of the desert at Cabazon Peak, and he came upon Mr. Cummings. Mr. Cummings spoke with him and conversed with him for about an hour, and then Mr. Cummings asked him to come with him to witness the body. Mr. Cummings told Mr. McCullough that he killed a man in self-defense and he wanted him to witness the body. Mr. McCullough followed Mr. Cummings back to the ranch, and Mr. McCullough will tell you that he had medical training, so he believed he could render aid to anybody who was injured. So that's why he went back to the trailer, to the ranch, to see if he could render aid. Mr. McCullough will tell you that Mr. Audiola was past the point of aid being rendered, 
The defendant, Dean Cummings, told Mr. McCullough that he had used the rifle in the back of his truck to kill Mr. Adeola. Mr. McCullough will tell you that he saw the rifle in the back of Mr. Cummings' truck. And then he then proceeded to drive to an area where he could get cell phone service. Mr. Cummings stayed back at the ranch while Mr. McCullough drove out to get cell phone service. The area was so remote that it took him several times to get in touch with a 911 dispatch. And you'll hear those calls and they continue to be dropped. He made about four calls to 911. You'll hear those calls. Mr. McCullough waited for law enforcement and then he led them to the remote area where the ranch was located. After Mr. McCullough called law enforcement, then Mr. Cummings also called law enforcement. You're going to hear testimony from... All right, so Cummings, this is the guy riding around on his motorcycle who encountered the defendant, and the defendant asked him to call 911. Now, is it weird that the defendant, they chatted for an hour before the defendant asked him to do that? Sure, that's weird. Might that create some ambiguity, some doubt about the claim of self-defense? Maybe. I mean, ultimately, he did. He didn't. He never had to tell the guy on the motorcycle that he just killed someone. Can you call 911 for me? He never had to do that. He did it. He delayed an hour. Could have been the stress of just being in a life or death fight and having to kill somebody with a rifle. Maybe. But whatever ambiguity that hour delay raises, that's not the legal standard here. The legal standard is does it disprove self-defense beyond any reasonable doubt? And I would suggest it certainly doesn't do that. I do like the move of asking someone else to call 911 if possible, because you don't want to be your voice on that 911 call, because anything you say can will be used against you. Yeah, he does so. end up calling himself as well shortly thereafter. Maybe. So finally, they're well, in a place where they can get a cell signal. So he calls too and identifies himself to police on the phone and th th does what you would think would be uh, yeah. normal. They have to drive at least four miles to get any cell service on top mm. of this ridge line. They're literally in the middle of nowhere in New Mexico. So now we have these uh, a list of these four officers. They're all from the local sheriff's office, and uh, they're all terrible. They can't remember anything. They didn't do anything. They didn't save this Literally. for testing. They didn't ask for that for testing. They they, they work for the uh, you know the, the firearms uh, forensics unit, and they they don't know what the difference between a bullet and a cartridge. I mean, they're they're just awful. One of them's on his third or fourth job, uh, police job in eight years. Uh, uh, <laughs> asked what he does now, he says he works for a personal friend. I mean. And, and he can't remember anything about what happened because, well, it was two and a half years ago. And none of these guys bothered refreshing the recollection. It was more importantly, none of their testimony was inherently inconsistent with self-defense or contributed to undermining self-defense beyond a reasonable doubt. The biggest area of ambiguity here in their testimony was they would consistently say when they arrived on the scene, they didn't smell or detect a residue of mace. And the state's trying to argue that that's bullshit by the defense, that it, there was never a mace attack by the victim here, which is fine for the state to argue. But the absence of evidence is not evidence. The fact that they, hours yeah. later, when they arrived on the scene, they couldn't detect a, scent, a, a smell in of the mace. Middle, in the middle of the open air, right? Yeah. Well, it was in a room. So okay. it, the, uh, it, it happened inside of space. But the, the, state, the state is trying to suggest that, like, the, the guy was just hosed in the face with pepper spray, like you might expect to happen in a self-defense encounter. That's a lot of mace. Um, that You might think that would leave a residue even hours later. But the defense narrative is quite different. They're not saying the, the defendant was sprayed in the face. They're saying the defendant was being struck in the head with the canister. And under that circumstance, some, you know, the canister... So for folks who don't know, the, the plastic outer shell is just an outer shell with the flip top and the thumb button. Inside here is a little metal canister, and the canister can move. And if you impact this hard, it wouldn't surprise me at all that the valve would get triggered a little bit and you'd get a small release of mace. A small release of mace in a confined space, and this was a tiny room. It was like, I don't know, seven foot by eight foot or something. Very, very small space. A small amount of mace in that confined area you would feel it you'd feel the burning in your eyes and in your throat trust me i've been through that experience uh, so you might feel especially if you've never actually been maced before you might feel like you've been maced you might describe it as being maced your face and throat are burning that doesn't that tiny incidental bit of mace that caused that sensation might very well not be there uh, if all the doors are left open in the cabin and the cops don't arrive until four five six seven hours later uh but again, that's not actual, the, the fact that they couldn't detect it isn't evidence that there was no mace attack. It's an absence of evidence, if you believe it. But there's still a reasonable explanation consistent with innocence, consistent with self-defense. So it, it certainly does not get you anywhere close to disproving self-defense beyond a reasonable doubt. 
several Sandoval County. By the way, all the stuff I'm talking about now with the canister and the can and incidental, of course, none of this came out in the state's case in chief because they don't want to talk about that. But the defense is calling a use of force expert, and I expect him to talk about all of that. But did it have blue dye in it or red dye? Hear testimony from Deputy Hayden Walker. He was one of the initial responding officers that responded on February 29th, 2020. You'll hear that he met up Mr. McCullough and Mr. McCullough led him into the ranch. And you'll hear that Mr. Cummings told him he killed Mr. Audiola in self-defense because he was sprayed with a neurological agent. Deputy Walker placed Mr. Cummings in the back of his patrol car while they conducted the investigation. And hey Mr. folks, Cummings we got 1,500 people watching and 400 likes. So if we don't get above 50% likes ratio, likes to people watching, I'll just stop the stream and, and Kurt and Jeff and I can just go about being productive elsewhere during the day, right? We're, we're, not, we're not here to just waste our time. The likes is the single most controlling factor for YouTube sharing this content more broadly. And they're free, my friends. So if you're here, I presume you think the content is worthwhile watching. The least you can do is hit the like. And if, if you don't enjoy the content enough to hit the like, well, we don't need to be here either. So let's let's hit that like button and get those up. Yeah. Simmons tells de the deputies that he placed the rifle on the porch and that he had the, the magazine. He took the magazine out and they were both laying on the porch for them. Mr. Cummings tells Deputy Walker that he washed his face off and his hands and changed his clothing. You'll also hear testimony from Deputy Jonathan. So I talked about this shortly before with Jeff. But, Kurt, this is this is one of the funny things about the state's case. So they charged this guy with murder and manslaughter, but also tampering with evidence on the premise that he he was trying to conceal the mace when washing his face and, and that's changing a neat trick. That's a neat but trick. That I was trying to get the mace out of my eyes and that's concealment. of evidence. That's a neat trick. I haven't heard that one before. Plus, wow. it's counter it's better. to the state's own argument because the state's yeah, argument yeah, yeah. was no mace attack. So if there yeah, was yeah. no mace so attack, what's he washing off? There's nothing to conceal. <laughs> Yeah, right. so that's uh, that's also nice. That's brilliant moves by the state all around. I've heard some of this stuff from the state. I haven't been following it super super closely, but I've been I've seen some of the testimony, and no, well, none they, of it's been incredible impressive. Yeah, they, they said he changed his clothes and, and threw them in the back of the truck, and by that I guess they meant he folded them up and told them it's in the back of the truck and asked <laughs> them to test it, which they didn't do. Right. Nice. And he also responded to the scene with Deputy Walker. They secured the scene. They made contact with Mr. McCullough. He collected some witness statements while he was there on scene. And then they secured the perimeter. They went into the trailer to make sure that there was nobody else that was injured. And then they held the scene until law the remainder of law enforcement can come. You're gonna hear testimony from Sergeant Thomas Griffin, another officer with the Sandoval County Sheriff's Office. And he was the on-scene sergeant out there at the ranch. He arrived with Deputy Gutierrez. And he was present when Mr. Cummings was evaluated by emergency medical services. Mr. Cummings told Sergeant Griffin that the clothing he was wearing at the time of the homicide was in the back of his truck. So <laughs> Deputy Griffin Hiding was Evans. clothing. <laughs> and he's going to tell you that the clothing was indeed wet, as if Mr. Cummings had washed himself off. Sergeant Griffin also assisted with the towing of the vehicles from that ramp. That's important. They towed the vehicle of Guillermo Adiola. It's they towed the this case that they towed the vehicle. As well as the fifth wheel. We'll never hear about he it also, again. Sergeant Griffin <laughs> yeah. also collected the evidence. So in this homicide, the Sandoval County Sheriff's Office called the New Mexico State Police and they come out and they assist with the crime scene. So he collected the evidence from the New Mexico State Police that was collected from the scene that day. And he's the, the one evidence, who it in. The case. evidence that the defendant pointed You'll also hear testimony from Lieutenant Frank Tomlinson, our case agent here. He was assigned this investigation and he's- Hey, thanks for getting the likes up, folks. I appreciate it. Thank you. One who was in charge of making sure everything got done. Lieutenant Tomlinson literally the worst witness the ever in the history of witnesses out of the Sandoval County Sheriff's Office, which is right here in the courthouse. Well, Thomas Griffin was the one at the ranch because there was no cell phone service. They had to play telephone tag, if you will, to get sure the warrants done. He wrote several warrants and he interviewed several witnesses. And you're going to hear about all of that as part of the investigation. He also transported the evidence. As I stated, the New Mexico State Police assisted with this investigation by processing the scene. And you're going to hear testimony from... Carlos Herrera, the New Mexico State Police case agent, he was the criminalistics agent. So he was the one in charge of making sure all of the evidence is documented and collected. New Mexico State Police arrived at the ranch after the warrants were granted so that they collect and document everything. He'll tell you about the processing of the scene. One person is assigned to take photographs. One person is assigned to scan the scene. And he was assigned with documenting the case scenes, the trajectory, where the blood was, and things like that. Agent Herrera is going to tell you that he collected 10 spent casings from the scene that day. 
He collected the mace and he collected the AR-15 rifle. Agent Bogue, also to the New Mexico State Police in the criminalistic. This was the coma guy, right? She was assigned with running what's called a Leica scanner. Oh no, that's somebody else. Oh, no, yeah, yeah. The, the, the worst, the worst witness in the history of witnesses, I think, is. And she'll testify about the diagram the next that she created <laughs> that documents where the body is, where the case is, the coma guy, and the outline of the house. And you're finally going to hear from Jennifer Otto. She is the New Mexico mm -hmm. Department of Public Safety DNA analyst. She's going to testify about the analysis of the evidence that was sent to her for review and whose DNA on, was on what and what kind of DNA it was. And finally, so the DNA was very inconclusive here. Uh, the DNA, they, of course, the, the rifle had the, the defendant's rifle had the defendant's DNA, DNA on it. Naturally, there was also other DNA from someone else. But they couldn't match it up uh, to anybody. But so not obviously, if it had been the victim's DNA, that would be very helpful to the defense. But it's not inconsistent with self-defense in a trial where the state has to disprove self-defense beyond a reasonable doubt. We hear from Dr. Heather Gerald of the Office of Medical Investigator. She is the chief medical investigator there at UNM. The only woman in this trial who has a hairbrush, apparently, was this woman. <laughs> and she conducted the autopsy of Guillermo Adiola. She's going to testify that Mr. Adiola had two gunshot wounds to his body. The first gunshot wound was to the head, and it entered at the right temple with a trajectory of right to left and downward. Dr. Gerald will testify that there was a second gunshot wound of the chest and it entered at the supraclavicle region of the chest and exited the left side of the chest. As I stated, ladies and gentlemen, this is a case of reasonableness. A second degree murder is a homicide committed without having been provoked and a voluntary manslaughter is a homicide committed after having been sufficiently provoked. And the judge is gonna give you the definition of what sufficient provocation is. Again, this case isn't about who did it or how it was done. The facts for you so you know how she presented that as if it's either murder <laughs> an unprovoked killing or manslaughter a provoked killing of course both of those she's leaving out a word murder is an unprovoked unlawful killing manslaughter is a provoked unlawful killing there's a third option on the table folks lawful killing self-defense gentlemen are to decide whether this homicide was committed in self-defense or whether it was committed with or without sufficient provocation this is a case of reasonableness, and you are the finders of fact. You are uh, reasonableness is quite right. Were reasonable on that day when he shot and killed Mr. Adiola with an AR-15 rifle when he only had mace. And I surmise <laughs> to you that the evidence will show that there was no struggle in the bedroom, that little bedroom on February 29th, 2020. Mm -hmm. and the evidence will show that this was. So this part is funny because in the bedroom, in fact, th there were things disheveled. The rug was folded over on itself. A wall heater had been torn off the wall. I mean, the, the bedroom was a bit of a mess. What they did in the what the state actually showed was photographs of other rooms in the trailer yeah. where no one claimed there had been a fight and said, well, it's not disheveled in the kitchen. It's not disheveled in the eating area. Well, of course not. not that's, that's pretty dumb. Mr. I mean, why, why even bother about what happened in that little room on that day? But the evidence will show what happened on that day. Uh -huh. And at the end of the case, the state, we're going to ask you to find Mr. Cummings guilty of second degree murder or the lesser included offense of voluntary manslaughter for the killing of Guillermo Adiola. And we'll ask you to find the defendant guilty of tampering with evidence for him washing his hands, his face and changing his clothes after the homicide. And we will ask you to find him guilty of concealing his identity when he refused to identify himself to the law enforcement officers on that day. And thank you for your time. Lame. Now we'll go, yeah, pretty lame, right? Now we'll go right into, I'm gonna continue with the uh, defense opening, much more substantive. Uh, again, one and a quarter speed. I'll try not to interrupt so much. And uh, the trial, I don't expect it to come into session until the top of the hour, but I'm watching it. So if it does, uh, whenever it does, we'll cut over. Counsel. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, good afternoon. This case is not about who did it. Ms. Walker is correct because Guillermo Ariola was shot and killed by Dean Cummings. There's no dispute in that. So the question before the court, before the jury, isn't who killed him, but why? And the evidence is gonna explain to you why that happened. The facts that led up to the death of Mr. Ariola. Mr. Cummings told the police when he called 911 that day, he called them and he told them, my name is Dean Cummings. I just shot and killed a man in self-defense. So he told the police that right away. And he told David McCullough that right away. 
Because after the shooting happened, Mr. Cummings reacted. He was in the middle of nowhere. You're going to hear evidence, and Ms. Walker showed you some overhead photos of where this occurred, the ranch where this occurred. It was out in the middle of nowhere. It's a remote area. There is no cell phone service out there, not for miles. It's a place that is so remote. There are no neighbors. There's no other buildings. You have to drive for miles before you reach anyone or anything. And that's where Mr. Cummings found himself on February 29th, 2020. Because as you heard from Ms. Walker, and you will hear in the evidence, Mr. Cummings was looking to purchase some land. He grew up in New Mexico, Los Alamos to be specific. He grew up here. He spent his childhood in New Mexico I've got her at before leaving quarter, Colorado. That's why it sounds good. She's not talking this. And then in 2019, he returned to New Mexico. Mr. Cummings is an outdoorsman. He's a man who loves to be out in the wilderness, to be out in remote areas, to live off the land. And so he was looking for a piece of land back home here in New Mexico where he could build a home, start a new life. And Mr. Ariola owned property that he, was what he was looking for. This property out there, out near San Luis, San Ysidro area, near Cabazon Peak, remote, beautiful land. So Mr. Cummings and Mr. Ariola were planning this real estate transaction. And Mr. Cummings was excited about his future. And you're gonna hear evidence about this real estate contract that they were negotiating. And Mr. Cummings had every intention of buying that land. And in the meantime, he was permitted to stay out there. He put his RV out there and he was allowed to stay in this little trailer. Mr. Ariola encouraged him to stay out there, encouraged him to get to know the land, the property, the trailer. There were some horses out there. Mr. Cummings was helping take care of the horses, feeding them. And that's what led up to this incident on February 29th. Mr. Cummings Beating. was staying there, Beating as horses he had been told and this? encouraged to do, when Mr. Ariola show, showed up. He showed up unexpectedly. <clears throat> Mr. Cummings and Mr. Ariola started talking about this real estate contract, and they started arguing. It was a verbal argument in the kitchen of this small trailer. And while they were arguing, all of a sudden, Mr. Ariola attacked Mr. Cummings. Without any warning, Mr. Cummings was all of a sudden fighting for his life. Mr. Ariola and Mr. Cummings were in this physical altercation. It led down this very short hallway to a small bedroom. And it was during this physical altercation that Mr. Cummings realized that Mr. Ariola had something in his right hand. You're going to hear testimony Mr. Ariola was right-handed. You're going to hear testimony that Mr. Ariola routinely carried a canister of mace with him. Mr. Cummings didn't know exactly what it was, but all he knew was that he was being struck with this thing in Mr. Ariola's hand over and over again. During this altercation, Mr. Cummings was able to grab his rifle that he had had sitting there. He had recently purchased a scope and was putting the scope onto the, onto the rifle, which is why it was sitting there. He grabbed the rifle and he and Mr. Ariola started fighting over this rifle. And it was during this struggle Mr. Cummings has one hand on this rifle. He has his other hand blocking, his left hand blocking Mr. Ariola, who's re repeatedly striking him. During this, this struggle between these two men, all of a sudden, Mr. Cummings realized that his eyes were starting to burn, his lungs were starting to burn. Something had been sprayed. He didn't know what this stuff was. But at the same time, he starts to feel this burning sensation. He feels Mr. Ariola pulling on the rifle. They're fighting over control over this gun. Whoever wins is gonna live. Whoever loses was gonna die. And during the struggle over this gun, the cap on the scope of the rifle comes off. And that's important. And you're gonna see the evidence. You're gonna see photos. Hey, Steve Gosney in the chat. Steve, I emailed hey. you the if you wanna come in. I know hey, Steve. Steve is really on vacation, but I, I see he's in the chat momentarily. Steve, if you want to come in, check your email. Okay, the, the presidential email. You know the one I mean. Of that cap. That cap had been taped onto the scope with electrical tape. Mr. Cummings had taped the cap on with electrical tape, so it was on there good. And you'll see photos, and you're going to see the evidence that shows that the cap from that scope ended up underneath Mr. Ariola's body because it came off during a physical fight for control of that gun. During this struggle for the gun, shots went off. 
you're going to see photos of bullet holes in the trailer. That is important because those bullet holes, or we call them impact sites, a lot of times that's what we refer to them as, those impact sites tell the story of what really happened in that trailer. And you're gonna hear from an expert who's gonna explain that to you. But some of those bullets sprayed down the hallway and out of the trailer. Three, three bullets went out the trailer on the other side, the other side of the trailer from where the small bedroom was. And that shows how this fight was progressing and continuing as these men are fighting each other for control of this gun. They end up in this small bedroom and Mr. Cummings ends up basically trapped in that room. Mr. Ariola is in front of him. The only way for him to escape is through Mr. Ariola. And you're gonna see other impact sites on the floor in that bedroom. And those impact sites are really important. And you're gonna have an expert who's gonna explain to you why those impact sites are so important. And the reason that those impact sites are so critical is because what they're gonna show you is that at some point during that struggle, the gun that ultimately killed Mr. Ariola, that firearm was upside down, almost on the ground. What she means by this, because I found this a little confusing, was the rifle has a scope on it and it has a muzzle brake with vents on the top half of the muzzle brake. And it's as if the rifle were flipped upside down so the scope is facing downwards and those vents from the muzzle brake left burn marks on the floor consistent with the vents. So the, the gun is literally rotated upside down, scoped down this way, which is not the way you would normally expect someone to intentionally shoot somebody. Uh, it's more consistent, again, with there being a fight over the gun. Again, the evidence will show that that gun was upside down, literally almost on the ground, when two shots were fired. That shows you that there was a physical fight, a struggle occurring over that firearm. I'm just going to pause here because I have the, the courtroom is uh, the camera's on in the courtroom. It's not in session yet, uh, but I can see the, uh, the defendant, Dean Cummings, is chatting with the bailiff. Uh, they're just having a casual conversation. The giant bailiff, you'll, you'll recognize him when I bring the screen up. Uh, the guy who's this, you know, that's, that's, uh, that's not a moon, <laughs> that guy. Um, so curious. Okay. Whoops. I lost my cursor. Darn it. Oh, there it is. Okay. You're going to see that firearm. It's going to be in this courtroom. You're going to have a chance to look at it. And it's important that you take a close look at that firearm. Oh, I really like how they do this because uh, they're going to show you a picture now of the rifle with the scope on it, <laughs> but the photograph is actually upside down, just like she was describing the rifle was upside down in the fight. I thought that was very clever. Technology. <laughs> There's a light. There you go. Yeah, there go. You'll get going. She could have shown it right side up, right? <laughs> There you go. This is a photo of that gun that was taken by an investigator with the Office of the Medical Investigator. What you're looking at there, this is the AR-15 that was involved in the struggle. What you see there is some kind of residue or spatter that dried on that firearm that is consistent with Mr. Cummings' story that something was sprayed at him that day during that struggle while they're fighting over that gun. You're gonna be able to look at that firearm when it's in this courtroom. So those are the two important things about that firearm that the evidence is gonna show. One, this residue or spatter that dried on the gun. And two, that the muzzle created those marks on the floor, showing that that gun was literally on the floor or almost on the floor when it went off at least twice. You're gonna hear evidence from Dr. Gerald with the Office of the Medical Investigator, as Ms. Walker indicated. Officer Gerald conducted the autopsy of Mr. Ariola. And there's a, a couple of important details that she's going to tell you about what that autopsy revealed. First, the trajectory of those bullets. Mr. Ariola was shot and killed by two bullets. 
Both of those bullets entered in a right to left trajectory, one through his temple and downward, downward and ended up in his chest. The other one entered on the right side of his chest and went through and exited on the left side. So those two bullets, both right to left in a downward trajectory. Dr. Gerald will be testifying to that and you'll probably see some photographs that also help to demonstrate some of that. The other thing that she's going to tell you is that Mr. Ariola was intoxicated at the time of this altercation. He was intoxicated on alcohol, he had cocaine in his system, and he had marijuana in his system. And Dr. Gerald will explain to you the significance of that combination of alcohol and cocaine when it's in some- So this is funny because when the state brought up their medical examiner witness to testify about the injuries, just before the witness came to the stand, they, they, they asked the judge to exclude evidence from the tox results on the victim. <laughs> yeah. One system at wow. the same time. And they also testified it had nothing, see photographs. no impact whatsoever, nothing to do with see. the act. And again, I explained, you're going to see photographs of those impact sites that tell you the story of what happened in that trailer. The impact sites that go down the hall out of the trailer, the other impact sites next to Mr. Ariola's body that show that the gun was on the floor when it went off. And you're going to also hear testimony from an expert by the name of Aaron Brudinell. Mr. Brudinell is a forensic scientist who has spent decades working with the Arizona Department of Public Safety. He is a forensic scientist. His full-time job is working for the prosecution in Arizona. Well, he's a prosecutor. He analyzes crime scenes, especially <laughs> when there, um, is, uh, there are firearms involved. And he reconstructs shootings. He took the evidence that was gathered by the New Mexico State Police and the Sandoval County Sheriff's Department. He took that evidence and he examined it and he reconstructed what happened in that trailer that day. Mr. Brudinell is going to testify that he closely examined those impact sites that I've just briefly described for you. And he's gonna tell you that the physical evidence that he saw is consistent with some kind of physical struggle occurring over that firearm. So at the end of this trial, there is not gonna be a dispute about the fact that Mr. Cummings did shoot and kill Mr. Ariola, And the evidence is going to show that he acted in self-defense. The evidence is also going to show that he did not conceal his identity at any point in time. In fact, the evidence will show that he placed a 911 call to the police. I okay, folks, the judge is seating himself. So let me pull up the uh, the courtroom feed now. I mean, it sounds like she has the facts, <laughs> which, you know, has been demonstrated at the trial. Hey, big bailiff's back. Big bailiff. That's that's who the defendant with uh, the uh, male pattern baldness there. That's who the defendant was just chatting with moments ago for quite some time. So that's uh, uh, Nicole Moss speaking now, defense attorney. Okay. Okay. Anything on the stick? No? You don't forgot something, I'll be right back. Hold on. Oh, come on. All right. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
uh, to find her contact information online. And I did find it, but I also found, see if I can find it now, a, uh, a review. Of course, now I don't know where it is. A review of her. She had two Martindale Hubble reviews. One was without comment, just five stars out of five. The other was 2.6 stars out of five. And I was like, that's not the lawyer I'm seeing. And it was supposedly by a judge. That's who it's identified as. Mm. And uh, the judge was like, oh, she lacks courtroom uh, decorum in the courtroom, <laughs> but she zealously yeah. advocates for her client. I'm like, man, from a criminal defense attorney's perspective, that's a 10 out of five stars. That's not <laughs> a five out of five stars. Certainly not 2.6 out of five. Okay, looks like we're back. Hold on. I don't see how you get a conviction when I was on these your, murder uh, counts. I was reviewing PTIs for Ms. Dominguez, who's one of the, the defendant's expected witnesses. And I just want to make sure that she was reminded of the limited scope of her testimony because she sure had a lot to say. And the purpose of her testimony was very limited to that one incident of May's um, and that was it. Well, a couple of things, if you want to talk about it right now. Uh, the state has asked witnesses <clears throat> if, uh, if, if, if Mr. Ariola had a gun, if he carried a gun. So they've opened the door to that. They've asked witnesses if Mr. Ariola, uh, or, or elicited testimony that Mr. Ariola was honest. So they've opened the door to that. Um, but I do intend to visit with her She's coming in about half an hour early uh, to visit with me so that I can talk to her about the scope of her testimony. But uh, we certainly are entitled now to bring a couple of other things out, <clears throat> excuse me, based on the state's questioning and, and the, uh, the evidence uh, that, that has come out. So, you know, this is going to be an extremely damaging witness for the state. <laughs> and that's yeah. why they're trying to, to forestall uh, the scope of her testimony right now at the start of the day. Can I respond to the one about the honesty? As okay, you know, thought, we're, not, we're not going to go into the character, uh, into right. the, his character to truthfulness. But we already have. But, uh, Your Honor, as you recall at the bench, I, she, when Ms. Moss brought it up, I said, I didn't elicit that. I want to, I will lead her so she doesn't go into that. And if the, if the, if the court feels that the door has opened, then I'm going to pursue it further with this witness and other witnesses. And I wasn't allowed to do that. Okay, we're not, we're not going to get into the issue of character for truthfulness. Okay. But the vision with her, before, she's not going to come in right away, right? Oh, no. She's, the, okay. she's not coming till the afternoon. Yeah, okay. But obviously, they've asked uh, whether or not he had any guns. Uh, she can comment on that. Um, I, I, didn't t I didn't make the state ask that question. Uh, they asked it. So now I, I get to follow well, well, up that, with my that, witnesses that's, on it. But not, we're not going to get... We'll, we'll, Discuss this more, but right now I'm telling you we're not going to get into the is issue of his character for truth. Sure, I understand. All right. All right. I've heard you. Okay. Okay. Bring him in, Loretta. I mean, that tells us that he doesn't have a character for truthfulness, right? Because this the defense would not be trying to bring in this evidence unless the evidence was contrary to truthfulness. And I'm not saying the judge is wrong here. Generally, character evidence is not admissible, and there's a lot of character evidence about the defendant apparently that's not being admitted. So he's probably being even handed here. I'm just observing that we've read things in the media that might make us question uh, the defendant's mental health. Well, there's stuff about the victim, too, that's not being admitted to the jury. OK, I'll. Uh, I'll do that. Gentlemen, thoughts. Oh, Kurt, first, tell people where to find you. <clears throat> yes, I'm on the channel on civil law where we cover a lot of appellate court cases. We're going to be covering, we recently covered the cases uh, for oral argument at the U.S. Supreme Court for Students for Fair Admission versus UNC versus Harvard. That was really fun. That would be great. We're going to be, we're going to be covering uh, pretty soon a case coming out of California dealing with pork, where California has put some regulations that are potentially unfair, unfair trade on other states. And also this week, there's a fairly significant argument dealing with adoption and custody issues for Native Americans. They have a special law for them that, in essence, gives Native Americans special preference, special dispensation to um, adopt Native Americans. And uh, that law is being challenged this week. So that's going to be a pretty significant oral argument. So if you're into any of that, check me out on Uncivil Law. There you go. Cool. Testimony about the use of 
Oh, they called. That's <laughs> they called the defendant as a witness. First, even. I'm surprised. I'm genuinely surprised by this. I guess he must not be completely insane. Mm. Are, are you a, are you well, a skier, Andrew? I mean, I, I know how I've done it. I'm not a fan. It's not that Did unusual. That Primacy either. and recency. Uh, I mean, calling him first. Yet, but I Get his story out fresh. It's not like unheard of. A lot of times they'll hold them back because they don't want to do it. And they'll kind of call the other witnesses and get a feel for how they think the case is progressing. And if they feel they're behind, the, the, then they, they'll make the ultimate decision at the end. Yeah, yeah, that's fair, too. <laughs> Good morning, good to sir. There's another day of good testimony morning. brought to you Could by you Gloveworks. A lot of these trials, they don't call the defendant ever, right? But they called Rittenhouse. Mm -hmm. They didn't call him first. Yeah, yeah. Introduce yourself to the jury. Uh, my name is Dean Cummings. And how old are you? I'm 57. And do you have any children? I have three beautiful kids. How old are they? Um, they're 9, 17, and 19. And where are you from? I'm from Alaska, Valdez, Alaska. And did you grow up in Alaska? I grew up in Los Alamos, New Mexico. How long did you live in New Mexico for? Um, until I was 23, 24 years old. Okay. And what? Um, where did you move to after you left New Mexico? I moved to Valdez, Alaska. And what were you doing in Valdez, Alaska? I ran a heli skiing business, a guide service. Um, and what does that mean for those of us that aren't really into skiing? I, um, I offered a trip, a helicopter skiing trip. People would book uh, a trip from all over the world and fly into Valdez, Alaska. And we would take them out in helicopters into the mountains and ski them down mountains. Where we'd do multiple runs a day. They would sign up for six, six to eight runs a day. And I would book out... Um, four groups a week and then one private helicopter sounds like a wealthy clientele How does a boy from los alamos <laughs> new mexico end up guiding hella ski tours in alaska i uh, have been i've been a skier my whole life my dad taught me how to ski when i was in, in kindergarten and i went on to make the u.s ski team and uh i found my my calling in big mountains US and ski team. Skiing. okay i went up to alaska in 91 and uh, i don't know if you've seen any of the warren the miller ski films they make every year but he's been and in i had them. helicopter experience from when i was a younger man so i was asked by a helicopter company to start a heli ski business so i did and so that's what you were doing in alaska exactly i did other things too i owned a small gravel pit and I developed 50 acres of property as well. So you should was, be nervous, folks. He's looking at like some him. heavy equipment in the summertime, doing operations, and then doing helicopter skiing in the wintertime. He's been in jail for two and a half years. And when did you leave Alaska? I left Alaska in 2019. And where did you go? I ended up putting an office into Wilson, Wyoming, um, to do helicopter ski bookings. It was a booking a, a booking office, basically. Okay. And... Did you stay in Wyoming? I did. I was in Wyoming um, until 2020. And where did you go then? Then I came down here to New Mexico. And why did you come back to New Mexico? I was looking at finding um, a place for the summertime um, and the early fall. I'd spend my winters in Alaska and the rest of the year in New Mexico. I was looking for a piece of land. And what were you going to do with that land? I was going to build a house and start doing some hunting guiding. I'm a I'm an avid hunter. I live subsistence in Alaska. I'd hunt a moose every year and a mountain goat every year. I'd put away about 500 pounds of meat every year for my family. And so you wanted to do that here in New Mexico? Yeah, I'm, uh, I really enjoy hunting. I'm pretty good at it. And uh, there's a good market for it here in New Mexico. And where were you looking at properties? I was looking um, in the era of Largo Canyon, which is basically everything from uh, San Ysidro all the way to Farmington. I was looking for property in that area. There's just an incredible amount of wildlife and game in those areas, the Camazon area and the Largo Canyon area. And how did you first meet Guillermo Ariola? I was just looking around for a different land and uh, exploring some of the region by Camazon Peak. And I ran into um, five horses. I was also looking to get a horse with a piece of property. And I ran into five um, horses that looked really 
beautiful. They were look really healthy. And uh, at the same time, I ran into the horses. And I two two guys came by on horseback. Uh, one of the ranchers from the Camazon area, him and his uh, his one of his cowboys. And I asked them about the horses, and they told me, yeah, that there's a chance he would sell one of those horses. And uh, I said, well, how do I find this guy? And they said, um, he just was riding down the road on his horse. We're surprised you didn't see him when you drove, drove down. And so I just took note of it, and then I left. And as I was driving out, I ran into a gentleman on a horse, and I was pretty sure it was going to be the owner of that the horses in that property. And I stopped and talked to him. And was that Guillermo Ariola? That was. And so tell us a little bit about that first meeting on the road. So I was in my truck. He was on a horseback. He, dis he dismounted off his horse, and we started a conversation at the window of my truck. He went on to tell me more than I was even looking for. Um, I was looking for land, but I didn't think he had land. I just thought he had horses at the time. And he told me he actually didn't have horses, that it was someone else's horses on his property. But he had a chunk of land he was going to sell. He was going to sell a small ranch. And I said, I'd be interested in looking at it. So we uh, decided to, to exchange phone numbers and that we could reconvene at another time so he could show me the property. So you didn't see the property that day? No, we just uh, made it so that we would call each other and schedule a time to come look at the property. Did you make any observations regarding Mr. Ariola's demeanor that day? I did. Um, he did smell like liquor that first time I met him. And uh, as I was about to drive off, he was having a hard time mounting his horse. He couldn't get up on his horse. His horse was kind of dragging him along, and he was trying to climb up on this big old horse. Um, I was my observation that he was he was intoxicated. Okay. When did you next speak with Mr. Ariola? A couple of days after that, we I uh, gave him a phone call, and uh, he was uh, willing to go look at the property as soon as we as soon as he could, which was just a couple of days out. Yeah, the mask for court mandated, folks. So we uh, scheduled a time <laughs> that I would go out there and meet up with him, and he could show me the property. And did you end up going out there? I did. Tell me about that first day on the ranch. So I drove out there, and there was two gates to go through to get in, into the ranch. I drove through, and the gates were open, which was nice. And I drove on the property, and it was much nicer than I anticipated. It had, like, four really beautiful areas for horse corrals. And then it had uh, land on the side where you could graze the horses. Uh, that was a, some other landowner, but um, we had permission. He had permission to let his horses graze in that area. You can get DUI on really nice. horses. It was a small trailer. It had a water system, so I had water. Got a friend that's got um, one of those. <laughs> uh, solar power for electricity, so it was off the grid. And uh, he was really that's, adamant that's about showing points, me um, if you can do everything that. with the water and with the solar panels. Um, he invited that I come out there and stay there any time, and uh, that way I would get a handle on how the water system worked and how the electrical put system. The mask worked blows the nose now. <laughs> how did you and Mr. Ariola get along? You have to put a breathalyzer we on got the along horse in order to start it. Um, yeah. We seem to have a lot in common with uh, mountains and deserts and horses and stuff. There you go. And so, did you see Mr. Ariola again? I did. Um, he invited me to stay there and to use the trailer anytime I wanted. Um, I also talked to him about, I, I let him know that I had a fifth wheel RV camper and that uh, we could do one of two things. I could purchase the property if he was interested in doing that, or I could just live out there and pay him $300 a month in my fifth wheel. I figured I would walk before I ran on this, on this deal, get a handle on the property since he was nice enough for me to look to stay out there and get a feel for how the water system worked and how the power system worked. Not a lot of water out um, there, folks. So I ended up uh, staying at the trailer the following weekend, and uh, I explored the region with my with my four wheeler. I had a side by side four wheeler. I went around and explored the mountains and checking out wildlife and stuff like that. And to be clear, Mr. Ariola was aware that you were out there? Yeah, he uh, he was adamant about me staying out there to learn the water system and the, uh, the electrical system. Okay. So that weekend, that first weekend when you stayed out there, was he with you? No, he wasn't. I had the whole place to myself and I explored the whole region. And after that weekend, did you speak with Mr. Ariola again? I did. Um, I spoke to him again and I told him I was very interested in the land. I had already pulled out my fifth wheel RV. So 
I was already set up to start paying three hundred dollars a month for for the rental of the spot where my camper sat. But I told them I was very interested in purchasing the property. And I want to back up a, a, a little bit here, Mr. Cummings. When can you give us an approximate time frame of when you first met Ari Mr. Ariola on that road that day? I'm not too good with the dates, but um, I'm pretty sure it was it was about three weeks, three and a half weeks before the incident. Um, the incident was post like caption is on, folks. 29th of February. So I was, I had uh, met up with him three weeks before the incident occurred. Oh, I guess I have to change the configuration though, don't I? Okay, here we go. So you and Mr. Ariola are having conversations about how you can purchase the property or rent the property. Yes, I actually met him one more one time in uh, Placitas at the grocery store, and we talked further about it. And he was very motivated to sell it, and I was very motivated to buy it. And how were you getting along with him during all of these exchanges? We got along pretty good. We had no problems. Um, we seemed to have a lot in common. Was there a time when that started to change? I ended up staying out there one time when he stayed out there and we did, we did some drinking. We drank a little bit of whiskey and uh, he went into detail about having problems with his neighbors. Um, he drank more than I did that night and he seemed to really want to share a lot of his history with his neighbors with me. Well, and before we get into the details of that, um, <clears throat> Can you kind of explain how it was that the two of you ended up there together? Um, yeah, he, he said he'd come out on a certain weekend that I was there and um, I was excited to learn more about the watering system. So he actually walked me through the whole watering system. We went to where the, where the well was drilled, where the, the containment, the, he had a secondary containment system that it would fill up a, as about a 500 gallon tank. Um, and then he showed me how to, how to, irrigate all the trees he had planted a lot of trees out there and he showed me how to plant how to water all the trees out there and then showed me a, a little bit more about the electrical system with the solar panel and you mentioned some whiskey yeah we had some whiskey we drank some liquor um, that night after he showed me everything who brought the whiskey um he did do you recall how much whiskey you had to drink that night there was a bottle i can't remember if it was completely full when we started but um I probably had five drinks mm -hmm. and when the bottle was running out, it only had a few more drinks left in it. He seemed to want to finish off that bottle. He, he had about eight more drinks worth. than I had my, um, personally. <laughs> um, he was definitely liquored up. <laughs> That's a scientific and term. And you mentioned that he started up. talking to you about problems he had with his neighbors. Yeah, he started talking about. I'm going to object to hearsay at this point. <clears throat> Seems reasonable. Far so good, man. Yeah, I mean, you can try to sneak it in, especially if they're trying to argue the guy had a problem with drinking. You could talk about how do you know his speech was slurred? How do you know he was drunk? You know, he couldn't pronounce my neighbors suck and I wish they were dead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, you know, so far, it's a perfectly serviceable. Yeah, because the biggest weakness for the That's defenses right. here is, you know, why the jury would want to know, why did this have to happen? Why why would this guy just attack the defendant here such that the defendant had, had to uh, defend himself? Um, because it, you wouldn't expect it to happen for no reason. So they're trying to portray the victim here, obviously, as being somehow erratic, bad with alcohol, someone who tends to get into confrontations with other people, including his neighbors and things along those lines. Uh, that's why I'm well, concerned. Jeff, I'm concerned you don't have through the, burden the testimony. Of I'm just concerned he's going to give the prosecution the motive for why he would do it just inadvertently. He's got to be so careful here. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's a big bet putting your, putting your client on the witness stand. Well, especially here where there's literally been no argument as to motive from, from the prosecution. I mean, why would he do it? Why would there be any need for a self-defense or a for not self? I mean, it doesn't make any we, sense to me. We right now everything's controlled for the defense, yeah. right? Because they're asking direct questions. We won't know how much of a train wreck this is going to turn into until <laughs> until cross starts, yeah. and then we'll see if the guy yeah. unravels. It's very very dangerous to put your client in a position where they're subject to cross examination by a skilled prosecutor. Now I've yet to see much skill from these prosecutors, but <laughs> you know, principal, yeah.
She seems to have worked the weave out though this today anyway. I don't know what trial the comment the chat's talking about where somebody wasn't allowed to bring up self-defense as a legal defense. There's good reasons not to allow self-defense, but he's allowed to raise self-defense here. I think they might be talking about this case uh, Leto right, was so covering, Cummings, I think yesterday or the day before, had, uh, where uh, the judge basically just said, no. Nah. You about some problems he had and the Fifth Circuit uh, specifically did he was looking at it, I think. you about an incident where he attacked a car with a hammer. He did. He told me he had scared the heck out of somebody. Hold on. By um. Hold on. He's answered the question. I think that's what he was doing. He acknowledged is what's what's relevant, not the details of the incident. You, I don't know if we should be doing this, but in open court. But you just said he could testify to that, to this incident. Oh, so this this is why it's being permitted, right? Because he. If he had knowledge of a tendency towards violence or a reputation for violence or past violence by the victim, if he had that knowledge at the time the fight occurred, then that would go to his perception of the reasonableness of the threat. He had knowledge, the defense is saying, he's testifying, he had knowledge that the victim had previously attacked someone with a hammer. His defense is that he was being struck in the head with an object. He didn't know what it was. He didn't know if it was mace. He didn't know what it was. But if he had knowledge that this victim had previously attacked someone with a hammer, that would contribute to his reasonableness of a deadly force threat in the nature of that attack, hence his going to the rifle. And that would make it admissible. It's not because it's not being hearsay is when it's an out of court statement being introduced for the truth of the statement. It doesn't have to be true that the victim ever attacked anybody with a hammer. He just has to have believed that it was true. It's going to his subjective state of mind, not the truth of the underlying allegation. I'm, I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. Mr. Cummings, did Mr. Ariola tell you about an incident where he attacked a car with a hammer? He did. He told me he scared the heck out of a guy that had pulled into their driveway, um, the neighbor's driveway, and uh, he had beat on the top of the car, and the guy was scared to death. Hmm. And how did that make you feel when you heard about that? He shared a few more incidents than that. Um, but how did it make you feel when you heard about that? Incident? Subjective state of mind. I had a red flag uh, go up immediately. I, um, this, I, I figured yeah. out I didn't want to be on his bad side. And uh, I needed to be careful on how I dealt with them to close the land deal. Okay. And how did the evening end? Um, I went and slept in the back room. He showed me where the bunk bed was. And uh, we got a couple blankets out of a, a Rubbermaid container. And uh, I fell asleep in the back room. And he uh, slept in where the fireplace is, which is basically the living room of this little trailer. And I'm going to show you what's already been admitted as State's Exhibit 46. Now, one thing that would be interesting here, because if I were involved in this case, if I were on the state side, I'd ask, well, what's the evidence that you actually knew this at the time and didn't just hear about this in the two and a half years since this event happened? Because if you learned about this, this reputation or this attack afterwards, it could not have contributed to your subjective state of mind at the time of the attack. And normally, if there's zero evidence that you can produce as foundation for that you had that knowledge at the time of the attack, the, the judge is likely to exclude it. Yet you don't have yeah. to show much, but you'd have to show something. Now, now who knows? Maybe when he was being questioned by the cops at the time, he made a statement about this background. So that would be evidence that he knew it at the time. But I, I would wonder, you know, all right, you say you knew this, prove it. Mm, exactly. So you can't lock yourself into something. You can't lock yourself out of every, something. Everything depends on what you know at the time. So if the person is, in fact, like, you know, a virtuous soul, but is this the you didn't know that, it doesn't matter, and vice versa. Yes, it is. And did you sleep on the lower bunk bed or the upper bunk bed? I slept on the lower bunk bed, the one to the looker's right. And the mask is under his nose again. These stupid <laughs> masks. The masks are... It's pretty dumb. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, geez, they even told him to put it up nice. It's like all the, all okay, the so stewardesses that keep waking up. me up on flights to Which tell me to put my on? mask back on. The one to Looker's right with the blue mattress that's showing the mattress. And the Atlantic says the we should have amnesty. Lol. Can you see that other bed in the back with the uh, boot box on it? Did you ever sleep on that bed? I didn't. 
And we've heard evidence um, that there was actually a rifle wedged between the mattress and the box springs of that bed. Were you aware that rifle was there? I never did see it. I didn't know it was in there. Okay. Now, this trial is occurring right now, folks. 2022, New Mexico court still mandates masks, which might tell you something about the jury pool. Did you see Mr. Ariola again after that evening of drinking out at the ranch? Yeah, we met up another time to go horseback riding. Tell me about that. Um, he, we met out at the ranch again. We had, this, we had uh, scheduled a time to meet up. And he was uh, going to give me one of the horses that was on the ranch with the purchase of the property. So I really wanted to know how everything worked, where the saddle was, where all the bridles were. And uh, he was more than happy to show me everything. He really enjoyed being around horses. I could well, all that stuff right is away. really expensive, folks. So you um, definitely so wanted to include saddled it. up the horses the and we rode up the dirt road, probably a couple miles up the dirt road and into a small canyon and then rode back. It was kind of a short ride. But uh, the horse was, was a great horse. I really enjoyed getting to know that horse. It was... Uh, perfect for me to have a horse out there and one that was as big as strong as the one that was out there and how did the two of you get along during this horseback ride no we got along just fine did you see mr Ariola again after that um i did but that was the big the big day did you ever meet with him at his office in placidas oh i'm sorry yeah i sure did um we had scheduled a time to meet in placidas where he had his realtor um and he was going to meet me. He said he had an office in Placidas, and then we scheduled a time where I could go meet the realtor and see the contract. And did you meet up with him? I did. It was hard to find because I didn't know it was a little trailer that he was in. He was in a camping trailer, and I was looking for an office space. Um, so I showed up on time, but I couldn't find exactly where they were at. And I finally called him up on the cell phone, and he walked me into where, where I could go into this gated area and go into where this little camper was. And at that point in time during the meeting, did you have a chance to review the contract? I did. I looked at the contract. It was pretty lengthy. I read it from from front to cover. And uh, the attorney was, uh, Glamour was there, and so was the realtor. Did the realtor become irritated with you? She definitely was short with me. Um, she was pushing me to sign the agreement, and um, I wasn't ready to do so. I needed somebody to look at it. it was, some of the language in the contract was beyond my scope of law and realty. Did you ask to take that contract with you? I did. I asked them if I could take the contract to an attorney or to a realtor. And she uh, responded back to me that she can't do that or she could lose her realty license. <laughs> Here's so what a, that whatever. Meeting? That was a pretty big red flag. Um, <laughs> Guillermo didn't really speak up in the meeting. I could tell that Guillermo was a little bit bugged with his realtor because she wouldn't, wasn't really being very uh, open with the agreement. And um, I, I just ended the meeting right then and there. It was a waste of time at that point. I needed to be able to convince Guillermo that I needed an attorney or a realtor to look at the contract. He seemed a little bit bugged with uh, his attorney, with his realtor too. So did you leave that meeting without signing the contract? I did. I left without signing the contract. Were you still interested in buying the property? Oh, yeah, I definitely was. And did you speak with Mr. Ariola again after that meeting? Um, yeah, we had another phone conversation, and um, he apologized for what had happened. And uh, I asked him if there was another realtor we could work with or uh, how we could work with the realtor that he had. And did you, did, did the two of you reach an agreement or was it still open for discussion? It was a vague conversation. He didn't go very far into uh, meeting up again with a realtor or finding another realtor. Um, so it was open-ended at that point. Did you return to the property at some point? I did. I uh, went back to the property to stay out there um, again. Were you still hoping to purchase the land? Absolutely. Was Mr. Ariola there when you arrived? No, I got there late one night around 10, 11 o'clock, and uh, nobody was there. So I uh, put on a, a movie and watched a movie inside the trailer. And what happened that evening? I uh, fell asleep in front of the TV, and then in the middle of the night I woke up, and I smelt a propane smell in the trailer, which concerned me. Why would that concern you? 
Because propane is flammable. <laughs> <laughs> now, you um, said that Mr. Ariola had spent a lot of time showing you the property and how it worked. How was this trailer heated? With a, with a wood fireplace. What else did they use to heat it? They had a small propane heater in the back bedroom. Yeah. Right. So this is the propane heater that was knocked off the wall. So it was wall mounted, it was knocked to the ground, which obviously would be consistent with uh, a, a physical altercation having occurred. And frankly, I guess ultimately they really had to put this guy on the witness stand or where was the evidence of self-defense going to come from? And uh, he had a couple bottles on the back of the back of the trailer that were propane bottles. I'm going to show you what's already been admitted as States Exhibit 61. Do you recognize what's depicted in this photo? I do. What is that? It's a propane heater on its side. It looks like it either fell off or uh, somehow tumbled off the side there. And where is that propane heater? That's in the back bedroom. There's the pepper spray canister on the left. But that's not where it was found. Sitting on the floor so like this is that? another thing. Mm. So when the when the when the room uh, when the cops actually came to the room, the propane can uh, the um, mace canister was in the victim's hand. Uh, the nozzle was facing towards the victim, but it was in the victim's grasp on the floor. The police did a lot of photographing of 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 the room after things had been moved around, which that's is just great. That's very just fantastic. Great. Right. They, even, they even have an evidence marker next to this mace canister as if that's where it were found when they arrived on the scene. That, that That's not where it was. That's just call, it was really fantastic place work. I think there's a hanger just outside of this photograph where it was supposed to be hanging. Okay. Do you know how we got on the floor? I'm guessing because we got into an altercation that some one of us bumped into it. show you what's been marked as States Exhibit 75. Do you recognize I mean, I've never been to one day of a police academy and I know not to do that shit. Bottles. Where are those propane bottles? They're just on the outside of the back bedroom where the altercation occurred. So now you testified that you woke up in the middle of the night and you smelled propane. Yeah, I did. Uh, and that concerned you? It did. I was, uh, I was, wasn't, the smell was really bad. It woke me up basically. And I got up and I was trying to figure out where it was coming from. I checked the stove, but the stove wasn't turned on. And at that point I just went to my trailer because it smelled so bad. And when did you see Mr. Ariola next? I slept in, he showed up around, I don't know what time exactly it was, 1.30 or 2 o'clock, and he pulled into the property in his truck. And where were you when he pulled in? I was in my fifth wheel trailer. I stepped outside when I saw him pull up. And what did you do? I just went to greet him, and uh, we, we, we greeted each other just outside the gate where my fifth wheel RV was parked. Did you notice anything about his demeanor at that point? It was definitely a little bit different than the other times I had met up with him. He was kind of short with me, and uh, he kind of had a scowl above his eyes. He um, he seemed to be in a bad mood is what I thought. He, he just wasn't in a good mood or something. So after you greeted him, what happened? Um, he went over to his trailer. I went back into my fifth wheel, and um, he was moving stuff from inside the from his truck to inside the trailer. He had brought a bunch of, gro a bunch of groceries and was moving stuff into the trailer. So what did you do at that time? So I wanted to have a conversation with him about the purchase of the property. And um, I was thinking things were falling through, but I really wanted to communicate with him to see if we could work a deal. And so I went over to the trailer and went on inside and he was in the kitchen unloading groceries. And what happened when he went inside the kitchen? I started talking to him about the trailer and about getting someone to look at the agreement. And he was kind of standoffish more than I'd ever seen him. Um, he's behaving differently for sure. And we started talking about it and it started getting kind of heated. Um, so I, I could tell that our conversation wasn't getting much better at the time. So I wasn't mm -hmm. sure what to do, but um, I was just trying to communicate. And how long were you talking to him for? 
probably about 10 minutes, uh, eight minutes to 10 minutes. And when you were speaking with him, did he appear intoxicated? He kind of did. Um, I didn't get very close to him. I couldn't smell anything at the time, but uh, he definitely he definitely seemed intoxicated a little bit. I wasn't sure if he had, had been drinking or been smoking some weed or something. And we've heard testimony in this trial that Mr. Ariola was on cocaine. Hey, there's a thousand of you watching who haven't hit the like, thumb up button. Let's get with it, folks. It's free. Hit the like button. At the time of his death, were you aware that he used cocaine? No, he never shared that with me. He never uh, told me that he used cocaine or tried to share it with me when we were drinking. And so you're having this conversation and it starts to get heated. What happened next? So he gets a pretty bad scowl above his eyes. You could tell he was getting pissed off. And um, I, was getting, I was getting a little anxious too myself. I just really wanted to get, get the deal done and get the contract looked Thank up you. by the attorney. Um, I started calling him out. I was calling him out saying, look, are you trying to scam me on this deal or what's your problem? I kind of maybe went one step too far. So Don't say I didn't that. realize how Careful. angry this guy could be or how he could get that way. When you say that you may have gone one step too far, what do you mean? I called him a scammer, um, and that really blew him up off the top. That really made him angry. And after you called him a scammer, what did he do? Um, I said, are you scamming me? And he uh, runs across the kitchen. He was only three or four feet away from me at the time. He comes running at me. He has something in his right hand. And he comes at me, he swings at it. I block with my left hand and he barrels into me with his, um, his left hand, kind of like a, like a blocker in a football game. It pushed me against the countertop and I slid off into the hallway. I was on my, on my hands and feet. I'm going to stop you there for a minute, slow you down. Okay. And I'm going to show you what's already been admitted into evidence as States Exhibit 44. Do you recognize what's depicted in that photo? I do. And what are we looking at? We're looking at the kitchen with a, the start of the hallway. You can see the hallway going off to the left there. And can you tell us where you were standing when Mr. Ariola attacked you? I was standing right there. I think that's where my feet were. My feet, my feet were. And when he knocked into you, when he attacked you, where did you go? I fell backward. I landed about where the sunglasses are. And then he was all over me. Um, but my rifle was sitting right next to the wall there. Um, right about there. And I, as he was on top of me, he was trying to swing with the canister or something in his hand. And uh, I reached across with my right hand across my legs and grabbed the rifle. And then I was uh, scooching backward down the hallway, trying to get back up to my feet. And I'm going to stop you there for a okay. minute. So when he tackles you or attacks you in the kitchen, I think you used the word attacked. When he attacks you and you fall to the floor, were you wearing sunglasses? I wasn't. Whose sunglasses are those? They were on his hat. They were uh, Glamo sunglasses. Do you know how they got on the floor? I think when he came over me, swinging above me, they fell off. So he's swinging at you with a canister? Yeah, I know there was a canister at that time. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know if it was a knife or what he had. Did he ever make contact with you? He never did. I kept blocking with my left hand. And so after you're on the floor, what happened next? I was doing a crab walk kind of thing, trying to get my feet under me. I got back up to my feet or almost back up to my feet. And he came running down the hallway and hit me again. I fell into the very entrance of a small bathroom. I was kind of in the door jam with my, my legs were in the hallway, but my upper body was in the door jam of the bathroom. Um, he was all over me at this point. He's swinging as hard as you could swing. I'm blocking him as much as I can. I've got the rifle by the barrel and he's trying to grab the barrel uh, and trying to grab the rifle out of my hand. I knew I couldn't let go of that thing for the life of me. Um, I ended up fighting myself back to my feet. I backed up down the hallway. I was about four or five feet from him. And he's just in a rage. He just starts. Let me uh, stop you there. Okay. When you are knocked down the second time, yeah, you just slow us down a little bit more. Up, you said, yeah. And what do you do then? I get it back in the hallway, and I get back about five feet from him. I'm about at the very end of the hallway at this point. 
I finally grabbed the rifle like you should with the handle on, with one hand on the handle and another hand on the barrel, which is kind of got a plastic coating around the barrel so it doesn't burn your hand. And I said, <laughs> stop. And uh, he didn't stop at all. He came charging at me and knocked me into the back bedroom. When you screamed stop and you have the rifle, what are you doing with the rifle? I'm trying to protect myself. I'm basically thinking that if I point this at him, he's going to stop coming at me and realize you know, how serious it was. But he didn't. He just came barreling into me. He, he was coming into me like a, like a football blocker, coming with his left hand, his other hand up in the air with, the, with some object in his hand. So after you yell stop and he barrels into you again, what happens? I fall back in the back bedroom and um, my legs were all the way in the bedroom, um, kind of by that heater where you had showed that heater before. Let me pull it up for you. For those in the chat saying they don't believe this guy's story, you have to point to evidence that could disprove this story beyond a reasonable doubt. I don't see it. It's a gut feeling is not enough. So is, where were you? Does this photo show where you fell? Yeah, kind of. I would say my uh, legs were where the uh, number four is and my upper body was just out, just outside of this photograph. I was scrambling out from underneath him. He was all over me. He was on top of me swinging with that thing in his hand. And I was crab walking back again, trying to get my feet back under me. This time he was all over me, though. He was leaning over me and swinging violently with uh, something in his hand. I'm going to show you a different photo that might help us a little bit in understanding okay. what you're describing. Um, and, and folks, this is why I get unhappy when the when the defense in their opening statement doesn't emphasize the extent, the height of the burden that the that the the prosecution faces from a legal perspective because you could hear this guy's story and feel like yeah gut feeling i don't know i'm not sure i trust this guy i'm not sure i kind of feel like it might not have been self-defense if a jury feels that way they, they might convict this guy at a much lower threshold than the law actually requires mm. permission to approach the witness your honor i wish they'd spent a little bit more time and, and lengthened sure, out sure. the rise of the That's conflict sure mm, yeah I do. Of this part of the room. It definitely shows the entrance of the bedroom. At this point, they, they spent a lot of time on like background, how they knew each other. But when it got to, okay, we're in, we're in business dealings, converted to, we're in a state of animus, converted to, we're in a fight. That sort of middle step of the animus stage was a little bit too fast. Yeah, she lost fast. control of the pace there. So, Mr. Cummings, in this photo, what are we looking at? We're looking at the entrance of uh, the door entrance to the back bedroom and a propane heater. And I don't know how we clear the yellow markings that we had previously made. Again, those those blue gloves there are certainly the police gloves. They're leaving their own gloves just on the floor in in evidence photographs. It's ridiculous. Do I just hit clear here? Thank you. So this is the doorway to the bedroom? It is. And what is it in that lower corner? What is, what is this? That's the propane heater. What is this metal bar? It's uh, where you hang the heater on. I'll do a poll after the end of the direct, folks. On YouTube. And so as you're falling into the bedroom, tell me what's happening. He's just all over me. He's totally in a rage. Um, I fall backward into the back bedroom. I start scrambling and trying to get out from underneath him as best I could. I had the rifle in one hand. I had it by the handle at this point because I picked it up and put it in my hands properly when I was in the, when I got out of the ba bathroom. And um, I'm scrambling right now trying to get away from him. And he's, he's swinging as fast, as hard as he can with his right hand. And I'm using my left hand and I'm using the my elbow and my palm of my hand with the gun in my hand, pushing off, trying to slide myself back out from underneath him. And I don't know, one of us hit that heater. I don't know if it was me or if it was him. No signs of a struggle, by the, the way, though. One of you hit the heater. Did it come off the wall? I, uh, I see people in the chat saying alcohol's a downer. Folks, uh, chemically, <laughs> it may be a depressant, but we all know people 
who can drink and they're just happy drunks. And we all know people who, when they drink, they'll mm -hmm. fight a fucking telephone pole. Those people exist. Uh, it was yep. too crazy. Um, and then add I cocaine into the mix. I didn't really pay attention to that part of it, but it looks like it did. Fair enough. I'm going to show you again what's been already admitted as States Exhibit 46. You can see the canister in his right hand there. That's where it was found. Mr. Cummings, do you see in this photo a green area rug? I do, a throw rug. The throw rug, yes. Where was that throw rug before this fight started? It was spread out evenly on the floor, basically where you'd be sitting on that bunk bed with your feet on the, on the carpet. It was laid out on the floor. It wasn't underneath the tote. It was on the further to this side of the tote, the Rubbermaid container. How did the rug get all pushed up like that? I think I was on top of it. I think uh, part of my body was on top of it. And when I was doing the crab walk, trying to get out from underneath him, I think I pushed it up. So as you're crab walking or pushing back, what is he doing? He's swinging at my head with that, can with that canister. He even glanced at me a couple times. It was like he was trying to rub it on me or something. But I got a hold of his, I had a hold of his jacket and I was blocking him with my left hand. And this, this whole room is much smaller than no, I did, folks. And where was the gun? It was in my right hand. And I was using my right hand to walk, try to crab walk away from him and trying to get my feet underneath me and blocking him with my left hand. And was Mr. Ariola touching the gun? He was all over it. He was trying to get it out of my hand. He was pulling on it. And I was hanging on to it for dear life. I didn't want him to get that gun. I knew it was a, would have been the end of me if he got a hold of that gun. State did not DNA mm -hmm. test the barrel. And so you say that you knew it would have been the end of you. What is going through your mind while you're fighting over the gun in this bedroom? I just couldn't believe he was this crazy that he would attack me like he did. And I was definitely seriously worried about my life at this time. I knew if he got a hold of that gun that uh, it would have been the end of me or if he would have nailed me in the temple with that, with that canister in his hand. Um, I started thinking about my family and my kids, and I said to myself, you're not going to be a father much longer if you don't get serious about what's going on here, Dean. I was basically talking to myself, trying to get, get, um, get to the point where I could start pulling a trigger. And so what happens when you have that thought? Um, I'm still trying to get up. I think I got up to just uh, about mm. um, in a squat position, and he's all I didn't like that he's part. got a hold of the gun. A I couldn't too. get up. And uh, he's pushing on the ground. I think he pulled somehow. the gun against my fingers. What happened is why the first couple shots went off. Um, once the shots went off, I got my left hand. I took it away from his right hand. And, and I, I want to stop you, and I want to talk about those first couple shots. Okay. We've heard evidence, and we've seen photos of some impact sites with scorch marks. Yep. Those two impact sites on the floor. Yeah, I saw those. Do you know how those happened? He had a hold of the gun, pushing it down so I couldn't pick it up, and the gun went off. Um, I thought it went off more than two times, but it turns out it was just two times where it shot the floor. I'm pretty sure the barrel was touching the floor when those two shots fired. And after the gun goes off those two times, what happens? I just say to myself, Dean, you got to get serious about this. If you're going to be a father any, any longer, I just started, I grabbed the gun with my left hand. I tried picking it up and he had his hand. He was fighting over my, over me with his, his hands all over that gun, trying to yank it out of my arms. And I just started pulling the trigger. And um, I must've been just a quarter of the way up, not even that, maybe a, um, a quarter to a third of the way up because all the bullets went through the wall at a horizontal plane. Um, I never really did get that gun up. Okay. So when you, when you pulled the trigger, you're saying you're about a third of the way up. Yeah. I think he was all over me with his right hand. I'd given up on his right <laughs> hand so I could grab the rifle properly. Mm -hmm. And I just started pulling the trigger and, um, I didn't think we shot that many times, but that gun went off a lot of times. And um, what happened when the gun goes off? Um, once the gun went off, um, <laughs> I knew I had the gun went from, from, being down low to going up higher and um he falls at my feet just right where i was right where i was at trying to get up on my feet did mr ariola say anything to you during this fight at the beginning he said i'm gonna kill you 
That's the first thing he said to me when I fell down in the hallway from the kitchen. That, that's a helpful Did detail. Believe I believed him. He was, he was in a rage. That's another helpful one. <clears throat> After the gun goes off and Mr. Ariola falls to the floor, what do you do? I get up to him. I get up all the way and I walk outside and I was choking on something. So I was coughing. I was doing a technique that you do for high mountain uh, mountaineering where you and you get you clear your lungs, you get anything that's in your lungs to come out. And I was went out, I walked outside through the little mud room. He had a little porch there, and I walked outside and I was kneeling over, um, trying to hack that stuff out of my lungs because I could feel it was that my lungs were kind of seized up a bit. Did you know why your lungs were seizing up? I didn't. I didn't realize uh, that he had anything like mace. Um, but I was coughing and um, I looked over there and my, my face felt really cold and it was stinging a bit on my face. So I ended up looking over and there was a water spigot over there to the back of the trailer. I went over there, started splashing water on me. It didn't seem to help much. So I actually went back inside and I looked in to see if, if that guy was still moving or not. He wasn't, and I noticed a canister in his hand, and that's when I was uh, concerned it might have been a chemical of some kind. I went into the to the kitchen. I got some soap in my hand and the palm of my hand. I went back outside. I took my shirt off, and I started washing myself um, on the side of my head, washed, the, washed my hair, washed the side of my skin, and then I dried myself up with the towel with the T-shirt. So my, the T-shirt got all wet, and I was worried the T-shirt had some sort of chemical on it as well. How long did it take for you to uh, recover from the effects of the spray? My skin was stinging quite a while. Um, I seemed to be able to clear out my lungs. I just kept coughing and doing that technique that you do for high mountain elevation mountaineering. And I got that out of my lungs, but uh, it kind of burned for a while. Um, at that point, I went over to my trailer and I grabbed a shirt. I took the shirt off. I threw it on the bed of my truck. And then I put a new shirt on. It was still chilly. It was winter time. And what did you do with the gun? I put it on the front step. I, I cleared, I took out the clip. I cleared the, the barrel so there wouldn't be a round in the barrel. I knew the police were going to be coming. I just wanted to make sure that it wasn't a hazardous situation for them and that I wanted them to be able to trust me that they were safe by going into that mm -hmm. building. Um, I'm going to show you what's already been admitted as State's Exhibit 27 kind of cuts against because it, it shows thoughtfulness planning is that where you consciousness put your you'd think you'd that be is, in i said it right there on the state of disarray and did you remove the magazine i did i took out the clip and i cleared the magazine out of the barrel and you did that you said because you wanted it to be a safe scene yeah i wanted the police officer to be able to see it so they knew where the weapon was so they could go in and check out the scene um, I was just trying to make it as easy as I could for them. And I was definitely kind of worried about what could happen next. So I wanted to make sure they didn't think I was armed. Now let's talk about this firearm for a minute. What type of firearm is this? It's a 5.56 five, um, Sig and Sauer. Sig and Sauer. And why did you buy it? <laughs> I bought it when uh, they were going to, they were supposedly going to outlaw ARs. I bought it to... Uh, as an investment, I bought, I bought two of them. I bought a Colt and I bought a Sig and Sour. I was going to sell them. In Alaska, you can <clears> sell <throat> guns on a thing called Alaska List. So I was going to just try and double my money on these weapons. And why did you have it out this at this time? I was going to go Barbary sheep hunting. Uh, New Mexico has a Barbary sheep hunt that's year-round over the counter. <laughs> and there's Barbary sheep out there by the Kimazon Peaks and out there by Largo Canyon. So I was going to go hunting and see if I could find one of those uh, Barbary sheep. So why was the rifle out in the first place? I had put a new scope on it. And when I mounted it, it wasn't uh, quite right. It wasn't level. So when you look through it, um, you could see that the crosshairs were off angle. So that night I readjusted the scope and made it all level. And that's why I had it there on the table and it's leaned up against the wall. We've seen evidence that there was some electrical tape around the scope? Uh-huh. Why was there electrical tape? I put lens covers on the scope. So if it rains, the scope doesn't get wet when you're hunting and or dust, and they just cover it up really good. And it, 
it was not the tightest fit. So I got some electrical tape and I stretched out the electrical tape and wrapped it around there. It's really secure stuff. Once you stretch it tight, it's kind of a technique electrician, electricians use to put over wiring and stuff like that. Was the cap to the scope still on when you came outside after the shooting? I didn't really notice. I was in shock. I wasn't really paying attention to any of that. I was just so worried about getting that stuff off my face and off my, off my hair. Um, I didn't pay attention to that. So backing up a little bit, do you know approximately what time of day it was when this attack occurred? It was around three o'clock, maybe 3.30. And you said that it took you a little bit of time to clear your lungs and the, st the stinging to stop? Yeah, I, um, my lungs were stinging for quite a while and my skin was stinging for quite a while too. I, I, uh, I washed myself really good. I washed my hands, I washed my face, I washed my hair, I put on a clean t-shirt and it probably lingered on my body for about an hour. I noticed it was still stinging and um, and my lungs cleared out pretty quickly because I had coughed, just coughed it out um, probably 40 minutes. And then my lungs felt normal again. And when you started to feel better, what did you do at that point? I went over to my truck and, um, well, I did a couple things. I put the gun back on back. I put it by the porch on the front, the front, front porch there where they could see it. I went to my truck. Right when I got to my truck, I saw a motorcycle going down the road. So I ran over to the edge of the property by the gate and I was waving, <clears throat> trying to wave this guy down, whoever was on that motorcycle. And obviously he didn't see me. He didn't come, he didn't pull in. He was a good quarter mile away, but I thought since it's so remote, he would see me one person flagging their hands back and forth. And then when he didn't come see me, I went back to my truck. I got in my truck and I drove to an area that's about four miles away where you can get cell phone service. Um, I one time, once, Guillermo showed me one time with his four-wheeler, we drove up there so he could call his father. Um, so I knew where the cell phone service worked from, from that trip we made. So to be clear, was your cell phone working at the ranch? No, no cell phone works at the ranch. When you were seeking cell phone service, why? Because I wanted to call 911. And as you're driving out there to get cell phone service, what happens? I'm driving along. I'm looking at my phone to see if I'm getting any bars. I drove all the way up to an area called Camazon Peak. There's like an interest, interest sign there that the BLM put up. It talks about the, all the volcanoes and how they were created. And as I pulled up, there was a man over there reading the sign. And I pulled up and wanted to converse with him. I wasn't sure if he was friends with Guillermo or who he was. So I started a conversation with him. So he's saying now he wasn't sure who this guy was who might have been friends with the victim. This would explain maybe the hour-long delay before he asked that person to call 911. He wanted to feel him out and make sure it wasn't going to be someone who would also turn into an enemy, I guess. I'm not saying that's necessarily credible, but that would be why he's talking about this now. And I have to say, folks, I've driven around this Los Alamos part of New Mexico many, many times on my motorcycle. If I'm out there alone in this desert remote region and you try to wave me down, the chances of me stopping is pretty much zero. Uh, what I will do is once I get to a place with a cell signal, I might call the state police and say, hey, there's someone out here that looks like they need help. Uh, but I'm not planning to end up dead in the desert. And so, you know, the timeline, the maybe he's telling the story that the timeline weird, but he he's mm -hmm. talking about how he's inhaling this pepper spray and how it's infecting his lungs, infecting his eyes. And apparently at the same time this is happening, if I understood his story of the timeline correctly, He's conscious enough to, like, clear the firearms so the police will see it's empty. He's thoughtful enough to, like, you know, deal with his clothes and issues like that. And he's thoughtful enough to to make all these plans and preparations. It, it and He talks about the, the, the him talking to himself in this fight. It, it, feels, it feels too cute somehow or too planned out. It's, it doesn't... doesn't Am I the only one having this reaction? So, I mean, as someone were, were, mm -hmm. were made full in the face, it can be pretty debilitating for quite a long time. But I've been in buildings, large buildings, huge square footage, where someone did a pepper spray demonstration out in the parking lot and it got pulled into the building's ventilation system. 
and a little bit of the spray got spread through this whole building. You couldn't stay in the building. Your eyes were burning. Your throat was burning. But, I mean, we were shooting a pistol match. We were all able to handle our equipment, bag up our stuff, walk out of the building. It wasn't a panic. You were not out of control. You were still making rational decisions. But the level of irritation was such that you knew you'd been exposed to OC. There was no question about it. Yeah, okay. Well, I, I think I've hit the 2 a.m. wall here. Uh, better better call it a night for myself. And, uh, All right, Jeff. Thanks well, for stopping uh, by. I really appreciate it, buddy. Hopefully we'll see you tomorrow, too, for more excitement. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> Good night. Take care. Well, why were you concerned about that? I was just concerned. I wanted somebody to be a witness, and I wanted to have somebody with me uh, when I went back to the property. I was definitely in shock. I was kind of scared and in shock. My hands were still shaking. Um, I was definitely nervous. I was now kind of concerned about the police showing up with guns. I figured it'd be a good idea to have somebody out there with me. And so what did you do next? Um, we, we talked and he said he had cell phone service and, um, he, he asked me what my phone number was and what my name was. I gave it to him and then he walked behind the back of my truck and was talking to 911. Yeah. Keep in mind, folks, this was two and a half years ago. He's been sitting in jail that entire time, two and a half years with nothing to do, nothing to do, but think about this. I thought he was giving him my license plate number, but I'm not sure if he did or not. And then right about the time he was on a conversation on the phone, I had three bars pop up on my phone. So I called 911 as well. I wanted to tell them as much as I could. I knew they'd have a hard time finding the place. So I wanted to tell them where it was. I got 911. I called and I let them know what my name was, what my phone number was, and that what had occurred and tried to give them directions to where I was at. Two and a half years, folks. After you well. spoke with 911, did you call anybody else? I called my dad. Why did you call your dad? Because I was just nervous and scared. Um, I knew when the police were going to show up, there was going to be guns out, and I didn't want to get shot. Um, I was just, I just felt like I needed to have some people there with me because I was so scared and in shock. So, what did you do next to try to ensure your safety? I took, I took David down to the ranch with me. Um, he followed me on his motorcycle. We took him down to the ranch. I wanted him to be witness of everything and to be there with me. Um, he uh, walked into the building, he took a look at what was going on and he exited the building. And instead of staying there with me, he jumped on his motorcycle and took off, which was kind of nerve wracking. I was hoping he would stay there with me. Um, so I, I climbed back in my truck and I sat in my truck for a good, for a long time. Um, I waited around for the police. It seemed like it took about two and a half hours before they arrived. It was daylight when, uh, when the incident occurred, it was daylight when I met with David and when he went into the trailer to look at the scene, the scene, and um, by the time uh, it must have been around six thirty, six fifty, maybe, um, I decided I better drive back up to the to the property. It seemed like two hours or, or more had gone by, so I ended up driving back up to the Kemazon Peak Trail, so I could uh, call nine one one again or see what was going on. And I jumped in my truck. I drove out of the property. I got maybe 100 yards out of the property, and I saw three cop cars parked at the top of this road. It was an entrance road to the property. They were about a quarter of a mile away from the property. They had parked there, and they weren't sure what to do, I think. So but, when you started to leave the ranch, did you know they were down there? I didn't. I thought, they, I thought they'd be up at Camazon, or they just hadn't arrived yet. Are there any other roads that, leave, that go away from that ranch, or is that the No, only it's road? a one-way so when you see the officers, what do you do? When I see the officers, I put my truck in park. I roll down my window to see if they're yelling anything or telling me what to do. Um, and sure enough, they were. And I turned the engine off because my truck's a diesel. So it's hard to hear anybody. So one of the challenges here, folks, if you're wondering why he's on the stand, is if you're going to argue self-defense is a legal defense at trial, there has to be evidence of self-defense. You, you have to meet what's called your burden of production, producing a certain amount of evidence. Not a lot. One percent is enough to on each of those five elements of self-defense, whichever ones apply, to be allowed to argue self-defense in the first place. You're not allowed to just like the judge is a gatekeeper on the evidence that the jury is allowed to hear. The judge is the gatekeeper on the legal arguments the jury is allowed to hear. And until you've met your burden of production, producing some minimal amount of evidence of self-defense in the first place, 
Uh, you don't have a legal defense of self-defense. So sure, the, the defense in opening talked about how this was a self-defense case, but opening is not evidence. You have to get evidence into the trial of self-defense. It doesn't necessarily have to come from the defendant. If there were witnesses, for example, witness testimony might be enough to raise uh, the meet the burden of production on self-defense. But here there's no witnesses. There's the dead guy and him. And the evidence of self-defense has to come from someplace. If, if by the end of the trial, there's still no evidence in the record of self-defense, the jury will not get a self-defense instruction. So they have to get that evidence in somehow. And it looks like the only way to do it is through this guy's testimony. And if you're going to yeah. have him, the moment he's on that witness stand, he's subject to cross and impeachment. So you may as well have him tell the whole story. Yeah, fair enough. And as soon as I put my head out the window, I heard them say, get out of the truck, put your hands up and approach us, um, walk toward us with your hands up. So the defendant does, once the issue of self-defense is properly raised, the burden's on the state to disprove self-defense beyond a reasonable doubt. But that burden shift does not happen until first the burden of production is met by the defense. So two burdens Absolutely. make up the burden of proof. Burden of production, you get self-defense as a legal defense into court in the first place. Once you've done that, the burden shifts entirely to the state to disprove it beyond a reasonable doubt. But they don't have any obligation to disprove self-defense if you have not met your burden of production. 100% correct. And so did you follow their orders? I did. I just walked up there with my hands above my head. I had about, I don't know, I was a good 100 yards away from them. So I walked up the road. I knew they were pointing guns at me, so I was definitely nerve-wracking. So I just made sure I kept my hands up no matter what. Smart. And did you try to follow all of their orders? I did follow their orders, yeah. I could hear them, and I was definitely concerned about them having guns, so I followed their directions perfectly. How were you feeling when you were walking towards the police? I was scared. Um, I was still in shock from the incident. My hands were still shaking. Um, I was nerve-wracked. I was, I was devastated. I couldn't believe what had just happened and that I was involved with it. Do you recall ever being asked by any of the officers what your name was? I don't. I don't think they ever asked my name. I had given my name already to 911, so I figured they had it. Um, I just... so Steve, Steve Gosney is asking me softball questions in the chat. Steve says, uh, but can't the burden of production be met by the state's evidence? Evidence that the state produced. Yeah, and that's commonly how it happens. There's witnesses. Uh, there's uh, other evidence consistent with self-defense. You don't necessarily have to literally produce the evidence yourself to meet your burden of production. The evidence has to be somewhere in the record. And often it's in the record from sources other than the defendant. The trouble is here we have a case where the, there's only these two people in the room and one of them's dead and the other one survived. And if the burden of production is not met by other evidence, then you have to produce it yourself. That's the only remaining source. And unfortunately, you, you often don't know whether you've met your burden of production until you've rested and you're arguing over the final jury instructions. And then the state says, your honor, they didn't meet their burden of production. There should be no self-defense jury instruction. And you don't yeah. want your, your how much evidence of self-defense was produced to be perceived by the judge as inadequate. Merely saying self-defense in the 911 call I, as a defense attorney, I think that should be enough, but it's not a lot. Let's face it, completely self-serving statement. Having the, the defendant himself on the witness stand exposing himself to cross an impeachment, I mean, there's no question that's sufficient to meet the burden of production. I heard the testimony of that officer. He claims he asked me my name, but the whole time I sat in the back of the truck, he sat over there in front of his vehicle he never really came over to converse with me. I don't remember him ever asking my name. So what you're talking about now when you were sitting in the back of a truck, are you talking about your truck or a police a, officer? A police car. They had uh, Dodge Ram trucks uh, with with uh, sirens and markings. No, no computers, though. <laughs> Did you ever give any of the officers the wrong date of birth? I don't think so. I know my date of birth. That's not possible. Did you ever attempt to conceal your identity from the police? I didn't. I'm not sure where that came from. Did um, you ever attempt to hide or destroy evidence? No, not at all. I told them exactly where my shirt was and where my coats were. I let them know exactly why I put them there and where they were. 
So it's the why is the defense talking about this now? You might be asking, given that the tampering with evidence and the uh, concealment of identity charges were dismissed on directed verdict by the judge once the state rested, because the jury doesn't know they're dismissed. The jury wasn't in the room when that decision was made. And the jury heard about these charges at the beginning in the state's opening statement. Uh, and if you if if you believe those things, it would undermine the credibility of this guy's self-defense narrative. So the defense still wants to they're just asking this now to profoundly undercut uh, even the mention. The jury will not get instructions on those charges, but they may still be thinking about them as things that the state talked about during their opening. Mm -hmm. Motive is not an element of a crime, but it helps flesh out the narrative. At least it's not an element in these crimes. Yeah, maybe they're done. Once they're done, I've, I've got a poll. I don't really know how polls work in YouTube, folks. I think I have it set up correctly. We'll, we'll see. I've got something typed out. I don't know where it pops up from your perspective as a viewer. Now, Mr. Cummings, I want to back up just briefly to the rifle that was found wedged between the mattress and the box springs. Okay. Was that your rifle? Not at all. I didn't know that was there either. And the evening where you fell asleep and woke up to the smell of propane, how were you feeling when you woke up? I felt a little bit dizzy. Um, it was kind of nauseous. I guess I was kind of nauseous in my stomach and a little bit dizzy. Um, it smelled really bad. And the spray that emitted in the bedroom, well, actually, you know what? Do you know when the spray from that canister came out? I, do, I don't. I didn't know he had a canister until I went back in there to get soap. That's when I saw the canister, and then I got a little more concerned because I didn't know what kind of toxic a material could have been in the can. I, I was definitely thinking it was worse than mace because of my lungs, but um, I don't know. I was in shock. I was jumping to conclusions a little bit. Well, you testified that he was swinging with his right hand yeah. and something was in his hand. Did you know what it was in his hand? I didn't. I thought it, I didn't know what it was, if it was a knife or what it was. Uh, back of a pistol or something. I never really saw it. He was swinging it so fast and I was trying to get away the whole time. Okay. And so the spray hurt your skin and your lungs. Did it affect your eyes at all? It didn't. Um, when I stepped out of the trailer, I noticed a plane flying over the ranch and I could see it perfectly. So I was happy to know that my eyes weren't affected. By the way, the, the whole attack, as he describes, it would be sufficient to justify deadly force self-defense independent of any mace Mr. exposure. Cummings, why did you shoot and kill Guillermo Ariola? I was fighting for my life. He was uh, out of his mind at the time. He was he had a, he had it in for me. You could tell when somebody tells you they're going to kill you and they have they're pounding at you for over three different times where you fall down. Um, even pushing past a, when I've had the gun up in my hands, held, holding it properly, he still advanced on me and tackled me. Um, I knew he was serious. I was fearing for my life the whole time. Thank you. Pass the witness. Okay. It's okay. So I've put a poll up. I don't know how it looks to you viewers, though. I don't know if it pops up on the screen someplace or if you have to click someplace else on my YouTube channel. Good morning, Mr. It pops up in the live Good chat morning, box. Oh, does it? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I don't know. Maybe I did it wrong. Thank you. I don't see the poll yet. Uh huh. I might, I might have to walk through Bronca through how to set up a poll. Oh, I see. I see. Okay. I've done a lot of big first descents. And it's my life. It's definitely. Okay. I'm going to pause it here while I set up the poll. Are, are they done with direct? This is. They passed. Yeah, they this just finished. They just, right. Okay. They just finished. After direct. Um, now, keep in mind the choices are going to be guilty, which I doesn't mean you have a gut feel it's guilty. You believe the state has disproven at this point in the trial disproven self defense beyond a reasonable doubt. 
A guilty state has disproven self-defense at this stage beyond a reasonable doubt, which they damn well better have because they've already rested or not guilty self-defense, not disproven beyond a reasonable doubt. That's the legal standard, not not whether or not you think it more likely than not. Let's see. Now, what do I click? Oh, for God's sakes. No, that's not what I wanted to do. He posted why, why the poll on the community page. Did I put too many letters in? Too many letters in. Are you in your own live chat so that I you am. can create the poll? That's where at I'm the bottom. Doing. Okay. It's saying add option. Yeah, add option. Oh, There's usually I two. Like There's a QA and a thing and a poll thing. Undecided. Well, you you have to have at least two options. Yeah, I I, I clicked add option by accident, and uh, now I can't make it go away. So I have to add a third choice. So I added undecided. Now okay, we work. Should... Oh, there you go. Yay! All right, all right, everybody. Uh, hey, listen. While people are filling out the poll, uh, Kurt, could I ask you to chat a little bit? I'm going to hit the head. I'll be right back. Sure, no problem. Yeah. All right. So I'll just share, yeah, it's fine. So I'll share I'll share a little bit more of my thoughts. Like, you know, I want to give all the commentary and critique, right? Just because I'm saying particular things about I find this particular element weak or this particular element undeveloped or this particular element thing doesn't mean that I think guilt. You know, I'm just trying to provide critique and commentary, like, you know, one does. And so like for me, it's like, okay, I I'm looking for I'm looking for things to comment about, as one does. So I'm like, okay. For me, I felt like this this antagonism stage was a little underdeveloped, right? And it's like, okay, we spent a fair amount of time on how the parties know each other, this land deal, right? We're setting things up, we're setting things up. So we got this nice setup thing about the parties between each other. Then we got the, okay, things go wrong stage. And then we got the fight stage. Okay, so first criticism I had was the things go wrong stage was underdeveloped. We went through it too fast compared to, for example, the setup. We spent a lot of time comparatively in the setup of how the parties know each other and the land deal and you know, touring the land and being there and spending time together and going on journeys and frolicking in the woods and all the rest of it, right? And then comparatively a little bit about a time in the how things went wrong stage. It's like, okay, this is, this is because the jury is asking themselves the question, why does this guy deserve to be dead, right? Someone's dead. Why does this guy deserve to be dead? What happened that deserves to be dead, right? Now, of course, there's something. I'm not saying there was nothing, but it was underdeveloped. I wish we had, we had, we had you know, brought it out more. It was gone to more details or asked the question more different ways, you know, to really resonate in the jury's mind about, you know, the things that were said and things that were done and actions that were taken and stretch it out, stretch it out, you know, a little bit. So that was criticism number one. Criticism number two I had of the uh, of the self defense of his testimony was when we actually got to the sort of the after fight. A lot of what he's saying sounds like because he's talking about things in the time. He's talking about things contemporaneously. That's how the testimony is coming across, and it sounds to my mind like things are more planned than I would expect. Um, you know, it's true he is an Olympic, he was an Olymp a U.S. ski athlete. It's true he's been in the woods. It's true that he's a hunter. It's true that he has experience with firearms, right? It's true that he has a lot of experiences that could show grit and determination, but one experience I don't think he has, because he certainly never talked about it, is being in a fight to your death, which I imagine would, you know, raise a whole new scope of things. You know, he's never been in a life or death situation of struggle for his life. So the problem is he's talking about a lot of things that, to my mind, suggest a consciousness planning uh, awareness that seems a little bit incompatible, to my mind, of the expectation of what I would think would happen in a life or death struggle, right? So he's talking, for example, about making a conscious decision to clear the firearm so the police can see it. Is it normal for a hunter to clear a firearm? Sure. Is it normal for a person in a self-defense situation where they're in a fight for their death to think consciously, oh, I better clear this firearm so the police can see that it did to make that like conscious decision? 
I suppose, and he's not saying like I did it out of road, right? That wasn't the testimony. It wasn't, oh, I cleared the firearm because, you know, every time I use a firearm, I always clear it. It was out of complete habit, muscle memory. I didn't even know I was doing it. That wasn't the testimony. The testimony was I made a conscious decision to do it for the purpose of showing the police so that they would see it when they came here and saw the thing, right? It shows a consciousness, an intent, right? That seems a little incompatible with self-defense ideas okay and then he's talking about for example um you know i'm making these conscious decisions to 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 do this thing or do that thing and and i'm making this conscious decision to 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 suss this guy out in terms of whether or not he's with him and i'm sussing him out for like an hour it's like okay that's showing like a lot of presence of mind right it's showing a lot of presence of mind he's he's saying to himself According to his own testimony, he's saying to himself during his own testimony when he's in this fight death struggle for his life, okay, I was thinking to myself, you know, if you don't do something now, you know, you're a father, but you won't be much longer. I'm like, really? Really? You had thoughts that complex? I mean, I understand like you had a flash of an image before, a flash of your child before your eyes or something, but he, it's like too cute. It's too cute. It's too, it suggests more awareness, more consciousness, more intent, more planning, more design than I would expect in a self-defense scenario. Okay. So the all only reason that would, being all that being be said skeptical. does not mean that I think he's guilty, because I think the state's case sucks, and I'm well aware of the burden of proof. I'm just pointing out yeah. weaknesses, folks. Yeah, yeah, I totally get it. I will just say, so I've I've never been in the military i've never been in combat i've never been a cop but i worked on an ambulance crew and we were often at terribly tragic events uh where you know limbs are, come off people in car accidents things of the, along that line and some people respond well people respond differently to stressful situations for some people it just they fall apart they see an arm come off somebody they completely lose it other people it right. just they just do their job uh, it, they just go about it and they don't get emotionally affected in the same way. And this guy was, how would you call it? An extreme skier, helicopter, mountain skier. I mean, you yep. couldn't pay me enough money to, to go off one of these mountain trails. I would, I would, I would feel like I was skydiving and I've been skydiving and I know how I felt then. I thought like I, I was going to die. Uh, so this is a guy who puts, who's routinely probably thousands of times put himself in that situation where most of us would be terrified out of our minds. Our, our brain would be reduced to lizard like functioning. And that was just his day job. Uh, so, yeah. you know, I, and I, I presume it's weird. That for in, in fact, that the, I see the state now is opening up with, Oh, you were an extreme skier. Uh, I guess we'll see where they go with this, but let me take a look at the poll. Um, 4% are saying guilty. I guess I can just end it. Right. End it. Does it go away forever? Oh shit! You can you can say end the poll. There's a button for that. But then it goes away forever. Now I can't see the results. All right. Well, it was four percent saying guilty. So self defense disproven beyond a reasonable doubt. It was like eighty four percent. Seventy nine percent not guilty. One percent or seventy nine percent not guilty. Sixteen percent undecided. Three percent right. guilty. And with I would one thousand votes. I would suggest, folks, that what was what was the undecided? Uh, 16%. Okay. Yeah. If you're undecided after the state has rested, that's not guilty. Right. So, so that means, uh, you know, 96% not guilty is where we're at. Of course, something could yeah. collapse here on, on cross-examination of the defense. So he starts saying stupid shit on the stand. Uh, that's always a possibility, which is why generally you don't want to put your criminal defendant client on the witness stand, but we'll see what happens now. Another woman who doesn't have a hairbrush, by the way. Yeah. It's scary. There's no, there's no future in not having fear when you're in the mountains. Okay, she's three questions in and she's already stopping herself because she realizes she was about to ask a bad question. Did she prep for this? Oh my God, can you yeah. imagine how you knew the defendant was going to take the witness stand? And she's away from her microphone. I'll see if I can bump up the volume, folks. Sorry, it's not up to me. She's doing that. Would you would you say that people who do that um, are like kind of like adrenaline junkies? Is that the people who do that? No, it's uh, called mountaineering. What's it's that? it's called mountaineering. Mountaineering is uh, the way you come climb a mountain and the way oh, you descend. Mountaineering. 
mountaineering. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's there's hundreds of people that do what I do. They're sponsored by companies and they go all over the world skiing big mountains and make a living at it. But so do you actually so tell us can you rent a helicopter and does the helicopter like take you to the top of the, the peak? Exactly. And then you jump out? No, the helicopter the helicopter lands and then you step out. And then you ski down the mountain and then you get picked up again by the helicopter and flies you up for another run. So it's a multi multiple run day of heli. Sounds skiing. like she's on a date with this guy. They do it in Canada. They do it in Europe. They do it in Alaska. Alaska is the premier spot for helicopter skiing because we have such amazing big mountains at low elevation. So you're you're not breathing really hard because you're at low elevation, but the vertical gain is impressive. It would be like skiing off a of Sandia Peak and, and coming all the way down to Tramway Boulevard, right. okay. and that's that's one heli ski run. Wow. Okay. But the ability level. Um, I have advanced intermediates, advanced and expert skiers. There's runs like this that are just perfectly like 20 degrees for four miles. You don't have to be an extreme skier to ski that. You could come up to Alaska and go skiing and have a good time. But it is it is dangerous, though. Yeah, the sport of skiing is dangerous, yeah. You can hit a tree or you can slide down a slope, yes. Um, yeah, because I, I was just looking at some of your videos and just marveling at I mean, to me, it looked like it was straight down. I'm sure it wasn't too big and straight, but it was pretty steep. Yeah. Your Honor, I didn't have a chance to interview him. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Approach the bench. Approach the bench. Did we approach? What's happening now? Okay. This is this is bullshit. This is like binger level bullshit. Uh, where the hell is my cursor? Darn it! Here it is. So. <laughs> The, uh, the defense objected that all this talk about the skiing and the films, the guy's been in skiing, this is outside the scope of direct. And the uh, the state's response was, well, it's not like we had a chance to interview this guy. Well, of course, he has a Fifth Amendment right not to talk to you. <laughs> of course, you didn't have a chance to interview him. He's got a right to silence. And that's why, of course, naturally, the defense just lost their shit. Uh, and now they're right at the bench. That's great. Just great. Yeah, you're not allowed. You're not allowed to say that the defendant was unwilling to speak to you. <laughs> you have a Fifth Amendment right. It cannot be raised in front of the jury at trial. It, it's no big deal. It's like only one of the most basic principles of law known to man, uh, and you know, basic prosecution 101. But you know, it's that's fine. Com that Binger... Comment on the defendant's silence. That's great. This is the same thing that Binger did in the Rittenhouse yeah. trial, where the judge called them out and started screaming at him. Fundamental, it, this is not a gray area. Steve Gosney is in the chat. Objection. Yeah, no kidding. Bad, bad, bad. We're going to take a, we're gonna take a 15 minute recess. <laughs> I'm going to. John Madden style. You see, the thing is that right. you have a right to remain silent. You think the defense was asking for a mistrial right there? <laughs> Probably. I would. It's, uh, I don't know. It's, uh, I guess you would, right? You can hardly keep yourself from doing it. On the other hand, it's going pretty well for the defense. So that's true. They, they get to an acquittal, the guy's free forever. Fair point. So, all right. So, we're going to take a little break. I'll just mute the, uh, mute the sound there. That's the sign of a prosecution that just does not have its shit together, folks. They know they're not allowed to do that. They know there's going to be an objection. They're just trying to plant this seed in the juror's mind. That this guy, well, why wouldn't he talk to the state if he's innocent? And that's exactly what the Fifth Amendment is supposed to protect you from. Uh, really, really contemptible. And uh, it would be nice if we had another, uh, uh, what was the judge in uh, Rittenhouse? Schroeder? Was that yeah. his name? Uh, if we had another Judge Schroeder screaming, I don't believe you! <laughs> that was great. Although he didn't do anything about it. Nothing ever happens to these prosecutors that overreach this way. There's never any sanctions, ever, ever. It's depressing. No one's true. ever held accountable. To my knowledge, Binger is still in his job. Uh, I Last I heard a few weeks ago, oh, they're back already. Okay, I, I, I interrupted the state's questioning that Ms. Romos asked the state that she did not have the time or the right to interview the defendant. Well, the court finds the state does not have the right to interview the defendant. Of course not, Your Honor. He has the right to remain 
silence, yet it's prosecutorial misconduct to go and bring up a fundamental constitutional right like that in front of a jury. At this point in time, I'm moving for a mistrial due to prosecutorial misconduct for commenting on his right to remain silent. Hold on, hold on. The, the other right he has, he has counsel. Not only does he have the right to remain silent, he also has the right to counsel. He has counsel. So there's no right to interview the defendant. Ms. Romo. Y yeah. Your Honor, that was not clearly. I, it was in response to Ms. Moss objecting. And my point was that as before she interrupted, I was about to say, and I was in the middle of saying, I would ask for leeway because we didn't have an opportunity to do a pretrial interview with him. Well, you don't have that right, Ms. Romo. Well, I know, but that's why I was asking for that leeway. That's all, that's all I was asking. Why would that be cause for leeway? Okay, so you could, I, I understand I, that, Judge, and I respect your ruling. But for them to jump up and down and her to start laughing in front of the jury and yelling prosecutorial misconduct, that's not what I was doing. Hold on, hold on. Hold on. This court knows it's kind I kind of a big do. deal. Hold on, Ms. Romo. She didn't do that in front of the jury. She did it after I sent out the well, jury. she was laughing. Anyway, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deny the motion. She was laughing. Take a break, and, uh, and and we will come back in about 10 minutes. Ms. Kelly, you may step down to the table with, with your clients, with your lawyer. All right. So what, do we make it four questions into it, and we're already breaking the rules? That's going great over here on state yeah, yeah, land. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. You'd think the state would have their plan of attack completely nailed down here. They should have every question carefully sculpted for specific purposes to advance a narrative, tear this guy down. And instead, she's there just now. Fair enough. You might ask a few fluff questions to get the guy relaxed, get him talking. Hopefully he'll relax enough that he'll say something stupid. But you you don't end the fluff questions by going off the rails. Yeah. Bad, bad, bad. Yeah, and you know, I mean, up to this point, I can't remember now if this woman's, if this prosecutor's even asked a question before. Maybe she has. Mostly it's been the other prosecutor. They Every time the state is, speaks, their case gets worse. Gets worse. It's and amazing. Most of the time I would have said it's because of the witnesses. It's because they have so little to work with. Their questioning has struck me as, I mean, technically competent. It's not like Elaine Bredehoff, who can't ask a question without being leading. Uh, they they struck me as technically competent, but just that they had so little to work with, there was really nothing they could accomplish. But this, this is absolutely terrible. Uh, you know, I may be able to actually skip some of this break because I did have a couple pauses. So let me see if I can do that. I can. All right. Thanks, chat, for the suggestion. Okay. Anything before we get we continue? Your Honor, in light of the defense counsel's comments, I would oh, ask what is for this? A, um, a limiting instruction, or not a limiting instruction, but instruction to the judge to remind to the judge, to the judge, to the jury, to remind that the jury has that the state has the burden of proof and the defense has no obligation. Blah blah blah. I'd give that instruction every day of the week. Comment I made that is. Uh, offensive to no Ms. not Romo. however however <laughs> well, i am well, 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 ridiculous inappropriate unconstitutional question i'm doing my job I i'm following the law i understand that your uh, honor and that's why i'm trying to protect her client's rights to ask the judge to remind the jury that the state has the always has the burden of proof and the defendant has no obligation and the comment it wasn't a comment i was referring that to that's how bad the state knows they screwed up now they're afraid that heaven forbid they get a conviction it'll be reversed because of this so they're she's calling it a limiting instruction it's not limiting <laughs> it's a corrective instruction to correct their own uh faux pas to your motion for a mistrial that's all i, was I, I appreciate that though get some accountability okay. all right judge First, we, By the we, way, I should say, I don't know anything about this judge, and he hasn't said much. There haven't been a lot of rulings. But I've also noticed that the, the lawyers, until this moment, uh, with this pr prosecutor right here, uh, that the, the lawyers haven't been engaging in conduct that I would characterize as testing the limits of the judge. 
that may be because they they know the judge. I mean, they work in the area. They may know he wouldn't respond well to that, the, that he's a judge who's in control of his courtroom and you don't push the boundaries. Because when, when lawyers, especially in a criminal prosecution and defense, believe the judge is weak, they will shit test that judge all trial to get away with what they think they can get away with. So the fact that it's not happening here, I mean, I'm speculating, it could mean that these are not hyper aggressive lawyers, although Kerry Morrison on the defense is definitely a pit bull. Uh, or it could mean they, they would be aggressive, except they know the judge wouldn't allow it and they don't want to get a bad response. But we've seen plenty of trials where the judges are tested over and over and over again by legal counsel on both sides. With regard to the issue of Ms. Moss saying that there's prosecutorial misconduct, that was done outside the presence of the jury. The jury has already left. If, secondly, if, if I give a curative instruction, it's also going to include the, 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 the following that the, the, the defendant has a right to remain silent and the state has no right to interview a defendant for two reasons. One, he has a right to remain silent. Secondly, because he has counsel. If I give an instruction. Yeah, so far I like to so just leave it. I would just leave it at this point. We'll just leave it. Okay. All right. Bring in the jury, Loretta. Loretta, very reasonable. Yeah, nobody seems to be brushing their hair yet. I mean, with the uh, with the two defense attorneys, they're from Albuquerque, which is some distance away from uh, where this trial is taking place. They may have, you know, checked into their hotel and realized they forgot their hairbrushes. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe they have an excuse. Uh, but the prosecutors are local, so no excuse for them. I just cannot believe how badly the state is screwing this up. Two and a half years of prep, and this is what they've got. It's unbelievable. I mean, they never had much, from what I no. can tell. And then, then what they had degraded. I mean, their lead investigator went into a nine-day coma. You know, no, no positive evidence came out of forensics because they did the grand jury before they even had all the test results back. And, what, and the stuff that came later was not helpful. Oh, by the way, Kurt, I don't know if you caught this, but... Earlier in the trial, during the state's case in chief, the defense actually revealed that they had in evidence two magazines for an AR-style rifle, <laughs> and only one of them was at the scene, and nobody knows where the second one came from. Very, That's very good great. evidence management. That's great. Yeah. Just random magazines just yeah. showing up. That's <laughs> <sighs> Let me see this. You know, not not for nothing, but there is no yeah. statute of limitations on murder. So you didn't Mr. want to Cummings, like sit on it and break, wait for something uh, better to let's, happen. Let's just move on a little. You know, I think we've heard all uh, enough Lord. about your career. Does that require quite a bit of athleticism? It does. It uh, it requires a lot of technique um, and athleticism. Would you consider yourself a an athlete, a pretty good athlete? I'm a world-class skier. I've made my living as one of the top skiers in the world. You mentioned several times in your direct about your three beautiful children. So that means he's impervious to attack. <laughs> When's the last time you saw your children? Objection. Your Honor, she... They're trying to elicit character evidence. I presume he hasn't seen his children, well, in two and a half years. <laughs> he's been in jail. Maybe they didn't come visit him. I mean, you know, he's looking to live in a trailer in New Mexico by himself. He's probably not married, probably divorced from whoever the children's mother is. And that's all character evidence. It's got nothing to do with the facts or legal issues in this case. It's true. You didn't give your daughter a train for Christmas when she right. was eight. That's what they're trying to do. I mean, listen, he's on the witness stand. So he, 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 he's subject to his character being tested in terms of things like veracity, truthfulness, any witness is. But that's not what this is about. He can love his children and not have seen them in a long time. If there were some falling out in the family.
when you were skiing, you were planning your murders, weren't you? <laughs> Yeah, and one of the reasons for the delay in his trial was apparently there was a question of competency to stand trial. So that was part of the delay. People are asking about right to a speedy trial. In most cases, folks, the defense doesn't want a speedy trial and they waive it. That's what typically happens. Uh, but in this case, there's also another explanation that they, they were having hearings on his mental competency. So as I said, there's been media reports about him you know, being paranoid, uh, being in, into conspiracy theories that people were against him. He may have some mental instability. None of that is being introduced in evidence for good reason. And it looks like the prosecution's trying to sneak it in. See, they lost. Oh, my gosh. So obviously they lost that. The state lost that objection. And uh, now they now she's so off the rails, she doesn't know what question to ask. Well, the best you have is maybe you weren't a great father. It's not going great for the state. <laughs> Oh my God, this is. When was the last time you took your children hunting? <laughs> Were yeah. you training them to be killers? Ooh, that'd be good. That you allegedly had with Mr. Guillermo Ariola about how he struck someone's car. I like the way they always pronounce the victim's name with with the Spanish accent. It, it, it makes me think that there must be a, a political dynamic here because the, the victim was local. He was a Spanish ethnicity. This guy, of course, is a white dude from out of town who's thinking about moving into the area. Uh, I wonder if they're part of part of the uh, reason for bringing this very weak prosecution uh, is a political dynamic here. Car with a hammer. Probably yeah. not feeling that New Mexico spirit anymore, though. I'd have to guess. I didn't find it funny. But you were laughing with him. No, I was not. Was he laughing? He wasn't laughing. He was serious about what he was talking about. He um, okay. showed us. He showed Thank us you. That. No, you've answered the question. Thank you. You can, you can do on redirect. You know, if Ms. That was good. I mean, of course, uh, the defense wants that, right? They want their client to be able to give longer answers. The, the judge is right. I mean, the, the state can basically answer yes or no questions and just keep you right there. But just by raising the objection, a speaking objection on this in front of the jury, it makes the prosecution look bad, but like they're trying to hide something. Ella had a diesel truck. Um, I'm not sure if it was gas or diesel. But he didn't, he didn't surprise you when he came out. I mean, yeah, yeah, I didn't expect him to show up. Um, he hadn't showed up for a lot of weekends that I had stayed out there. Okay, but he didn't come in to startle you, did he? Yeah, I was surprised. I didn't expect him to show up. Okay, but he didn't startle you, did he? Um, yes or no, did he startle He you? did startle me. I knew I had stuff in the house that um, I needed to get out of there, so I was startled because I didn't want to have my rifle in the house when he showed up. I didn't mean to do that. Mm -hmm. that was a dumb question just just a reminder folks the state's burden here is to disprove self-defense beyond a reasonable doubt that's what we're looking for here and this this uh, unbelievable opportunity to cross-examine a criminal defendant and this incident about that you supposedly had with him when you first met mr ariola that he was drunk and falling off his horse i never said falling off his horse almost falling i didn't say that either well okay well that's what i heard he was uh, running alongside his horse his horse was taking him for a little bit of a ride um, he just couldn't get back up on the horse because he was intoxicated okay 
How could and that obviously didn't stop you from hanging out with him or trying to buy land from him, correct? I still wanted correct. the land. Yes I still no. wanted the land. Sir, could you please listen to my question? I did. And answer yes or no, unless I ask for an explanation, all right? Do you understand? I understand. This is such a bad luck. But you do admit that you and uh, Mr. Audio got along great, right? We did. We got along just you fine. drank together, yes? Yes. I have a question. And I would ask the court to instruct the witness to answer my question appropriately and not be non-responsive, as hold I just on, instructed on, him. On, what the hell are you talking about? Okay. And Mr. Cummings, to be fair, you will have an opportunity if you need to explain something when your attorney redirects you, okay? Okay. All right. But you got along great with him in the beginning. Isn't that true? I yes. had a yes. Yes, no? we got along just fine. Okay, thank you. You drank beer together, yes? No. You drank whiskey together, we yes? Drank, we drank whiskey together. You ate steaks with him at his house, yes? Um, not, not with him. Ah. Uh. You never really stayed in that trailer, did you? I stayed in the trailer every time I went there. Yes, I did. Do you recall when you voluntarily talked to a reporter? So staying in the trailer could potentially be important legally because if he's staying in the trailer, it's his dwelling for use of force purposes. He definitely sure. wouldn't have a legal duty to retreat uh, from an attacker in his dwelling, but you need to stay there. It doesn't have to be, you know, a, if it was a tent, that would be enough as long as you're staying in the tent. David Williams, do you remember talking to Mr. Williams? I do. Do you remember telling Mr. Williams? Yes, that would be Castle Doctrine, is what I'm talking about. Do you remember telling Mr. Williams that you never stayed there? I never told him that. You didn't. Okay. Your Honor, I would like to play a portion of an interview. It's been redacted to play only that portion. I'm going to object. I don't think that that was the testimony. He already said that he stayed there a couple nights. He just, we've listened, we've listened to that audio recording, and he did say that he stayed there. So it's not proper impeachment. It's not, because what she's trying to impeach him, what he didn't say, is not yeah, folks, I know New Mexico's not has no duty to retreat. It's a stand your ground state. But imagine if they characterize it as the victim's dwelling and not his. And he's not in a place he has a lawful right to be. And stand your ground wouldn't apply. And do you remember telling that same reporter that you just testified that you saw when you stayed there one night, you smelled They lost propane. that direction. I did smell propane, yes. Didn't you also tell the reporter that you, you it was all neuro? Um, I was dizzy from it a little bit, I think. But you told the reporter that it was all neuro, correct? I'm not sure. Do you want to hear the jail call? Um, I don't think I need to. Hold on, Hold on. counsel. Approach the bench. The jail call? Okay. The judge is calling him to the bench? Maybe the defense stood up. Hey, guys, we're... hit that like button, folks. 700 of you are not clicking. You're watching and not clicking. Hit that like button. I mean, I don't know why you wouldn't click it if you're enjoying the content. And presumably that's why you're here, because you're enjoying the content. As you should, because Andrew kicks ass. 
this is terrible. I mean, they can't get through three questions without having a, a sidebar. Yeah, their questions aren't particularly good. You ate steaks together once. You had a beer together? What? Again, what we're looking for, folks, is testimony that would disprove self-defense beyond a reasonable doubt. This, this is nothing. And this is really the last chance for the state. I mean, they've rested at that point, overwhelmingly not having disproven self-defense beyond a reasonable doubt. Their last chance is having this guy in the witness stand to have some kind of catastrophic failure on the part of the defense. And I don't see that happening. Not right now, no. No. Right. So which of the elements of self-defense are they attacking with this line of questioning? Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I, I need for you to totally disregard the last question from the process. If they the ate steak, it not. means he felt hate. Any type of deliberation. Shroma, you may continue. No, no jailhouse call getting played, I guess. You, do you remember having the conversation with the reporter? Yeah, I remember having a conversation with a reporter. And do you remember? <laughs> See, I mean, a lot of this is simply outs outside the scope of direct, by the way. Uh, and it's not going to, I mean, there's things you can ask outside the scope in this kind of situation. If it's going to things like reputation, character for veracity or truthfulness, because he is a witness on the witness stand, but you can't just cover anything you want. So she got half a question out before they had another sidebar there. Were, were you aware or were you made aware at some point that that conversation was being recorded? I wasn't aware of it. Were you made aware of that? What conversation? Testimony here today? That my conversation was recorded? Well, just disregard that last question. <laughs> I don't even know what they're talking about. What conversation? You do recall the conversation, correct? Yeah, it's okay. been a while. It's been two and a half years, but yeah, mm -hmm. I do recall it. Do you remember telling the reporter that you couldn't even recall the night? No, I don't remember that. And in the, the call to the reporter, it sounds like you're saying that Mr. Adiola arrived and this altercation began right away. I'm not aware of that. I don't think I would have said that. Uh, if I played a portion of that conversation, it might help refresh your memory. No, I don't know. Your Honor, the proper way to refresh his memory is to play this outside of the presence of the jury. Of course. And then let the state of the press of the court get a transfer tape and try to transfer. We can't just broadcast it. I realize that, Your Honor. No, I'm doing it the same way they've been doing it to save time. What a load of garbage. Everybody knows. Everybody knows you need a transcript for this purpose. They've had two and a half years to prepare for this trial. Do they not have a transcript? They don't have a transcript. You can't be to, serious. To time to save time. You can't be serious. They don't have a transcript. We'll take another uh, like a five, ten minute break. All right. We'll call you back here. So now they have to. What are you talking the about? They don't have a transcript. What do you mean? They have to excuse the jury so they can play the audio file out of the hearing of the jury to try to refresh his recollection. What kind of a clown show is this? That is like. Okay. How long, how long is the entire conversation arrested? Your Honor, um, I, we do have a transcript. Oh, I mean, no, but, no, the reason I'm asking is if you're going to play a snippet of it now and then we have to send them again, how, how long is the entire? We play the whole thing to him better now. In, instead of 
doing it in the middle of pizza. Why don't we just play? Why don't you just play the transcript? the transcript and see if that helps refresh his memory before we play? Oh. What I asked Ms. Romo is whether or not the transcript was complete, and she told me she didn't know. So if the transcript isn't complete, she shouldn't use the transcript. It was oh my God. Reporter, Your Honor. What does that mean? Well, I know. Oh my God, please. Please oh my God! Their, their transcript—they they didn't even do the transcript. It's what some third party gave them. It's what the reporter gave them, and they're trying to use this to put a guy in prison for the rest of his life. How do they know it's an accurate transcript? Oh my God! Please make it stop. Please make the stupid stop hurting. So just play the audio. Okay, All right, the we'll audio. just play the, the whole audio, audio then. Okay, and Mr. Cummings, pay attention because there's going to be actually questions on this. Okay. Now all of this is outside the hearing of the jury, folks. It's not a transcript. It's the reporter's notes. <laughs> why, why didn't they just get a transcript made? They just look, the state looks completely inept here. Is the audio on? Also, what do you mean you don't know if it's complete? You didn't. He's willing to do a pretty good deal. And I was looking at like five properties. Okay. And so I brought the thing out and I left it there for maybe two weeks, but I never stayed there except for a couple. I stayed there a couple nights. I knew it was bogus and I was like, fuck this, I'm gonna go get my trailer. So I went there, I stayed the night, and um, in the middle of the night, I was like, yeah, but the whole place smelled like propane and garlic, and I was all neuro. And then the next day, at around 2 o'clock, he showed up and he pulled up with his truck and he's looking at me like, hey man, uh, how are you? And I'm like, I couldn't even recall the night. I'm like, I'm fine, boy. And um, he goes over to his trailer and I start packing my shit up. I'm like, I'm just getting the fuck out of here. This is street shit. And um, what, I went over, I drove my truck over there to get my shit out of the trailer. And he's at the kid in the kitchen and I'm like, dude, what's up with you? you why do they keep chopping out like that? That's I would find that extremely objectionable. Yeah, objection for this entire audio tape. It's not complete. Oh my god. It's subject to interpretation. Speculation. Kitchen um, counter. I fall down into the hallway, and I was a. Uh, what? I was sheep out there. At Barbary sheep. So I was thinking about trying to go and hunt some of these Barbary. So a, a rifle. I just put a scope and adjusted the scope, and it's leaning against the wall next to the table by the kitchen, like the exit of the kitchen. I grab it with my right hand as I'm getting up. And then he hits me again. I fall into the bathroom. You gonna play that part for the jury? <laughs> and he's, he's fucking screaming. And, um, and this is his house, or yeah. are you in the mobile home? Yeah. I just started pulling the trigger. Okay. I just started pulling the trigger. I don't even know if I shot him. I shot the floor like five or six times, and all of a sudden he just fell face first. Completely consistent with the evidence. I go over the water fountain and clean the shit off. But it, it like evaporated so fast, it didn't even matter. Whatever it was, was um, it evaporated so much, it felt like uh, it was super cold, you know? Right. And then I'm just like, shit, I'm involved with big time shit here. Holy shit, what do I do, you know? And I didn't have cell service, so I drove four, three miles up the road. And, this is crazy. The only person I get up there and my phone's not getting the signal and there's this guy named Walt Wood, the guy from Breaking Bad, the doctor dude. And he's like, uh, I felt you. I'm like, and I can see anxiety is creepy. And I'm like, maybe do you have a cell service? 
be like, you know, and I'm medically trained. Yeah. Well, could you make a call? Are you willing to come down and be a witness of what happened down here? And the question that was in reference to the excerpt, and the follow-up question is going to be, you made it sound like... We're using this as impeachment? That's just great. You didn't mention that you were in the fifth wheel at church before all this happened. That's an incoherent question. He doesn't even mention fifth wheel. And he can answer and she can redirect on it. Judge? I'll allow that question. Are you ready then? Yes, Judge. This judge is so done. He's so done. <laughs> Yeah, Steve Gosney does a lot of training of the uh, the Public Defender Trial Division. I'd be interested to hear from Steve sometime. Maybe he, if he's still here, he can mention the comment. If they're teaching their trial attorneys to pay attention to where the damn microphones are these days. This is, uh, this is really incompetent. It's completely unpersuasive. Everything she does undermines her own case. Her bombshell testimony from this tape, which shouldn't be admitted for every possible reason, undercuts her own argument. <sighs> every time the state speaks, it gets worse for the state. I don't know why the video is choppy, folks. Sometimes it does that. I'm not a I'm not a technician. Ask the internet. But he's totally guilty because they had stakes one time. That you weren't sure <sighs> what was in Mr. Audiolo's hand. That's correct. Now I'm confused. Was he striking you or was he not striking you? He was trying to. But he never struck you. I blocked him. Are you confused about whether you were sprayed or not? I'm not confused. Okay. And were you sprayed? Yes. And you washed your face and hands? I did. And when you washed your face and hands, did it make it feel better? It did not. I had to go get some soap, and uh, the soap made it feel better. Okay. But you never told anybody you were sprayed with mace, did you? Yeah, I did. I told uh, Tomlinson. You told David McCullough you were sprayed with poison. I don't recall that. Did you hear him testify? I did. You didn't know Mr. McCullough before this incident, did you? I didn't. Did you ever have any fights or disagreements with Mr. McCullough? No, not at all. You also told the deputies on scene that it was some kind of neurological agent. Do you recall that? I believe I referred to it as chemical. Chemical and neurological. Do you recall that? I don't recall that. No body cameras, by the way. So, so there's you no had the AR no, record. Yeah, of course not. Why would, why would there be? Why? Because I had worked on the scope. Um, I adjusted the scope. That night before I went to bed, I was going to go sight it in the next day. After you work on the scope, you got to sight the rifle in. Yeah, I was. I had other rounds too. I had both kinds. When you put that rifle up against the porch, there was still a round chamber, was there not? I don't think there was. I thought I cleared it. Was there a round already chambered when Mr. Audiola got there? 
No, I pulled it back when I got away from him in the bathroom. So Mr. Adiola arrived around 2 p.m., right? About that time, 2.30, 2 o'clock-ish. 2 and you said the fight ended around 3 or 3.30, is that correct? Yeah. So what was happening between 2 and 3 or 3.30? He was unloading his truck, and I just was at my fifth wheel RV. Um, I was just hanging out at my, my camper, and then he was in the house doing some stuff. Why are you hanging out in your fifth wheel? I thought you were staying at the house. Because my, I was in my trailer because I was giving him space to have his own place. Can you think of any reason why Mr. Adiolo would just attack you for no reason? I figured he just had a bad temper. <laughs> never seen that bad temper before, though, had you? I heard it. He talked about his neighbors. He definitely told me some stuff about his neighbors where he had, what was definitely using. I'm not, there's no questions for you, sir. Okay. I would like you to sit down close to Missy and show me how you are holding the gun and what Mr. Ayala was doing. I'll be Mr. Ayala when you were able to camber around. Okay. Let me see what my attorneys think. I'll, I'll allow it. Now, you're That's human resources right there. Yeah, no joke. What is going on now? What the hell is this? Unless the state can show his narrative is completely impossible. What are, what are we got? What the hell? Are we doing skit time now? What the fuck is this? Oh my God. <laughs> she should punch him right in the head now. That would be great. What on God's earth is happening right now? Oh, she should shoot him. <laughs> he cycled the bolt and the zip tie came out of the chamber. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> Can't believe we have a, a, a murder defendant pointing a rifle at state council in the courtroom. What's on the floor? 
We all know what happened with Alec Baldwin. I, I agree with that. Uh, do we have a stick or something they could use? Uh, a... Oh, my God. Let's bring out a stick. Yes. Let's bring out a stick instead. Yeah. The stick of truth, baby. Woo. He <laughs> had that the whole time. I would be pissed. She had that the whole time, and she had him use a real rifle. Wow. Uh, oh, my God. Is that a is that a fully semi-automatic death stick? <laughs> Salt stick. They do a background check on him before giving him control of the assault stick. Boom, boom, two shots went up. I get up to here, and the rest of the shots are fired from about that level. It's hard to recall it all, too. Mr. Guillermo, Mr. Guillermo, Mr. Guillermo, Mr. Guillermo, Mr. Guillermo, Mr. Well, apparently skit hour has now come to a close. Wow, I've never I've never seen anything like that. I I don't ever. He fell ever. right at my feet. Mm -hmm. And then, and then I walked out of the room and went outside and coughed out what was in my lungs. Mm -hmm. So, according to the testimony, now, so all I learned now is that the state. The state doubts his narrative of self-defense. She's skeptical about it. But there's no evidence contrary to his narrative. Yep. No, I didn't say you fell right when the shots went off into the floor. I did not um, say he fell on me when, I, when the first two shots went off. Those shots went into the floor. They didn't go into him. Yeah, maybe your question sucks. <laughs> He's trying to get the weapon. Mm -hmm. He's leaning over you. Correct? Yep. And you shoot him. Yep. And he shoots you. Yep. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Shot in the floor. I didn't shoot. I think he pulled it against the trigger. I don't remember pulling the trigger at first. Okay. And then he fell? Yep. No, he didn't fall. I got up a little ways in more of a crab walk position, and I started pulling the trigger. That's why all those, sh those shots went through the wall. I'm trying to get away from him. He's not over you oh, yeah, he was. He's definitely trying to hit me in the head with that canister. <laughs> he was so aggressive, you couldn't believe it. I didn't even ask my yeah, he is following me. He's trying to strike me in the head with his hand, his right hand. <laughs> yep. Yep. He's still swinging, yes. I, I, had his, I had his arm by his coat for a long time, and I was blocking everything he was talking. I mean, th this line of questioning is only helpful if, you, if you're trapping the defendant in an obvious lie. 
right? If he's saying something and you have evidence to the contrary and it, it looks, his response looks completely incredible. All they're doing here with these questions is getting the defendant an opportunity to repeat his narrative of self-defense. There's no contradictory evidence. She's just asking the questions in a very skeptical manner. That's not disproving self-defense beyond a reasonable doubt. Yeah, no. He was using. I miss, right I miss Trade Hour though. I hope Trade Hour will come back. I'm gonna have He's to take some more acting me, yes. classes and stuff up, up my game. He was advancing on me. He was following me on crab walk. There was no room in that. There was no space in that room. That room was tight. I crossed crab walk a little bit backward. And I ran out of space, and he was on top of me, trying to hit me the whole time. So then the gun went off. I think I got up to a little bit, maybe up to my knees. I started pulling the trigger, and all of a sudden he just uh, he fell up. I I might have been. I don't recall. I was definitely doing too many things at one time. He was leaning over me, trying to hit me in the head, yes. I think the photo depicts it perfectly. It shows where he ended up. There's no question before you, sir. Okay. There's quite a bit of blood, was there not? Not at first. I'm questioning the state's sanity at this point. Yeah, when I exited the room, I didn't see any blood on the ground. Well, there never was much blood. Even the, the, the crime scene photos don't show blood until they move the body. You, you're not pumping out blood if you got shot in the aorta at all. When he was first shot, you said he fell face down. That's right. But how could he fall face down if you were still right in front of him? And you didn't grab him. He landed right at my feet. Yes. And he had been shot in the head, in the temple, in the chest? I couldn't tell at the time. I didn't look. But there was no blood? I left the room as quick as he hit the ground. I was definitely... But when he was shot, you were right next to him? I was right in front of him. You were right in front of him? Mm-hmm. How is it that you didn't get any blood on you? I don't know. No, I didn't have any blood on me. So what is the purpose of this? I mean, I, I guess you might be trying to suggest that he shot him from some kind of distance. That's why there's no blood on him. But th we've all seen the room. The room's like seven foot by nine foot or something. It's tiny. Someone hmm. in chat just... asked the question, how are they putting the drama show on the record? I don't know. I got nothing. Yeah. When I came back in to get soap, I looked in there, there was blood. You didn't get any on you or your pants or your clothes, nothing. Right? Not know? that I know of. Well, you were young, weren't you? I didn't, uh, I took my clothes off, so they were on the back of my t truck, but I don't think any blood was on me. Is this the heater that you say was not? I believe so. I don't know. I never used it. I don't know. Look at that hand. That's gross. I don't know. I don't know. It was Hey, Steve, couldn't resist, huh? <laughs> How about this circuit? <laughs> I've never seen this. This is crazy. Never seen anything question? like this. Did you see Drama Hour? I've been watching all morning, but I'm on vacation. So I, how's my cell phone coverage here? It looks great. Can you, can you explain to us the merits of the state's uh, use of uh, skit, skit and reenactment and trade hour? Because... Uh, I have never. Have you ever seen anything like that? No. no. It was pretty small. No. <laughs> Kurt was coming in skeptical. <laughs> he's the clothes like, were behind the bed. He's rolling over when he gets the prosecution. <laughs> this is just too much fun. 
Yeah, there's the bed. There's the well, made, and there's the clothes. I like, yeah, to point out the I like to point out the weaknesses of the case. The weaknesses of the prosecution case are just a little oh, bit yeah. easier to note and a little bit more extreme. <laughs> you have a lot of defendants in your trial, Steve. Get the point of rifle at the prosecutor. I, I've never seen yeah, anything like that. Heard in the hallway. There's nothing in the hallway. There's no cabinets. There's nothing. No shelves. I kind of slid off of it. it. It hit me in the top of my buttocks. Buttocks. Prosecutor committed at least three reversible errors in this cross. List them. List them, Steve. Um, I fell backward. It wasn't too hard. Mentioned that he was in jail on the phone call. I don't know which. I don't know which. Um, um, talk about which, have you seen your kids in the last two and a half years? And there was the first what was the first one, the mistrial motion. She, she, Mentioned she didn't have right. We haven't had a chance to um, interview him right there. Yeah, yeah, the yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Steve, why are you being so mean as a criminal defense attorney? I want to talk to your client. You keep saying no. Damn it. <laughs> Constitution is just really tricky yeah. given the Tricky defense lawyers. Yeah, this one weird trick. Prosecutors hate it. Uh, good times. I could have sworn I cleared it. What difference would that make? Whether the rifle was cleared after the shooting. She's just trying to create as much chaos as possible. That's usually a defense attorney trick. Right. Uh, this whole prosecution has been like that, Steve. They're raising reasonable doubt in the state over and over again. Not very long, just uh, like a minute or two. Half their questions are, is it possible that or is possible that possible that that? That'd be my guesstimation. I didn't have a watch on. Yep. Yeah, as best I could. Did you go and check to see if he was still alive? I did. When I came in to get the soap, I checked. I looked in the room, and there was a big pool of blood. He wasn't moving. His chest wasn't rising. I'm medically trained, so it was obvious he did, he wasn't uh, breathing. Right after you shot him, you didn't check then to see if he was okay? I did. I looked in there. Right after you shot him? Oh, not at all. I left the room as quick as I could. I was uh, in shock at the time and was, was uh, gasping for air. My lungs were full of something not good. Imagine how loud it must have been in that room. Ten rounds fired out of an AR in a nine-foot by seven-foot room. I didn't know what he had. I don't know. I don't recall that. Yeah, I've got a poll all set to go, folks, after they finish cross here. Dude, I don't even know what poll questions to ask. Now, this point. When you... Let's get our best hour. Yes, no. <laughs> what should what should the magazine capacity limit be for assault sticks? <laughs> I like the way she wore the same color blue as the fake rifle, though. That was nice touch. Color coordinated. Whatever. I guess the defense finally objected to it being called an AR-15. I did. I wasn't in the bathroom. I was just in the doorway of the bathroom. What is the bathroom directly across from in that home? Nothing. It's just wall. What is it directly across from? Uh, the hall. The wall in the hall. Yeah. Yeah. It's not. <laughs> okay. It's a little off centered. What is the point? What is she getting at? She's flailing it's, around. You can point. Ask it out out a point? You think there's a point? It's not directly, but you can. Oh, you sweet summer bathroom. child. <laughs> they're off. They're off centered. You're within inches of the front door. Is that correct? 
Kurt was, you were so funny. You're like, you were coming in on like, well, I'm going to give the other side. You're like, what is going on? Oh. Kurt's cracking me up today. No, I fell into the back. Approach the bench, Nope, another approach to bench. He's probably going to say, what's the point here? You need to move along. Yeah, he, and he had no legal duty to retreat. But it's yeah. also, like, what's the, re you know, you're asking, this is an ask and answer. There's going to be relevance. There's going to be, yeah. at what point does the judge say, what do you, and what is the point here, prosecutor? If a defense attorney was doing that, they'd shut him down. Yep. It's and folks, I got the sound cranked up in the courtroom, but they're not on microphones, so there's nothing I can do about that. I kind of like taking it. their trial tips from Saul Goodman. That's <laughs> what's going on right about now? <laughs> the, the judge is pretty good, I think, so far. I think I've liked right. him too. Yep, I've liked him too. I mean, good he rule. actually it, he actually interrupted at one point when there was something they were over the line, and he made the uh, he said approach. I don't, yeah, even, I don't I even know. If the but I couldn't see the defense table. I mean, it's possible that the defense counsel was standing up and so he knew the objection was coming. But uh, there's been really no not sure how stable allowed in, until this cross-examination. None of the lawyers have really tried to go over the line, but clearly she, Miss Blueberry is doing it here. <laughs> but see, this is the typ typical Miss Blueberry. <laughs> this is the typical problem with prosecutorial misconduct. Because what's the judge supposed to do here? You know, I mean, he could grant a mistrial, charge it to the state, now it's prejudicial, now the judge has dismissed a murder charge, American right? Directed verdict for wasting my time. When you were crab hauling, hauling backwards, correct? Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure the door was shut and I was more in the back room. I was- No, were you within inches of the front door? I wasn't within inches of the front door, no. At no time? It passed wow. by me on my left when I was getting away from him. <laughs> I have to use the bathroom myself or I'm going to pee my pants pretty soon, I think. <laughs> so <if you> <laughs> stupid. <laughs> and you met up with Mr. McCullough around 5.30. What were you doing in those two hours? I don't think I spent that much time um, somewhere of the time's off. It must have happened a little bit later in the day than I thought. I didn't have a watch on me. I wasn't paying attention to the time. So what's the first thing you did after you saw Mr. Ariola dead in the bedroom? What's the next thing, the very next thing you did? I went out to the... They ask and answer. See, now she's going to start shutting him down. I went out uh, and washed myself up better with soap. Well, you know, you washed, you never looked in on, Elder, on Mr. Ariola until I came back to get soap. I looked into the room and I saw the blood. I saw no, no breathing from his chest, from his back. And then I went into the kitchen. I got a little bit of soap and filled my palm with soap. I went back outside where the water was and washed myself off more. And how long did that take? I don't know. Not very long. What did you do right after that? I went to my truck to change my shirt. Mm -hmm. And what else? My truck was about, I don't know, 100 feet away. Okay. Uh, then I went to the edge of the property when I saw a motorcycle, and I tried waving down Mr. McCullough. I was waving my hands like this as he rode by. But you didn't get in your truck. When he didn't respond... What did you do? I got in my truck and drove that way to try to catch him and to use the phone up where the phone service worked. Did we find the prosecutor guilty? <laughs> <laughs> she was attacking him. You saw it. Yep. I didn't. I um asked. I talked to him a little bit. I wasn't sure if he was friends with Mr. Ayola or not.
Okay. So you didn't tell Mr. McCullough right away. And you said on direct, I believe, and I'm paraphrasing, you weren't sure if he was friends with Mr. Ariola or not, right? Um, I was using my phone too at the time. What do you mean you're using your phone? I was trying to get service. I was looking for bars on my phone. Exactly. Okay. Once again, if you did not tell him right away that you had shot a man in self-defense and you needed help. Um, I, I told him pretty quickly. After you talked about motorcycles? I don't recall talking about motorcycles. After you got back in your truck and you were going to leave and then you had second thoughts and came back? You don't remember that? I thought I talked to him the first time I arrived. I don't recall that. And after Mr. McCullough called 911. No, he called 911 directly. He was uh, behind my truck calling 911. And then I got three bars. Sir? I was sitting in my truck. I wasn't standing there. But would you agree that you were close enough that you could be heard on dispatch? He was behind my truck. I couldn't see him. Did you hear yourself on dispatch? Yeah. Okay. Who are you talking to? I didn't hear myself on dispatch. I only heard David McCullough on dispatch. So you said you had three bars now. Who are you calling? I called 911. At the same time as David McCullough? Yes. I wasn't sure he was on the phone with 911. He was behind my truck, like 10 feet behind my truck. My truck's really big. It's like 27 feet long. Did you hear Mr. McCullough on that call try to answer a dispatcher's question about where the, where, whether he still had the weapon or whether what was happening? They, he, Mr. McCullough, in fact, talked to you. No. Information related to the dispatcher. I don't recall what he said. And you didn't call 911, <coughs> even though you say you had cell phone service right there at the same time you say you had As soon as I got service, I called 911. You didn't call, even though you just testified that you already had three bars, you didn't call 911 until about 13 minutes after. Oh my God, 13 minutes? No, that's, that's not correct. Have any I called 911. I don't know if they got together on the time of the call, but I called 911 while Mr. McCullough was calling 911. I ended up getting hold of BHI, Bureau of Indian Affairs, and uh, he ended up getting hold of Sandoval County Sheriff's Department. What do you mean got together on the time? the time um i called as soon as i had, i talked to mr mccall out my window of my truck i told him what happened i asked him if he had bars on his phone he said he did can I, you please call 911 and let them know what happened out here and about the same time as he walked to the back of my truck my phone got three bars on it i dialed 911 immediately and told him my name my phone number and where i was at <laughs> so that was all pointless we we'll just move on. This is just dead? terrible. She's just, she's just going to go on and on and on with, like, with this with condemning God. attitude with me until she gets shut down. Why would you be concerned if you were acting in self-defense? Because police with guns isn't exactly the safest thing you, you could deal with in life. Fair enough. 
Fair enough. <laughs> She's got nothing. The prosecutor's what got nothing. Happening? Now look at her. She's she's trying to struggle for a question now. I mean, she, this should be completely planned out. She what should have. She should, if name. you have a case, there is there are points that you're going to want to make. She has no. She has not made one point to to contradict there, self defense there are, theory. There are specific legal elements you would be attacking right now. Maybe Very we should send her off with a copy of the chart. She obviously doesn't have it. Yeah. Send her a quick email. This Here's a copy of the chart for free. Use this. Somebody oh was killed by a scary looking black AR type gun. So they must they must be guilty. Right. Let's wave it around in front of the jury and and talk condemningly. And you know, that's basically what they're doing. They're like judgmentally, like pointing at him. I, I can't imagine the circumstances in which I would ever consent to having someone point an actual rifle at me, even if that I cleared crazy. it myself, which she hasn't done. A prosecutor has the defendant point the gun at her. <laughs> you and I, open. Andrew, we're going to reenact this. This is not going to go badly at all for either one of us. When she had a blue gun right there. Yeah, that's what I, I didn't know what he had in his hand. She just downloaded the PDF of Law of Self-Defense Principles. <laughs> what, 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 yeah, what when we drank that night, he told me he had sprayed his neighbors with mace. Show where you could call a friend for help. <laughs> that's, See, that's what she needs. I knew he, he, also, I knew he had used it prior. See here? The, she also, you remember, they shut down the defense and having him tell the other stories about the other neighbor stories. And now she's yeah. just opened up the door. So now the defense is going to be able to come back and bring that in. All the stories about the neighbors and all the violent stuff that he had told him about is coming in now because she just opened the door. This is the second time she's done that. She needs to stand behind her. She's trying Anytime to you want to ask a question would be fine. If that's what they found, yes. Yeah, she she keeps approaching the... The witness. That's not really very proper. I, I don't like the way she's doing that. Yeah, I she's to trying sure to do that. You make sure of that, right? I don't know. Counsel, do you have any actual questions? <laughs> yeah, I think you're right. I wanted them to know that he had a weapon, that he had something in his hand he was trying to hit me with. I think I told McCullough that. Objection. This is, again, getting into... I don't I know. I did. I never, I never said it. Paraphrasing. paraphrasing to get this guy in prison for the rest of his life. How about not paraphrase? No. They weren't. Just the side of my face was burning. Side of your face was burning. Okay. Because of something he sprayed out of that tank. That was my guess. Yes. Well, did he have anything else in his hand to spray? I didn't see anything else. What? These questions are so sloppy. You you ask questions directly from evidence. If he's made a bunch of statements, she's just winging it. This lady's ex-husband is getting calls from his friends. Oh, man, you got so lucky getting out of that. <laughs> I asked him to go, yes. And you used those words, witness the body. I can't recall that. And after you got out there, you made sure that you saw the canister in the hand, correct? I don't recall that either. I just told him to 
go take a look. I was just concerned that the police video cameras weren't working. <laughs> oh, yeah, no. You're still there with Mr. McCullough, David McCullough, right? He left. But you were there at first, right? Yeah, I was on the property. Did you go in the house with him? I wasn't sure about that. McCullough testified that I did, but I don't recall. I thought I stayed outside, but it's hard to remember everything. And mind you, I was devastated and definitely in shock. Excellent testimony. You were twice that night, If that's what you call it, I'm not sure exactly what that means. Oh my gosh. I take away everything I said about the state being competent. You had said something about the state being competent at some point? I'd, I'd, I'd said they were technically competent. At least they knew how to ask questions. That's right. This is a train wreck. Oh, yeah. Uh, no. Well, we, we, were, we sure. were commenting that the case is weak, but we weren't sure about the competency of the lawyers. Well, I'm not sure. I, I know I drove back toward that direction to go meet the police, but that's when I ran, I ran into them. Where is she going? Why is she going there? What is happening? Oh, it took more than that. I was there a long time. And you were just leaving your property when the deputies are arriving on scene. I'm going to object that kind of statement of the testimony. It wasn't his property. Well, I, I believe I said the property. When the police didn't arrive, I started driving out to go back to Cabazon, but I ran into the police about a quarter of the mile. Maybe the prosecutor the lost a bet. On. That's when I stopped. Maybe my that's what's going off on. The Indian, so I could hear them. Did you know any of these? Well, no. We think that the prosecutor above ordered them to prosecute this case, and these people pulled the short straw. Why they would make up I mean, I can't imagine why you'd volunteer for this. Did or didn't do or said or didn't say. I never called anybody. I mean, if I was prosecuting this case, I would drop it. I just say we we we, we drop the charges, no problems, right here. Um, I don't believe they re they reconstructed the site, the the scene. Um, I think I have a little better account of everything since I was the only witness. Hey, that's not what I asked you, sir. Go ahead and ask me again, please. He's telling her, he's telling the prosecutor how to question him. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. When you talk to the deputies on scene and David McCullough, you never told them that you were screaming for him to stop. I wasn't screaming. I was waving my arms. He was too far away for voice voice to work. He was a, he was literally a quarter mile away when he rode by on his motorcycle. Yeah, it's your fault. Get behind your podium so we can hear. This constant pacing is a very defensive. Um, I did yell stop. Demeanor. My question to you is, you never said that, even though you were claiming self-defense, self-defense, self-defense. You admit that you said that to the deputies, right? I think so. Yeah. And, but you never said... I told him to stop, and he never stopped. You didn't say anything like that, did you? I was trying not to make any statements until I had an attorney. Because so I might be brought up on charges by idiot prosecutors. Other things voluntarily, you never told him that. Told him what? That he screamed, or you screamed for him to stop. I gave very brief statements. Is that a no? I don't recall. Uh, what about the other client? You, you, never said, you never told him to uh, hit you at a slower pace, did you? Never told the detectives that. She's got nothing. She's got nothing. I don't know how these people sleep at night. So after Mr. McCullough left, you didn't follow him right away. 
She's trying to intimidate him and get him That's off rattle, but he's a cool character. I don't know what she's you 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 you, you, you assume there's deliberation in what she's doing. I it's just I, I've seen prosecutors like this, and they're usually a lot of prosecutors are bad at cross because they're not used yeah. to doing it. And they don't practice it. Yep. I don't I don't and recall so, when I did the rifle. Uh, mind you, I was definitely in shock. I don't recall everything that happened. I definitely had more concerns about the police officers arriving with right with rifles and guns. I was definitely concerned about that. Well, in fact, and that's one of the conversations, the first kind of three-way conversation that Mr. McCullough had with dispatch while you were there. You're saying, I was, don't touch the weapon, right? I was where? You were standing right next to him, or sitting yourself right next to him. You were close enough that you could have a conversation. When did we have a conversation? When you were on, when you were called, David McCullough was on the phone with dispatch. He was behind my truck. We weren't uh, in communication at that point. I had a conversation before he dialed 911. I called the Bureau of Indian Affairs. My, my phone rang to the Bureau of Indian Affairs. His phone rang through to Sandoval County. Objection asked and answered. Rephrase it, please. Maybe I'm misunderstanding you. And he comes across as cooperative. Mr. McCullough was on the phone with 911 and dispatch. Mr. McCullough was on the phone with 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 dispatch. Mr. McCullough is getting information from you at the same time. He wasn't talking to me. He was behind my truck looking at my license plate when he was calling 911. And then I got on the phone. I couldn't have had a conversation because I was busy on the phone talking to 911. She really wants a different answer to this question, and she's just not getting it. I don't know. I, I think it was right away. This, this is some, something that's important to her on closing, and she's just not getting it. Nope. She's going to say he's being deceptive because you can hear on the 911 call where he's asking him a he question. Never told anyone that you encountered that day that you were hit by a can of mace or that he was attempting to hit you. With he mace. had glancing blows for sure. I felt it, I felt something yes, up sir, in what? Please listen to my question. Okay. You never told anyone that you encountered not David McCullough, not the deputies on scene, not the reporter. Just pretend you like you got the answer you wanted during close. No one will know this he difference. Was trying to strike you with a can of mace. You never said that, did you? I never said it when. When you talked to David McCullough, when you talked to the deputies, when you talked to David Williams. Um, I can't recall. <laughs> you never told anyone about one of you hitting that heater. I don't recall. But even if all this were true, it, it's it's just raising doubt about self-defense. It's not disproving self-defense beyond a reasonable doubt. You never told anyone that your skin was stinging. No, oh. I did. I th I told the police officers. It's on the uh, police officer body cam. Oh wait. Yeah. <laughs> They should get a jury instruction on that destruction of evidence, that spoliation issue. Yeah, yeah. The, yep. defense, the defense should be asking for an instruction that presumption should be against the state. Right. No, I did not. Yeah, he fell right at my feet. Uh, 
no experience with threatened death. We don't know. It's been asked an answer to your question. I objected to that question. It's hard to hear. She keeps moving. I, if I was a judge, I'd keep her behind that podium unless she asks. Just it makes it harder for us to hear the stupid, which is probably a good thing. It's also unnecessarily <laughs> aggressive towards the defendant. I mean, I, before she was actually just kept walking up to the to, to the witness. Like you're supposed to ask permission before you do that. Well, some judges allow things, but the way she's doing it is she's trying to intimidate it, and that's not proper. <laughs> her colleagues handing her post-it notes. Yes, please shut it down. Oh, risk all this. This is just like throw everything against the wall and see what sticks. This is like she's deposing him in front of the jury, and it's she's like trying they, to be this condemning. Thing. They haven't. They haven't. They can't lose until they stop asking them questions, right? So they're just going to ask them questions forever <laughs> and never lose the case. <laughs> yeah, it's a bold plan, Cotton. Because this is their last shot. I mean, they've rested. They got the defendant on cross. This is this is the last shot. Yeah, yeah this for is sure. as strong as the as the state will ever be. And that that I'll tell you that reenactment that is so crazy that it might swing a juror. Of what happened that day is clear then or now? Um, I don't know. Um, it's been two and a half years, so I've been trying to play it back in my head every day since it had since it happened um i would say i'd have a better bigger picture of it now after working with my attorneys and uh, knowing more about the canister and everything else that's a good answer he's yeah. good on the stand i call yeah. him every day he's the first uh the defense defense, defense, by the way it looks like he's what door. The door into the mudroom. I should have said that, yes. That's the that's the that's the door into the mudroom. There's another door. Yeah, you go through a, the main door and then you go through a screen door to get outside. About three feet. Three feet. No, it's about six to eight feet. It's a pretty good sized little porch. What city is this being prosecuted? Uh, it's near Los Alamos. I don't remember. They might, they might be in Los Alamos. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, probably, prob probably so. Probably 12 by 8. And you were struggling with it. Excuse me. Yeah, exactly. Popular Hispanic local guy shot with an AR by somebody out of town. Right. Yep. And every time they say the victim's name, they say it with the, the Spanish accent and the rolling consonants, you know. Elected prosecutor says, we're going to, you know, all his, this is a friend of all of our local people and this defendant is nobody. So the elected official says, prosecute it and you've got the short straw. That's probably what's going on here. I hope, I just hope the jury is there. Yeah, but I'd expect more of a trial ad team at any law school. Yeah, but they have nothing. They have no case. So this is what you do when you don't have a case. You just throw it up there. This is chaos theory. Chaos theory is a defense strategy, not a prosecutor strategy. And they're just hoping that if they make him look bad, they put the gun in his hand, they show him, you know, and they be condemning and they wave the AR around that maybe somebody will hook onto it and say, we don't like it. 
We don't like guns at ARs. All right, okay. in New Mexico. Re That's it. On cross examination. Well, okay, that was a lot dumb. You did you want to post a poll about the dumb? Asked you several times if you were startled by Mr. Ariola's arrival at the property that day. Oh, yeah, I remember her asking that. Yeah. Poll is up. And you said that you didn't mean to do that. You didn't mean to have the rifle in the house when he showed up. Yeah, that's right. I wasn't expecting him. So what do, what do you mean, though? Why were you concerned about the rifle being in the house with him? It just wasn't appropriate. I didn't think I should have it in, in there when someone else showed up. Kind of hunter safety. It should have been put away, but I didn't expect him to show up so quickly. Okay, so this is just a gun safety concern. Yes. See if she gets into the neighbor stories too, about the opening the door with the neighbor stories. And Ms. Romo had you get down on the ground and basically show how you were crawling and retreating away from Mr. <laughs> Ariola. Do you remember that I do. demonstration? And Ms. Romo was standing over you and she swinging said, you her hand at you. Yep. How many times did you go down on the ground because of Mr. Ariola shoving you? Uh, three times. And after the first time he shoved you to the ground, did you shoot him? After with a, repeat that, please. After the first time he attacked you and shoved you to the ground, did you shoot him? No, not at all. I, After the second time that he attacked you and shoved you to the ground, did you shoot him? No. After the third time that he shoved you and tackled you to the ground, did you shoot him then? I did. And was it an immediate thing or did you still retreat and fight? I was still retreating and fighting, trying to block him. And when you were retreating in that back bedroom away from Mr. Ariola, you said he still had that canister and he was still swinging his right hand? He did. He had and, something in his hand. And what was he doing with his left hand? Grabbing the rifle. And when you said, that, and you were demonstrating how he was grabbing it, he was grabbing at the scope? Yeah, the top of it. Okay. Is that when the scope cap was ripped off? That must have been when it came off. Okay. And as you, after the scope cap comes off, you are still trying to retreat away from him. Is that correct? I'm out of room at this point, so I'm fighting to get to my feet. Okay. This is a very and good redirect. What is he doing? I'm much happier with this. With his right hand, swinging, trying to hit me in the side of the head. And what's and he doing with his left hand? He's trying to pull the gun out of my hand. I don't know if that's because she's better or I'm just comparing it to the absolute stupid incompetence shit show I just saw. But either way, it's working for me. So we, we have one person voting guilty in the poll. Did you call 911 one first or your father first? I think I called 911 first. And when you spoke to Mr. McCullough that day, did you give him a full play-by-play -play description of everything that had happened? I didn't. I didn't feel it was appropriate. What, what did you think was appropriate to tell him? I told him that some guy attacked me and that I shot him. And why did you tell him that? So he would know what happened, so he could help me and be a witness to it. And you wanted him to call 911, right? I sure did. Thanks for keeping the likes up. That's it. Great. Super simple, clean to the point, effective, going back to the to the threats. Just reemphasize so that, was, that point. Easy. That was really the last practical opportunity for the state to disprove self-defense beyond a reasonable doubt. And the poll we'll take our lunch break now and uh, be back about yeah. uh, ten after one. We'll start at one fifteen. All right. It's it's not gonna get any better for the state. Our hour long yeah, break, I mean, folks. You, next, next up, we've got two defense experts. You think they're going to give anything to the state? Quite, the, quite the opposite. Yeah, I they're mean, just going to fill in. Go ahead. Yeah, the state didn't present any use of force expertise. They had the medical examiner. They had the cops who arrived after the scene, who gave you know their, their personal um, perceptions of what they saw after the event. Uh, they didn't have anybody provide any kind of use of force expertise at all. And I expect the, uh, the, uh, the defense expert should be pretty good. Hopefully they found a good one, so, but he should be able to address so all the pertinent issues, the mace, the gun, the, phys the physics of it, everything. Is this a lunch break here or what? Lunch break. Yep. 
So we got about an hour. What they could call me as the use of force expert, and I think I get get them home. <laughs> That's right. so, All right. So the the poll. I'm going to wrap it up. I think. Well, I don't know. People are still voting. I'll leave it up a few more minutes. Right now, it's uh, guilty two percent, not guilty ninety four percent, and undecided is five percent. Folks, at this stage of the proceedings, the undecided is a no guilty vote. Not guilty vote. So yeah. that would be 90, <laughs> the numbers don't add up to 100. Uh, 99% uh, guilty, 2% not guilty. The other way around. What did I say? 90, 90, 99% not guilty, 2% guilty. Yeah, okay, sorry. All right, so while we're on the break, let me finally get to some of uh, questions and comments. I bet we got a ton of them. I'll start with the uh, Law of Self-Defense members First, uh, let's see, uh, I, folks, I, a lot of the comments are jokes. I'm not going to read all the jokes. Okay. I, I appreciate that. But just the, unless they're really funny, the, the non-funny okay. ones. I'm skip over. Uh, let's see. Uh, David writes, these are all law self-defense members here. David, Andrew, I agree. Legally, you are certainly right as always. Well, I wouldn't say I'm always right, just like 99.9% of the time. However, if the jury has a gut feeling, you can go to prison without the legal evidence. Yes, there's always a chance of getting convicted, um, oh, yeah. no matter how innocent you are. Uh, Jim, uh, proper gun handling would include emptying the firearm before mounting the scope. I don't know why people insist on believing that the guy was mounting the scope with a loaded rifle. That's not his testimony. He never said that uh, it would be expected that the gun would be unloaded while he's mounting the scope. He gets the scope all set. He's going to dry fire it the next day and he pops a magazine in without uh, without loading the chamber. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, Wendy, I don't understand how anyone would accompany, let alone walk into a building with someone who just told you he'd shot someone. Uh, yeah, like I said, if I'm if I'm riding on my motorcycle in the desert, you start a stranger starts waving me down from a distance. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not going anywhere near that person unless I have a damn good reason. And that's going to be a, a hard sell for me. Um, Donnie O, uh, the burden of production is on the state to prove the use of force was unlawful. The defendant has no burden of production to prove the use of force lawful. The legal presumption of innocence is evidence of the lawfulness of the use of force that the prosecution must rebut before it. I know we'd like to think that, Donnie, you do have a burden of production on self-defense. Uh Donnie O, Coffin v. U.S., burden of proof is on the state, never shifts. A defendant can stand mute and rely on the presumption of innocence. If you want to raise the legal defense of self-defense, you have to meet your burden of production. That's it, It's not magic. But now, I want to ask about that because, in, you know, I'm just going from Florida. I'm a Florida lawyer, so um, my understanding in Florida is that if you, um, in, in this case, for example, this case was in Florida, the state having put his statements where he's claiming self-defense into evidence would in the state's case in chief right. would be yep. sufficient to, to, to be able to get the jury instruction on self-defense. So he, the, the defense right. could put on no testimony at all, and they get yes. the self-defense instruction because the state had it in their case. Well, what you're right. saying is if there was no self-defense in the state case, then you have some modicum of burden of production. And to it has to come from somewhere. It has to come from right. somewhere. Nobody cares where it comes from. And often it comes from evidence other than the defendant's own testimony or statements. Uh, but it has to come from somewhere. If it doesn't exist anywhere, you haven't met your burden of production. Normally, it's not, especially in, um, well, normally, it's the, normally burden of production is not difficult in anything resembling a lawful use of force in self-defense, even if it's barely arguable. Uh, but there are cases in which it so obviously was not self-defense that you can't meet your burden of production. There's literally zero evidence on multiple elements, required elements of self-defense. And if there's zero evidence on an issue, folks, the jury can't find for you on that issue. There, there's no facts for them to to consider. Well, and, and, and how that plays out in court is that it comes out in the jury instructions because, you know, if the defense, you know, you, you defense is going to be on top of it. They should be. They're going to be looking at your defenses that you're going to you want to be read to the jury and you're going to be looking to produce enough evidence to support each jury instruction. So, you know, and in fact, I was thinking when when you were talking and I was off in the chat land, um, you the defense at certain points prior to resting and saying, Your Honor, just wanted to um, to inquire. You know, we believe that we've met the burden of production on X, Y, and Z. Before we rest, we'd like to get a pre-ruling on our instruction. A judge mm -hmm. will usually give you that. Yep. 
So usually it happens at at least two points. So before the trial, in most jurisdictions, if the defense plans to argue self-defense, they have to notify the prosecution that they intend to do that. So the prosecution can have a fair opportunity to counter argue against self-defense. So if the prosecution has a problem with raising self-defense at all as a legal defense. That's where they would argue it. Now, typically, the court, in an abundance of caution, will say, well, all right, look, self-defense looks pretty weak here, but if the defense develops that evidence for the burden of production over the course of the testimony, well, then I'll give a jury instruction on it at the end. But if they fail to do that, there will be no self-defense jury instruction. So you have to have a second conversation about it at the end of the trial. And if, uh, obviously, if the, defendants, if the defense is being prudent, they'll ask the judge about this before they finally rest, just to make sure if, if they're falling short, uh, they can try to produce some more evidence, maybe put their client on the stand. If that's what it takes to make sure they meet that burden of production. Yeah, usually, that, usually that's what you have to do. I mean, it's oftentimes that forces the defense to put a person on the stand. If the state does not bring out self-defense and you got nothing, right. a lot of times you have to put your guy on the stand, even though he's got eight felonies. You know? Right. And of course, yeah. normally you don't want to do that because normally the client's a shit bag and everything comes out and you, you don't want that yep. to happen. Uh, let's see. Um Robert M., as far as Andrew's guest, the motorcycle guy told him to clear the weapon. And while the timing seems off, it has been two years. I'm not too worried about those kind of inconsequential details. It doesn't really matter when he cleared the weapon or if he cleared the weapon after the fact. That can all go to just, you know, misrecollection. It's not it's not a pivotal issue uh, in the legal defense here. Uh, Andrew, did you check to see if the defendant is a law of self-defense member? I'm pretty sure he's not because my office didn't get a call and we would have. Uh, are things he's describing pretty much what you would hope he'd be pointing out? Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, it doesn't seem to me like he's like he's learned the elements of self-defense and he's trying to align his testimony with those elements, which is what I would recommend. Uh, so I, I doubt he's like read my book or anything, but uh, the the his testimony of what happened. I mean, you may choose not to believe it, right? But if you believe it, it's consistent with a lawful use of force and self-defense. Andrew, you have a book. If I were interested in getting this book, oh, yeah, how could I go about getting it? If only I had one handy. <laughs> Here it is, folks. Law of Self-Defense Principles. We give you this book for free. We only ask you pay the shipping and handling. Look at the reviews on Amazon. Don't buy it on Amazon. They'll charge you for the book. But if you look at the reviews, over a thousand reviews, five star rated, we'll give you the book for free. You can get it at lawofselfdefense.com slash free book. Pretty easy to remember, folks. Lawofselfdefense.com slash free book. And we have a guest on here who also has a book recently released. Do you have it with you, Steve? I'm almost out of my first. You, you got it. There's only a few more copies left. Shane Sousa in the in the chat. They've been set. He's been selling books for me, even when I'm on vacation. So I think I've only got like nine books left of the first edition. I'm going to have to reorder, but I'm going to reorder it with a different cover. So if you want the collectible first edition, right, go to crimelaw.net and buy the uh, book on law. And I should point out that both Steve's book and my book are, in fact, bulletproof. You just may need to buy a bunch of them for that to be effective. <laughs> but if you have enough of them, they're bulletproof. Well, I really hear the hard covers of things are better for the bulletproofness, but it's really unfortunate you don't have a hard copy of your book available, Andrew. It's amazing. It's amazing what people bring to mind. If you'd like the beautiful, beautiful, it's actually a gorgeous book, hardcover version of the Law of Self-Defense Principles. You can get this one's not free, folks, because they're too expensive to produce. But if you'd like the presentation version of the book, great gift. Father's Day, Christmas is coming up. Uh, you can get this one at lawofselfdefense.com slash. Yes, you can come in. Get hard. Housekeeping is here in my hotel room. Oh, okay. All right. See, look, I, I didn't make up the bed. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Well, you're lucky. House you connection, by the way. It's not too bad. Your, your mic chopped yeah. out for a couple seconds once, but other than that, it's been good. Uh, let's see. Uh Paul in Florida writes, and just like Binger, they did it because they see their case going down the hopper. I presume that's the waving of the gun all around the courtroom. That was that was amazing. Um, yeah, let's put the murder weapon in the defendant's hands. The classic trick, but I've never seen it quite done like that. Yeah, it's uh, kind of like the OJ thing. Races try the glove on in front of the jury. Right. No, it's and even then the prosecutor is up there with her fist raised. <laughs> I thought, I'm not sure that's what I'd be doing. Uh, Jim says, looking at only what the prosecution has said and done, they are incompetent. Same for the LEO witnesses. Yep, I would agree. Um, 
Miles Dog says, please explain defendant's innocence when he brandished rifle during the physical altercation in the kitchen. Seems like a quick pull. I don't Oh, You mean he went to the rifle too early? He, what he's describing, what the defendant is describing, and you're free to not believe him, but if the jury believes him, it's consistent with lawful self-defense that he was being struck in the head with an unknown object, having been told by this attacker that he previously threatened people with a hammer. That's a deadly force attack against which a rifle would be justifiable deadly force response. And, and also, I'd, I'd note it doesn't really matter when he armed himself. What no. matters is when he used the firearm, was he justified? Right. So you, it's always an ambiguous area when you're just presenting the gun, but you're not shooting the gun, because some will argue that you're not actually using deadly force until you pull the trigger and discharge the weapon. Some prosecutors will disagree. I mean, threatening someone with a gun without firing it for unjustified reasons is still a crime, right? It's aggravated assault with a firearm. So anytime you get the gun out and you're waving it around, you've incurred prospective legal liability. But you can always argue, hey, I didn't actually use defensive force until I fired the gun. In any case, presenting the gun uh, to deter someone from an, an ongoing attacker with an object in his hand striking you in the head is certainly reasonable. And, and there's also zero evidence of any alternative narrative. Right. Yep. Uh, let's see, Jim, isn't the prosecutor supposed to be limited to some extent because it's cross? Well, yeah, in theory, the judge let her get away with a lot. No, um, we should have expanded because it, we didn't have the opportunity to interview this uh, witness before. Right. <laughs> when was the last time you saw your children? Have you been in jail for the last two and a half oh, years? That was horrible. That was there were that all three of those the judge could have granted a mistrial and charged it to the state, and that would be double jeopardy if they did that. See if they if they really had some balls. They do that because this this how are you ever going to stop prosecutors from cheating like this? Right. Uh, just and we're going to see. I'm sorry, closing is... arguments. I think this prosecutor is going to go way over the line on closing. They got to be, yeah. you know, the defense right. has got to be on their toes. Yep, I agree. That's what they're going to do. Just as desperate as they were on this cross, they're going to be even more desperate on, on closing. They're going to do burden shifting is what they're going to do. Right. Yeah, that, probably. That, that's probably a good way to go. Uh, let's see. <laughs> let's see. Do you know that the defendant has to prove their innocence? It's true. Little known fact. Um, a lot of this is just observations about the testimony. Has the state... Uh, Stogies and broomsticks. Has the state raised enough issues to warrant a mistrial? Yeah, as we just said, if the judge wanted to go that way, it would be justified for him to do that. Yeah, but no judge. I mean, this even though it's justified, judges are not going to do that. You know, the judge, no judge. Generally, judges are not that aggressive with prosecutors. Right. Even though they should be. <laughs> yeah. So someone here. Uh, where was it? Um, Jim writes, seems to me they could each use the castle doctrine here. So the castle doctrine would apply if you would otherwise have a legal duty to retreat. You don't have to retreat from an aggressor in your castle. Sometimes two people in a confrontation both have castle doctrine. Uh, that happens. Uh, this guy can say, uh, the, the defendant here can say, well, he he's allowing me to stay there when I'm on the property. That becomes his dwelling, his castle, while he's on the property, if he's staying there by permission. And the the victim could argue, well, I own it. And I stay there when I'm on the property, too. It's also my castle. But that doesn't help the state. That just removes you, a, a legal duty to retreat from both parties. And what's interesting here, though, is, is, that, is that the facts of this case, all the facts show that he was done retreating. There was no ability for him to retreat once right. he got cornered into that back room. So even when there is a legal duty to retreat, it only applies when it's possible, safely possible to do that. And that's not the case on the facts as described by the defendant. He was under continuous attack the entire time. You're, you don't have a legal duty to do something that's impossible, and you don't have a legal duty to retreat if retreating would increase your jeopardy. It's only required if you can do it with complete safety, which, which is not here. If there was a back door out of the room, maybe you'd have that argument. But there wasn't. There was only one door into or out of the room, and the aggressor was between the defendant and that door. Can you put That's why the state up? started yeah. talking so much about this door across from the bathroom. Like, oh, you were only inches away from that door. But yeah, when you're actually being the victim of an attack, it's 
it's not like you're standing there and nothing's happening and you could just step out the doorway. You could put a, you could remove the flag and put a three up. It's, it's hard for me to see. It's so small. Oh yeah, sorry about that. Good points. Yeah. Good points. There we go. This is very. Oh hey. There we go. I <laughs> got it. Thanks, Steve. Steve, you're becoming more of a professional on this stuff than I am. Good for you. This is cool, man. I I, I couldn't stand it. I had to get on because this prosecutor <laughs> was just driving me nuts. Uh, Donnie yeah, Osh uh, writes, a use of force expert should testify that the first person to go to the ground just lost the physical fight and it's time to go to whatever weapon is available. Certainly you're in a much more vulnerable position if you're the first person to go to the ground. No question about that. Um, let's see. Uh, Brian asked, did they say if this was the jail recording of the call or the reporters? At times you could hear background noises during the pauses. Uh, the blocks of complete silence, sound muted or edited. I don't know what that recording was all about. It was very poorly explained. I guess he was being interviewed by a reporter from while he was in jail. Uh, that's what was happening. And they redacted certain portions of it, probably in limine hearings prior to the trial. But the way they presented it in court, I found very out of context. And I presume the jury found it much the same way. Did Again, they this should present the audio of- with the jury there? I'm not sure if they did or not. No, I think they just did it right. <laughs> they, they, what they did yeah. is he refreshed his recollection with right. the audio, yeah. and then they kind of left it there. Like they, they, the point that the state was trying to make there was, was not in the audio. Right, right. And but by the time the jury came back in, the, the prosecution was on to a different line of questioning entirely. Because what they were trying to prove with the audio was not there on the audio. Right, right. Which is uh, Jim, something you might want to know about before, you know, trying to impeach someone. It might be helpful to know that the thing you're impeaching them with is impeaching. That'd be good. The state uh, is Jim, not on top of the evidence. No. Well, I think they're just hoping to kind of bluff their way through, right? I mean, just put ev- some kind of evidence in front of the jury and then mischaracterize it during closing. Oh, you, you know, one thing. Someone had asked, the defendant said, blah, 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 blah. You know, that kind of thing. Somebody had asked. I'm not sure it was. I don't know which stream it was on, but. Why is the state calling this witness? Why is the state calling this witness? All right. Well, one thing as a state you're going to want to do is call every witness that's involved in this so that the defense doesn't call some witness to say, well, they didn't, you know, we're bringing this person. in." So they're taking every witness that saw it and letting them tell their story because what else they got? They got nothing else. You know, so that's a typical state strategy is they'll call even witnesses that are not pro state. They'll just call them because they were there so that then they don't have a defense witness. You know, the defense calls witnesses. Oh, they didn't call them that kind of thing. You know, but and also yeah. because they got nothing else. Right. Uh, Jim writes, lording over him while he's on the floor. This is presumably the uh, attorney Blueberry uh, scene. Uh, while the floor is going to impress the hell out of the jury yeah. as prosecutorial prosecutor sure. assaults defendant. <laughs> I hope she batters him soon. Uh, yeah. Then they brought in the blue gun. Is is this argumentative? Paul asks. Yeah, a lot of that cross was argumentative. Uh, Brian, the prosecution just wanted the jury to see him waving a gun around. I can't believe the defense and the judge allowed that. Well, I I, I would have been really pissed if I were the judge, and then I realized suddenly they had the blue gun there the whole time. They never had to wave a real gun around the courtroom. Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> Hey, Steve, haven't put a mint on my pillow. <laughs> She's going to help me out here. She's going to clean my, my room up. Uh, Keith, uh, so despite the prosecution missteps, suppose I'm on the jury and I just don't believe the defendant is being honest. You, as a juror, you can come to whatever verdict you want. That's up to you. Ho- hopefully you'll well, you be- can disbelieve him. That's fine. But as yep. we've been trying to say, at least legally, the question is, can you disprove self-defense beyond a reasonable doubt? Right. So, so if you want to disbelieve him, I mean, I've given you some reasons to disbelieve him in part, although those reasons seem so inconsequential at this point because the prosecution is such an absolute clown show that I can't remember what my objections were at this point. Um, but to say that there's proof beyond a reasonable doubt of, yeah, no. I don't see it. I don't see the evidence. Someone would have to point me to the evidence that, amounts to disproving self-defense beyond a reasonable doubt, because I, I don't think a rational, unbiased, impartial juror could come to that conclusion. That said, you know, <laughs> jurors can be uh, uh, irrational if they want. They're not supposed to be. 
Uh, Danielle writes, prosecution can't afford an expert witness trying to testify herself on cross. Well, she was certainly trying to do that. Um, Jim, the longer the prosecutor continues this cross, the greater the reasonable doubt she injects. She didn't certainly didn't strengthen her case. Uh, let's see. Uh, she's incredibly inept, apt word games with the witness. Lots of word games. Let's see. Uh, Charles says, uh, Andrew, you said there was evidence Cummings had some psychological issues. Could this whole dramatic adversarial tactic by the prosecutor be in hopes that he might crack? So I didn't say there was evidence because I'm, when I say evidence, I mean stuff that's in court. Uh, I've seen media reporting where th they allege he's had some mental health issues, paranoia, conspiracy theories, people against him, that kind of thing. Uh, I don't know if those reports are true or not. That's just what I've seen in the media. Uh, I know there was questions about his competency to stand trial. That's one of the reasons for this delay. So the, the prosecution might have hoped that he's sufficiently fragile, mentally fragile, that if they adopt this very aggressive uh, cross-examination stance, that he would somehow crumble and break on the witness stand. Uh, maybe they felt that was their only chance. Very inappropriate. Uh, Wendy says, uh, prosecutor not only has no points to make, she's remade his points by giving him a second chance to provide his blow-by-blow -blow recounts of the events. Yeah, I don't think he hurt himself. It was like when Rittenhouse took the stand. You know, it's always a, a you're, you're always afraid as defense, it's going to be a shit show if your client takes the stand. Uh, and when they don't, you just feel so lucky that it didn't happen. Um, and I'm sure that's what the defense feels here. I don't think this guy hurt himself at all. No, not really. Uh, Brett asks, quote, I guess this is Prosecutor Blueberry talking. Why did you not self-incriminate yourself without a lawyer? <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, let's see. Uh, Jim, the moron, the prosecutor, I guess, thinks the jury is too stupid to realize he had not identified it as a can of mace when he was being struck, just as an object he was being struck with. Uh, Kansaki asks, Andrew, do you think having a jury instruction of, of, if you acquit the defendant, do you find the prosecution was malicious? Well, that that's not a thing. Uh, there is one state, one state, Washington state, where they actually have a special jury instruction and a special verdict form in self-defense cases where they ask the jurors, if you acquit on the grounds of self-defense, do you also find that the prosecution failed to disprove self-defense by even a preponderance of the evidence? And if the jury affirms that verdict form says the prosecution failed to hit even 51 percent, that defendant is entitled to reimbursement for their legal expenses from the state. Nice. So that's kind of a, a, a light version of what I've proposed is that the Kyle's law it should be should be everywhere. The train's coming through, folks. That's a, Sorry. That's a good step, though, don't you think? That's a really good step. Yeah, I think I, it's I good like because the, the only thing my 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 version of Kyle's law took it further because I would have held the prosecutor personally responsible for half that legal expense. So they they have some actual skin in the game. That's the only way you stop this kind of bullshit. They, they have to be held accountable and the system doesn't hold them accountable. So if the system's not going to do it, in my mind, the next best way to do it is to have a cause of action for the defendant himself against the prosecutor personally. And all a prosecutor has to do to avoid liability is not bring these fucking cases unless they have a preponderance of the evidence, which is far less than what they would need for a conviction. Oh, is that, am I freaking out the maid? Sorry. Okay. Uh, let's see. Jim, if I was the judge, I would have already instructed the prosecutor to stop approaching the witness. Uh, I probably would have too, uh, but it's up to the judge. Jim, any woman yeah. on the jury would who would like to be questioned by Binger B. Okay, I'm not going to say B. Steve, Steve did you uh, ever Kyle see the movie Paul? Paper Chase? I have, B? sure, of course. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sure. yeah, so I'm just thinking about what happened when the law students in that movie, they went to the hotel room to study, and then the uh, maid overheard them. You remember oh, yeah. that? <laughs> Alex says, uh, not all pepper spray will work upside down 100%. His testimony about feeling cold on his face could be caused by propellant from an upside down can. The propellant will still carry some chemical to cause irritation. That's an interesting angle. I wonder if they're, the defense use of force expert will talk about that. We've all had things like spray cans, right? Where you try to, you're spray painting something and you tilt the can upside down and it doesn't work right anymore. Uh, let's see. 
I don't know what's happening in my video here. You look at us. I don't know. Well, um, one thing that I wanted to point out, too, is that the second edition of my book that's coming out, <laughs> I'm going to add in a chapter. I, I did not include it in the first edition because it's the um, I thought it was too Florida specific. But now that I'm seeing these prosecutors here <laughs> at work, I'm thinking it might not be. And one of them is remedies for bad prosecutorial misconduct in closing arguments. So it's and the, the article's actually available on SSRN and it's about it's about how a prosecutor should do a closing argument, how they get reversed on closing argument for bad behavior. And then I also the third part is proposing remedies for bad prosecutorial behavior in closing argument. Um, so I'm going to be adding that chapter in on my second edition, which I'm going to try to get to the printer at the end of next end of this week. Um, but anyway, so just but you can you can find that chapter. It's available on SSRN if you want to look it up called. Um, you got to make them pay for it, Steve. You got to make them pay. Oh, you don't okay. know how to grift, man. They got to pay for it. <laughs> well, uh, someone in the orders. comments that um, your website's not accepting any of their credit cards. Have, have you stopped taking orders because you're out of books or? I'm probably out of books. So okay. those are probably, so it's, I, I have an inventory and I ran, if I ran out of inventory, it's not going to sell. So mm -hmm. um, just wait, give me a week and I'll try to get the second edition printed. Okay. Fair but thank enough. you. Yeah. Here's the, I, here's the one, uh, here's one of it in my hand. See there? Ideas and answers in law. Ideas. Like see, it's got a little, I'm going to change the cover. One of your viewers volunteered to make, give me a really professional cover. Yeah, that's um, nice. Isn't that nice? We have Are a you going to leave it here. as a tip for the hotel? No, I don't think she wants my book. That's a collector's uh -huh. edition. Do you want my book? Do you want to get want to say hi to the law of self defense community online? No. Okay. <laughs> 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 uh, Northman says, uh, I know the prosecution doesn't have to work for the defense, but all the missing testing would seem appropriate to disprove the self-defense claim. I presume you mean the opposite of what you wrote. So all the, the failed testing, the failed testing is by the state. All, the presumption should be that if they fail to test or they fail to collect or capture or preserve evidence, that's presumed to be against the state's interest and in favor of the defense. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah. Oh, somebody writes for the last membership one I'll cover. Does anyone in the chat know if there's an app I can use for the law of self-defense membership chat chat? I don't have an app folks. It's, you gotta be on the webpage for law of self-defense members. All right. So that's all of those. Let me turn to the super chat and uh, see what we have. Let's see. Uh, five bucks and up, folks, as we said at the beginning. I think all you people are crazy. You're paying 10 and 20 bucks a pop for Super Chats for $10 a month. You'd be a Law Self-Defense member for the whole month, and you could. I'll answer all your questions. I'll read all your comments in the Law Self-Defense chat. I think you're crazy. You know, YouTube takes a third of that Super Chat money. You're paying YouTube for no good reason, and you're spending a lot more money than, than you need to spend. All right. Well, it's up to you guys, of course. Uh, all right, so Neo Neon, $5 Super Chat, thank you very much, says, uh, hey, Branka, wanted to say that after the painfully cringe Brooks trial, your stream is a breath of fresh air and sanity. Well, okay, yeah, it's a pretty low barrier to beat the Brooks trial. <laughs> so I appreciate and that. It, we have failed to meet the, even that threshold, I tell you what. Uh, Michael Hickson, $5, and a few people are doing this early on. Bologna, Bologna, Bong, $5. Kurt, they're letting me know that you're in the chat. Um, Flux, so like Ahmad Arbery grabbing that dude's gun. Uh, yeah, like Ahmad Arbery grabbing the guy's shotgun. Right. Um, 200 Wall Street, that's two bucks, man. It says good morning, but okay. Uh, Tank Rat, L uh, $10, thank you very much. LOL, Branca sounds like how I evaluated, evaluated judges for elections based on legal ability of their performance reports from lawyers. Not one judge got a vote for me under 91%. I'm not sure what that means, but okay. Uh, Sanir Chris, $10. Would it be possible to get closed captioning turned on? Yep, I did that. Thanks for bringing it to my attention. Uh, Ryan, $5, says, 
I had mentioned that you can get drunk driving because you're on a horse. You can get drunk driving for operating anything that's the vehicle that's transporting you in a public way, folks. Bicycles, too. Um, he asked, wouldn't it be an RUI riding under the influence? I, I guess so. Uh, um, riding mowers, any of this shit. If you're drunk and you're on the street, it's it's a DWI. Uh, Farmhand Tom, $10. There must be such a thing as a defense attorney over rehearsing their client. The balance of getting your client adequately prepared but not sounding scripted must be tricky. I mean, normally you're not worried about it because you're not putting your defendant on the stand, you know, so you're not really preparing them for anything. If you are preparing them, it's already, you're kind of a shit show situation. Uh, and uh, you got well, to, you have to. I think you always, yeah, I think you always have to prepare your client for testifying because you never know what's going on. Um, and I, I, I've got war stories here, but let's just say that I think that, that the, um, you really need to prepare your, your defendant to testify. You need to get them prepared to keep their cool in the face of hostile prosecutors. Questions. And then, um, and then, but, but the choice is made at the last minute. Usually you're coming in either with a plan that are definitely going to testify or definitely not going to testify. But then there's also that, like, you're going to see how things unfold and then you're going to make that call, but you're going to be prepared to make that call one way or the other, according to, but like in the public defender's office, do, do you always have the luxury, the, the the time with the client before you get to trial to to do that? Or would that only be with like the more serious felonies? Well, no, I think that, you know, we're pretty good now in our office. at least. It depends on jurisdiction. Some offices are way overworked. Um, we've got we're, we're overworked, but it's not ridiculous. I mean, when, when we're ready for trial, we're ready for trial. And we, we have a really good defense team. And so when we. um. When we go to trial, I mean, we're ready to go. I mean, our teams are generally good. So I, I, and I think that it, it, there is that danger about over rehearsal, though. But that goes for the state too, because the state rehearses their witnesses too. Right. So it's kind of it, it's it's um it is a fine balance. I mean, as a prosecutor, I used to kind of like to put people up really cold because I like to hear the initial reaction. I want to hear the truth. I'm not. I don't want to coach somebody and tell them what I want to say as a prosecutor. I want the truth from them. Right. So um, I would tell an answer directly and clearly, but I would I'd go out of my way not to just the prosecutor. But I know that's not the normal prosecutor way. And what we're seeing here is bad prosecution. But they but the, the witnesses have been terrible, not only on, across the board. These police officers have been terrible. I was going to ask Curtin, he just stepped off, if, um, if he's seen any of the police officer testimony, because they have been terrible. It's been horrific, especially the lead investigator. And when and when they when the when the prosecutor the question that that blew my head off was when the when the prosecutor asked, "Well, your your funding is really low, isn't it?" Like excusing all their bad behavior by saying you aren't getting paid enough, which right. that's so anti-professional. I've I've you know we have one of the poorest counties in Florida, in Putnam County here, and you they would just never ask that. They're professional regardless of what they're getting paid. You know, I would it's argue like you're a doctor. Right. What's that? Yeah, I would argue it's I would argue it's burden shifting. Yeah, it's very that was really uncalled for. I, that was a very surprising comment, that question. Because oh, because you're from small town America, you aren't gonna do your job well, you're not getting paid enough. I'm gonna okay. mail it in. I lowered the threshold legally required to convict someone of a crime. <laughs> that, I, that was a crazy have you ever heard a question like that done in an no, open no. court? No, but they 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 were so lacking. I mean, the, with no body cameras, no recording, no testing. They did so many things wrong. Um, uh, everything was bad. So of course, I mean, what I don't know. I mean, if you're the prosecutor and this is the case you're presented with, you got to be kind of pissed that this is what you're being handled this bucket of garbage. Uh, but it's not the fault of the defendant that the police department may be underfunded. <laughs> That's got nothing to do with whether or not they're guilty of a crime, which is the question that we're supposed to be answering here. So when, when we're thinking about putting a defendant up on the witness stand to testify on their own behalf, I always think of the risks as being like three particular risks that you incur doing that. One is, uh, you know, your defendant may be a shit bag and have a reputation that will be exposed now because they're on the witness stand that wouldn't have been exposed to the jury. The other is uh, that you, you never know what they're going to say. Uh, they may just blurt out something that can be incrim incriminating. Um, so they can kind of break down on the witness stand. And the third is the prosecutor 
is thinking, if they're doing it right, they're thinking they want that defendant to say very particular words that they can build into their closing statement, closing argument at the end of the trial. And they know the exact words they're looking for. And you'll see them ask basically the same question over and over and over again. We got a bad echo all of a sudden. Are you hearing that, Steve? Uh, no, I'll turn it down a little bit. Try now. Okay, that might be better. The third risk is that, that the prosecutor is fishing for particular words or phrases for the defendant to say. So they're closing. He can tell the jury, even the defendant himself told us this. And the defendant has no awareness of what those words or phrases might be that could be used against them in the closing argument. So even if your defendant is well-intentioned, uh, the prosecutor says, well, if I can lead him to say something in this particular way, and you know when that's happening, because you'll hear the prosecutor ask the question, not get the answer they want, ask a slight variation, not get the answer they want, just keep fishing for it until finally the defense objects and the uh, prosecution has to move on. Right. Well, you know, obviously, uh, obviously, the biggest factor is if your client has multiple felonies, prior felonies or crimes of dishonesty. So that that's a big factor. Um, and, and then, of course, you deal with different levels of sophistication of your client. So not everybody is good on their feet. I mean, you know, not every lawyers are masters with words and questioning and gotcha questions and testimony. Right. So but not everybody, everybody thinks is they are. good. Some people get, <laughs> well, they think some are and some are right. not. Um, but but the fact is, is that your clients are generally not used to the adversarial type of dialogue that lawyers kind of like. And so, like you say, I mean, they just get rattled. There's a whole lot of reasons why you not don't want to testify. I'll, as a defense attorney, I really like to have my client testify when I can. So um, if I can put them up there, if I, if I have confidence that they're well-spoken and likable, then I like to put them up there. But sometimes they're just not capable of adequately defending themselves. They don't, they don't understand, you know, they're simple or they, they don't hear correctly or they get agitated or there, there's so many reasons you wouldn't put them on the stand aside from just, you know, being impeached by prior record. So it's, um, it is a danger and you really just have to assess it. It's really case by case specific, client specific, fact specific. Um, because sometimes you open the door to things by your client and they admit to things. You're also a lot of times you're narrowing your defense to one particular defense. Like, you know, well, you'd admit this, you'd admit this, you admit this. So you're locking yourself into a story as opposed to the scattershot approach if they don't testify. But I, I tend to be one of the reasons I like my clients testifying is because I tend to zero in on an element and saying, here's what you need to pay attention to. All this other stuff's garbage. And so therefore, I like my client to testify because it's usually going to be consistent with what they're telling me, right? I'm going to follow my client's lead on what they're telling me. Okay, Kyle, $5. Thank you. Asks, uh, it's so hard to watch someone testify in their defense, watching them knowing that one wrong word can ruin their lives is anxiety inducing. It's a high stakes game, folks. You're a defendant in a murder trial. It doesn't get much bigger than that. Uh, Culliver, $5. How is my favorite Gandalf the lawyer? Ordered three books from you. I guess he means you, Steve. Ordered three books from you for me and the kids. Thanks for all that you do, buddy. Uh, her excellent, you, excellent cool. Steve. Ten dollars. More of this prosecution's poor conduct. At the uh, we got that echo back, Steve. I'm oh, sorry. It's okay. I, I'm just told in the chat that people can't hear me when the echo is playing over. Uh, more of this prosecution's poor conduct at the end of trial four on Law and Crimes Channel. You can hear the prosecutor respond. That's BS to the dismissal being granted on the uh, uh, concealing identity and, and uh, evidence tampering charges. Uh, Derna, 1804, $5. Thank you. Uh, quote, did you stop? Did that stop you from buying the land? Close quote. I still wanted the land. Sir, answer the question. <laughs> I know she just wanted yes or no's. Uh, Harry. Uh, dick shaft five dollars for the dick shaft the prosecution getting tips from daryl brooks these are the types of irrelevant questions he was asking uh michael hickson twenty dollars boom thank you very much michael for 10 bucks for 20 dollars, you could be a law self-defense member for two whole months buddy but thank you i appreciate the contribution uh, and i'm sure youtube appreciates their 30 percent share is anyone else sick and tired of prosecutors taking rando journalist reports as divine truth. They lie. They have to lie to get noticed. I've never seen any sort of obligation for truth on journalists. Yes, a journalist notes on something should be, you, the presumption should be they got it absolutely 100% backwards. Well, except the, 
the, the statements of the defendant was on a jail call. So the, the, this, any statements a defendant makes come in against them. So they're admissible as statements against interest. Against them. So if you yeah. are talking on a jail call, this is a good example, that's going to come in against you. Um, it's recorded. Now, getting the, you know, so that, that is, that's an issue. People need to be aware those, those phone calls are tapped. Yeah, everything's recorded. Uh, let's see. 200 Watt Studio, $5. Writes, Daryl Brooks needs to help the prosecution. He's a better lawyer than they are. Tank Rat, $5. This is Binger, level of stupidity. Jeff K, $10. Objection, improv. <laughs> uh, Michael Hickson. The prosecutor is a real big fan of She-Hulk. Looks that way. Ian Calhoun, five Canadian dollars. I don't know what that's worth in U.S. money, but thank you. This is Kurt losing his mind. Yeah, Kurt was losing his mind during that uh, the skit show. Uh, five dollars from Her Excellency. Kind of weird that you think this guy is a murderer, but are completely comfortable with him pointing a gun at you while you antagonize him. Indeed. Uh, Derna 1804, five dollars. Plot twist. He had a dummy gun at the scene and killed the decedent through the power of suggestion. Okay. Michael Hickson, $5. When she grabbed his assault stick, I heard bow, chicka, bow, bow. It was magical. It was professional. Thank you, HR, for teaching me drama today. News Now Wyoming, $5. I still can't get over. He racked the gun and pointed it at the prosecutor. How many defendants would like to do that? It, it was weird. Um, Jade Phoenix 07, $5. It's the Rakita simp. I don't know. Oh, that must be Kurt. Uh, news from Wyoming, $5. Is there any way you can download Chrome Volume Extender to give the trial stream a little more volume? You you all are over three times. Folks, when they step away from the microphone in the courtroom, there's nothing I can do. I, I have the uh, audio, uh, whatever it's called, plug-in thing. I can boost it up to 600, 100%, but if they're talking 10 feet away from their microphone, it doesn't help all that much. And then when someone doesn't suddenly does speak in the microphone, it blows out everybody's ears. But I'm doing the best I can. You know, actually... <laughs> On that point, you know, somebody maybe you just asked this and I, now it just rang a bell. We just had um, I'm surprised that the judge isn't more on top of that, of them speaking the microphones at the podium, because I know that in our jurisdiction, all the court reporting is now done remotely. And it's basic. And so now we are being trained. We just had a class that we had to talk about talking into the microphones and that the judges are being aware that everything's being on because you've got a live court reporter taking it down, then the record is clear. But if the court reporter, if we're having trouble with the audio, the court reporters who are transcribing that remotely will also have trouble. And that can result in incomplete records. Right. Yep. Uh, let's see. Uh, Steve C, $20. Thank you. Thank you, Steve C. That's very kind of you. Writes, why do you think the state takes on such horrible cases? They have little or no evidence, political pressure. I presume it's political pressure. Yeah, the, 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 whoever is the ADA, or rather the DA or whatever title they have in that jurisdiction, the head, the elected prosecutor, uh, sees some political capital to gain over bringing this prosecution. Steve said it out earlier. It's a, a well-liked Hispanic member of the community, been there forever. People like him. He gets shot dead by some carpetbagger who's came in. Uh, using a, an evil AR rifle and, a, you know, and New Mexico is a pretty liberal state. I guess they just decided, you know, if there's sufficient political capital to gain and the political capital gain is free to the prosecutor, it doesn't cost the prosecutor anything to do that. Um, then what you're really doing in the prosecution is not seeking a conviction. You're, you're just going through the motions to gain the political capital. It, it becomes, if you're politically motivated as a prosecutor, it becomes a no-lose situation. Either you get the guilty verdict and you can tell everybody you were right all along, even though there's guilty verdicts that are just random chance in the noise of, of the criminal justice system, or it results in an acquittal and you've technically lost the legal fight, but you still got the value of the political capital gain. You fought the good fight for your community. So it's, it, there's no lose. That's why I feel something has to be done to hold prosecutors personally accountable for, for doing this. Otherwise, there's zero incentive for them not to drag people. I mean, they kept this guy in jail for two and a half effing years. And he could still get convicted. 
Uh, let's see. News Now Wyoming. Five dollars says he spent over a year in a mental institute and spent that time incompetent to stay in trial. He's doing an amazing job holding up. OK. Um, Michael Hickson, five dollars. Uh, Branka, these kinds of Sheila's sleep real well at night. Alone with the cats after two bottles of wine and watching the view. It could be. I don't want to know her personal life. Uh, Wildland76, $10. Thank you very much. The state tests this man to hold a real rifle in Oh, trust this man to hold a real rifle in court. I didn't see them wearing gloves when handling the rifle. Yeah, I'm, I, I guess you don't have to. Personally, I would, I would not want to touch any evidence from any crime scene without gloves on. Uh, it's gross. Uh, and I can't say that I've ever seen in any criminal trial a defendant handling the weapon. Yeah, it's crazy. I, that is, even in, be, in Red like, House, they didn't do that. That this, this was this was off the charts crazy. That that move, I think that was a hail mary pass, trying to put the gun in his hand and making him look like the scary guy with the AR, and just you know that was that was a nuts move. I mean, have you ever, uh, Kurt? Have you ever seen a defendant handling the weapon in court? Not to this, not to this extent, no. But put, putting the putting the weapon in the defendant's hand is a classic prosecutor's trick. But I've never seen anything like this with Skid Hour, where we're going down into the well. Like when you see this, you you're hoping for like five, three seconds with the with the guy touching it, so you can just kind of point and. But this is like Skid Hour with like props and sticks Ra and I don't even know what's going on. This is <laughs> this is a whole new world of stupid. Uh, Bally, five British pounds. Why no bail? Two and a half years held in self-defense case seems ludicrous. Well, there's a couple things. One is, I guess, there was a competency issue that would have held things up. Um, also, it's a murder case. And he's from out of, out of the area. So there could be flight concerns. He's from Alaska. He could disappear into the wilderness. I mean, who knows what argument the state made against bail. Uh, but, I mean, is, is bail common in, you know, second-degree murder cases in Florida, Steve? No, there's there's certain charges that are there's no bail allowed. So if you have a first degree murder firearm charge, then then um, that doesn't that doesn't necessarily require bail for that. Now, there, there's exception. There's lots of exceptions. You can get into these things, but it's the severity of the charge. There was one somebody was asking about speedy trial, too. And I wanted to address that when you get a chance. Sure. No, we can do that now. Oh, well, well, people were asking, you know, the speedy trial. And this is two and a half years. And uh, people really misunderstand is a lot of our rights have been watered down by the courts over time to the point that we don't have very few rights do we really have. Speedy trial is, is delusional when people think that they have it. OK, all speedy trial can do is give the defense the ability to force a trial. That is it. I, I mean, the, the number of cases that actually get dismissed because the state has failed to bring them to trial in a, in a requisite time are so small. They do exist, but those are extremely small. What speedy trial really does is it's a tool for the defense to force a trial to happen. So, for example, you've got a busy trial docket. You've got a person held in custody on a third-degree felony, and he's been in there for eight months, and you've got a good case, but your case is going to be tried for another year because it's, the docket's so clogged up. So what you do is you demand speedy trial so that you can get it to trial, so that you can get it resolved and get your client out of jail, um, or at least one way or the other resolved. That's all it is. People, uh, but all our, believe me, everybody in jail thinks they should demand speedy trial when, and they're, they're going to somehow they're going to win and, and the state's going to have to drop it. That, that's not what happens. There's so many ways out, catch outs for the state to get out of getting, bringing you to trial. It can only force a trial, does not force the state to drop the case. So and of right. course, sometimes so a speedy it. trial, sometimes a speedy trial is not actually in the defendant's interest especially if they're not in jail, if they're out on bail. Well, usually, and the way it should happen, the state should have, they should be ready to try the case when they file the information. So when they when the information's filed, the state's ready to go. The defense needs to get their experts time. They need to do the depositions. They need to see if there's holes. Or they got to explore for witnesses. So the defense is usually the one asking for time. And when you ask for time, you're waiving your speedy trial rights. You can right. re-invoke that by demanding speedy trial, but then that just forces a trial. And like I said, that state gets multiple attempts at that. So all it really is is a tool for the, the defense to be able to force the state to try the case in front of a jury. 
Yeah. So in this particular case, they had charged this guy with murder six days after the event. And they went to the grand jury and got an indictment before they even had the forensics results back from the lab. So they were making representations to the grand jury like, well, we expect the lab results to you know, affirm our narrative of guilt in this. They didn't even have the results to share with the grand jury. They're, they're just making representations. Got it. A lot of representation based on evidence that, we might have in the future. That never happened. Yeah. And a lot of that evidence never actually appeared because it turned out the testing was never done. What, what so evidence? Were they were lying what? to the grand jury about the testing being done? For example, they, they, the lead investigator told the grand jury that he was having a trajectory analysis done of the bullet holes and the cases and that were ejected and all this kind of stuff, and that he expected that would be consistent with the guilt of the defendant here. That, that trajectory analysis was never done, ever. Dude, that's not cool. So that's how, you know, yep. But not only not only was the trajectory analysis not done, from what I hear from the defense opening statements, is that the, those trajectories are consistent with a struggle for the gun, and the yes. defense is going to bring in their expert that's going to do trajectory right. analysis that will be consistent with the defense theory. Correct. Which yep. it should I, have been I, obvious I, to any investigator. If you've got bullet holes in the floor and the roof and this way, that is consistent with a struggle. If this was an assassination, like the state is saying, that would be a targeted shooting, an unsuspected type shooting, right? Boom. It, you wouldn't have shots all, all different ways. Right. In the chest, in the back. And, you know, I don't know what they're thinking is like he, he killed him on purpose and then he shot a bunch of rounds to fake the scene or something. I, I don't know. But listen, if he just wanted to kill this guy, they're in the middle of nowhere. Just kill him. And dig a hole and dump them in the hole. And you're in the middle of the New Mexico desert. No one's ever going to find that person. Well, the other little bit of evidence. That's not the, the argument that the defense is, would want to make, I guess. <laughs> if I had done it, right? The, the, scope, the, the scope cap evidence, Andrew. Tell them yeah. about the you, Kurt, I don't know. Did you watch? How many of the cops did you watch, Kurt? Uh, I've only watched it intermittently because but what everything I've seen has been stupid. Yeah, so the he had a flip up. So you watched the whole thing. <laughs> He had a flip up cover on the front of the scope that he had just mounted and it was kind of loose. I guess it didn't fit quite right. So he put electrical tape on it to help hold it in place. And that cover, uh, first of all, it, it's two pieces, right? It's, it's a ring and then the flip up is hinged on the front. Uh, the cover uh, came off the gun, even though it was electrical taped onto the front of the scope. It came off and it was found under the body of the victim in two separate pieces. Uh, so that would take a lot of foresight to say, you know what, not only am I going to murder this guy, but then I'm going to rip the, the flip cover off the front of the scope, break it in two and slide it under in the pool of blood under his body. Yeah, doesn't seem likely. Uh, yeah. All right. Uh, let's see. STFU FFS five dollars. Just got a couple more here. Uh, but the soft cover, the soft cover, the soft cover is so portable and convenient. You know, it's also portable and convenient. The uh, the Kindle version is really light inconvenient to carry uh also the audible version doesn't weigh anything i had to read the damn book into a microphone folks you might consider that option as well again free book law self-defense.com slash free book or the hardcover law self-defense.com slash get hard all right last two tank rat the front door issue is moot because which hand should he have used to open it the one securing the gun or the hand he was using to defend himself yep uh uh, that was Tank Rat. Thank you very much. And uh, that's it. I think I'm all caught up on the Super Chats. Hey, can I leave you guys to chat for a second? I got to hit the head again. Sure. All right. Hey, Kurt, what, what do you, you know, something I've been, I've been actually watched a couple of your videos on some of the cases you did. You did the Apprendi case. And mm -hmm. uh, your analysis of these cases, I love it because it's thorough. Um, and so tell me about, um, tell me about like, is this a part of your regular show that you do these in-depth analysis of cases? Oh, yeah, all the time. It's probably what I'm most known for is the in-depth analysis. I've been trying to shift a little bit more into stuff that's more pop and a little bit more current news stuff. But the the history of my channel is built on in-depth, in-depth, deep dive analysis of courts of appeal and U.S. Supreme Court cases because, I, you know, I think it's fascinating. Yeah, no, it's it was that was a really good because people don't know Apprendi. I mean, it's amazing how um, how important that that. Or I mean, say Apprendi. Yeah, Apprendi is the one. Did you do Apprendi? Because I I, thought, I was thinking Anders. You did Anders recently. Have you done the Anders. Apprendi case? I've not done Apprendi. Yeah. 
you should do Apprendi. That, I think that's one of the best Supreme Court decisions, one of the most rational and clear and helpful des- decisions that we've had. That's the one that decides basically uh, when the, when the, fact, the jury is the fact finder and the judge is the lawgiver and the distinction. So any, any fact that enhances the sentence must be found by the jury. So this is when you get jury interrogatories about firearm discharge, use. Those are facts that enhance the sentencing. And uh, Apprendi is a really, and there's a, Brett Blakely is the follow on case that talks about it. But those, though, that line of cases, um, I'd love to hear your, your in depth analysis on it. It's one that most people aren't aware of. And the Supreme Court is so screwy. Their, their case, they, they usually screw things up when they do it. But this one is a very rational and helpful and useful, practical kind of decision that we do all the time in the public defender's office to clarify these things. So um, I would just, I'm just, I'm of a fan, so I'm recommending a case I'd like to see you do. Yeah. And Crawford as well for confrontation clause? Crawford's for confrontation, but Apprendi is, uh, Crawford has to do with confronting witnesses. Apprendi Blakely is the follow on case, is the um, the jury is the fact finder case. Um, so mm-hmm. we, we get this a lot when the judge is making factual determinations that enhance, that, that aren't in the jury verdict form. So um, I, I've got lots of little ticky tacky issues that I argue on appeal that are always based on Apprendi saying that the judge is making this factual finding and that's a jury function, not a judge function. Um, mm-hmm. So, I, I, you know, it's, it's if you haven't looked at, I know you do more than criminal law though, right? You do a lot of civil stuff. Right? I, I do everything. I do everything because I, I like it all. I like everything and I want to learn everything. I mean, I like, I like every, I like the legal issues because you're playing with, doctrines usually at really sophisticated levels of analysis with competing principles and trying to figure out like what the right result is so i think it's all interesting so i'll cover any topic that looks interesting basically right well you know, I'm why, focused not, why not learn it all learn it all but no but i would just recommend that Prendy Prendy decision and the blakely decision because um it's it's one that most people aren't aware of and it a, has a big impact on the practice of at least appellate criminal law. But um, I know you have a broad scope, and so you're not just focused on criminal. But uh, I, that's one that I'm a big fan of that case. So many cases are so bad. You read these, these criminal cases and the, from the Supreme Court, and you're like, what are you doing? <laughs> but, uh, but this one here, I think, I think it's actually a Scalia decision, too, which is interesting. Yeah. Andrew's back. Oh, and also, if my books are sold out, you can go to crimelaw.net, which is wherever here, and you can donate if you like me. <laughs> <laughs> I have gotten a couple donations. It's kind of cool. That's a good idea, folks. Well, I'll tell you what. I'll, I'll even do you one better. Uh, how about this? How about next time you're uh, at your studio or something, why don't you come on and we'll cover it together? Oh, that's that's a nice offer. Thank you. Um, well, we, let can me even, get... we can even do a Supreme, We can even do the historical Supreme Court react. You know, okay. sometimes well, I do all the historical let's do that, let's plan it, but it'll probably be audio a... in Apprendi well one of, the reasons I'm, one of the reasons I'm thinking about it is because I'm working well I'm previewing the class I'm working on uh, Andrew's self defense class right and, uh, or his, uh, his criminal law class and one of the assignments that I'm going to give my class, it's the homework for this Wednesday is to read Apprendi if we get to it, is to read Apprendi and we're going to be talking about it going into the death penalty because the end module is going to be on the death penalty. And Apprendi is a big part of the death penalty. A lot of the problems with the present death penalty as it constituted in Florida, because right now the jury just says they just check a box and say death or not death. But it has to be based on beyond a reasonable doubt aggravators and mitigators. And those aggravators and mitigators are not individually voted on. And so Apprendi says that the jury must find, as a matter of fact, those enhancements beyond a reasonable doubt. And there's no unanimous jury polling, you no know, unanimous jury polling. So th- there's a problem with Florida's death penalty legislation based on Apprendi, but that's, that's one of the things we're leading towards. That's one of the reasons I'm, I'm spoiling your class a little bit, Andrew. But I don't think that's quite what Apprendi uh, had in mind, uh, unless I forgot what Apprendi is, because Apprendi was about the judge finding factors that weren't provided for a trial. So you would get to the, you would have the guilt phase and I, I don't be a, I believe Apprendi was a death penalty case, was it? No, it's not. It's not. But what yeah, it does stand so. for, it stands, it stands you, for... Um, because what you used to have is that the judge would find certain aggravating factors at, at, during right. the sentencing phase that were presented at trial. 
by preponderance right. of the evidence. And so the judge right. would say, like, okay, I find this additional fact, and therefore your sentence instead of five years is 10 years. And Apprendi said, no, you can't right. do that. If it's a finding of fact, the jury has to do the finding of fact. Right. And so you have to find it right. beyond, a, beyond a reasonable doubt. So but that but would apply to what you're talking about in Florida is not that the evidence isn't presented to the jury, but they're not asked about it separately. But right. that's not quite what Apprendi seemed to be talking about. But imagine, well, imagine it, it, you it, the death penalty. There were two aggravating factors cited by the prosecution, right? So let's, I'll make them up, but let's pretend one is the person you killed was a police officer. The other one is it was exceptionally cruel uh, use of force. Half the jury might have believed one of those and half the jury the other, but you never had a uni unanimity of the jury on either one of those. In that case, the death penalty should not apply because they should be unanimous on one of those aggravating factors before you get to the death penalty. Exactly. Perfect. Exactly. I'm right. thinking, and and that's the problem because there's because they're finding a there there's there's a factual finding that is not specifically asked the jury, you see, so that the jury should be asked by interrogatory for each aggravating factor that they find um, beyond a reasonable doubt, and they have to agree with that unanimously. Um, that that is exactly the Andrew said it perfectly. Better generally, than I generally, the death penalty is a result of some aggravation. It was a, a kidnapping was involved. The cop was killed. There, there's something above and beyond a, a typical, you know, cold-blooded murder. Right. All right, let me get a couple right. more stats. Uh, a, a few came in as I was uh, out out in the uh, out in the restroom. Uh, J875 says this is happening in Berna, Lilo, New Mexico, just north of Albuquerque. Everyone there is related. So it might be this guy who the victim here had a lot of family, friend, certainly friends. Uh, but maybe a lot of family in the community as well. They all vote, right? They want justice. The family always wants justice. Um, here's one. It's only $2, so normally I wouldn't read it, but it's for Steve. Uh, Steve, uh, for first edition buyers of your book, can you email us the new chapter that's going to be in the second edition of the book? Well, that's Something to idea. think about. I should do that. That's a good suggestion. I probably can. I'll have to get my wife on it. See, I'm in Arizona right now. I'm um, Kate, my wife. For uh, our anniversary. Cents, you, do, you do the serial style, like Reader Digest, right? You're at least a mm -hmm. chapter at a time, old school, old school. And you have to pay for each oh. chapter of the book. He's I'm kind learning. of done I'm, that. I'm still he, a... he was making them all available for free as academic publications. There are things in this book that are not available right now. I had somebody question me about it. A book, for example, the cost of incarceration chapter. A couple other, my book suggestions, there's two other chapters interacting with police and and one other one. So there's at least three chapters in the book that you can't get ex exclusive only to the book. You know, one 900 number, I can call and have a book read to me for two ninety nine a minute. Uh. <laughs> and that would be great. You should do that, Steve. You got to do the audible version. Are you going to do a Kindle version? No? No, I'm not. I'm just, this is just a sideline. <laughs> <laughs> you never know what it could turn into my friend uh, all right news now Wyoming. i know i know well thank you andrew's the wife what for andrew i would have done it kurt do you have a book i do not have a book no i don't know what, what to do write you sell about. sell i How sell i sell my knowledge and insight for subscriptions and super chats okay well we'll class, do something in, in a couple weeks on the Prendy, maybe. So news now, Wyoming. Everything I know about constitutional law of the book. That'll be good. Uh. <laughs> All right, he writes, in two months, second-degree murder will allow no cash bail in Illinois. I guess with that new law. I think that, that was quite right. I, I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's not quite right, but yeah. Mikey Mike, $10 Super Chat. Thank you very much. Didn't even ask a question or leave a comment. Just wanted to donate $10. That's much appreciated. All right, so, well, now we're just waiting. we got a few more minutes, I think, one or two minutes probably for the court to come back into session, unless they're having arguments <laughs> between the parties before they come back in. Wouldn't be the first time so far this trial that's been happening, although previous times they did do it on camera, which is always appreciated. Uh, the, the, uh, the poll, the poll, I never closed. Uh, it's now it's 88% not guilty, 9% undecided. So that adds up to 97% not guilty. 3% is saying guilty, I think, just because they want attention. So you got your attention, folks. 
And that's the end of that poll. This should have been the last opportunity for the state to hope for anything like a conviction on the merits, their cross-examination of the defendant. Things can only get worse from here, I would think. Um, that said, there's always that noise in the system, possibility of a guilty verdict. We don't know what the jury's like, obviously. Um, and uh, especially if, uh, you know, it, it strikes me as the kind of community setting where you might end up with a biased jury. Uh, we'll have to see what happens. What do you think about the prosecutor being surprised and shocked at the dismissal of those two charges? I mean, what world are they on? It was just insane, especially the tampering with evidence charge, because it's it's broken circular logic. It's like, all right, you're, you're saying that the defense is lying about being maced. If it was if there was no mace, what evidence was he washing out of his clothes? I mean, then there was no evidence to be washed out of the clothes or washed off his face. So it just doesn't make any sense. Either you have to decide he was maced and therefore he was tampering with evidence or he wasn't maced and there was no evidence to tamper with. It's ridiculous. And the guy clearly identified himself when he called 911 with his name and his phone number, identifying information. Uh, the, the fact that later on in a different discussion with a different officer, he was disinclined to be as open in communication. That, that's not a failure to identify yourself if you've already identified yourself to the police. Did we lose you, Steve? I've lost Steve a little bit, but yeah, that's okay. Froze. I'm still here, Andrew. So all right. all's right with the world. <laughs> Indeed. All right, Steve, we'll come back in if you can. You still have the guest link. I think Steve's actually on, like on his phone. Um, that's why it's uh, we're having some echo issues and things along those lines. It doesn't have on a laptop. It shouldn't matter. I don't think on StreamYard. I would hope they have echo cancel cancellation, but perhaps not yeah maybe they maybe he's overstayed his hotel room stay and they cut off his internet nice. <laughs> i've had that happen last thing cleaned out of the room was steve himself <laughs> that made it sir oh man see the maid come up behind him and put him in a chokehold you gotta go sir we have new guests coming in <laughs> you gotta go all right. Well, I'm going to uh, I'm going to uh, just remove Steve until he comes back in. If I, I can see the little thumbnail on my end, if he starts moving again, I'll bring him back in. Cool. Sorry, Steve. It's always great to have you on. It's uh, he's been a, a gr enormous value add to uh, the law self defense community. And Steve just dropped that himself, so maybe he'll try to reconnect. All right. Well, this should have been a high water mark for the state, and it's a pretty fucking low high water mark. Uh, they are they are deep deep underwater. Uh, and I think things are going to go even worse for them now. I think we're going to see a pile on now by the defense witnesses, especially their experts. And and the court is coming back. Something's yeah. happening. I still can't get over reenactment hour. I'm looking forward to watching back my own reactions at some point in this stream because I still can't get over. Let's do dramatic reenactment hour with skits like we're mad TV or some. I don't even know. Let's see. All right. Well, it's just on the flagpole at the moment. So I've got it in readiness for when they actually come back. Uh, malicious prosecution. I don't know if it's personal enough to be malicious. I think it's just stupid. I think it's just political. Yeah. The defense did finally call the state out and referring to the rifle as an AR-15 over and over again. That was nice. And the state was like, well, whatever, whatever. Well, if it didn't matter, you wouldn't be doing it. Yeah. Okay, the judge, now they're on the judge's seat, but he's not there. He's been pretty good so far. I got no complaints about the judge, and we've certainly seen some terrible judges in some of these trials. Sometimes those judges just completely lose control of their courtroom. And that's always bad because lawyers who see that, that's like blood in the water. And uh, certainly for me, if I see a weak judge, I'm going to take advantage at every opportunity. And of course, the other party will as well. And then it just becomes a circus. But I haven't seen much of that here. I haven't seen really any of it. I mean, I should say everything obviously went off the rails. I hear Steve. Steve is back. Hey, Steve, they give you a new room? <laughs> What's is that? the bed made? Is the bed made now? It is. Look. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, this is very, um, this is, I'm 
trying. So we'll see. Yeah, my books are sold out, by the way. It'll be at least next week before I can get it. And it will only be, it'll be the second edition, hopefully with a new cover and a new chapter. I've got it done. I just have to uh, send it to the printer and get new at ISBN number and all that stuff. But uh, so now, so you can still uh, now donate, you can... but this is my Rumble channel. The Rumble. What's the Rumble channel? Yeah. Crime Law. I've got Steve... Crime Law with Stephen Ngozi is my Rumble channel. Okay, good. Good to know. And now you can characterize yourself as a sold out author. Hmm. <laughs> well, I don't want. I don't want. To, I don't order too many books because I always feel like everybody. That's going to be like my last book, and I'm going to have a big pile of books that I'm going to sit on, and nobody's going to want them. You know, so I order them a little bit at a time. You know, but yeah. Well. Yeah, I mean, of course, you never know how things are going to develop. That that that's that's how I used to be with our book. I'd be like, "What? I got to order how many next time? What are you talking about? We'll never sell them. <laughs> we'll never get rid of those books." And every time we order like another fifty percent more, and now the orders are in the. Th I remember when I first started Law of Self Defense, I had to go back into the post office to renew my post office box, and they were like, "You want to do it for three months again, or you want to go for a whole year?" And I was like. I'll go for the whole year. <laughs> and that's how confident I was. I could survive a whole year. That was Jesus, 15, 20 years ago. Nice. Yeah, the, the, the we have a really nice postal people at our post office. And uh, and my wife actually sold the post office person one of our books. <laughs> and they were like, and they were saying, We've never had anybody sell books. I mean, this is like we've never seen so many books being sold. What are you doing? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> But it's not like a whole lot. I think I've made like eight hundred dollars or so. But you know, it's better than losing money. It's found money, found money. If yeah. you found a paper bag with eight hundred bucks in it, you'd be pretty happy about that. Yeah, you know what? I mean, actually, I was I'm probably going to gonna a do paper it. Paper bag with a Powerball ticket in it right about now. Hey, has anybody won the Powerball? No, they didn't win it last time. So now it's up to oh one point nine billion. Someone in the chat is saying that Ms. Attorney Blueberry is the 13th district's lead attorney, lead prosecutor. She even has it on her work photo. Okay, well. Well, that's great. a hell of a district. That was not an impressive performance. Where is the defense attorney from? They said they're from Albuquerque, right? They're from Albuquerque, right? I believe the law office is Nicole Moss, which is the shorter of the two defense attorneys. And the other woman is uh, Carrie Morrison, and she's from that office as well, the same office. But uh, yeah, I've liked them. They've done a good job, I thought. Um, I really enjoy watching Carrie Morrison because she's just a, a Morrison, I guess. She's just a pit bull. Um, she's, she's quite aggressive and uh, zealous in advocacy for her uh, for her clients, which is, of course, from my perspective, an enormous strength. Yeah, you know, we got for this, this, these three people here, I think we're all in the top 1% of disagreeable people. And it's, it's kind of interesting that we're all agreeing on this, this, uh, this case. <laughs> That's why I was laughing when Kirk first came on, he's, he was picking, he's like, well, I, you know, I think they should establish that narrative. And then, and then as soon as they, the, the, the state starts, I mean, he's like, what's going on? What's going on? That was the transition. He, they sold you the other way, right? right. I, don't, I, don't, I don't really see it as a transition. For me, it's consistent. It's like, in both cases, I'm just pointing to the weaknesses. It's like, okay, here's where some elements where the, the defense is weak. And then, okay, let's see if the prosecution's weak. Yeah. Well, in fact, people don't understand that a good attorney, your job is to be objective and to look at things and to look at weaknesses and strengths, even when, you know, if you've got 90 percent strength, you're still going to say, well, but what's the 10 percent weakness here? And so what you're doing is just basically cold, rational legal analysis. So um, yeah. you're not voting for guilt or anything, but people want to say, well, he's against the defense, right? No, uh, and I tried to make that point clear that. even at that point. I didn't try to make that clear. It's like, I'm not saying guilty. Even then I was saying not guilty. I'm just like, okay, here's some elements that are weak. Here's some points that could be flushed but out people better. people hear that oftentimes. And they, they, they misperceive when you're right. saying those things, when in fact what you're doing is you're pointing out strengths and weaknesses in an argument, which is a lawyerly kind of analytical way to go about things. So. Um, and that's what I'm, you want. I'm, I mean, you don't want somebody in my time. who's so bought into their story that they're selling themselves. Yeah. They get emotionally invested in in the in their preferred narrative, and that's, I mean, 
that's normal for normal people to do, but that's not, that's not being a lawyer. That's not being a critical thinker. Well, and I'm wondering yeah. if the state isn't, hasn't done that. If the state sits around and says, oh, AR guy, and they sold, bought themselves into a story and no, they have nobody in their office to push back. Maybe I, I the way yeah. I see this, it, it, it just, it, when I, my intuition tells me that this is a, an elected official decision making this state team go forward. And now they've got to figure out a way to win it. And they're playing a I mean, little dirty. Only, they're cheating a little bit. There's only two possibilities, right? They know the case is bullshit and they're trying it anyway. Or they or they 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 can tell the prosecution can tell their own case is bullshit, in which case they're terrible yeah. lawyers. I mean, you've always got to be trying to figure out the weaknesses in your other ca in your case because the other guys sure are going to try to. That's the point of and attack. You may not you be able to. You may not be able to think of everything and see every blind spot, but like you got to try at least a little bit and try to anticipate some things and be like, okay, if I were the other side, how would I attack my own case? Well, so and, where and am I that's weak? why I would say my intuition was telling me this was an elected official saying, but when the when the the comments that they were saying that they said, oh, that was BS that our, those charges got dismissed. To me, then it's like they're being delusional. These trial attorneys are not assessing their case properly because they should damn well know that those charges are going to go away, that they're shocked or that they're angry or surprised to me is that they don't have a good perception of their case. Yeah. Yeah. It certainly, certainly doesn't seem like it on, on any of this, frankly. I mean, it, and you know, I'm not saying like, I'm not saying even of course that my reactions are typical or normal or whatever. I'm like, all, all I'm trying to say is these are my genuine reactions. And you know, to the extent that they differ from members of the chat or whatever, it's like, well, there there's presumably other people out there that think like me, at least to some degree, and perhaps some other people are perceiving these issues or perhaps not. That's why we have jurors of 12 people. And so if I can bring some perspective that's different, then, you know, at least but you're I'm also looking at doing it very, something very analytically. about you. Yeah, you're looking at it to. very analytically and you're trying to assess these things. And, and that's the value. You know, if you're blinded by your preconceived notions, which is very easy to do, then, then you, you know, then you're not, you're going to have blind spots. You're going to, you're going to lose on that weak part. Somebody's going to see it and they're going to attack on that area. And so that's what, I mean, the point that you made up with, which I think was a good valid point. I remember when I was watching, which was that um, that they had not established the lead up narrative to before the attack. That how it kind of transitioned from the meeting and the surprise into the physical confrontation. That they hadn't really fleshed that out. Just like Andrew had said in the opening statements, they didn't really hammer on the reasonable doubt standard like they should have. Those are mild criticisms, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, but I think mm -hmm. legitimate criticisms although we are all kind of on the same page about where the case is. Yeah. And then it's just clown world when the prosecutor gets up. So finding their flaws is, well, well that's just, basically just pointing in the general direction of everything. So, yeah. Um, I'd be interested in the competency things. We're not going to learn about that, but he seemed very together on the stand. I'm surprised that he had a competency issue. He doesn't come across that way at all. In stand. I've dealt with incompetent clients. Right. It's um, not this guy. You know, it may have been a, a temporary thing too. You don't know. Yeah. Well, they were talking about it for uh, my sense from the media reports is he was having mental issues long before this event ever occurred. I, th that was happening over a period of years. It was, the articles I saw were things like the, the final descent of world-class skier, Dean Cummings, you know, uh, like outdoor magazine articles, that kind of thing, where they were interviewing his friends who were recounting weird stories about him. Uh, because I guess in his day, he was a famous skier. I don't follow skiing, so I don't know. But that's obviously he was whatever he said he was, uh, U.S. ski team or whatever. Um, so articles were being written about him and his, and his apparent mental downfall. Uh, but yeah, he certainly presented fine on the witness stand. Well, and, so, and the thing is, is that in, in competency, we deal with competency a lot, too, in public defender's office. And and what happens when you like a lot of times your client is clearly there's a problem, you know. And so you you file in a, what's called a suggestion of incompetency with the court. And so once you use a sworn statement that says I, as a public defender or as an attorney, believe that my client is unable to assist me in the defense or has competence issues. 
then the court must order a competency evaluations and resolve that issue before proceeding. So if the, if the doctor comes back and says, yes, we agree the person's incompetent, then they go off to the mental hospital until they are restored to competency. So that's probably what happened here. That was probably a year delay. They said, oh, yes, he does have competency problems. He was said that he was restored to competency. Although usually when they're restored to competency, all they are done, all they've done is train them to answer questions in a certain yeah. way. They have not actually done anything helpful to help their mental state. So the person says, this is the judge and they're made law. This is the prosecutor. They're out to get you. And they identify the people properly. They answer the questions properly. Now all of a sudden they're competent and the state rushes them through the trial as quick as they can so that they can convict them before they become incompetent again. So that's kind of our experience of competency, but. Yeah, interesting. So folks, I, I am seeing, I do have the uh, courtroom open on another screen. Uh, I'm seeing occasional movement, the camera's live, but the judge doesn't see the jet, so nothing's happening yet. But I, I do have it up here. I'll bring it back up when, uh, when something of note is occurring. Not right now. And they are, they are late. They're almost 20 minutes late beyond what the judge said they were going to do. Maybe, maybe they're dropping all the charges. They Not should. Nice. They should. You know, that's like, it's like, what was, the, what was that movie? Uh, the Youths? Uh, my Cousin Vinny. You know, we'd like to drop all charges. Remember that? You know what? I am a, I am a few minutes behind. <laughs> so let me, let me advance. Okay. looks like they're coming back into the courtroom. Oh, okay. There's the judge. So I'm two, I'm two and a half minutes behind, folks. My bad. Here we go. I'll bring it up right now. I will bring it up right my now. My connection is iffy. I'm not even sure if I'm running out of minutes on my phone. So if I drop out unexpectedly, thank you for uh, having me on. And I'll, I'll email you uncivil, Kurt. <laughs> uncivil, Kurt. <laughs> Yeah, you say all three of us are disagreeable. I, I don't think you can be a good attorney, or at least not an attorney who does criminal defense work or trial work, unless you're disagreeable. You're, you're arguing with people for your client's interests all the time. Well, and in fact, you, it's a prerequisite because you don't want to agree with everybody in the courtroom. You've got to stand up for your client in the face of a lot of hostility. Okay. Is it? Oh, the audio? Are we in a jury order? Your Honor, I'd like to move to just dismiss all the charges, as obviously there's no reason for us to be here anymore. This, Your Honor, is a hot pile of garbage. I think we all recognize. Let's see. <laughs> People are saying you don't have enough minutes on your phone account, Steve. It's, it's true. Like I don't. Yeah. I know. It's true. I, I'm... I'm... I'm not a cell phone guy. Ask Emily. She complains no, all the time about trying to I don't have to ask her. She's told me about it. <laughs> <laughs> this, this has been brought to you by our provider, Ting, for discount wireless plans. You know, for half the price, you can get Ting. Or Google Fi. That also works well. The defense will call Debbie Dominguez. 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 I think our, our, our things are blocking the uh, the transcription. Oh, yeah, sorry. The yep, yep. I was wondering why I had it the other way. Right. And this is Carrie Morrison. This is the uh, the principal defense attorney I like. I like the other one, too, but uh, I really like Carrie. Yeah. All right. I tell you one thing, there's no food shortage in New Mexico. Ma'am, go ahead and state your full name for the record. Debbie Dominguez. And Ms. Dominguez, did you know Guillermo Ariola? Yes, I did. And how did you know him? I was raised and grew up with the whole family. Uh, we lived right next door to each other. Okay. Uh, so he was your neighbor? Yes, he was our neighbor. Um, I'm just gonna ask you some very pointed questions, okay? Okay. Did you ever witness Guillermo Ariola spray anyone with mace? Yes. And who was it that he sprayed? He sprayed my son, Alonso Dominguez. He sprayed my cousin, Joe Chavez, and he sprayed me, but I turned my face and he didn't get me. 
So he tried to spray you yes, also. Yes, he did. Now let me ask, <clears throat> the mace that he used, uh, did it have any dye in it that you were aware of? No, none at all. Um, <clears throat> now when he <laughs> tried to spray you and you turned your head, um, had you physically threatened him at all? No. Did Mr. Chavez physically threaten him? No. Did your son physically threaten him? No. Did you know Mr. Ariola to possess guns? Yes. Uh, and let me, let me back up. The, uh, the incident that involved the mace, if you know, was Mr. Ariola intoxicated at the time? You could smell the liquor off of him. <laughs> what a killer witness keep in mind folks, great questioning the, the state knew all this the state knew all this coming to this trial they knew they were going to hear this testimony to the jury <clears throat> notice how she got now, right to the point Dean too Cummings? no you've never met this man here no thank you i'll pass the witness Amen. Quick and deadly. Boom. That's see, that's when you've got something, that's all you need to do. Yep. When it's all in the facts are on your side, just throw it up there. Boom. Jury. That's what we want to say. Sit down. Right. I love so that. Now, now we know this victim got drunk and pepper sprayed people, which is what the defendant's been and saying. Use, for the first moment. And uses it offensively. Offensively. Right. And it's pepper spray. It's mace, whatever, without a dye. What do you think the sidebar is here? I don't know. Um, who asked for it? It had to be the state, right? I mean, they just passed the defense, just passed on the witness. Maybe the state wants to explore some avenue of questioning outside the scope of direct. Uh, uh, renew an objection for improper propensity. I don't know. But that would have been done before the testimony. That's already in. I know. No but you, why not throw it out for a delay? Good afternoon, Ms. Dominguez. Good afternoon. Is that it? I'm going to ask you some questions about what you just testified to, okay? Um, you said that you've known okay. Mr. Adiola pretty much your whole life. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. um, um, you I grew moved up together, right? Yes, but I moved away for 22 years and came back. He was already older. He was a younger kid when I moved away. Okay. So let's talk about this incident that you testified to. Do you remember doing a pretrial interview with me on the telephone? Do I remember? Yes. Do you remember doing an interview? Was it you? I Do you remember doing an interview no. on the telephone? No. You don't remember doing an interview on the telephone. Okay. Um, do you have memory She's making problems? herself a witness? No. no, but you don't remember talking about this case on the telephone. Asked and answered. I remember an a investigator calling me and asking me if I knew Ariola, um, if I knew um, the case about. Um, well, do you remember on the on July 11th of this year, on the telephone, you spoke with me, and I believe um, the investigator was also on the phone, and potentially an attorney. And what is your name again? My name is Jonna Walker. Do you remember doing a telephone interview? I remember doing a telephone in, in, uh, interview at one o'clock or something like that. Okay, so now you remember that interview. Yes, I do. Okay, so do you remember in your interview, you told me over and over that you couldn't even remember when this had happened. You couldn't give me a date. I couldn't give, I can't give you dates on it. Okay. I just know it was like five years ago. Okay. I don't know dates on all the stuff that went on. Okay, but you remember the incident? Yes, I do. Okay, and this was July 9th, 2017. Does that sound right? About. Okay. And um, do you remember telling me that this was a verbal argument only before the mace came out? Yes. Okay. You told me that they had a little bit of a fight. They were pushing each other like chest to chest, like that kind of a argument, a okay. verbal like Who's going they? in front of each other. Was they your brother, Joe? No, it was... Um, my son, it was, it was my son, Joe, my cousin, 
like he was right at us, him and his cousin, I guess, that live right next door, okay. would come up and they'd bump each, they would bump against each other's chest. Okay, and that's Mr. Audiola's, what you called him, his little cousin. Is that right? The one that lived next door. I didn't never know who he was. Okay, but you referred to him as his little cousin? I think as his cousin. Okay, so it was Mr. Audiola and his little cousin. Right. And they were arguing with Joe. Joe was to the side, my son here, and I was to the side here. Okay. And you said that they were all pushing each other. Like going in, in you know, when they're yelling at each other and uh, verbally, and they're like right in each other's faces. So chest bumping and shoving, would mm -hmm. that be accurate? Yes. Okay. And you told me that this was a rumble. Do you remember that? Well, it was like a rumble. They were like on tor towards back and forth on each other. Okay. And um, you were out there with them in this rumble? Yes, I was. Okay. So it was your son, your brother, and you fighting Mr. Audiola and his little cousin in the rumble, right? Yeah. Okay. But your husband, Mario, was also there, right? My husband was there at the beginning and he took off. He said, I don't want to get involved in this. He took off. Okay. So then it was four against two. Yeah. And then Tanya was calling the cops. Okay. So then three men, your husband, your son, and Joe. My husband didn't even get near him. My husband okay, was But he was the there, right? Yes, Plus he was. you. Sorry. Plus you. So that's four people against two, right? And you never told the police that your husband Mario was there. Is that correct? Yeah, because he wasn't there when he took off. Okay. And you never told police that Tanya, Joseph's wife, was also there, right? She was up in the, in the yard calling the cops. Okay. So, so was she, she there in the rumble? I don't recall her being there. She was up further up calling the cops. Okay. If she was there, would that be five people against two? Yes. Okay. And then you said your son was maced and your brother, Joseph? No, my cousin, Joseph. Cousin. Gotcha. Cousin Joseph was mm -hmm. maced. But I know him by Joe. Okay. And then Joe went into the house and retrieved a pellet gun. Is that right? I don't recall a pellet gun. Okay. And he shot it in the air? Do you remember that? I don't even remember that. I just remember I was holding my son down because I'm like, don't touch him. Come on, he's drinking and he that's what he wants, you know, because it's like scary when Okay, so he didn't shoot I don't recall at seeing, Mr. Audiola with no, a pellet gun. I don't recall that at all. If he did, it would be after getting pepper sprayed. <laughs> this is normally done with a deposition, not a phone interview, because you're making yourself a witness. You remember okay, Paul and, and me? Mr. How does she Mr. Impeach her with it? Shot the mace, right? Yes. And did it break up the rumble? Um Pretty much, because then the cops started coming. Okay. Where is your son or Joseph transported to the hospital for this? No, just the ambulance came and they went in and they um, washed out their eyes. Okay. And this was With just a water. verbal argument where you guys right. were saying Shoving. stuff back and forth. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you yourself was saying stuff back to Mr. Audiola, yes, correct? Yes, because he tells you some ugly things. Okay. So you said that he was carrying mace. Where does, where does he typically carry the mace? Does he have it in a certain pocket all the time or? I have no idea. He just pulled it out and I don't even, I didn't see him. Have you ever seen him carry mace before? No. Okay. It's the first time. No further questions, Your Honor. He, he never pulled mace out before, guys. Okay. Now, when I use the word fighting, the way that I define that is two people are physically hitting each other. Right. So let me ask you this. Were you fighting with Mr. Ariola? No. Was Joe Chavez fighting with Mr. Ariola? No. Was your son fighting with Mr. Ariola? No, they were just chest to chest. Just kind of in each other's faces? Mm-hmm. Is that a yes? Yes. Just for this lady? Yes. Um, <clears throat> when this occurred, were you on your own property? Yes, when he came around, we were on my mom's property. So yes. car reporter is in the room. Did you invite him into the property? No. Did you invite his cousin onto the property? No. Did you have a weapon? No. Did your son have a weapon? No. Did Mr. Chavez have a weapon? No. Did Mr. Ariola's cousin have a weapon? Yes, he did. No further questions. 
I'll do clean, it. Clean. That's the way to do it. Right clean, there. clean to the point. Yeah. When you have something to say, when you have testimony to elicit, you get right to it and you elicit it. Instead of all yeah. this no, wandering no, no, around. No, simple, easy peasy. The defense will call Joe Chavez. Oh, they got the, the cousin too. Nice. He was rubbing his areola on areola. Now, these are not public defenders. These are uh, private attorneys. Yes, Carrie Morrissey is legally hot. I would agree. Legally. But when they're sending us their prosecutors, they're not sending us their best. Well... Oh, he brought his Navy hat with him. <laughs> I wonder if the defense told him to do that. Go ahead and state your full name, sir. Joseph A. Chavez. And Mr. Chavez, move that microphone a little closer to you. Okay. Oh, yeah. You don't so mind it's a word of this. <laughs> Mr. Chavez, did you know Guillermo Ariola? Yes. How did you know him? We kind of grew up together. And as adults, were you still in contact? No. Well, other than me being being his neighbor. Yeah. Okay. And I, just to be clear, you said you were his neighbor. Yes. Okay. Thank you. We were neighbors other than living next to each other. Yeah. Did you yeah, ever uh, have an occasion uh, where Mr. Ariola sprayed you with mace? Yes. And did the mace have any kind of dye in it? No. It didn't dye your skin or your hair or, well, pardon me, uh, or, or your <laughs> clothing in any way? No. Um, at the time that Mr. Ariola sprayed you with mace, were you physically threatening him? No, we were just like in an argument. Did you have a weapon? No, not at that point in time, no. Not at that point in time? No. Okay. Uh, at the time that Mr. Ariola sprayed you with mace, do you know whether or not he was intoxicated? Yes. And w was he intoxicated? Yes. And how could you tell? <clears throat> the only time he was really aggressive was when he was intoxicated, which was pretty much daily. I like how focused and direct she is. Pretty much daily, yeah. Boy. What do you want, man? Pretty much daily. Wow. Prior to being sprayed with the mace, had you hit Mr. Ariola? No. Had you threatened to hit Mr. Ariola? No. Had you gone on to Ms. Ario Mr. Ariola's property? No. Where did this incident take place? It took place on El Cajon, which is a... Um, it's the road in front of my, my home. The road in front of your home? Yes. Okay. Yep. Do you know Mr. Cummings? Aggressive no. drunk. You've never met him before? No. I'll pass the witness. Right. I forgot that he had a fatty liver as well on medical examination. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Um, I'm going to ask you some questions now, okay? okay. Um, you've known Mr. Ariola. You said you were best friends since you were kids, right? Yeah. Okay, let's talk about this mace incident. Do you remember when it happened? Oh, it's been a while. I mean, maybe three years. Would it surprise you that it was five years ago? More than five years ago? Well, the frequency of incidents, I mean... <laughs> so would you would it surprise you that it was July 9th, 2017? Okay. Okay. 
Do you remember telling law enforcement that you were walking with your nephew up the roadway? Yes. Okay. And this is the Al Cajon Road, is that correct? Yes. And then you told law enforcement that Mr. Adiola started to taunt you and talk to you. He was, yes, I was in my driveway when they were coming down the uh, El Cajon. Okay. So, Mr. Chavez, this was a verbal argument, is that right? Yes. And then Mr. Adiola pulled a can of mace out of his pocket and maced you and your nephew. He was going to mace my wife, and I lunged in front of her because I wasn't sure what he had in his hand at the time. Okay, so let's talk about this. Um, you never told the police that your wife, Tanya, was there. Is that right? Well, if they questioned her, she was there. Okay. Law enforcement never documented that your wife, Tanya, was present. How would so he let's know? Let's talk about who was there. Okay. You were there, and I your was nephew there. was there, right? It was, it's a cousin that was there. Okay. A cousin, not yes. your nephew. Right. Okay. And Mr. Adiola was there? Who else was there? Um, his nephew. Okay. And after Mr. Adiola pulled out the can of mace, you then went inside your house, correct? Correct. And you got a pellet gun, correct? Correct. And you shot at Mr. Adiola, correct? Correct. And... You were not even involved in the initial verbal argument. Is that correct? That is correct. But you decided that you wanted to go down and see what was happening at the end of the road and join in. No, I right? did not go down. You didn't go join in? No, the argument and the scuffle came to me. I was in my driveway. Okay. Um, but this was just a verbal argument at that point. Yes. That you decided to join in. Uh, no, I didn't decide to join in. I just decided to go out there to try to kind of, you know... And then your wife, Tanya, also did that, decided to join in, right? Yes. Okay. And you jumped in front of Tanya, so she wouldn't get maced, but you got maced. Correct. Was there pushing and shoving in this rumble? Yeah, there was a little bit of pushing. Were you pushing? Uh, no, I wasn't. Okay. You were just being pushed? Yes. Okay. Was Debbie pushing? No. No? But this was just words and pushing and shoving, right? Correct. Was Mario there? I believe he was in the background. But it all happened pretty fast and quick. I mean. So it's you, your wife, Tanya, right? Two people. Debbie, her husband, Mario. So that's four people. Her son. And her son. So five people against Mr. Adiola and his cousin, you said? His nephew. Nephew. So it was five against two. Would that Correct. sound accurate? Yes. Okay. And no one was ever arrested for this incident, right? Correct. There were no charges? Correct. And you were a willing participant in this rumble? Um, what do you mean by willing? You could have not joined in the rumble and the pushing and shoving, right? You could have just watched them. <laughs> Uh, Your Honor, I'll object. He's indicated that he wasn't pushing anyone. Sustained. Did you join in the verbal argument? Yes. So you willingly joined into the verbal argument? Yes. A verbal this rumble? Was, this would happen daily. <laughs> A verbal rumble. That's a new one. That's what happened daily. Was this the only time you ever saw Mr. Adiola use mace? No. Oh, bad question. Oh, that was a prosecutor question. Just open the door. You're right. Let's talk about the other times you saw him use mace. <laughs> In detail. <laughs> See, the, the prosecutor has not deposed these people. She's operating off a police report, and she's using that police report to try to impeach him, trying to think she knows everything from what the cops told him. She has not questioned this witness. She's operating. You understand what I'm saying? 
I mean, they've Plus only had two think. and a half years to prep. It's only a murder case. You know, why would you go through the trouble of doing that? I mean, you know, come and, on. And she comes across to me as intentionally mischaracterizing what happened. And these people come across as completely genuine. So then and it was five was seasons. Best friend. You were never afraid of Mr. Adiola, correct? Yeah, I was. <laughs> oh. oh! Do you remember talking to me on the telephone? On the telephone. The telephone it's terrible. Yeah. It's a murder case. Once so again. In July, in July, back in July, we talked about this case. Do you remember that, sir? Yes. Do you remember during that interview, you told me you've known him so long that you never were afraid of him? I was more afraid for my family. I mean, do you remember telling me that you've known Mr. Adiola so long that you're not afraid of him? Yeah, I just, I mean, pretty, I mean, no further questions, Your Honor. Oh, that's just really great impeachment there. Just great contradiction. Fantastic she, she work, counsel. Hey, wow. Wow. She can't. Oh. Get him, Carrie. Get him. Go get him. Ask. Did you and your family members gang up on Mr. Ariola and his nephew? No. His nephew, I mean, the reason why I went out there was because his nephew had a, uh, a large knife on the side. Hold on. Well, I, th I think he gets to explain it, and I think that the state has clearly opened the door. Yep. Go ahead, sir. Yep. Nice. I, mean, I went out there to kind of, you know, stop what was gonna, probably going to take place. I mean, well, wait a minute. I, I Hang, on. In it. Hang on. Let me back you up. Okay. You said the reason you went out there was because Mr. Ariola's nephew had what? He had a large knife in a sheath um, on his side. And what, why was that concerning to you? Because, um, I mean, he, at that point, he, you know, I believe he was, he was dangerous. You believe I he mean, was dangerous? Yes, because, you know, the alter, altercation, altercation came to me. They were obviously arguing and coming down the road. So this started somewhere else. But it didn't, you know, he went out and actually was the aggressor. Who was the aggressor? Mr. Ariola. Okay. Uh, and you, you were asked by the prosecution if you ever saw Mr. Ariola use mace an, a, di a different time, right? Yes. A and did you? Yes. What was that time? I've got a surveillance. Jackson, Your Honor, can we approach? She oh, he's got yeah. a lot of tape. Oh, oh, oh. She's got a she's I have back. a surveillance camera footage of him macing my dog. Lol. Oh. <laughs> and the judge did didn't even allow the five. Any interactions with Mr. Ariola where you were frightened of him? There was a few, yes. There were several occasions where he would. Objection, Your Honor. All right, I'll, uh, I, I don't have any further questions. Okay. Thank you. Lol. She got what you wanted. I have it on tape where he based my okay. dog. Dog. Oh, shit. Oh. <laughs> Jury is not going to like that. No. Your Honor, I'm just going to see if our uh, next witness is in the hallway. Go ahead. Wow, prosecutor just devastated. The prosecutor opened the door completely. And and now there's this other stuff that he did that's unknown that they can fill in all kinds of gaps. So now there's the mystery of all the other bad stuff that made him frightened. Amazing. Right. And the, so the judge didn't even, he didn't, he, she says, objection, can we approach? And he's like, no, overruled. You can ask the question. Boom. Right. That was a good judge. I mean, she obviously the door. The door. Yeah, a little bit. Well, you want to tell us about she how he had a knife? He yeah. had a doctor's appointment, and I did speak with him on the phone. He said that he was on his way. He's not here yet. Uh, we can begin with Mr. Brudenell, or we can wait a few moments for Mr. Klinger. Let's Call Mr. Brudenell. It's fine. One of them here, let me know, and we'll get started. Let's take a break. Let us check to see the medical is available. We're going to take him out to the hallway, and I'll, I'll check for you. I'll let you know. Okay. All right. All right. Another break. 
Wow. I'm liking the judge. Judge was judge is growing on me. I think he's he's got his act together. He's listening. The fact that he did not let them approach. He saw yeah. they opened the door on that. She objects he, he, when she wants to bring it up, and she's like, "Nope, overruled. Ask the question." Right, right. The judge made his decision on that objection the moment she opened the door. He knew what was coming, of course, and yep, he's like, "Nope, we're not doing that. We don't have to waste time on that." <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was uh, that was. <laughs> well, we predicted it, right? Not that it was hard. Are we back already? No. Um, not that it was hard to predict, but uh, it's only going downhill for the state. Dude, they look, they look very bad with these witnesses. They're listening damaging testimony on cross <laughs> of these witnesses. The damage is supposed to happen on direct. You're supposed to impeach the witness on cross, you, you, and you're you they're shooting two, themselves in the face. You got two witnesses, including a relative who's known him all his life and is a neighbor of him, who is now testifying to him being violent, the aggressor, with a knife. He was scared of him. Also, I have him on tape macing my dog. And he, uh, and he like, and he's always thinking of alcohol, and it happens all the time. It was yeah. drunk. He can't remember exactly when it was because the frequency of these events. <laughs> I mean, oh my God, the whole thing was so damaging. I mean, even if the jury has started sympathetic to the victim, they got to be thinking to themselves now. Well, the guy he was kind of an asshole. <laughs> and the guy, the guy, did he say he was like, I was his best friend or something? Mm -hmm. At one point, he's like, I was his friend. I don't know the defendant, but this guy's my friend, and I'm throwing down on my best friend. I mean, come on. Holy cow. And, and this, oh, let me, the, the prosecutor here, she is impeaching them with police reports. Yeah. She, phone, she phones it in. So she calls the guy with her investigator in the room. See, the problem with that, and, and she was, it, she's lucky she didn't get burned worse than she did. Because if the guy could say a completely different thing on the stand, and she'd have no way to impeach him, she'd say, "Well, you you didn't tell that meet, and now you're making her. She's making herself a witness. She can't get up there and testify to what he said. It's not under oath. Right. It's not in a depo. She can't impeach him. So she is like, she's just mailing it in. This is a murder trial. You know, this is the top rung of criminal law. You know, you, we we have the our best attorneys on." This is so sloppy, front to back. Cops, prosecutors, the whole thing, terrible. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going off, but I mean, the, well, look, at right, the, look, at the, look at the Brooks trial. Those prosecutors had their act together. That was exactly the way. Those prosecutors were great. This, I don't, what are they doing here? Do they, are, I mean, are they so used to winning that they don't even know how to prosecute? I mean, you see the other side? What, what is going on? I'm, I'm very confused by this prosecution. Yeah, it's bewildering. I mean, even if you don't believe in the case, you'd think they would have. She knew and she she knew she had to at least make the phone call. Right. So she knew some effort was required. If any effort is required in a murder trial, you got to do it all the way. You can't just half ass it. And yeah, just being on the phone call now, as you say, now she's a witness. The prosecutor's making herself a witness. It's it's not the first time well, I've seen them do this, but. Well, what they would do normally, in, a, in like if they had, they'd have a depot, they'd have all his statements, it would be under oath, there'd be question, there'd be answer. And when the witness departs from what you think they're going to say, which you know because you've already done it, then you'd say, well, can I refresh your recollection? You remember giving a deposition. Here, read the deposition. Now, is your answer the same? It's not. Then you remember me asking this, and your answer was this, and that well, you were sworn to tell the truth, right? And you're sworn to tell now? Boom. You know, that You impeach them with it. But see, she doesn't have yep. the depot. She phoned it in. She called the witness and had a discussion, thinking right. that that person's going to say the same thing. Thankfully, this witness is honest. There's no transcript of any kind, <laughs> much less one no. under oath. There's Just nothing. her memory and her little lawyer. Well, she doesn't believe in transcripts. She doesn't believe in transcripts, and she believes in transcripts being handed to her by sources unknown. Right. Yeah. Remember that the, the jail call is not a <laughs> Unbelievable. Well, I don't know what to say about this. This prosecution should never happen. But clearly, and, and I mean, it would be fast. Do you know anybody from Albuquerque area that can clue us in on the politics? I don't. I'm I'm hoping to be able to get Carrie Morrison on uh, a guest on the show. 
uh, if she's willing to do that kind of thing. I don't know. I make a lot of jokes during these things, so she may, <laughs> I may have already I may have pre offended. We'll have to see what happens. I made all those hairbrush jokes. Maybe she'll be mad at me. But uh, hey, Carrie, I think you're an awesome lawyer. That's what the only thing that should matter. Uh, if I if I were charged with murder in New Mexico, I would call you. Okay, I would call you. I think I think you're that good. That's high praise, and I mean, there's not many lawyers I recommend. So I, I, when you say that, it's true. I, I'm I'm pretty hard on the lawyers. All right, let me That's hit some of these questions here. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see. Um, okay, here's one about our uh, Steve's law course. So Steve's teaching a criminal law course for the Law Self Defense American Law Courses. You can learn more about that at lawselfdefense.com/slash law courses. I can tell you the students in this class absolutely love and adore both Steve and the course. We're hearing nothing but world level praise uh, for what Steve's doing. The question here is: Does it come with CLE? So can you get continuing legal education? So two facets to that. One is these courses aren't really designed for lawyers. They're designed really for non-lawyers, like students going through law school. That's the way we structured it. Um, second of all, uh, getting things pre-accredited for CLE across 50 states is unbelievably burdensome. We will never do that. But a lot of states do allow you to self-report for CLE, and uh, we can provide like a course syllabus kind of thing, an outline of the courses. Um Normally, that's enough, but you would know your CLE jurisdiction guidelines better than I would wherever you are. But there's no default CLE option. Uh, let's see. Uh, someone said, oh, yeah, Wendy, this is like Mystery Science Theater 3000, but the legal version. <laughs> well, I guess I guess that's good. I like Mystery Science Theater. Yeah, I guess she's talking about us being the Mystery Science Theater guys. Yeah, a little bit. Uh, Charles, right? What are you? Oh, I don't know. I haven't. It's been so long since I've watched. It. Like the robot, we should have like the gallery like this, watching the trial with our head outlined the silhouette. <laughs> that would be funny. Uh, now we know why the prosecutor's hair is always must. They've been trying to tear it out because of the lack of a valid case. That could be. Um, let's see. Konsaki, how the hell does this help the prosecution? I don't know what point what point of the questioning that was, but it's a good question so far for the whole trial. Yeah, is there anything in there that helps the prosecution? <laughs> AR-15, Albuquerque, New Mexico, Blue State, scary gun. Uh, Snarky writes, Cummings likely has a paranoid disorder with mistaken perceptions of being threatened or attacked that can lead to homicide. Google his bizarre interview in Outside Magazine. But I, I don't care about anything that's not happening in the courtroom, folks. So uh, that's all rumor to me, unless it's, it's subject to an adversarial process. And none of that history is. Uh, Konsaki writes, Judge, can I strike my previous question from the record? <laughs> yeah, I think, I think there's been a couple times where the state would have enjoyed that privilege. Uh, let's see. Um, snarky. Uh, couldn't the prosecutor ask Cummings if he had previously felt threatened by anyone or if he had ever feared that he might be attacked in order to expose his paranoid disorder as a predisposing factor in the homicide? Uh, I, I presume there's reasons that they're not talking about any kind of medical history with respect to the defendant, even when he was on the witness stand. But I'm, I'm not privy to that. All right. Next witness, it looks like. Maybe she did. Sir, can you go ahead and state your full name for the record? Sure, my full name is Carl David Klingler. Not that close. How do you spell your first name? Carl with a K, K A R L. And how did you spell your last name? K-L-I-N-G-L-E-R. Thank you, sir. Mr. Klingler, did, uh, did you ever know a man named Guillermo Ariola? I had a couple of interactions with him, yes. Um, I am going to ask you to discuss with us <clears throat> Uh, the the time that you were in front of the Chavez res, uh, 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 residence. 
Yes. And, and that was, to be sure, the only time I really interacted with him. Okay. So the, the, the other time you saw him, but you didn't actually interact with him. Is that right? Exactly. Yes. Okay. So this time that you had an interaction with him, well, that's what we're going to talk about. Um, what were you doing at the Chavez residence? Uh, I had arrived there to, I, I think that time, I, I, I had responded to a Craigslist ad a few weeks before, and I'd met Joe and Tanya, and then that time I think I was there to drop something off. I think I was there to actually drop, to lend Joe some insulin, if I remember correctly. Okay. Joe has diabetes, and I have diabetes. Okay, and, and, and you initially responded to a Craigslist ad because you were purchasing some medical equipment, right? Exactly, okay. yes. Uh, so, so Joe and Tanya Chavez at this point in time, it doesn't sound like they were close friends of yours. No. Uh, these were just folks that you were having a transaction with. Yes. So when you arrived at their residence that day, were you able to enter their driveway? I, no, uh, they kept their gate closed and, um, Tanya had asked me to immediately let her know, um, when I arrived there because she wanted me to, she wanted to come out, open up the gate and, and let me into the yard so that I could park inside the yard uh, because of some of their previous experiences with their neighbor. Okay. Uh, so, <coughs> so, so when you arrived at the closed gate, what did you do? So it was uh, just right around sunset and I turned the car off and turned my lights off and, um, and began texting Tanya just to let her know that I was there. Um, and, uh, and then, uh, and what happened then? Well, what happened then was that somebody ba began banging on my car with a hammer. Oh, uh, with a hammer. Okay. Um, I looked in the review mirror and I, somebody was just walking along my car, banging it with a hammer. And I knew immediately who it was because Tanya had described him to me. And you had never had an interaction with that man? No. You didn't have any previous beef with him? Nope. Uh, uh, we had never met. Uh, nope. I, I'd never had any inter interaction. The, the last time I had been at the Chavez residence, Objection. I had seen him listening through the fence. Hold on. I, I don't I don't I don't know what she's referring to, but I wasn't gonna I'm just gonna move on. Okay. Um <clears throat> so that would be a the, character evidence when issue. When you realize that there was someone banging on your car with a hammer, and let me ask you, were were they banging on your car with the hammer lightly or or hard? Uh I'd say about me medium. It was about, you know, it was enough to make a dent. Uh, or to make dents, it left a little a series of dents down my car, and it was enough to break my he he broke my tail light as well. Broke your tail light. Uh huh. So what did you do? Well, I jumped out. Um, I, you know, I got out, and uh, and I was just trying not to lose my temper, and I said, "Why are you doing that?" Now, and without saying what he said in response, did he do anything at that point in time? Uh, without saying what he said in response, um, physically, what did he do? Um, he, he did not do anything at that moment or, you know, he just continued to speak to me and hold the hammer. Did he threaten you with the hammer? Uh, a couple of sentences later, he did. His initial response was, I'm just okay. teaching. You're saying, yep. When you say that he threatened you with the hammer, just talk t talk to us physically about what he did. Okay. Um, well, uh, he brought the hammer back and said, "Nope." Well, I think it's not being offered for the truth. I think it just goes to his it could be, mind. Could also go to it's also it a verbal act if it goes to an assault. Right. Yeah. Go ahead, sir. So he pulled the hammer back, and what was that sentence he said? When I turned to him, he could see that, you know, I, I turned and looked at him, and he said, I will fuck you up. 
Okay. All right. I'll stop you right there. I'll pass the witness. Yes. <clears throat> Isn't it true that you don't like Mexican food? <laughs> More than gonna say. Good afternoon. So let's talk about this incident with the hammer. She, she talked to so this guy. Does that sound right? Yes. Okay. And um, Mr. Audiolo, was he walking around your vehicle making dents or only at the back of the vehicle? Uh, he was walking up the driver's side. He so, just made a succession of, of dents up my driver's side. But not only in the back of the vehicle. Correct. Well, that's better. He, he said he was teaching me a lesson okay, initially. Sir. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember telling law enforcement that he had hit the back of your vehicle? Yes. So you never said all up the driver's side. You said the back of your vehicle. Is that correct? Uh, he started with the taillight and I'm then worked his you, way up. I'm asking you, do you remember telling law enforcement that he hit the back of your vehicle? You never told them all around your vehicle. Uh, I'll take no. your word for it. It's not helpful. This is not proper impeachment. She's going off the police report. Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. He said he'll take your word for it. You don't get to refresh. Objection. Do you remember doing a statement for law enforcement? I do. Okay. Do you remember in your written statement saying that he pounded on the back of your vehicle? Uh, I think that that might have been subject to their interpretation. Yeah, of course. Because it turned out later that there was okay. something else they wrote down. Let me stop you there, sir. Yeah. Well, wait a minute. Let me stop you because you're not giving me the answer I want. <laughs> Lol. What a clown show. Joe Carey will cover it on redirect. Were you backing out of Joe and Tanya's driveway? No. No? You weren't backing out and almost hit Mr. Audiola with your Jeep? Oh, no. I had just arrived. And the car was turned off. Do you remember telling law enforcement that you were backing up and that you were looking and that there were some items back blocking your view? There were signs blocking your view? Do you remember saying that? I never would have said that. There you go. Doing a written statement to law enforcement. Yes. Okay. Would looking at that written witness statement refresh your memory? Well, what I understand is that law enforcement. So the question is: Is would looking at your witness statement refresh your memory? What you said. No, Such a bad certainly. Look. When you're not dealing with a hostile witness, it's he's clearly not trying to be hostile. This is the this is the Brooks method of impeaching witnesses. He would read the police reports. And then ask the witnesses what but the police said that they said. Right. This is not the way you do it. Yeah. Because who in the hell knows what the cop wrote down in his report? That's got nothing to do with the witness. Yep. I mean, properly done, as Steve has pointed out, it's a deposition, and you get a chance to review the deposition to make sure it's right, correct, a correct reflection of what you actually said. What was the trial we saw where it was, I think, was the one, the Johnny Depp trial? Someone had been deposed and he said, no, I, I disagree with that deposition. That's a misrecording yeah, yeah, of what yeah. I said. I didn't get a chance to review it. Didn't get yeah. a chance to review it, right. Well, in the way, at the end of, if you actually do a deposition, at the end of the deposition, they will say, do you want to read or waive? And when right. you read, you don't, you basically, you can waive the reading and trust the court reporter, or you yep. can waive. If you, if, you, if you read, then you can add to it. You cannot subtract to it, but you can add uh, er error stuff. So you can say, no, they misquoted me here and misquoted me here. If there's enough, if there's substantive changes, you can get a redeposition. But I don't think that's what's going on here. I think that they are, I don't even know if he, this is the written statement that he filled out. I think this is the cop taking down what he said. I mean, I, right. I'm very That's mistrustful. Yeah. Right. Especially if it's, you know, something where no charges were ultimately brought. I mean, the cops aren't going to take it seriously. It's just paperwork to them. They're not anticipating it's going to be evidence in a murder trial sometime down the road. I think Carrie's just telling the judge, Your Honor, I, I realize now I'm going to need a much larger strap on than I thought I would need for today's testimony. 
<laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. I can't believe how unprepared the prosecution team is. It's just, it's just malpractice. I mean, what is she going to open the door to now? Yeah. Yeah, for <clears throat> sure. You know, that's when we do a death penalty trial or murder trial, we depose every witness. I mean, like it's, it's amazing. Person. Yeah, it's like you just you have them lined up. You say, okay, I'm going to take, I got three days worth of depositions. You have 30 witnesses. You tend to attend a day, boom, boom, and they come in and out. You go through them, you lock them down. It's not a big deal. This is like you lawyer. You can do 10 number. a day. What's that? You can do 10 a day. Oh, well, if you know, you like, if it's some, some witnesses, a lot of times the state will list as a bunch of like handling witnesses. And you just yeah. have to ask them. All you have, you just handle this. You have nothing else about the case. Okay, next witness, right? So you can rock through a lot of these witnesses. But, but this is not a minor witness. This is a key defense witness, isn't it? Yeah, well. Just a couple of questions for you further, Mr. Klinger. Klingler, I apologize. I know I got it wrong before. Right. So just remember, when the defendant was on the stand, he had testified having knowledge of the victim using a hammer to attack somebody. Right. So that's what he was concerned about, uh, that level of attack when he was being struck in the head. Um, you said that Mr. Adiola had, you show, motioned to the jury how he had had the hammer in his hand, correct? Yes. And he was about four feet away from you when he did that? Uh, I think more like six. Okay. I, I remember the whole thing okay. pretty clearly. Okay. And um, you believe that this incident was an opportunity to do Joe and Tanya a favor, right? They had told me, or is this this is a yes or no question? I don't even understand the question. The form of question. I don't understand what she's asking, and I don't think he does either. Okay, I'll ask it again. Okay. Sir, did you believe that this was an opportunity to do Joe and Tanya a favor? What does that mean? What? Calling law, sorry. Was calling law enforcement an opportunity for you to do Joe and Tanya a favor? Yes. It, okay. it, it, they had, uh, there is what? some background to that if you okay. would allow me to no, go into sir. it. No, she's not into the uh, background. During... The truth. She doesn't want the truth. She wants right. what she wants to say. See, the prosecutor should be an advocate for the truth. Tell us the whole story. <laughs> right. I know it's a joke. Oh no, I'm told you those lies. <laughs> I think we're going to redirect. Here comes Carrie. Klingler, what's the Here background on you? <laughs> wanting to do Joe and Tanya a favor by calling law enforcement. She opened the door. How, how does she get to ask Lots. the question? Hold on, hold on, counsel. I'm going to allow that question. She opened the wall. Well, they had called law enforcement many times without oh, no. any sort of relief. No, they're not making a statement. He's not recounting a statement. For the truth asserted. But, she, but notice that that first objection got overruled. The jury just heard that. It's in. Even if he overrules it, the jury's heard it. Oh, my goodness. This is crazy. This is a great trial you picked, Bronca. <laughs> oh, my God. We learn a lot about what not to do over here. <laughs> See, guys, here's the thing. If you're going to be involved in a murder case, you might want to prepare in some ways. You might want to prepare plan and i mean it, but it's also inept i mean it's, they keep doing this they keep asking these witnesses questions that open up the door to advantageous redirect by by the defense yeah i mean they're yeah. asking questions they don't know the answers to right and then when the, when the witness says something they don't like they try to control the witness by just saying and then the defense just gets back up and says well tell me the rest of the answer right so yeah, now really. who's trying to conceal the question just to be clear, what you just indicated, you, you were talking about uh, the Chavez is calling law enforcement numerous times. Yes. And 
Was it your understanding that they were calling law enforcement about Mr. Areola? Yes. Thank you. Would you agree or disagree? <laughs> Be careful of that step. Be careful of that step. The judge knows his courtroom. The judge has been on them. He's been on them. I think he's very good. I, I think yeah, the judge has got a Yep, no nonsense. All right. Is this going to be an expert? He's got the, the jacket pin. Yep. He's got a non-paper mask. He's got a professional level. Good afternoon, sir. Almost matches the suit. Could you please introduce yourself to the jury? Yes, my name is Aaron Brudenell. I can spell that. It's two A's, R-O-N, and Brudenell is B-R-U-D-E-N-E-L-L. -L. And, sir, where are you employed? Um, I'm currently employed full-time with the Arizona Department of Public Safety in the Crime Laboratory. One of their experts. And how long have you been employed with the Arizona Department of Public Safety? Since 2007. I'm going to step and away while you do his call. the Arizona Department of Public Safety? I'm a firearm and tool mark expert. What are tool yeah, let's bring in the state's expert. Yeah, let's bring in the state's expert. Yes, I'm the state's expert. I work at the state lab. I'm the state's expert. Let me tell you all the ways the defendant's right. Great. Uh, for example, in the firearm context, the tools used to manufacture a firearm typically leave very unique and identifiable marks behind on the firearm, and then subsequently those marks get transferred to fired ammunition. So that type of examination is the type of work a firearm examiner usually does. And do you have any degrees? Yes, I have a, a bachelor's degree in chemistry and a master's degree in analytical chemistry, which is more focused on the analysis of chemical substances. And do you have any other educational background? I do. Um, my firearm and tool mark education, my forensic education for what I do, uh, came from the ATF's National Firearm Examiner Academy. It's a year-long course of study that started in 1999. I was in the second class, um, so Approximately a dozen students go through a year-long course of study covering all topics in firearm forensics. What is the ATF? Oh, ATF is the Federal Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. Um, they were formerly part of the Treasury Department. Now they're part of the Justice Department. All right, and you indicated that you have a master's degree in analytical chemistry. Yes. And when you were obtaining your master's degree, were you a graduate research assistant? Uh, yes, I was. And what it, what areas did you study or conduct research in when you were a grad student? Um, the research I worked on was essentially uh, ion molecule interactions, uh, like mass spectrometers. This is very technical, but the the simplest application are when you see the screening devices at the airport, where they might run a swab across your luggage or your hand, put into a piece of equipment to analyze for trace substances such as explosives. That's the type of research I was focused on. And after you uh, obtained your master's degree, where did you first uh, go to work? Uh, my first uh, job in forensics was with the Idaho State Police. I was hired in their crime laboratory in Pocatello, Idaho, where I started training and did casework as a toxicologist. And your casework as a toxicologist, what did that entail? Um, largely analysis of urine samples and also testimony. I'm trying to think of a case me, me in up. which largely the, analysis the of defense urine samples for, called uh, the, the, the state firearms and other comparing substances. Have you ever had a case where the defense called the state I did work with firearms the alcohol as analysis. their witness? So that's the type of alcohol analysis that's well, usually done the state, either in the but, uh, field or in, say, a police station for it's testing New Mexico. The for the state. level of alcohol intoxication. And you mentioned that you would also testify in your scope of work. Yes, I've testified in both those areas before. And were you testifying as an expert in those areas? Yes, I was. And did that, uh, that work include uh, drugs such as cocaine? Yes, cocaine is one of the common drugs and its metabolites that we would see um, routinely in urine samples, for example. And alcohol? Uh, yes, alcohol as well. After the um, Idaho State Police, where did you go? Um, once I uh, was at the Idaho State Police, I got my training in firearms and worked cases there. I worked briefly for the Washington State Patrol after that, uh, about a year and a half. And then I moved to Arizona, where I worked 
for the Tucson Police Department in their crime laboratory in the firearm and tool mark section. How long were you at the Tucson Police Department? About three and a half years. And you said you worked in their firearm and tool mark department? Yes, um, I did some brief drug chemistry while I was there, but for the most part, I was focused on firearm and tool mark forensics. And uh, when you're doing firearm and tool mark forensics, what does that entail? Um, a most common firearm case might be receiving a gun in evidence and examining it for operability, seeing if the safety features function, seeing if it's safe to fire. Um, the next probably more common and, co and less and more complicated analysis would be looking at those test fires under a microscope and then comparing them to evidence that may have been recovered from a scene, such as a fired bullet or a fired cartridge case. Did your work with the Tucson Police Department include reconstruction of shootings? To a limited degree, I did reconstruction of shooting incidents at Tucson Police Department but I would say the bulk of my reconstruction work happened once I moved to my current position at the state. And did your work at the Tucson Police Department include processing of crime scenes? Uh, not at that, that department. I did some crime scene work in the Idaho State Police. And did you ever testify when you were at the Tucson Police Department? Yes, I did. And in what areas were you testifying? Uh, almost all of my testimony was in either firearm and tool mark work or reconstruction. And was that as an expert? Yes, that's correct. And then where did you move after Tucson Police Department? Uh, currently where I, where I currently am at the uh, Arizona Department of Public Safety. Same city, just a different agency, statewide agency and a different laboratory. And when did you start with the Arizona uh, Department of Public Safety? 2007. And what do you do for the Arizona Department of Public Safety? If you could kind of walk us through your career there. Sure, and it's essentially stayed the same since I started. I work on routine firearm and tool mark cases and do shooting incident reconstruction case work as well. Anything having to do with firearm forensics or a shooting incident, that's what I'm tasked to. Do you also assist in training employees? Uh, yes, I do that as part of my job. We'll train uh, sometimes new employees on basic firearm safety and handling um, all the way to having, um, so a new firearm examiner, if they were hired, I might participate in their training as well. And have you testified as an expert um, during your time at the Arizona Department of Public Safety? Yes, many times. And what areas do you testify as an expert in? Uh, firearm and tool mark analysis and shooting incident reconstruction. Do you know how many times you've testified as an expert in those areas? I do not. Um, we routinely have our testimony reviewed once a year. So I would say with only one exception I can recall, I've testified every year that I've worked there and usually more often than just once. Which courts have you testified in as an expert? Um, I've testified in um, criminal courts in Idaho, uh, in Washington State, in Arizona, uh, Illinois, Kansas, Colorado, and here in New Mexico. I believe that's the full list. I've also testified in federal courts in some of those jurisdictions too. And have you ever conducted um, any trainings or taught any classes? Yes, on a number of occasions I've taught uh, shooting incident reconstruction, for example, and other uh, related coursework. I've done it for different organizations from time to time. Um, National Institute of Justice, uh, West Virginia University, uh, the Arizona Department, excuse me, the Arizona, the Arizona Homicide Investigators Association. Those are some of the more common ones. Are you also an instructor for the ATF? Yes, uh, the academy where I attended in 2000-2001 uh, brought me back as an instructor in 2004. Have you taught classes on trajectory? Yes, I, I've done that type of casework, or excuse me, classwork in classes involving shooting reconstruction. And I did a specific online class for a group called RTI, which is a research organization and training organization in North Carolina. It was called the Four Elements of Trajectory, so it focused on specifically the trajectory aspects of shooting reconstruction. Have you taught classes um, regarding firearm evidence for prosecutors? Um, I, I have tried, at least. I've done these, this course that I called Firearm Evidence for Investigators, Attorneys, um, et cetera, and some prosecutors have participated in that. And one course in particular uh, that was for the Pima County um, uh, Attorney's Office, we did a firearm forensic specific uh, course. Have you written any articles or books that have been published? I have written some articles that have been published and I've also participated as a co-author in doing research for some other articles as well. And in what areas have you been published? Um, gunshot residue, 
um, I'm, I'm kind of blanking on the other, some of the others, but the gunshot residue part of, uh, aspects are the most common in my field in terms of stuff that I've published or participated in publishing. Have you published or participated in articles regarding flash suppressors? Um, yes, I did an article um, that was published in a, it was a magazine as well as a forensic journal that focused on um, the uh, relationship between flash hider design and also barrel length and how those interacted. Have you received specialized or advanced training in any, in any areas? Uh, yes, a variety. I, uh, my CV usually lists all of the individual trainings I've received um, uh, going into either forensic meetings or specific training I've gotten from specific organizations as well. And some of that advanced training, would that be in firearm and tool marks? I would say most of it is either firearm tool mark analysis or related fields such as shooting reconstruction or in some cases other types of pattern analysis. And advanced training in crime scene analysis? Yes, I've had some of that as well. And some advanced training in chemistry? Uh, yes, I believe so. And advanced training in toxicology? It's been a few years, but yes, I've had some training in toxicology as well. And have you toured any firearm facilities? Yes, as part of my initial training and continuing on as the opportunities present themselves, I will take advantage of opportunities to tour either firearm or ammunition manufacturing facilities. And why do you tour those facilities? A number of reasons. Um, the firearm facilities are useful for seeing the process of how guns are manufactured because we use the manufacturing marks in part to do our job of identifying individual fired bullets and cartridge cases to specific firearms. Seeing the process and how they're manufactured is useful. Uh, for example, uh, most firearms have a serial number but it, it may surprise you to learn that the gun that has the second serial number to the first gun may not have been made at the same time. They make parts in batches and then the guns are assembled from the parts that are made. So you could have two guns that have the same, or excuse me, similar serial numbers that were made some time apart. That's just one example. Um, ammunition factories are probably equally useful, but for different reasons, seeing how the manufacturers uh, use the raw materials and assemble them into complete ammunition. Occasionally marks may be left behind that you wouldn't want to confuse for marks that could be used to link a fired cartridge or bullet to a gun. Also the different manufacturing uh, type, the different manufacturing technologies and also the different manufacturing processes will show you things that might help you identify the brand of an ammunition or some other important aspect of something that may have been recovered at a shooting incident. How many facilities have you toured? I don't recall um, the numbers in, I would say, in the dozens. Would that include uh, SIG Arms? Um, I did tour a SIG Arms facility, uh, I believe, in 2000. Um, and it was the facility in Exeter, New Hampshire. Your Honor, at this time, the defense would uh, tender Mr. Brudinell as an expert in firearm examination and shooting reconstruction. I'm not a toxicologist. And toxicology. And Your Honor, I would um, object to that too, sir. <laughs> and they they hate the tox. <clears throat> yeah, the state does not like that tox. They don't want them talking about cocaine on the brain, driving. Guillermo, insane. By the way, it's ridiculous that they're arguing about this now. This 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 should have been settled weeks or months ago. Whether yeah, or not right. the guy's going to be privileged to testify as an expert on these topics. I sent you a DM, by the way, on uh, Twitter. And you're muted if you didn't know, Andrew. All right, so to be clear then, uh, Mr. Brudinell is qualified as an expert in firearm and tool mark and shooting reconstruction. Okay, thank you, sir. Mr. Brudinell. 
have you been provided with any information regarding this case that we're here for today? Yes, I received a number of documents, um, photographs, um, recordings of interviews and transcripts, things of that nature. And did you review those materials? I did. And what was your purpose in reviewing those materials? Uh, essentially to do what I could to evaluate the, um, the evidence available to me um, in the context of the incident. And in reviewing that evidence, um, did you make note of any, any items or any investigation that was missing that could have been useful? Um, there are a number of things that can go into a shooting reconstruction. And if I can pause briefly to elaborate. Please. Um, when you do a traditional forensic examination where you offer a firearm or an unknown substance to a crime lab, um, the analysis is fairly simple and straightforward. It may be technically difficult, but it, it's a straightforward answer that you get at the end of that process. The firearm may be decide, determined to be operable or inoperable, and that will be listed on a report. The substance may be identified. This is a controlled substance, and it's cocaine, or this is a uh, non-controlled substance, or something of that nature. Um, but a forensic reconstruction is very different. It's interpretive. And what that means is a forensic reconstruction usually involves assembling as much information and data as you can, both from, say, a crime scene and from forensic analysis that happens at the laboratory. And the way I like to describe your result at the end of that process is you have a filter. You have a series of facts and information you can use to sort out different scenarios, to try to decide if one scenario under those circumstances that you've identified is possible or say impossible, or if one of those scenarios is more likely say than another. And so when the, you're, you're done with a forensic reconstruction, hopefully you have a better picture of what happened, but you will almost never have a perfect picture of what happened. You may have some information that will help you sort out certain facts, say the sequence of shots fired, or you may not. It's very difficult to be sure. Uh, a perfect reconstruction would involve a number of things, uh, including trajectory analysis and measurements. Um, so in this case, when you reviewed the evidence, this is the evidence that was gathered by Sandoval County Sheriff's Office and the New Mexico State Police. Is that correct? That's my understanding, yes. Okay. And have you ever reviewed cases that involved either of those agencies before? I would say a number of times I have, yes. And so are you familiar with the work of those agencies? Somewhat, yes. And in reviewing the work that was conducted in this case, were there certain areas that you felt there could have been more follow-up done? I think there are always going to be other things that could have been done, additional work. And if you're doing the reconstruction, you're trying to answer the questions that are posed to you. Um, but specifically in this case, there were a number of bullet impacts inside the structure and some traveling outside of the structure. Uh, those bullet impacts were photographed and they were labeled, very important parts of the process. Um, in some cases, trajectory rods were placed to indicate the bullet paths as they went through certain structures. Um, but what wasn't done were um, specific photographs or measurements um, that would allow you to document the exact trajectories more accurately. Um, and there wasn't that I saw a evaluation of the whole scene that included information on bullet trajectories that may be incomplete. For example, a bullet striking the floor at a shallow angle. Um, some other information that might be useful is to try to determine if that bullet struck that flooring and ricocheted or if it went through the flooring and entered some space underneath the house. Um, those are the types of information that I would have liked to have seen if possible and possibly some other information in, um, on specific materials, such as uh, what the flooring was made of exactly. Why would that be helpful to know what the flooring was made of? Um, in some cases, you will see different effects depending such, such on, for example, the, the thickness of, say, flooring material or the, what it's constructed from. In this case, I have a pretty good idea what the flooring is made from, and, but how thick it is um, or other in information of what might be below it was, was lacking. Um, and you had mentioned impact sites, the different impact sites at the scene. Yes. Is there testing that could be done on those impact sites that helped you to, I guess, sort of construct that filter that you had mentioned? Uh, yes, and I was able to do some of that test. And what other types of testing is there? Is there like some kind of chemical testing that could be conducted? 
Um, there's, yeah, two things in particular. Some chemical testing may be useful. Um, the residues of gunshots that are fired at close distances to objects often leave residues that are, if not visible, can be made visible through chemistry. Um, there's also um, other things that can be observed, such as physical impacts. Um, sometimes the residues from a shot that's fired at close range are visible. Sometimes they're not visible, but can be made visible with oblique lighting or other techniques that enhance, say, the magnification of the surface you're looking at. Either a very close photograph taken with a macro lens, or in some cases, even a photograph taken with some form of magnification so you can see individual particle impacts on the surface. And why would individual particle impacts on the surface be important? What that can give you in some cases is a, a better estimate of the distance and in maybe some other cases, the angle at which a shot was fired. Um, essentially, when a gun is fired, the bullet leaves the barrel at a high speed, but following that bullet out of the barrel are a number of residues, including unburned particles of powder that are also leaving at approximately the same speed. Now, a bullet does not slow down very fast cutting through air, but small lightweight particles of powder do. So once you get a certain distance away, those particles of powder will disperse in their area and also lose velocity so they don't produce the same kind of impacts. So for example, you might be very close to an object and have lots of visible residues. You might be a little farther away and have impacts from these particles that leave small um, visible or barely visible damage to that surface. And once you get farther away, sometimes all you have are the particles themselves adhering to the surface. And some of these things can be seen easily. Some of them will take some techniques to visualize. But in any case, that kind of information may help you get an idea for a particular impact, how close or far the gun was. And in some cases, even what was the orientation of the firearm in space at the moment that particular shot was fired. And there's been some discussion in this case regarding gunshot residue analysis. What is that? Uh, well, there's a couple types. Um, the initial uh, term gunshot residue is probably very broad. We use it in forensic contexts usually in two ways. One way would be to identify, say, the distance a shot may have been fired from an object, as I just described. There is another technique that's uh, trace gunshot residue. That's how I describe it. It's looking for particles of residue that are not visible to the human eye on, say, skin or clothing to identify if a person was hey, in the Joe. vicinity of a gunshot or hey. participated as a shooter, for example. And is doing? gunshot residue How much of this have you seen, Joe? That a crime lab can do. Uh, 90 seconds. Yes, um, mostly the former. Type. Okay, well, you've missed a whole pile. You missed a whole pile of stupid today. Laboratories, hmm. and it has limited probative value depending on the circumstances of an incident. The other type is more commonly performed in most modern crime laboratories. And when you have a gunshot victim who's wearing clothing. And yes. you're trying to determine the distance of the firearm from the from that person when they were shot. Does the gunshot residue analysis assist in that? It can. And normally what happens in those circumstances are the clothing itself is delivered as evidence to, to the crime laboratory. And that, that, la that item of evidence is analyzed by the laboratory for that purpose. And do you know if the New Mexico Department of Public Safety has the ability to do this type of analysis? They do. That was in the what Zimmerman about ejection case. pattern analysis? What is that? An ejection pattern analysis takes advantage of looking at the way cartridge cases are ejected from a firearm, uh, typically the distance and the direction they travel. If I hold a firearm and I'm pointing in a certain direction, in more cases than not, the cartridge cases that are fired, if they're ejected from the firearm in a semi-automatic gun, for example, they come out of the gun. They typically go right into the rear slightly, but that's a, a rough estimate. Every gun and ammunition combination can be a little different. So the value of analyzing the ejection pattern would be to see the distance and maybe the direction of cartridge cases and how they travel through air and where they land. And does the ejection pattern analysis have some limitations? It does. Uh, for one thing, it's um, a pattern. So you're not going to put too much weight on any individual data point. You, know, you may have 12 cartridge cases that all land in a pile and one or two others that go far and wide. That can happen. Um, also, the limitations would include, you'd have to have some information or knowledge or understanding of where the, car, the firearm was held and at what position. Because if I'm standing and aiming level, 
the cartridge ejection pattern may be very different than if I'm, say, sitting down and holding the gun at a 45 degree angle. Those are things that can affect it. Orientation can also affect it. If I have a gun, such as a rifle, and it's typically ejecting to the right, if I suddenly turn it sideways, it's gonna start ejecting upward, for example. So those sorts of things can have an impact. And the when last, you're, oh, I'm sorry. Apologies. The, the last thing I think that is significant is the environment. And what, it, what I mean by that is, uh, the simplest example is if you were firing a, a gun and the cartridge cases are landing, say, on a grassy field, they will typically land once and not bounce and stay right where they first hit. If, on the other hand, you're standing on a sidewalk or an asphalt or some rigid structure, those cartridge cases will typically hit and then bounce, and they may go a different direction and vary after that point. Lastly, if you're in a confined space, cartridge cases can hit objects in the confined space, hit walls, they tend to bounce around. So the utility of doing this type of work starts to become limited in those conditions. And while we're talking about casings, uh, as part of your shooting reconstruction, do you look at where casings are found? Yes, I do take note of that. And if there is some information to be gleaned from that, oftentimes I'll try to incorporate that in my analysis. And the location of casings, can that also have limitations? Yes. And what would those limitations be? Very much the same. It's, we're talking about the same process. If I find casings all in one spot, that's useful if it's an open air shooting scene. On the other hand, if they're in a confined space like a car or a small room, the location of those casings, at least the specific location within that room, may be of limited value because those casings, like I said, can hit and they can bounce. Um, it would really depend on the specifics of the circumstance. And what I have found is unless the question is, was the person in the room or out of the room, confined spaces are usually limited to just that type of answer. And you mentioned that you had reviewed the evidence in this case, is that correct? Yes, I've reviewed what I was provided. And do you recall what you were provided? Uh, I don't have the full list committed to memory, um, but again, as I said, a large number of photographs, um, some, some transcripts and some other information of that type, uh, specifically uh, the lab report from the New Mexico State Crime Laboratory and the conclusions within that as well. And did you happen to see if there was any testing done of a, a firearm by the Department of Public Safety in this case? Uh, yes, there was. And what kind of testing was done? Uh, kind of what I described, <laughs> routine uh, test firing and operability. Do you guys testing. have trouble um, trusting um, a guy wearing I'm, I'm a remembering mostly the SIG rifle because cloth the mask on the side. It's a real problem. Um, all the masks. The uh, ammunition itself. The fire. He's wearing cloth mask really in November 2022, and he wants us to trust him. Well, wants us to trust him on the science. It's just so well, undercuts his court credibility. Court requires masks, so the masks are mandated by the court. Uh, okay. Did you conduct any testing in this case? Everybody uh, yes, I did. ask in court. What kind of uh, testing did you do? Um, what I took note of were the visible scorch patterns seen on the floor Which are we in? of the location New Mexico. on two of the shots in particular. And I tried to find a way to reproduce those patterns and see what it would tell me about a possible firearm location and orientation. So and I did. Oh. oh, go ahead. Sorry. So I did a series of test firings with a similar gun and similar ammunition on samples of flooring material to see if I could reproduce those, those patterns. And did you prepare anything to aid the jury in um, understanding your testing? Yes, I prepared sort of a series of uh, essentially PowerPoint slides, um, individual uh, pages that can be reviewed to show what, how, how that process took place and what the results were. Your Honor, at this point in time, we would ask to be able to publish the slides um, as demonstrative aids to assist the jury in understanding Mr. Brudenell's testing. This guy's a witness for the defense? For the defense, yeah. But his, yeah. his day job is doing this this kind of examination for the Arizona Department of Public Safety. So he's normally a prosecutor. Uh, expert. Next, for, next for a good witness. Yeah. Yeah, there's uh, databases and books of experts, folks, expert witnesses that lawyers can use, just can refer to. There's, there's organizations that experts can join. To... I don't see a visual here, so I'm not sure. Firing. But having the sure. state-owned expert testify for the defense is pretty darn good. <laughs> it's helpful. Yep. If everyone can see that, I'll begin. The state secretly likes it also, though. 
not in this case, but this way when they rely on him in the future and he gets cross-examined, he shows it shows that he's impartial. Yep, I'll, 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 I'll be back later. Sig model uh, 556 rifle. Um, it's very similar to an AR-15 in some respects. It's also different in others. Um, this particular firearm has a 16-inch barrel based on my analysis of the image and similar products. Uh, the ammunition is photographed above. Um, the green tip ammunition is a common uh, U.S. military type of ammunition. We don't hear you, Steve. Uh, and You're it's muted. Got a specific bullet weight and usually a head stamp, which is the yeah, I mute because I'm on funky connection in the circular image below. Or to nice the to meet you, Steve. By the way, and that is uh, LC19. LC. I like your work with Nick. City. That's the name of Thanks. Good to meet you. And green tip ammunition. is not really the armor piercing ammo in this caliber, folks. That would be black tip. So green green tip is just normal, um, normal I have access to the right this particular firearm or an identical model. And the ammunition I could find normal was similar, metal. but it was from a different I'm date. So um, my test equipment that I use for generating test fires would be shown in the next image. <coughs> so again, the same type of ammunition and also a head stamp that has just a date that's five years prior. So LC14. The rifle is an AR-15 rifle with a 16-inch barrel. Um, and more specifically for both firearms, we look at the next slide. Mm -hmm. The muzzle device on the front of the barrel, this is a device called a flash hider. Oh, come on. He couldn't get a SIG 556? To reduce the amount of visible flash that's seen when it comes to this type of shot. Chief. And both the uh, firearm from the shooting incident and the one I used for testing had a flash hider that has slits only on the upper half of the actual device. And so to be clear, in this slide that we're looking at, where did you get this photo, the top photo from? The top photo is a photo of the firearm that was recovered in this incident. It was shown in, I think, in the box that it was packaged in. And that's just a close-up of that muzzle of that image. And this photo? Uh, that's one I took at the range in preparation for my test firing. And the fact that you're not using the exact the, the exact gun and the exact ammunition, uh, like how does that play into the results? Well, I would say it adds some extra unknown. Um, and in particular, were I to get um, a pattern that I felt represented the pattern that I saw, I would only treat that as an approximation. Um, I would not assert with any kind of certainty the, the exact muzzle to target distance. Uh, that's the kind of thing that you would want to have a more precise um, combination of exact similarities from your testing and the original incident. Um, but for the purposes of this, it was easy to see in the basic format a firearm and how the various patterns change as the angles change and get a, a rough approximation of where this firearm would have been at the time those two particular shots were fired. This will be the burn and so mark. So why are we more. focusing on the flash hider? That yep. was in the last. The reason the flash hider is important is that because those vents are only on the top half of that circular flash hider, that means that the vents that are going to release those residues that are visible at very close distances are only going to be on the top. So, for example, if I was shooting underneath a windowsill, a very low top of a windowsill, I would expect to see those flash patterns there. I wouldn't expect to see them if I was on the bottom edge of a windowsill shooting out. There's of no window video, right? Because those flash patterns be directed. You're very quiet, out. Joe. In this case, right. the patterns Is there video on this thing? on the flooring in the shooting incident the shooting? had those no. patterns on Oh, it was just two men in a room. There's no video. In fact, the cops who showed up didn't have functional body cameras, so down. there's no video. At some point, Hmm. The gun was held. In He's going to have to testify then. But a normal shooter would. The defendant testified earlier today. Oh, grip, he was the first defense witness. Actually, he was the defendant. In this case, is he strong? Um, yeah. Yep. Came across very well. And the 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 state's cross was really inept. In fact, so he's saying the gun was upside down, oh, upside down, and shooting into the floor. Yep. With your permission, I'd like to verify this is an unloaded gun. Finally, somebody Wait. is checking the, the damn gun. The Holy cow! First guy that's handled a firearm properly in the whole damn court. You just visually see the chamber is empty. There's nothing inside the gun in either the chamber or the magazine area. So this gun has no ammunition in it, so it should be perfectly safe to handle. Okay. And so 
this firearm, is this the firearm that you were looking at in the photos? Yes, I believe so. Okay, and when you're talking about the flash hider, can you please show us what you're talking about? Yes, right here is the flash hider device. And it may be difficult to see from a distance, but the area on the bottom where the grip and the magazine are is solid. There are no holes on this portion of the flash hider. But on the sides and the top are where those ports exist. Um, the intention of this, I think, initially is to keep the blast uh, going upward rather than going downward. Uh, but as a practical effect, if it's fired close to a, uh, an object that records those flash, those, those patterns, you can get some indication of the orientation of the firearm in space. And so when I say that the firearm was inverted or upside down, I would approximate using this as a stand-in for the floor, it would have some sort of orientation approximating angles of this type. So upside down and at some angle, this direction, shallow angle. Furthermore, it may have been tilted slightly one way or the other, but for the most part, it was in an upside down orientation at the time those shots were fired. And is that a Consistent typical way a to struggle. fire a rifle? Typical way to fire a rifle. Not really. Should we move on to your next slide? Sure. Okay. So these are the two images that were taken by investigators at the scene. Um, you can't read the label below, but this items I-11 and I-12. Those are the impacts that are recorded and described in this photograph. Do you see the kind of gray black pattern surrounding those impacts? There is a close pattern, which has sort of a, just a parabolic shape to it. But then farther away are the individual little patterns that correspond to those open ports on the flash hider. You look at I-12, which is the lower one, you can see three of them. And if you look at I-11, you can see two. Um, what I found interesting was also that the distance between the actual impact site, the damage physically done to the floor, and where that um, cone of residues appears, they kind of just overlap right about the time the bullet impact starts is right about the time that that larger pattern starts to dissipate. Okay. Should we move on to the next one? Yes, please. So now we had talked about your testing that you had done in this case. Does this show some of your testing? Yes, it does. So to approximate this on the range, I got samples of similar type of flooring material and I set them up using visible patterns of the actual residues themselves. Um, this one up above has three that I can see. Thanks, Long Crime. Uh, this one also has several. But what you'll notice with this one and with this one, the location of that sort of central residue pattern isn't at the same relative location. Now, I wouldn't be comfortable ruling out these other two possibilities based on the differences that we described. The, the firearm is a different firearm with some different properties, and the ammunition is slightly different based on a difference of five years of manufacturing. So I wouldn't swear that any of these are absolutely accurate as far as determining the distance. But as you can see, for the most part, you have to be fairly close in my test set, under three inches, and contact being fairly reliable and you have to have the firearm in an orientation where those ports are producing marks, individual marks, um, that show that the gun was essentially upside down at the time. Please. And so to try to reproduce these specific samples, um, I used a, a firearm, the same firearm, in an orientation in a contact position. Okay. That's my feed from long crime, folks. Oh, my God. Everybody else is still here, so it's not me. Joe's here. Steve's here. Oh. Well, hey, while we got a pause, Joe, you want to tell everybody who you are, in case anybody doesn't know? My name is Joe Nierman. <clears throat> my channel is called Good Logic, and that's what everyone seems to call me. I am um, a New York attorney. I've been doing this YouTube thing for like uh, 18 months or so. 
And um, yeah, I stream him nightly, six nights a week, Sunday through Saturday night through Thursday. And yeah, I watch trials. But you really want to, my, my focus really is on law, politics, and making sure that when you're learning these things, that it's my So to try to reproduce these specific samples. Um, I used uh, a firearm, the same firearm, in an orientation in a context. And you said your channel, Good Logic? Good YouTube? Logic, yes. And I'm on Locals, too, at goodlogic.locals.com. All right, that's where to find Joe, folks. I recommend it. Thank you. Packed position. Okay, this is getting to be a pain. I'm going to refresh the page again. And so to try to reproduce these specific samples... Um, I used uh, a firearm, the same firearm, in an orientation in a contact position. Sticking at the same place. Um, it's a good time for us to comment on the video and audio quality of law and crime and how p completely pathetic it is. Just they, had they, work is. they had one job. They had one job. I mean, they pretend to do commentary, but the commentary is such garbage. That can't possibly be their job. They had one job, and they can't do it. They can't do it. All right. All right. Thoughts so far in this expert, Steve? Steve is muted. Steve is muted. I got it. I, I, I muted myself up there. You ready for the next slide? Yes, I am. All right. We're back. Never mind, Steve. Yeah, shut yourself up, Steve. Stop yammering so much. It's distracting. <laughs> and again, this is just close-up photographs of those two test shots that you just saw after they were produced with a scale and showing the direction of the shot travel. Um, and these, like I said, approximate what was seen at those two shots, impact 11 and 12 at the scene. Next. What are we looking at here? So this is a view from, I believe, a Google Earth or Google Map of the site. Or in this case, no, I, I correct myself. I believe that's a, an aerial view that was taken by investigators at the scene. Um, this particular area in the highlighted area, the red zones, the rectangles, show the locations of where the impacts were recorded inside and on their way out of the structure. And so I wanted to try to roughly diagram those based on the photographs that were offered. And the next slide should show the diagram. This is a shooting reconstruction expert and firearms. So in this case, I was focused on the trajectory rods that were made um, visible by investigators. They place a rod into a bullet path that tries to approximate the location and the angles and the directionality of that particular shot. Um, there were three going through the interior door between the mudroom and the hallway. Those are the ones in the center circle in green. And there were also three that went through the exterior wall and I believe a, a heating or some other unit that was in its path. So the individual photographs you can see to the right and above in this diagram image. Now the trajectory rods were placed, giving sort of a rough estimate of where the shots passed through and at what approximate angles. Uh, they weren't measured though, at least not that I could tell. And the photographs weren't of particular angles that were useful for taking measurements because sometimes you can take measurements directly off a photo if the photograph is done in a precise way. Um, the other thing that is lacking and it may or may not have been determinable is whether or not those three shots going through the door are also the same three shots that went through the wall. Uh, bullets can travel through a number of structures. Uh, the next images show uh, the actual impacts through the door itself. And it's a bit of a close-up showing the, the shots as they are going into the door from the inside, heading outwards. Um, and in this case, if you look, you can see that the holes through the actual door itself, those holes are not round. The holes indicate sort of an oval shape. And what that tells me is at the moment these shots all struck this door, they were likely destabilized by one of two possibilities either uh, something in the relationship with a firearm that's not properly stabilizing the bullets, such as the incorrect twist of rifling or something like that, some defect, or these bullets may have struck some other surface on their way. These might be continuations of other impacts 
that hit the hallway and then ricocheted off the flooring. At this point, I can't say either way. What are we looking at here? So this is a view of that hallway. And what I'll point out, and we'll see, I think, I think I have a better view of it as well, but there's another shot here. The three shots that we just saw going through the doorway are all through here. And you can't see them in this image because they're blocked by the door wall. But the uh, one through the actual corner itself that you can see has a trajectory rod through it. And there are additional impacts that are marked and labeled on the floor. You can see several of them here. And those shots were identified and marked and individually photographed. My next to process was to look at those individual photographs. I couldn't see any residues. I wanted to see if the feedback that we're getting gave me any information on directionality. We're hearing an echo. Now, there's two types of directionality. Oh, of the two spots there. Bullet paths. I think that's elevation, which just means how upward or downward is that bullet path relative to gravity. And the second thing is what we would call an azimuth or a horizontal or a bird's eye view, which is what you would see if you were looking straight down. And that was what I was more focused on. That angle, that virtual visual top down view would give an indication of which direction through the structure these bullets were flying. And if they were hitting at a shallow angle, I could see that. If they were hitting at a steeper angle, they would be more difficult to determine because that shot would not be, it'd be closer to a round hole rather than a linear hole that would point in the direction of bullet travel. And why is that important in this case? Well, in this case, I think there was some question about whether or not there was a struggle. And one of the things that I thought lent itself to a struggle besides the orientation of a firearm leaving those residue patterns we already discussed would be a very shallow impact. You know, uh, somebody, somebody firing a gun very low to the ground, unless you're lying prone in a deliberate fashion, that might also be indicative of shots fired during a struggle while the gun is being forced away from somebody and held low. Are we done with this slide? Yes. What are we looking at here? So this is inside that room, um, looking at slightly different angle. This shows additional impacts. These are the ones we've already discussed, 11 and 12. Here are some other impacts here. Um, I don't believe these are impacts. I believe these are blood marks. I don't recall specifically. But also showing the location in that room where these individual impacts were. And as you'll start to see, once I look at the diagram, these impacts were going in this direction. Um, both 11, 12, and the one next to it, which is I think was number 10, but it's in my diagram if we go to the next slide, I believe. Before we move to your next slide, though, please. the location of impact sites 10, 11, and 12, was that interesting to you, or does that say anything to you? Yes. Um, it's easier to see when you get the whole diagram, but the bulk of the trajectories were at least going this direction down the hallway, but these were running in a very different direction. These were more or less parallel. Okay. Yeah, that's probably good. <laughs> okay. um, the red arrows are indicating what I'm, my finger is doing a mediocre job of drawing. Uh, the red arrows show the indications of where these individual impacts were and what their angles were relative to a bird's eye view. Mm -hmm. So we have multiple trajectory angles illustrated here. What's almost as interesting are these impacts that I can't make that determination because they were fired at a steeper angle. And again, if the firearm is fired downward at a steeper angle, that may also be indicative of some kind of struggle for the gun because it's, it's, there's not a reason to do that short of maybe a warning shot or something of that nature or an accident. And what about impact 14? Um, 14 parallels going down the hallway. That's at a slightly different angle than the ones that appeared to be going through the door and also exiting the structure with the purple trajectory rods in the, some of the previous slides. Um, but other than that, I can't comment more than just that kind of angle. So how many different directions do we have bullets flying at this scene? I would say there are, um, it's unknown at this point. Um, there are at least, if you want to simplify and keep 14, uh, 9, and these 8 with the arrow all together with the group that are going through the door and the group that are going out the side of the wall, all those could be roughly described as a direction that way. But there's going to be some variation. But these, this group, this cluster, all appears to be going 
talk about a ninety degrees from them, and in particular, um, other impacts without that kind of directionality that I could determine from photographs could be in a totally different direction if, for no other reason, they're not being fired at a shallow angle to make ricochet or slight shallow impacts on the floor. They would be fired at a different angle, so something steeper. So once you consider three dimensions, I would say we have at least three likely sets of trajectory angles that these cart these fired um, bullet impacts would uh, fall into. And when you have these three different angles, what does that tell you about the about the scene? Uh, what that tells me is uh, it supports the likelihood of a struggle for the firearm uh, because the, a deliberate attempt to shoot at those angles doesn't really make any sense. Um, if people are fighting over a gun and it's going off in the process, that would help go a long way to explain different trajectory angles and also different vertical angles and even different orientations where the gun's upside down and in contact with the floor. That's a very unusual angle, and I felt that was the most compelling. Okay, and we're talking about those impact sites with the scorch marks that you tried to replicate in your testing. That's correct. Okay. I mean, is that something you see a lot in shooting reconstruction? I would say not often, and um, we do see things like that. Sometimes you just see a muzzle blast. Um, the firearm would have to have a muzzle device of that type, and then the muzzle device of that type would have to be in a location during the shooting event where it could produce it. But I have seen that before in some instances. Um, before we move on, um, the other three trajectory aspects I wanted to focus on were the ones through the body, through the decedent. There were two wounds to the decedent, um, one to the head and then one to the, the chest. Both were described by the medical examiner as um, top to bottom, right to left. So if you're seeing me passing through me in this direction, as well as in the diagram, but no front or backward orientation. So these projectiles are essentially slicing straight through this type of angle. Um, that's an unusual angle. If someone were shot while they were standing below a shooter, that would make sense. But in this case, given the likelihood of uh, a shooter being in a position that's on or near the ground, that body would have to be pivoted in such a way at the waist that it is point oriented mostly in that level. So bent at the waist, pointed, if not forward, slightly to the left of the shooter's position if both of those were produced at the same instant. Now, I can't sequence these shots. I can't say that the two shots through the body or the third shot I've described, which is a, a gray shot we'll show you in a moment, I can't say those were fired simultaneously or all at the same time. That seems to be the most likely scenario. Based on the location where the body fell and was found, it was, I think it's unlikely those shots would have been delivered after that incident. And you were in the courtroom when Mr. Cummings was testifying today, is that correct? Yes, I was. And you heard his description of what happened that day. I did. And would you agree that what he's describing as this altercation where he's on the floor doing this crack called back, and as he's trying to stand up, the actual meeting. A little loud, a little bit. And as he's, thank you, Your Honor. And as he's standing up, he starts to shoot as Mr. Ariola is coming at him. Would that be consistent with what we see here? It could be, yes. Um, I think the next image shows um, the grays. Well, that's really the key question right there. So what are we looking at yep. here? Yeah. So this is the decedent in the position where he was found. The question is be how much he got paid for this testimony. Uh, as I said, there's two wound paths that go well, through the Well, that's coming on cross. Although you should really bring it up on direct. Angle. Just there's to sort of cut the teeth out. He might not be paid anything. It's the clothing, the not place. place wound. But it also parallels those that's true. Trajectories. Maybe they brought him in, didn't like what he said, and said, we're not talking to him. skimming across the back through the clothing. Exactly. At the same angle and at the surface of the actual garment itself where it wouldn't produce a wound. So I regarded all three of those as parallel trajectories relative to the body, even though only two of them produced injuries. Next slide. Please, yeah. <clears throat> One other thing I noted uh, was the front scope cover was missing. It had been pulled off and also broken. There's two parts to it. You can see there's the lid that flips up and down. And there's also the, the circular rubber section that goes directly on the scope and holds that in place. Um, having this thing separated uh, could also have been done during a struggle because someone grappling for the gun could easily get a hold of that part and turn it or pull it and separate it from the gun and break it into two pieces. 
And did you see any evidence um, that there was electrical tape that had actually been used to secure the scope to the cap to the scope? Uh, yes, there appeared to be when the firearm was photographed on recovery, it had some tape that was around the scope itself. And that's usually done to uh, build up the circular surface area that the uh, scope cover is attaching to. The tighter the fit, the more likely it is to stay intact during use. Well, that's not what the uh, defendant described. So one last thing, um, these are photographs of the defendant's hands, specifically on this hand, which is the left hand. There are two sort of dark, I would call them scorch marks or dark residues. Um, they could be from a number of sources, but one of the things I have seen before and experienced personally is if a firearm is being held in an orientation or a location where the residues are coming out of the gun at that spot, you can occasionally get those residues deposited on your hand. Um, I'll use this gun as an example. If I was holding the firearm in a normal orientation for firing, I would be gripping the pistol grip with my right hand and the left hand would be underneath this part here. Uh, residues though may be coming out of the gun, not just at the muzzle, but also at the ejection port, possibly through these vents up top or below, and also through this area here. Um, I, I didn't have the opportunity to test this ammunition in this firearm to see at what point those residues could come. But the extent that those residues could be produced um, from areas of the gun that aren't normally held by the shooter, finding residues on a hand could be indicative of the gun being held at an unusual position or an unusual location at the moment the gun was fired, or at a moment the gun was fired. I thought the tape was wrapped around the outside of the scope cover, not on the inside of the scope cover to increase the diameter of the scope. But I could be wrong. It doesn't matter. It's a little confusing on what was, how the defendant testified. It's confusing. I do want to ask you a little follow-up. This photo here, this is one of the photos that was in evidence, is that correct? Yes, that's a photo of the exterior, this location, but on the outside. And what do these trajectory rods, what do they tell you about the direction or the orientation of the bullets? Um, this is just one photo. There are other photos that do show the interior and show other elements of bullet paths. So for example, um, if I have a shot fired through two structures, I can connect those two dots and form a line. That'll give me an approximation of the bullet's path through those items. Um, there were other structures inside the, the structure here that you can't see in these photos. But the individual rods are meant to show the approximate trajectory of the bullets that made the bullet holes, uh, they're, they're pushed through. And in this case, you can see one is very close to the floor because the floor is essentially this level here. And these other two are slightly higher and diverge slightly. Now I can't give accurate measurements because I don't have photos that will allow me to measure directly. And as far as I know, direct measurements were not obtained. Um, but what we're not. it does tell me that these are low shots that are either slightly ascending, uh, which could be indicative of a ricochet or from a low position firing out. And then these, this lower one here, again, same thing, could have hit something uh, on the way in at a low angle and just be traveling low or maybe on a ricochet upward. Now, Mr. Brudenell, <clears throat> there's been testimony in this case regarding uh, the distance of the gunshot wounds or the distance of the gun to the gunshot wounds. Yes. Um, are you familiar with that testimony? Um, I'm not sure. I, I, if it was something I heard today, I'm remembering only what I've reviewed in the medical examiner's um, documentation. Okay. So you reviewed the uh, medical investigator's report? Correct. Okay. And... The doctor testified last week that the shot to the head was at an intermediate range. Yes. What does that mean to you as a forensic scientist specializing in shooting reconstruction? To me, and generally speaking, I think throughout the field, intermediate means that it was close enough to see residues. So residues from the shot being fired, some of the residues we discussed today, um, but not close enough that it was in contact. Um, a wound, especially the skin, at a contact distance produces some very characteristic damage to the tissue that separates it from a shot fired from a distance. 
um, and an intermediate means it was close enough to leave some residues, um, but not close enough to actually be in contact. Um, the other has aspect of this was the, the absence of residues identified on the wound to the body, but that location was covered with clothing. So the residues that may have been present could have been on the clothing and intercepted by that. So the fact that there wasn't gunshot residue located on the body, can you make an accurate determination regarding distance without more analysis? Um, you may not be able to make an accurate determination of distance and you would do it with either shot separately probably. But I would say that it is possible that both shots could have been from a similar distance, not to the wounds themselves, but to the body in general, which is to say, if I'm bent forward facing somebody, and I'm gonna do this right now, the head may be closer to the gun than the chest. So two shots fired in a parallel path might produce residues on the face or the head but not produce them on the body. Because at that angle, those individual surfaces are different distances away. And specifically regarding the gunshot to the chest, that would be a scenario where gunshot residue analysis might be helpful? Um, it could be helpful in either case. Um, I can't speak to every um, combination of investigators and labs and agencies, but traditionally um, wounds to the skin are evaluated by the medical examiner for distance. Um, they may use uh, forensic scientists at the crime lab for test fire generation or other resources. Uh, shots to clothing are often delivered directly to the laboratory for analysis by them. So it really depends on the, the surface that struck and the organizations involved in the investigation and the forensic analysis. And being as how you work in a crime lab, you work with law enforcement. Um, in your experience, who typically is responsible for determining what type of forensic testing to do? In most cases, the either investigator involved in the initial investigation would make the determination. In the state's case in chief, did they, they bring in an expert to say give that to the laboratory with the evidence what they that, call a laboratory be request? Sense. So they're requesting the analysis they for want done. Law enforcement who came on the they scene. They may or may not want DNA or analysis. fingerprints collected from the audio is very choppy. Um, uh, they know the case better usually than anyone at the lab because the lab is a service organization. Um, in some cases, depending on the on the uh, the type of case, those uh, the only the only trial, those requests may also the uh, state has for law enforcement involved in the investigation. They did no trajectory analysis like we've done here, and the lead investigator after the event had a nine day coma and lost all now, memory. Mr. Brudenell, do you still have the right. firearm up there? Yes, I do. Could you take a closer look at it, please? Can you look on that firearm and see if there's any sort of dried residue or spatter? Yes, um, and it's difficult to visualize, but what I'm seeing here are um, a number of, I would call, call them essentially gray spots, small tiny spots, and in some cases, slightly larger ones on the opposite side. These were never tested. Um, they, they look almost like uh, water spots look on, say, a dark surface if the, you know, the water evaporates and you see a little bit of the, the calcium residue behind. Is that blood? Uh, it doesn't look like blood to me. Um, in the initial photographs that I saw, it appeared fresher and more wet, and I thought there was a possibility it could be blood. Um, but at this point, I wouldn't, I wouldn't guess that it's blood based on visualizing it. Could it be gun oil? Uh, I guess it could be, and I can't be certain that it's not blood without some testing. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't really know what it is. Could it be mace? Possibly. So without further testing, it's hard to be certain what it is. That's correct. And are you aware if there are any uh, laboratories that can do testing to determine if something has been sprayed with mace? Um, my understanding is there are a number of laboratories that could do that. Um, it's not a common uh, analysis that you see in most uh, routine crime laboratories but there are specialty laboratories that do all sorts of chemical analysis, so I suspect it could be done. Now, Mr. Brudenell, um, given your review of all of the evidence, uh, do you have any opinions about whether there could have been a struggle that occurred at the time of the shooting? Um, individual aspects of what I reviewed 
point that direction. Um, the, the damaged and removed scope covers, the varied trajectory angles, and also the fact that the majority of the trajectory impacts I've seen appear to have a shallow impact. Um, the, the fact that these residue patterns indicate the firearm was upside down and in contact or likely close contact with the, with the flooring when it was fired for two of those shots. Um, all of this independently suggests uh, a struggle. I can't think of a, a more likely scenario uh, to describe that combination of events. Thank you. Thank you. We passed the witness. <clears throat> now, now the state's going to begin raising reasonable doubt. For the last, they'll ask him first how much he's paid. Oh, we're taking a break. I, I think then they're going to state. Saying, I think isn't this it possible is that this isn't it possible that that. But this is this is a, I think this is the state's firearm examiner. I think this was one of the state witnesses, and they no, he no, came this, up with a word. This guy's from Arizona. He's not from New Mexico. Oh, okay, okay. Well, he's, no, he's from the adjacent state. He, all right, he's the adjacent state. He's he's really. I mean, what are you going to say? This the defense of the state, like the defense. It's cross. Like the state has <laughs> nothing like this guy. Fourteen minutes. Ten minute break. All right. I'll be right back. Yep, it's not looking good for the prosecution because they simply, they're as uh, they say in my cousin Vinny, their case doesn't hold water. The state's case doesn't hold water. They 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 just don't have anything that's inconsistent with the defense narrative of self defense. Indeed, the evidence is overwhelmingly consistent with self defense. In a, in a trial where the burden is on the state to disprove self-defense beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, I'm going to wait till after the uh, cross-examination of this guy, but then I'll put up another poll and uh, we can see if the voting has changed. Last time I did a, a poll, it was like 98% guilty, 2% not guilty. If I count the are undersided, we, it's not guilty. Are, are we behind in the in the stream? Can we move? No, we, should, we should be pretty much caught up, I think. Yep, we're caught up. Within, within a minute, it's hard to get to the last minute. The screen goes black on me, but. We can do the uh, the lost side-by-side -side too, right? Well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you were asking about opinions and stuff. We all have opinions, right? <laughs> and they're all, they're all worth what you're paying for them, I guess. But, but um, this guy, I think he was very good, very good witness for the defense. All the things he testified to, I think, were very coherent and rational. Um, I have a, a quibble with this type of expert on a very narrow issue, and that is the, uh, the, the issue of matching a particular bullet to a particular firearm. I think that's faux science. I don't think that's supported by, by um, that tool mark analysis that he's an expert in. I think and, it's all uh, bullshit. He did mention <laughs> it's all, yeah, it's, well, you're a little less, big. yes, it's bullshit. Yeah. But he, and he yeah. did mention that there, if there's some gross that, deviation, a different number of lands and grooves, you know, then that's obvious. It's not fired from that gun, but uh, bullets that are, are fired from similar barrels, similar ammo, th they're going to look similar. And every bullet fired out of the gun is going to look a little different. I mean, the, the gun induces wear on the barrel. It changes the marks. Uh, this idea that it's like a DNA analysis on a human being is ridiculous. Now, let me, let yeah, me well, and they, they test that it's not an issue in this case. So it's not right. really, you know, the fact that the shell casings of the bullets match up, I mean, that's not an issue. But oftentimes these types of experts do testify that bullets match when they cannot determine that is not science. That is garbage science. And uh, and I we deal with that with the FDLE Florida Department. This guy sounds like he does it in Arizona, but that's not an issue in this case. It's a minor quibble. It's a defense attorney quibble. But the other things that he's testifying to, I are very good on um, the the uh, trajectory analysis, the, the right. consistent with the struggle, the, the way that the gun was upside down and the muzzle break and the recreating the patterns. All of those things were very good, I thought. Yeah, I would I would agree. He, he was very strong. And look, I haven't I obviously didn't see the the, the defendant's testimony, but assuming you, your your take was was accurate, it's it seems like there's a lot here to raise reasonable doubt. I am curious. I, one of the things I, I, I would be thinking about if I was like, let's say, the in a follow-up suit from from decedent's family, 
for wrong for, for wrongful death. I would be stressing the fact that nobody knows when those bullet holes were made. Those bullet holes could have been made in another fight mm -hmm. that he had a week earlier or or 10 minutes after he killed this guy intentionally. So right. so and with respect to the timing of those bullet holes, you know, it doesn't definitively say that he didn't that it wasn't intentional, you know, intentional murder for a second degree murder here. But at, as far as raising reasonable doubt, I th you know, for this case, I think that this was this was fairly strong. Yeah, especially in contrast with what the state had to offer when they were delivering their case in chief, their, their law enforcement testimony was garbage. These guys, half their equipment didn't work. They couldn't tell what time of day it was. They couldn't tell it. Remember if it was daytime or nighttime. They didn't refresh their recollection from their reports. They didn't send things out for analysis. They, uh, I mean, it was just a complete clusterfuck. They didn't do trajectory analysis. The lead investigator said, uh, well, I just assumed they were going to do a trajectory analysis when I sent it to the labs. Uh, but he, he couldn't even remember if he testified before the grand jury because he'd had some kind of event afterwards that put him in a coma for nine days. And he's got no memory of any of this stuff. Well, uh, and that's and, their lead and, looking, and looking at the, the prosecution case as a whole, and I've, I've caught most of it, um, there is no independent narrative that is consistent with guilt, as far as I can see. Except that there's a dead person, and the defendant says he shot him. Is there and a there's motive? an AR-15. Is there a and motive? There's an AR uh, no, no, there's no evidence for a motive. There's no evidence for any, uh, you know, I mean, listen, it's the five elements of the self-defense claim, right? The guy's claiming self-defense. So was was the defendant the unlawful aggressor, the element of innocence? There's no evidence on that. Was the defendant not defending against an imminent threat there's there's no counter evidence to that did he did he use disproportional force i mean the two men were fighting over the rifle at that time it's just a gunfight it's a deadly force fight uh, there was no duty to avoid new mexico is a stand your ground state in any case he was living in this trailer so that becomes his castle and we're i mean at the beginning in the opening statement the state said this case is about reasonableness but reasonableness means you're applying your powers of reason to evidence. And where's the evidence that's contrary to self-defense? They, they haven't introduced any. They, yeah, they just want to I assume, kill. I assume the dead guy's prints are on the gun also. Well, he's not denying you shot him. So who's prints? Do you mean the victims? The victim, yeah. Now, we've, had, we've heard no fingerprint testimony. They did DNA analysis. But as often happens with DNA analysis, this, their, sec, their second person DNA in the gun, but they couldn't match it. So the owner, the defendant's DNA is on the gun, of course, as you would expect, and then somebody else's DNA. But they weren't able to match that to the victim. Hmm. So that doesn't, you know, that's not in support that the victim was fighting for the gun, but it's not inconsistent with the self-defense narrative either. Well, I didn't hear his story. In his story, did he say they wrestled for the gun? Because I remember yes. reading something to yeah. that effect. You know, yep. I read up on this case online. I remember reading some of that fact. So, so you have to ask yourself how it is that he wrestled for the gun and none of his prints or anything or his DNA ended up on the gun, but someone else's is. I guess that's that's possible. But I'm saying I'm trying to find some way that the state could try to salvage this case. But it, and they, I mean, they would have to skunk does, his story. Right. We, so, we, we don't, yeah, it, 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 it becomes ambiguous. But ambiguity is not enough to overcome a claim of self-defense. You have to disprove it beyond any reasonable doubt. Right. No, I understand. Yeah, the, the state has nothing, and they've been really, it's just been terrible. They should never have brought this case. This is really a travesty that this is being brought. I mean, from this, I've seen the most of the state's case. I'm seeing a lot of the defense testimony. There is just no evidence inconsistent with the state, the defense's stated reason for the shooting, which was self defense. The physical evidence is, is consistent with his claim of self defense, his testimony has been consistent. The motive, the uh, the predispositions of the victim of the shooting, is consistent with the self defense. You know, all of his actions, were, I think, were the proper, which what you would recommend generally for somebody if they were in the situation. What would you recommend that he do differently than what he did? I, I mean, I don't know. And think it's, about the kind of evidence that we could we could imagine evidence that would be entirely inconsistent with self defense, right? The guy shot in the back from a distance. The guy shot in the front from a distance. Uh, the guy is, uh, I don't know, uh, shot when he's laying on the ground and the bullet goes through his body into the floor. I mean, there, there's things that would definitely not look like self-defense. But but we don't, 
uh, prior threats by the defendant to, to kill this guy if he ever sees him again. Things like that. We'd say, uh, all right, well, that that really undermines a claim of you know genuine self-defense. But but there's nothing like that in evidence. Well, even good logic brought it up. He said, uh, or my name is Joe. <laughs> he, he even brought up, he said, what's the motive? You know, there, this guy has no motive to shoot this guy. Now, on the other hand, the, the, the deceased, he has shown, demonstrated that he gets drunk and he's drugs and alcohol and he threatens people and he's attacked people offensively with his mates that he's with consistently deadly force. drunk. And that he was angry because this guy wanted to have his contract checked by the checked by the uh, his lawyer, and he didn't like it. And he called him a shyster. I forget what the word he says, scammer. And he didn't scammer. like that, so he's drunk and he's aggressive, and he's got his mace and he starts attacking. So I mean, that's consistent with previous behavior. It's consistent with their, it's consistent with the claim of self defense. I mean, there's just I, I I can't believe that this is a I I don't know. I it's it's very dis, disheartening to see these kind of cases being tried. We need Kyle's law to hold these prosecutors accountable, personally accountable for bringing these bullshit well, cases. At least, this guy, at let's least let's face it. Even if we assume that the guy will get acquitted, which I would never assume, but the, the shit, on the legal merits, he absolutely should be acquitted. He's already spent two and a half years in jail. That's right. on, wow. On this? Two and a half years in jail on this. No bail. This happened two and a half years ago. He's been in jail with no bail this entire time. Wow. On this. That feels on so this unjust. Happens. That feels so unjust. And he has no prior record, right? He was a celebrity at one point. He was a celebrity skier. So yeah. I don't think he has I don't think he has like uh I didn't read anything about him having prior incidents of hostility that well, there was well, no he, he, apparently he has some mental health history. So it, there there were stories on him in like outdoor magazine kind of publications where they interviewed his friends and his friends were like, Yeah, he's really kind of lost his way. He's become paranoid. He thinks there's conspiracy theories against him. For for at least a year, there was uh, questions about competency, uh, his competency to stand trial in this case. Hmm. But he did great on the witness stand. He testified very cleanly, and the prosecutors play him dirty. They they asked we we were we were speculating because um about the prosecutorial you know they both did they just have a weak case and they were ordered to try it. But the two things that have come out that have really soured me on the prosecution is one that they were surprised that the two other charges got dismissed at JOA, which they should not have been a surprise. That was very reasonable for them to be upset about that says that they bought into their own Kool-Aid. Right? right. And then the second thing was when they played dirty on the cross of the defendant and brought up, there were three different things they did that were appealable. And they, they generated three mistrial motions by this defense. Um, all that. And that was dirty pool. And that shows me that they're, they're, they're cheating because they don't have a case. And uh, a, a prosecutor should never keep cheat. They are there to uphold the law and the truth. And, for them to cheat, they are un they are subverting the law, which is a contrary to their stated mission. Right, which should be justice as best we can achieve it, not simply getting a conviction on somebody, not just getting the win. Well, and they did some stupid beginner errors, which was like just answer the question. The guy's trying to explain it, and then they shut him down, which is like explain exactly, explain to your heart's content because we want to understand, we want the truth, right? But instead, they're saying they'll just answer the question, yes or no. And then the defense gets up and says, so finish your answer. You know, it's like beginning 101. So who's trying to conceal the truth here? The defense or the state? It's the state. That's right. ridiculous. That should not, it's, everything's reversed in this case. And, the, and those witnesses in particular, Joe, were explicitly non-hostile witnesses. They were just people who came in to testify. And the state was treating them like they were hostile, biased witnesses uh, mm. in a very aggressive way. And one way. guy said he was the best friend of the decedent, right? Yeah. But that he was afraid of the decedent and that he'd been maced offensively by the decedent. Yeah. And the one that <clears throat> And it wasn't the first time the decedent he had he had like doorbell <laughs> video footage of the decedent macing his dog. Jeez. And and, and, he's, had, and he's been offensive he's been victim. Yeah, lady has got a he's got he's always drunk. <laughs> Which he's best friend. I'm just talking. glad he's dead. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. The jury must be thinking. It's like, all right, well, listen, we were sympathetic to the dead guy at first, but it turns out he's a real dick. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and you got to tell tell Joe about the uh, about the firearm demonstration. 
<laughs> Never was, seen anything okay. like that. It was uh, it was amazing. It was amazing. It's uh, here. Oh my God! This is the the blueberry is the lead prosecutor. She handed the defendant the rifle and asked him to step out of the witness stand and recreate the fight and point the gun at her. That's the actual gun, not checked to see if it was loaded, pointed directly at the prosecutor. Oh, they're in New Mexico and they never heard of Alec Baldwin. Have you ever heard of giving a defendant a gun and doing a demonstration in court like this? Have you ever seen anything wow. like that? The, well, well, Binger waved his gun at the jury, which is probably worse. But this is another step beyond. This is like, give it to the, the defendant. Uh, is this wow. cross? Cross. And it went on for like 10 minutes where there's, she's struggling and she's attacking him from above. And they don't have depositions of any. Everything was mailed in with these phone interviews. The sound's not on. We don't it? have audio, you, you know, by the way. We're waiting for the... For you to, I don't know if you turn off the audio, uh, Andrew. <laughs> Nothing. Are you playing it through... Sometimes you have to share. Yeah, I don't think you're... Maybe you're not sharing it properly. Well, these guys... They turn audience. away from the microphone, so I got to no, boost like, We don't hear anything audience. from Long Crime. We only hear you. Right now? Yeah. Okay. Let's try it again. When you bring it up, it's like share audio, I think. I just learned that trick myself. My wife taught me. <laughs> this guy, with this, this guy put in the comment. Today, correct? Better? Was listening to the trial. And the second <laughs> opinion that you had formed was that Mr. Adiola was shot from a low position. And now we're here. Likely from the corner of a room. Is that correct? That's what it appeared to me at the time, yes. Okay. Now, we also talked about trajectory and scene reconstruction and that it's more of a, like what's more likely or less likely based on what the evidence says. Is that right? Yes, and as I said... This is where the state starts asking, isn't it possible or this, or isn't it possible that? That's not proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Or have reasons to describe one as more or less likely. Okay, and I, I think that the best scenario well, the way you saying, put it, at least in your interview was that this isn't like the Scooby-Doo show where you finally figure out what happened and in what sequence. That's correct. You don't get to the end of the story and a full telling of exactly what happened. And what. Okay, and obviously you weren't there that day. Correct. Um, and so you don't know. You're reading the evidence, if you will. That's correct. Okay, and only Mr. Adiola and Mr. Cummings know exactly what happened that day. That's probably a fair statement. In fact, I would even say that participants in an, in an event often don't get the full picture because an intense event like a shooting uh, or a fight can affect a person's perception and memory. So as a general rule, I do use testimonial evidence when it's available and I find it useful, but more often than not, I try to focus only on the physical evidence because that's stuff that can be tested um, he now he's waited. explaining away any variances in the defendant's yeah. testimony. Okay, so let's talk about your opinion that there was a struggle, okay? Yes. Um, in a firearm like the one that we have here in this case, I don't know if you have it up there with you. Yes, it's right here. Um, how is a round chambered in a rifle like this? Um, in a rifle of this type, there's usually a, we call it By the way, there could have been a struggle and he killed him 20 minutes later also. Can you stand up and show the jury what you're That's another about? thing about the timing here. Yes. But again, um, in this case, the operating control is right. There. It raises reasonable doubt. It has sort of a shape to conform to a person's finger, for example. So to charge this gun, if you had a magazine seated in the magazine well, you would pull this to the rear and then release it. Okay. And then a round would be in the chamber then? Yes. If everything's functioning properly, um, a round would be taken from the magazine and put into the chamber in for preparation for firing. If there was something in the chamber at that moment, when the action is pulled open, what, what's in the chamber will typically be removed. So if I had a round in the chamber and a magazine seated and cycled it, you would find a live cartridge coming out of the gun and then another live one fed from the magazine into the chamber. Okay. So what you just described, having to pull the, the, 
pin back, I think you called it. Uh, charging charging handle. pin. Yes. Yep. Thank you, sir. I'm not good with these That's terminologies. Okay. Um, that's Holy an affirmative hell. action that would add time to somebody who wants to shoot that rifle. Is that correct? Um, it's a process that requires um, an action. Um, that action will require some amount of time. Okay. Um, so let's talk about the scene. I'm sure you've reviewed all of the photographs. I believe. Okay. So you told me that one of your opinions is that the struggle occurred in the bedroom and possibly the hallway. Do you remember that? Uh, I believe so, yes. Okay. Isn't it possible that... So I'm going <laughs> to put what's been admitted as State's Exhibit 45 under the document. Well, ultimately, she's trying, to, I, yeah. she's trying to bring it back to his testimony. If they believe his testimony, so, the state lost. So she's trying to mitigate so that, you know, it must be there was a struggle here or that, you know, he knows what happened. I mean, that's what the or state has to do impact, here. Um, I don't recall seeing any. Um, having not visited the scene, there's no way to know if there were impacts there that weren't documented. Um, but I didn't see any documentation of impacts there. Okay. And actually, let's use the photo from your demonstrative. I think that would be easier. And this is page nine. Yes. Okay, so that would be this wall, correct? Correct, I'll mark it here. Okay, and as far as you know, there is no impact documented to that wall. That's my understanding, yes. Okay, and was there was no impact- This is all entirely consistent with the defendant's wall, narrative correct? of self-defense. Was there any impact documented to this wall? Um, there was a single impact in the wall, it's a very low area, which was basically the door jam the door is not accurately represented here, but it's approximately in that location. So there was one shot that was to the door jam, which would be sort of the part of the hallway just adjacent to the doorway. Right here? Yes, approximately there. Yes. Um, well, you can't see it here. It was in a different photograph. Essentially, go back to that one if you moment, for a moment. It would be in this area right approximately here, slightly above the view of that photograph. Oh, there it is. You can see it. You have to, okay, but that's this. not in the bedroom, correct? No, leading out. Okay, so there were no impacts documented on this wall then, is that correct? I believe so, well, none that I saw. Okay, so we can agree there's no impact on this wall. Correct. This wall? Correct. Or this wall? Correct. So can we assume that the gun was not fired in any of those directions? Um, Directionality is tricky because there are two directions. There's the top down view that we're talking about here, but there's also a downward angle view. Um, okay. And so I can't be certain if there weren't impacts, one, that weren't recorded, or two, impacts that might have been going in those directions. Um, it hit the floor. We're at an angle such that the bullet didn't actually make it to the wall. So a bullet striking the floor, for example, or for that matter, one that went into the ceiling if it wasn't observed. Um, those wouldn't make it to the wall either. You also had testified on direct examination about some of the, the best practices in doing scene reconstruction and trajectory and things like that. You said that trajectory analysis would be one of the best practices. Is that correct? Um, yes, I think that's a fair statement. I, I don't usually use the phrase best practices, and maybe I did in this case, mm -hmm. but it's one of the things that can be done, and there are certain ways to do it. Um, in, in some cases, there's no need to do it. Um, in a case like this, I felt it uh, useful. Okay, and I, I apologize. You said perfect scenario, Fair not enough. best practices. Okay. I've used just, that term before. I just... Just to be clear, <laughs> you said perfect scenario. So you also said that in the perfect scenario, you would have measurements. Correct. Um, and when I interviewed you, um, you stated that it, measurements weren't important in this case. Is that correct? Um, I don't remember the exact contents if I made that statement, um, but I would say for the purposes of evaluating whether or not there was a struggle, I felt I had enough information to, to draw that conclusion from a variety of facts. Okay. Um, I think what would have been more interesting or useful would be to do connections of some of these trajectories um, it would be nice to know if it's possible that the three shots exiting the structure 
could have been continuations, say, of the three shots through the door. Mm -hmm. That could have been done with measurements, possibly. Could have also right. been done in other ways. And I think that the questions I asked you when we had done the interview was, did you measure the gun? Did you measure the room? Correct. And things of that nature. And you said that those types of measurements were not important, correct? To, to, to the best of my knowledge, they wouldn't be. And I would say that only in the context that without other measurements to tie them to, I can't make use of sort of half of an equation. Okay. So... You testified on direct examination about the broken cap gun. And I'll just use your photos since we have them here in handy. A broken cap so gun? So going somewhere? The cap of the gun. She's the, 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 she is, this is the prosecutor. Oh, the, the cover, the soap office. cover. <laughs> the, the thingy, you know, the thingy? <laughs> the pin? This is the prosecutor you asked to cross the defense firearm expert. expert? Yeah. A broken cap gun. Page 16 on your... Oh, my God. Demonstrative. And the penny thing that you pull? You have it circled on your... He's been doing this over a week now. This yes. child. She doesn't know um, it's a scope cover? You testified that this may be indicative of a struggle, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, but, and in your interview, you told me that these types of things aren't tip aren't super robust. Do you remember that? Um, I may, yeah, that sounds like the way I would have put it. Um, if I can elaborate, the, this scope cover, the part that goes around the scope is of a flexible rubber that's designed to stretch and fit over the, the front of the scope. Okay, and you said that this is something that can be easily broken if you are carrying the gun and you bang into something. Those are possibilities too, yes. Okay. Um, like in a fight? <laughs> what if it wasn't actually attached to the gun, but it was taped with electrical tape? Would it be easier to fall off? If it was actually taped, I would think it would be harder. It would depend on whether easier or harder is difficult to evaluate without a scope. So and he, using it adhesive, it we make it hard. Oh, we're not making it easier. Either. We're not making it easier to come off. would be used okay. on the inside to sort of expand the diameter so it fits tighter. Kind of like putting a thicker sock on your foot before putting a shoe on making a tighter fit. Is it typical to use electrical tape to I, put on a cap? Um, I've seen it done in the past. I would say more often than not, if you have access to a variety of sizes, you get the one that fits the best. But oftentimes you have what's available and to make it fit, you might do that. And in scenarios, if we're talking, I don't know how to reset this. Do you have the reset button there? Oh yes, I do. <laughs> um, you don't know, though, whether or not this cap was actually there before the homicide or not, correct? <laughs> no, it was just laying there before the homicide. Okay. Now, um, let's talk about the other impacts. And him not knowing is not evidence. <laughs> because Steve is right. This Steve. feels like reverse. This feels like a defense attorney were... trying to poke holes and, and right. testimony. Ways are reasonable. Yeah. In an upward trajectory. So it's possible that he a committed first degree murder. Were in specific right. Cases. So then in closing, you put through all the possibilities and you know potential holes in the state's case. But that's not how you you say beyond reasonable doubt this must be what you know it was must be murder. I'm absolutely certain about the upward trajectory without a really good. Did they rec how many did they recover ten shell casings of them and multiple photos? That's what it appeared to be. Yeah. And I'm so we have ten bullet holes and ten casings. So that's consistent, you know. It... There was a difference in number. I can't remember now which way it went. I think they might have had extra bullet holes correct? because things yes. deflected or um, made one bullet made two holes. Where the shooter like I think it was have 10 casings and maybe 11 or 12 or 13 Mr. bullet Adiolo holes. Was shot. Um, I guess I would say there are two possibilities that make sense to me. Um, the one that initially seemed the most logical would be the shooter somewhere in this vicinity. Uh, based on the fact that the trajectories would more or less correspond to their locations and their path through the body as it. All right, Andrew, I got to start prepping for my show. Great seeing you guys. All right, buddy. Nice Thanks for coming by, you. Joe. All my pleasure. Shots that struck, the two struck, the shots that struck the decedent hit him at the same time, and he was incapacitated immediately thereafter. Um, it is possible that either of those assumptions are not correct. Um, the third shot across grazing the back also corroborates those orientations. Um, the other theory that does uh, fit that I think would be a shooter in this position 
and descriptions of the body turning slightly as the shots are fired. If it is back to the torso. So both where he's backed into a corner, back against the wall. Turn slightly. And are you saying on the bed or in front of the bed? Um, this is the part that I have no really good way to assign it. If, uh, two people standing, one bent forward and charging. This doesn't really shot. make sense to me because all the brass is where those green cones are. If you were facing away from that bed, that green red, the brass would be over by the far wall. That's true. I, I think it's more consistent with him not being on the bed, but the brass does bounce around. It's such but it a all ended up in the same place, though. Right, that's what, then that based yeah, that's why I go with the other the evidence that the shooter was at an elevated position from the decedent. Um, it is a possibility. Um, what I would say is the orientation of the firearm at those moments, those two or three shots were fired, is consistent with being parallel to the torso. Now, whether that means two people are, well, one person is at a position or the gun is at a position at this level and the body of the decedent is tilted exactly level with it, or that there's a slight variation, the body's tilted most of the way down, and the, the firearm is at a slightly elevated position is possible as well. Okay, let's talk about the position of the, dis the body during the shooting. I think that was your second opinion we had talked about in your interview. I, I think I missed the first half of your question. Please. Um, let's talk about the body of the decedent since, yes. since we're talking about this now. Um, this was a three-shot grouping in the bedroom? Well, there were um, three shots, two that struck the body and one that grazed the clothing that are all more or less parallel. Okay. And they were right to left? Correct, right to left and downward. Trajectory, okay. And that's based on an anatomical position of a person standing straight up. And can the trajectory of a bullet change inside the body as it hits different organs or different matter within the body can the trajectory change it can depending on a number of factors the, the type of projectile the speed and the objects in the body that it strikes um, my evaluation of that analysis is based strictly on what was reported in the medical exam so the medical examiner presumably follows the entire trajectory and describes it as a linear path um, presumably if a shot was fired and they hit a rib and changed direction, they would hopefully be able to describe that as well. Okay. Um, now, Mr. Audiola, is it possible that he was on all fours in a crawling position based on the shots to his body? I believe that is possible as well. Is it possible that Mr. Audiola was bent over leaning forward? Uh, yes. And the shooter, based on this position, must have been over or at a higher elevation or than the decedent was, shooting um, downward. It's a possibility, and um, one that I think is maybe almost absurd would be if the shooter was at the top bunk firing downward, I would still expect the torso of the decedent when the moment the shots were fired to have been bent forward slightly, at least, to correspond to that angle. Um, I think this was a hypothetical we talked about, right? Right, I believe so. Where the, potentially the shooter's on the top bunk bed, fires one shot, and then jumps down and fires two more, correct? This is why trajectory um, analysis on bodies is really useless because the, the it's such that, a dynamic and changing scene. The problem is that it requires uh, those shots to also continuously parallel themselves after bodies are changing position. Um, it's not impossible, but it, it's probably not the most likely scenario. Is it possible that the shooter could be standing on that twin size bed shooting down? Um, there is a possibility, yes. So oh, this is so stupid. But no measurements of Mr. Cummings or Mr. Audiola were used in any of your analysis, correct? Uh, correct. And there were no measurements available that I'm aware of, except okay. possibly the body height measurement from the medical exam. Just from OMI, correct? correct. They typically correct. take those from they the routinely, decision. yeah, measure. They measure the body <laughs> position and also the position of the wounds relative to height. Okay, so let's talk about the impacts to the door. <coughs> he shot once from the top of the bunk and then jumped out and shot more. That seems incredible. Yes. Now, 
uh, the impact to the door and that door and then exiting outside. That was, was that likely a three round burst? Um, I wouldn't three round burst. three round burst because that implies something mechanical about the firearm. It could be three shots fired in succession. Um, and that would require the single shot passing through the door jam up here to correspond to one of these impacts. And for all three of these impacts to correspond to the exits here. Um, it's a reasonable hypothesis that that happened. Um, and without seeing the scene and or doing measurements, it would be difficult to verify. It might even be impossible to verify. Okay, because I think that there is also an air conditioner that those shots travel through, correct? Yes, the interior that I didn't have photographed here, but did see photographs of the inside of this wall had a, an air conditioner, some device, some mechanical operation or apparatus um, in the path of some of those bullets. So in regards to the hallway impacts, and I'm talking about page 14 here. Now, yes. is it possible I, that the pew pew went bang bang in this, this way way? Could those be like continuations of the projectile? Um, or, like ricochets? The po there is a possibility that that some, and I'll even go so far as to include nine, some of these could potentially relate to those other trajectories. Um, it's, it's difficult to be certain with the information available, and it may not be determined if we had all the time in the world and all the resources to investigate the scene. Um, but one of the possibilities would be those shots traveling together, ricocheting off the floor, and then proceeding off as a departure angle to produce those other impacts. That's a possibility. Would you also include I-14? Um, probably not, and only because I-14 is further down the hallway. The impacts, I think, were all <laughs> here and here um, relative to this diagram. Um, so that doesn't seem to fit. Um, so it couldn't ricochet off the wall or the metal door and then put the flooring there? Uh, this was a downward impact, and as far as I can recall, is there any point uh, to any of the questioning? Or what I would call primary impact. What is the issue? What is the that's point that she's trying to make with this expert? Yeah. And every time they put this diagram up, it just screams to me three different shooting positions one down yeah, the hallway, one where 10, 11, and 12 are, and then where the fatal wounds shots were fired. As he's backing up, too, yep. resulting in the last shots being the fatal wounds. Right. As he's backing up and firing, and they're struck. Those holes through the door all appeared to have um, but what I hear is, say, is it possible one more time sure is it possible but is it, it possible that there's reasonable doubt in this case is there's possible there was another shooter outside that came through and pointed the thing through a window and then opened and closed it that there's no point to this cross yes and this is a good example. What we have here is an impact location starting there and where the damage that's really obvious tends to be downrange of that impact. Um, and so as the bullet's coming in, it's traveling this direction and it's striking in a nose forward stable orientation, this is likely the primary impact. So the first thing that this bullet hit was this area of the flooring. Now, it could ricochet from here and possibly even divert slightly, but generally speaking, the departure would be along this line, which would separate it from the angles of the burst. Now, that said, this line may converge with some of the other lines that we've talked about, producing, say, shots into the door and exiting the structure. So all of them could converge at one location and be part of the same shooting sequence and position. But I wouldn't associate 14 with the other shots in terms of continuing trajectories. Okay, so let's talk about the muzzle pattern. And I'm putting that in the document camera, so this is it at 51. Does she want to talk about this? <laughs> I wouldn't so want to talk about this. The tighter, I think, when we talked about, you said is used to separate the burning components at the muzzle and reduce or eliminate the flash. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, and that flash is a ball of fire. Typically, yeah. If there's no flash hider, you see a really nice, bright, you know, 
football or basketball shape flat. Okay. Um, would continuous shooting like 11 times make that barrel pretty hot? Uh, it could, yes. Okay. So it would be hot to the touch. It may be. Yeah. It would depend on ambient temperature. Um, 11 shots is enough that it would certainly warm it up. Would it be too hot to the touch? I don't know. Okay. And um, can we agree that there were 11 fired casings recovered here? That's the information I got from the lab report uh, that the state lab um, produced. Okay, but there could be potentially more or less because they just recovered what was on scene. That's also a possibility. Okay. Now, when it could I be more or less, and I believe that you testified on direct examination that you believed the gun was being forced downward and upside down. Right. Is that correct? How do you know it's being forced downward? Couldn't it just be held in that position? Um, I'd say that's a possibility too. Um, I'm trying to think of a reason anyone would intentionally hold the gun in that orientation, and I can't come up with one. So my most logical assumption is that it was being forced down during a struggle. Okay, so that's your assumption, but we'd, I mean, someone could potentially just hold the gun in that position and fire it two times. Yes, and that's exactly what I did with my test shots. I just held the gun there, deliberately upside down, fired, fired. So absurd. Friend of mine. And just to be clear, you can't age impacts, is that correct? Oh, that is correct. It's almost impossible to um, sequence even shots like this moments apart or even shots that are separated by a long distance in time. Hey, Jeff. There's some exceptions to that. Good morning. For the most part. Um, Good morning. Well, we've been, is it we've possible? Been up all night. <laughs> okay, so Welcome. because you can't age impact. Is it possible for the case uh, to get like much worse? It looks like I missed some really, really good stuff on cross X of the defendant. Were there. We'll catch you up in the break. It's great. Yeah, it's a possibility. Is it possible that the marks were put there after the homicide? It's possible. Is it possible? Is it possible? Is it possible? This is. These are defense so, arguments. Let's talk about your test fires. The roles are reversed. This is a state. This is a defense expert. Again, on October twenty. Yeah, this this is the guy that works for the prosecution usually. And when yeah. I initially yeah, he worked for the uh, Arizona six, Department of Public you Safety. You had not done any test fires, store. correct? That's correct. You had formed your opinion, but you had worked not done any test tens. fires yet to support your opinion, correct? Uh, not in the combinations that we've seen today. I've done other shooting that did validate my opinion, but it, I felt it was prudent to do more. Okay, but so you did your test fires. Would you remember what day you did them? Um, I don't recall specifically. Um, I could probably look at photos and ages of the photos mm -hmm. and get that information from her, but I don't remember. Okay. But it wasn't done on October 6th. No, no, no. It was definitely done days or weeks later. Okay. And you told me at that time that every gun, and I think you said that on direct too, every gun and ammunition combination is very different in how the residues appear. Um, yeah. I should say not very different. If I said very, that was a misstatement on my part. No, but it's a misstatement by the state. It's possible to have <laughs> the same gun with different ammunition and see different results. It's also possible to have the same ammunition and different guns and see different results. And I'm putting underneath the document camera. We can agree that the top gun was the gun that was collected from the homicide scene. Correct. And I believe the bottom gun is the gun that you used for your <coughs> test fires, correct? That is correct. Um, Which one of these is an AR-15? Which one of them isn't? Has a larger scope. That's not going to affect oh. how it fires. <laughs> um, but you didn't use any measurements, correct? In your this test one looks fires? scary. Any measurements of the gun that we Yeah, Andrew, but this okay. this round had a green tip on it. So the measurements that I could rely on, I didn't necessarily measure them, but I knew the barrel length was 16 inches, well, technically to here, mm -hmm. um, because that's how this rifle was built. Uh, the resources I could find showed the barrel length here, and this model was 16 inches, and I looked at images of various gun types, and that's the, that, that was visually what this appeared to be. These photos may not be at the same scale, so the fact that this distance doesn't match this. And if I were the defense on closing, I'd say, you know, the um, state used the phrase, it's impossible 48 times in cross-examining our expert. Those appear to be the same. That alone is reasonable. The, that, uh, the Air 15 rifle here, the gas travels all the way down an open tube to cycle the action during firing. So there's more gas produced and delivered into the action here, whereas this firearm has a piston. So the gas only travels a right. short distance and drives a piston to the rear. It's a different mechanical operation. 
and that may or may not produce differences in the residue patterns. That was actually my next question, oh. sir. So you, Thank you. <laughs> already answered that. Um, what about this thingy? She has no you also testified about the different easy? types of flooring materials. Could that affect your test fires? Um, it is a possibility um, to try to simulate the flooring material from the actual shooting incident. You should have seen what like the expert did. It's brilliant. I, those photographs I, the, the, I the saw it. Were, um, verified. Did verified you see the muzzle? The marks? The oh, no, the no. Marks I, the muzzle. But there's I misunderstood. Variety, I said what the what the defendant did on cross That's I saw the picture that <laughs> Andrew showed him. Wait, what? I found it was available. Oh, I chose colors yeah. that more or less match the floor. The gun was fired upside uh, down at a forty-five yeah. degree yeah. angle yeah. against the floor. To to absolutely yeah, and he recreated that mark using the other test gun with and, the same uh, muzzle device. Of that flooring, actual sections of the flooring itself that hadn't been damaged. Okay. I also felt that for the most part, illustrating what I saw is significant didn't require that extra level of precision. So I wasn't too concerned that that wasn't available to me. Okay, and when I interviewed you on October 6th, you said that the measurements didn't really contribute to your opinion, correct? That's correct. Um, and the, the weight of the firearm also didn't contribute to your opinion, correct? Yes, that's also correct. Um, so let's talk about the differences between the two between the one in the incident and then the one in your test fires. We can see that it has a different fixed iron sight, correct? Oh, that's correct. What is that the size difference? difference? That I don't know. Um, and what I can tell you is looking visually at say the angle produced from the muzzle to the top of the front so sight appeared similar to me. Um, again, I didn't measure the angles, um, and I didn't have the everybody that comes on and like, firearm. what's going I on? An attempt to find so what? And make a model, but was unsuccessful. Um, I'm sure they're out there. I just they're they're less common than the air 15 rifles that I had access to. So the fixed sight on the six hour is the reason this couldn't have been self defense. Appears to be longer in length. Uh, the barrel isn't any longer. Do you, what are you referring the to? The fixed iron sight. Um, I don't really know. I don't have a measurement. And in your test fires, you laid this firearm directly onto the flooring sample, correct? Yes. So it was contact at the fixed iron site. Uh, yes, I did several shots prior to that um, at different distances and angles, but the ultimately the two that I used to try to most simulate what was seen at the scene was a contact shot where the floor sample was in this orientation. In direct contact, excuse me, with the muzzle Man, I can't draw a straight line today, sorry. Mm -hmm. The muzzle, the tip of the muzzle and the top of the front side. Okay. And I, in your interview on October 27th, you stated that that would probably be the most significant measurement was the rifle you used with the fixed iron sight to the... Um, that might've been the most significant measurement to have, but I would say my assumption is that differences in ammunition and probably differences in the gas system might produce... Oh my God, someone's gotta teach this guy how to tie it. Hi. I can't I'm not a tie. either of those, but that's my assumption. Okay, and would the size of the scope affect the angles in any way? In this case, I don't believe so, because the angle produced in this case goes above that of the, of the scope itself. And when I place the rifle here, lying in that orientation, the scope doesn't make contact when those two points do. Now, it's possible that there was a shallower angle and it might have interacted with this as well, which might have been another limitation but I, I simply didn't have opportunity to test that. Would that have added weight as well to the firearm? Weight? Weight, like heaviness? The scope you're... itself? Yes, would that yes, have added weight? Would, yes, the scope would be make it heavier. Okay. It's a heavier gun anyway, I think. And I believe you testified on direct examination that the rifle used in the homicide could have been less than three inches from the ground. Is that correct? Um, that's what my notes state. Yes, you... that sounds about right. Okay. Um, and that's what would have likely produced those patterns in the flooring. Correct. Okay. Now you talked a little bit about the ammunition. Um, what was the difference in the ammunition? Um, as far as I know, the only difference was a manufacture date of about five years. Um, it's the same product, if you will. It's a military spec specified mil spec product. So it's probably very consistent. 
but there's no way to be sure if they didn't change powder sources or formulations across that five year period of time. And was the grain count the same? Uh, the bullets are the same, you mean the powder charge or the bullet? Yes. Uh, I wouldn't know what the powder charge, whether it was the same weight or the same type of powder. That I, I don't have that information available. Could um, that affect the muzzle powder? <laughs> Again, it's all possibilities. They're trying to prove this proves self-defense okay, beyond a reason. Did you take that into account? How about the spring when weight of the players? magazine? Uh, no. Um, it's almost as if the prosecution has doubts. Because the moment of firing is a very instantaneous moment. The magazine would only relate to cycling. So I can't see how it relate. It would, it would interact with these data. What about someone's ability to hold it upside down if it's a 30 round magazine? Um, again, if it's upside down, the magazine's upward. So it may or may not have any relation to how it's being held. What about weight? Would it add weight to oh, the firearm? It could add a little bit of weight in either yeah. case. Um, let's talk about the size of the room. Actually, let's There's simply no point to this cross. States Exhibit 51. <sighs> You talked Look, a it's got a different stock. Of a Did that affect it? You take into account the items that are hanging on the wall if there were a struggle in this room. Um, I did not. I had no way of knowing if those items were there all along or if they had been dislodged during the event. Okay. I'm pushing this same photograph downward. So he doesn't know. Uncertainty. A mirror leaning against the wall, correct? I see that. Have you ever been in a mobile home before? Many times, yes. Okay. Are the walls pretty flexible in a mobile home? I think it depends on their construction. Um, I've been in perfectly built single. Is this this house. area of expertise? Flexible structures too. Okay. Now let me ask you another. He's an expert in mobile home design. And I don't know how far this. I mean, they still have standards. <laughs> Is it likely that this could have been a ricochet on Mr. Adiola's boot? Um, I can't really make uh, an educated call based on this photo and the resolution. Okay. Um, Let me, um, would it be better to view it on a digital screen? Or it might how about be, the uh, real boot? While you were zooming how about in, the actual like evidence? Photo that looks like it could be an impact. Did they introduce the boots into evidence? No. Uh, this is just, this is yeah. terrible. Well, on the defense side, why wouldn't they find another Sig Sauer, or, or as the defendant said, Sig and Sauer, to, to <laughs> I mean, use the same weapon to do the testing? This, that just creates an unnecessary problem. Do they still well, make them? Maybe. I don't know. It may, be, may have been hard to locate one. They're not super common. I don't, I'm not sure they still make them. They're expensive too. And he's what happened, Jeff. Too. Sorry. Oh, I <laughs> knocked Jeff out. <laughs> what is the point of this cross, though? What what point is she making? That it's possible. I mean, so lots of things happened. It's possible. There's lots of lots of explanations for what happened. Okay. Yeah, I don't see the SIG 556 listed on the SIG Sauer website anymore. They, they went to a, it looks like they went to an AR type platform, a real AR type platform. Because Americans love their AR type platforms. The, uh, the charging handle decision difference is, a, I mean, the, the pull, the, the, pull uh, the charging handle on the SIG is mm -hmm. easier to charge, I would say, oh. than an AR type. You gotta go to the it's song. a good rifle. I've shot them quite a bit. I, I really like the ones I used, but uh, I don't know. Maybe they were just mine was lent to me, so I didn't have to buy it. Maybe they're just more expensive. Mm -hmm. ARs are pretty dirt but cheap these like, days. It's kind of like that AK round. You know, you pull the AK slide on the back, yep. whereas an AR you have to kind of yeah, this good. way. Yep. Digital photograph, a better photograph. It definitely is a better photograph. <laughs> you you can <laughs> one hand. You can um, charge the uh, AR on your shoulder. Exactly you can just grab one side of it. You don't have to impact. use two fingers. Or is it possible that it could potentially be a ricochet impact on Mr. Audiolo's boot? 
could be uh, anything. Of this spot here, is that correct? Or are we no, on the toe. The toe there. Yes, sir. Um, a I scuffed boot. Possible. Um, very difficult to tell from this viewing. Uh, I certainly want to inspect. This is speculation. Um, yeah. Where's speculation. the freaking boot? This and this looked like state. A likely bullet impact as well. That could have been a ricochet. So it might be in the same vicinity. Um, it's, now he's just speculating. Particular impact, if it was an impact, um, uh, could also come from. Is he an expert on photo interpretation? Shot. I mean, that's what he's doing now. Shot fire. Well, but the state is going so far afield that it's like, I mean, as a defense, you don't want to object because they're self emulating. So it's like, from, let him self emulate. From this muzzle mark. If the defense redirects, the first thing they say to the jury is, hey, we know it's been a long day. <laughs> um, the first is um, it's unclear. And in my testing at 20 degrees, the shots that entered at that angle typically went through the floor. Um, now, the ones that you saw in the video came back out because the floor was on the soil and it ricocheted off of that surface. But the ones that were shot at 20 degree angle from the apparatus went clean through. So... First, it would have to verify that a ricochet occurred. Right. Um, the other problem I see is this is very shallow. So for this to occur, that departure angle would have to be skimming the floor surface. And um, I haven't done ricochet studies on these, this type of material to know, mm -hmm. but very often wood is what we call a yielding surface. So the ricochet at the departure angles tend to be more substantial than would produce an impact like that at this angle as we see it in the image. I would expect a higher hit somewhere up if that were a ricochet and a departure angle on wood. But to be fair, I have not tested this particular type of material. So we just don't know. Departure angles. <laughs> so it could ricochet up and potentially be up here? Is that a possibility? Yeah, or... possibility. Sure. There's a glare up here that I can't quite see. Okay. I'm trying to clear it and I think it's not going to let me. There we go. Oh, bu -bu -bu. man, thank God they televised these trials. Huh? We would never know that this um, kind of nonsense was happening. You, sir, you also told me that there could potentially be a three to five degree variance with angle measurements. Is that correct? Uh, yes. And it's widely accepted that anytime you do a measurement, like for a trajectory rod going through a structure, you can't rely on your measurements to be 100% accurate in all circumstances. So as a general rule, when those uh, measurements are recorded, there's a presumption or even a literal description that the measured angle could be anywhere from three to five degrees either way. Now, in the Scooby-Doo show, you said that you can read the evidence and maybe decide what likely happened, correct? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's a Scooby-Doo theory of... This criminal is state, liability. That state brought up Scooby Doo. The majority of the oh my spent God. casings were I, along this. I was I was know, literally just I was trying to process whether I heard that wrong and what I could possibly have heard instead of that. Oh my lord. Okay. However, there was one case. <laughs> Merka. Case exhibit forty five. I just thank God the defense team are women too, so I can't be accused of being a misogynist for dissing this. There was one documented casing, partially under the bunk bed, correct? Yes, I see that. Um, what side of the that firearm do spent <sighs> casings expel from? This is just terrible. Yes, sir. Please show the jury. The ejection port on the firearm. Is right here where my fingers uh, are. Now she's going to try to argue he was shooting into the room from the outside. At some point, now they may come out. I, I don't. What is she saying? Back, she's creating out, reasonable doubt that he doesn't know for sure what happened. Okay, and for purposes of the record, from the shooter, Where's your point is on the right side. That's correct. Typically, most generic ejection patterns are to the right and slightly to the rear. Rifles tend to vary a little more than that. I've seen a number of rifles eject forward as well. 
Is it, does it matter if you're right-handed or left-handed? Is that why? Um, it can matter <laughs> if you're left-handed, for example, and you're holding it in orientation where your head or face is in the path. But often and not, as not, it doesn't happen that way. Okay. So if the firearm was upside down, then the spent casing would expel to the left side of the shooter if you were holding the gun, correct? Um, yes. If I was holding the gun like this, casings would come out this way towards me. Okay. So would we expect to see two spent casings at least in this room on this side of the room? Um, there's a possibility you would see that. Okay. Um, I would certainly have tried to look for two knowing what I know now. But there's also a possibility that they can be moved, they can be kicked, correct. they can roll, correct. they can bounce they off a body roll. during a struggle. They could impact, I mean, a case could have impacted the metal. Bed so, literally, bed. there's again more doubt. Thanks, prosecutor. Right. Uh, and likewise, this cartridge case here could have bounced from one of the other shots and landed there. Now, I'm putting underneath the document camera state's exhibit 46. This is tiresome. And I believe She's this making was identified no as number 12 in the state police report. And that's a spent casing on that plastic bin, correct? I believe so. Does that tell you a piece of the story? Uh, again, same answer, basically. It's these ejection cartridge cases are coming out of the gun with a certain amount of force. There's lots of walls and objects they can hit. and bounce. Yes, yes, so of course. Make any attempt to interpret that location beyond that shot was probably fired in this room. Okay. Can you say that that bin was there at the time of the shooting? Um, based on this photo, I'm not sure. Um, I believe there was blood evidence on the uh, bin. And it appears to She's correspond. She's spending an awful lot of time on this witness. Where the blood has pooled, say, at the With bottom. no point. I've seen in other photos. Okay. So it's likely that that plastic tub was in the room, correct? Yeah, that's reasonable. And especially since there's a spent casing on the top of it, correct? correct? correct. Um, and that lid is partially open? Uh, looks to be, yes. Um, but you can't tell any information where the shooter was when that spent casing ejected from the gun, correct? No, I, I wouldn't risk it. Now, is that, did, is that blue? Is the floor brown? Um, during these your walls interview, thin? we talked about, and on direct examination, we talked about the OMI and the different distances that the doctor had determined the, the shots to the body were. Correct. So the shot to the head was determined to be intermediate, correct? Yes. And that's because there was stippling? Um, I don't recall the exact description, but there were some kind of gunshot residues indicative of a close range discharge, but not a contact shot. Okay. And then the shot to the chest was determined to be distant, correct? That's correct. Although I believe the determination was made strictly off the examination of the body. Um, any analysis of the clothing may have been superficially done, but that type of analysis for distance usually involves the crime lab and often uh, magnification, microscopes, and or chemical testing. Could the difference in distances, is there a possibility that it could come from someone walking towards the shooter? Uh, that could be a possibility, yes. Or the shooter walking <clears throat> towards the person being shot? Yes. Wait, so there, there's, there's multiple possibilities as to what could happen? <laughs> Literally every question is helping the defense. Every single so, question. In your opinion that yep, there was exactly. likely a struggle, did you take into account the size of this room? Um, it was a small room, um, but I think you can have a struggle in a very small space. So Agent Herrera had testified he was in this room for eight hours processing the scene. He's the one who did the rods and documented everything. He said well, he didn't document everything. Was about eight by ten. <laughs> okay. Can you show the ju jury what an eight by show ten the, room show the looks who? like <laughs> by taping it out? On the floor in the courtroom? So if you have a tape measure, I could do that. I do. Certainly. Fantastic, sir. What, what, I, I don't understand what's going on. What is the state trying to get at here? I don't know. It's stupid. They've seen the photos of a grown man's body in the room.
I mean, this is so painful. This is endless, too. Oh, God, now I have to tape it off. There's, no, tape point. Out the There's no point to this. There's no point to this, this cross. If you've got to look, look how the defense cross, look how the defense put on those witnesses in and out because they had something to say. See, these people have nothing to say, so they got to go on for hours. Plus, I got a plane to catch pretty soon, so we got to. They better wrap it up. Well, it's getting what there four four thirty now. Yeah. Yeah, four thirty. That's my time. Same time zone here. The what? So the. Uh, Sorry, I'm just getting frustrated with this prosecution team. I, the whole case. Well, you should tell you should tell uh, Jeff about the uh, about the of the the uh, disaster of the defendant testifying, pointing the gun at. Well, that was yeah, the, that's uh, what I woke up to. I woke up and I just I just picked up my phone because the battery died while I was asleep. I turned it on and the, the, literally the first thing I see is Andrew's post of this <laughs> like pointing the weapon yeah. directly at the prosecutor. I've Where never seen that in, ever. You would give the defendant the weapon. And, and he's, he's, he has, like, he has means it. it. So that there's a zip tie through the ejection port, obviously, so okay. you can't load the gun. And she has him cycle the bolt and it breaks the zip tie right off. Oh, no. Yeah. So, so there we have the, the bolt goes home and nobody had checked to make sure there wasn't a what? round in the chamber. Seriously? Yep. I was waiting. Remember when we were thinking it couldn't get worse than Rittenhouse? It just did. <laughs> oh, my God. That, that little, that little yeah. scene was worse than Rittenhouse. I don't know. Do you think that this is a weaker prosecution than Whit Rittenhouse? I don't know the exact dimensions of the bed. Um, uh, so, I, I, you're I mean, else. here we really don't know. In Rittenhouse, we knew it was self-defense. We had evidence positively in support of self-defense for every shot fired by Rittenhouse. Here, there's genuine uncertainty, but that's not the question. Really the legal know. question is, okay. can they disprove it beyond a reasonable doubt? And there's also some bunk beds in there, too, right? Yes. So, are they so in Rittenhouse, there was no question in my mind. It was absolutely self-defense. You could tell just from the evidence. Here, I don't know uh, it, what it was. It could have been orchestrated. Would have left very little room for a struggle, correct? Did the prosecution forget that just down the road, Alec Baldwin blew someone away doing stuff like that? Gun safety is not big in New Mexico. Apparently. We're looking at... The photograph. I think it was thirty-one. Then they then they would have hung the bailiff out the dry. Should have used him. He could absorb a couple of them. Again, about these muzzle pattern marks. Correct. All that taping was for one question. Would it like? Is it possible? Let me rephrase that. Is, is it, it possible? possible? Is it possible that the rifle would have hit the wall, being that Man. it was such a small room? I hope the defense is keeping the little hash, hash mark scores of all the is it possible. They said it not five times, not 10, not 15, not 20, 55 times. But there's no, there's no coherent prosecution theory by which they're trying to fit his testimony. All his testimony supports the defense narrative. And then they're just saying, is it possible that this, and is it possible this, and there's no coherent prosecution theory of culpability let me just make sure i got everything sir one minute is it possible you have more questions i would suggest ladies and gentlemen of the jury when the state says is it possible 138 um, times that's reasonable doubt the possibility of a struggle oh. for the for the gun is it possible to crab walk <laughs> Oh my God. holding that firearm and using the other hand to fight someone off. I, I don't, 
I think of crab walk and I have an image in my head of what that means. Um, my image may or may not be what everyone else thinks of. I think it's possible for a struggle to happen in this confined space. Crab walking may be part of that physical activity. Um, no one in the history of mankind has ever scrabbled backwards while holding a, a weapon in their hands, I guess. You just picked it up with one hand. It's not that heavy. We just lost the court video. Oh, did you? Shit. I don't think we're I was missing hoping you. he was over. <laughs> yeah. That's terrible. Terrible. Oh. Sorry, guys. She went to lawyer school, everybody. <laughs> That's why you're but there's the uh, hey before we know it, guy. she may be a, another another gal on YouTube with a channel. So do you think the defense is gonna call any more witnesses after this guy? Sorry, sir. Today? I don't know. You think this is our last witness or no? I thought they had a, uh, I don't know. Do I remember they had a medical witness, like a tox? Or was this guy supposed to do that and it got tossed? Did they call the, 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 the female witness yet? 17. I think there was one female witness they were going to call probably after this guy, I thought. Because they were talking about how they wouldn't get to her till the afternoon. You said mm -hmm. that these potentially could be burns? Um, I, I wouldn't describe them as burns. I would call them Sit marks. Um, residue patterns similar to those produced on the surface of, of the flooring, uh, which means that they're not burns, but they're uh, dark sooty residue. Well, now we know why Walter White set a business in New Mexico. Uh, contact with <laughs> Is it likely for those things to come off if someone washes their hands with soap and water? Um, it, they will come off to a certain extent, but it will depend on how much scrubbing you do. I've had them persist to the point that I'm washing my hands normally longer than you would for routine hand washing. And um, can you get those marks from holding the gun in a regular fashion like you showed us on direct examination? Um, I don't know for certain. There may be a possibility that if gas vents through the holes in the bottom, that that could occur. Um, I think it's not likely because I don't think they would. <laughs> Why would you vent holes, the exhaust into someone's hand? Scorch, but you know, leave residues on the hands. But it would seem to be a bit of a design flaw. There are other gaps where gas can come out. Um, my first thought was the ejection port, possibly the magazine well, if there's gases coming out there, or maybe somewhere around this vicinity. But without testing, it's, it's basically just uh, speculation on my part of where those residues could come out of this gun. And I can't be certain. I don't think gas is designed to come out of any other part of the gun. It comes out the piston and it comes out the barrel. Some touching something dirty like a car tire or it could come from anything, right? Yes. So we don't know what that is. It's possible. For sure, anyway. For sure. We can't know for um, sure. So what you're saying is there's reasonable doubt all over this case. Right. That's what I would do on redirect. I would say you were asked repeatedly what is possible. Can, can any of this be known beyond a reasonable doubt? Nope. I have different rates for different clients. And uh, how much he was paid. Okay. What will you be paid in total for your testimony in this case? In um, total. For my testimony, just the duration I'm here. Um, uh, I don't have my invoice complete at this point. I honestly don't know. And I, the most of my time is spent work up and to and prior to this testimony. So how much do you anticipate making for your testimony in this case? Or for your testimony and your preparation and your interviews and everything? All, the all in. Done in this case. I'll park it. I really don't have a number. Um, uh, I, I can't think of. Um, I really don't know what it finally would be. I can tell you I spent all day driving yesterday and then several hours preparing the night last night. Um, and when I added that day up, it was under 2000, but very close. Oh, my God. A long day of working on this. Dude. <laughs> and Work Andrew thinks you need to step up your game. You need to step up your game, my friend. Two thousand dollars through all this. Put in on this, and you drove out there. Jesus. Hey, you know, I'll do expert witness testimony for prosecutor. I'm a I'm a board certified criminal trial lawyer. I somebody wants to hire me for a these, these prosecutors should have hired you, Steve. Mr. Bruden, did you see any I didn't tell uh, them measurements to drop the case, of the though. bedroom in any of the evidence? 
So this eight by 10 tape that the prosecutor had you mark off on the floor, it, what is that based on? I believe it was based on an estimate by the investigator who, who surveyed the room. Okay. That's what she said. That's what she said, but we That's didn't actually said. see measurements. No. Is it possible that room was larger? I suppose so. Okay. We don't know because no one measured it. As far as I know, it wasn't measured. This is where you're supposed to hear, is it possible over and over and over again? Is it possible that the state used up all permissible uses of possible in their cross-examination of you? Exhibit 51. This would be the photograph that the prosecutor showed you of the room and it shows some things hanging on the wall. Yes. If there's a fight going on down here, what would you expect to happen over here against this wall? Um, I really don't, don't have an opinion. All I would say is I can imagine someone colliding into something on the wall or a wall, disrupting that wall and maybe not disrupting another wall at the same time. Um, it's a and, dynamic. and if, the fight is occurring where one person is repeatedly tackling another on the floor. Would it be reasonable to believe that maybe nothing would be disturbed over here? I think that's a reasonable possibility, yes. Prosecutor asked you about a mirror that's on the wall. Do you recall that question? Yes. Do you know how that mirror is affixed to the wall? I do not. <laughs> the prosecutor bad. asked you a series of questions regarding the test firing that you did in this case. Do you recall her asking you about the uh, different guns you used? Uh, yes. And do you recall her asking you about the flooring materials? Correct. And do you ask? Do you recall her asking you about the site on yes. the different guns? All of the above. Yes. If that testing that you conducted had been done by the New Mexico crime lab here, would that be information you could have used? Uh, yes. Would you have mm. need, needed to recreate that testing if the crime lab here in New Mexico had done it? Most likely not. And they would have had the actual rifle. And as, to be clear, the crime lab in New Mexico is capable of that kind of testing. I so they say. <laughs> reconstruction type of testing, but it is also a gunshot residue analysis, and I know they've done gunshot residue testing in the past. The prosecutor asked you some questions regarding impact sites 11 and 12, and could you just explain again what impact sites 11 and 12 are? Uh, those are the two that had visual visible dark scorch marks that corresponded to the ports on the upper part of the flash hydrant. And just for reference, I'll just publish uh, the diagram you had made. So impact sites 11 and 12 with the scorch marks there. Right. The prosecutor asked you some questions and basically said, isn't it possible those marks were put there after Mr. Ariola had been shot? I cannot make a distinction between um, shots in time, so as a physical reality, it is a possibility they could have been placed after. And if somebody was placing those impact sites after Mr. Ariola was already deceased, what would they have, have had to do to position themselves to fire those shots? To the best of my knowledge, they would have had to hold the gun upside down in likely direct contact with the floor, possibly direct contact with the wall and fire the shots from that position. And would they look have at had that to have pattern. Does that show a retreat over, back over into Mr. the corner? body in order to do as that? As the guy that he's being pursued, right? Possibly. Legal? Yeah. Well, it's a small yeah. room, right? Yeah. I, I don't yeah. think there's another way they could do that <laughs> unless they were standing. They'd have to be standing on the body up here somewhere in the pool of blood. If they could reach. But the tub's up there. Yeah, that's true. So I guess the person would have had to have lain across the body and fired those shots. Or stood over or crouched over in some way. Or stood over, but they would have had to bend down so that the gun was almost on the floor, correct? Well, I think it would have to be on the floor to a certain extent. I, I, mm -hmm. I, 
I can't be absolutely certain. This is craziness. Contact, the gun was in contact, but that, that's my <laughs> testing. I mean, if he suspended himself upside down from the ceiling, you know, mission impossible on a cable. And exhibit 51 again, the prosecutor asked you some questions regarding some tiny little, almost some tiny little, I don't even know what to describe that as, mark, smudge, something on the toe of Mr. Ariola's boot. There appears to be, in this image, yeah. a slight defect. Um, is it possible? The toe, the this is an appropriate, is it possible? Whether that's related to any kind of impact or gunshot, I don't know. I've worn boots that get scuff marks. On I'd say the indeed. tape didn't collect the boots. And Without right even looking at that boot in person, I wouldn't begin to speculate on Show me someone indeed. in New Mexico, in the deserts of New Mexico, right. with boots so on that boots, doesn't have dirty or new? scuffed boots. And I'll show you a guy that took them out of the box really five minutes ago. Photo. Fair enough. Yeah. Who could have looked at those boots and made a determination about whether there was some sort of an impact site on them? I believe the state crime lab could have done that. Um, I could have evaluated them as well. <laughs> me, if the prosecution would have called me first. <laughs> Just give me the boot. What does that look like? Well, the first image, it looks like a possible bullet hole through the wall. Did you see any indications that there that the police had found that impact site in any of their oh reports, photos, diagrams? No, but I also can't be certain it's a bullet hole. And maybe a, a direct observation may have made it obviously not. I can't tell from this photo. And just going back to that suggestion by the prosecutor that the scuff mark on the boot was a ricochet. What do you think the likelihood is that that is a ricochet? Um, very unlikely given the position of the body and the material that the ricochet would have had to come from. Beyond a reasonable doubt, it's not yeah. a ricochet. <laughs> she also talked to you about the location of casings. Find the photo. Yeah. So she's going over all these points from the state, but people she's direct. Yes. People that don't understand guns see you ricochets. The going showing you this. Place. This is Exhibit 45, State's Exhibit 45. I do. That's and a 556 five, round. That's going to go right through questions the about this casing right there. Correct. That casing being located there, does it tell you anything? Um, the most I would venture on an opinion is that cartridge case is consistent with having been fired from inside that room. And that's because casings can get kicked? They can be moved um, after the fact, but they can also bounce after the moment of firing and land in a variety of locations in a confined space. And would it be possible that if a gun is fired upside down, where impact sites 11 and 12 were located in that room, yes. right? So you have the gun upside down firing almost directly into the floor. And as the prosecutor established, the casings would eject, I guess, to the left. Um, in the direction where this one was, more or less, possibly. And if there was a struggle going on right there, is it possible that someone could have kicked the casing and it landed there? Yes. <laughs> oh my gosh. The prosecutor asked you about a series of hypotheticals, one being that the shooter was up on the bunk bed. Yes. What do you <laughs> think of that possible scenario? Um, it's an unusual location. I wouldn't go so far as to call it absurd or impossible, but it's it's it doesn't seem to fit everything else. Likely or not? Um, also, were that the location of a shot fired into the body? the body would still have to be bent substantially at the waist so that the trajectory would correspond to the vertical axis of the, of the torso. How does that shooting, that hypothetical scenario from on top of the bunk bed explain impact sites 11 and 12, the upside down ones on the floor? I don't see any relation. The only thing I would say is those other two shots, because the gun was upside down, are most consistent with some kind of struggle when they were fired. And the other hypothetical the prosecutor gave you was that the shooter was standing on the bed or was on the bed. Yeah, I believe I, in my mind, I imagine crouching or sitting 
or something of that level on the lower bunk or, or that position. Okay. And how did how do those correlate or work with the upside down impact sites eleven and twelve? Uh, again, same answer. No relation. They would have to be from a different part of the event. So how likely do you think either of those scenarios are? Um, I think being in or on the lower position of the bed during the midst of a struggle is a possibility. Um, I think although we cannot sequence gunshots specifically in the context of a struggle, it seems to me more likely that those two shots, 11 and 12, happened during the struggle and the fatal shots occurred. But the state has no narrative of how those patterns would occur. Absolutely That's certainly. inconsistent with the self-defense narrative. Physical right. evidence. They, they've never said, we yeah, think this is how this asked you if you were getting paid for your work in this case. Obviously, you are. Yeah. Uh, in your full-time job working for the Arizona Department of Public Safety, are you paid for your your work in that yes, capacity? Sir. Yes, I am. Do you, uh, law enforcement officers typically get paid for their work? I believe so. Yes. No further questions. Okay. That's got to be it for the day. Get paid for their work? Thank you. Do judges get paid for the work? Do bailiffs get paid for the yeah. work? I think that question is so ridiculous. Every lawyer in the room is getting paid. Yeah. The only person not getting paid is the defendant. Right. And, and almost the expert witness. <laughs> yeah, I can't believe it. I would have asked is that him, it? That's it for him? A lot more? All right. I guess. Yeah. Only 10 minutes left till 5 o'clock. The Surely the court has to recess for the day, God willing. Is it possible the court will they recess might, for the day? They, they might rest. Any other no, Your Honor, this time for us. Oh! Wow. Uh, we, we are oh. on for today. Now. Uh, and tomorrow we'll start at nine at 9.30, not 9 o'clock. Be here about, uh, I'd say about 9.20 or so. And actually, uh, my bailiff is going to escort you into another room. We'll have you wait there until I'm done with I have a hearing at 8.30. So once I'm done with that hearing, we'll bring you in here, all right? They're going to do the renewed JLA and then schedule the charge conference for tomorrow, I would expect. All right, last poll of the day. Last poll of the day is up. Guilty, meaning self-defense disproven beyond a reasonable doubt. Not guilty. Self-defense not disproven beyond a reasonable doubt. Or undecided. Let's go, folks. And I will close. Okay. Them. Uh, let me. I'm going to leave this window up just in case uh, they come back for some discussion after they uh, dismiss the jury. How can you be undecided? It's jury time. I'm Make undecided is not guilty, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. That's true. I'm just trying to catch the weak-minded. I don't know. The the defense usually they do the JOA at the close of all evidence. You know. If I was the judge, I'd seriously consider this as a JOA. Let's see. Yeah. He didn't tell the jury he was going to instruct him tomorrow. <laughs> he just said, "Come back at nine thirty. Counsel, I don't know. I don't know if the state's going to have any any rebuttal. I I, I don't know what what the plans are. Um, <laughs> Is it possible? Is anyway, it possible? I, I have a sentencing on a homicide tomorrow, 8.30 in the morning. That's the only time everyone will be available. I'll take care of that. I'll make sure that the jury is actually far away. We're going to have them in another room so they won't be in here at all for that. It's a first-degree homicide so, uh, sentencing. We should be done by 9.15 or so on that case, so they won't come over here. Uh, a couple of, uh, uh, I, I think we're getting ready to wrap this up. A couple of things. Uh, on defense, give me a a clean copy of your proposed self defense instruction. I only got the okay. no J O A dirty copies, okay? Which are okay. I mean, the, the instructions. I just need a, a clean copy of them. And those were fourteen five one seven one, fourteen five one ninety, and then the definition of great bodily harm. Uh, that is fourteen one thirty one. Just give me clean copies of that, and. On the state side, okay, the instructions are, are, are good, but I, I need for the state to, on, on that step-down verdict instruction, uh, let me give you the numbers that I think are, are appropriate. There's two numbers, 14-6002A and 14-6002B. 
be. It's real similar to what what, Ms. Ro what I received, but it's a little bit different. We're gonna go with those. Okay. Other than that, I think the instructions are good. The verdict forms are good. With with uh, with these little uh, minor little things we need to do. Okay. I have one question, sure. Your Honor. Um, is it possible? As far as just formatting. And, and you folks may be seated back there. On the on the elements instruction, because of the self defense and then the voluntary, do I do one self defense and say? It wasn't as a result of self-defense or provocation, or do I do it twice? Or what your direction? Do self-defense first. I, I think it's pretty straightforward. You, you, you'll have <laughs> the second degree murder or voluntary, and then the self-defense just comes in separate. I, I know I know you're interested. I'm not making myself clear. So you know in the oh, you're just a lawyer. <laughs> right. We have to he hasn't been making himself right clear since day one. The defendant did not either did not act with sufficient provocation or did not act as a result of self-defense. Do we do that with two separate instructions or just put it in the same one? Overnight, I'm going to, this is probably the fourth self-defense murder trial we've done in the last year. Wow. I'm going to look at the way that we did the previous jury instructions um, and I'll have an answer. I'm, I can't give an answer right now. Okay. Um, but I agree with the court. I, I think it flows in my recollection of the way that the jury instructions work is uh, it, it, it's pretty straightforward and it flows. So so let me just have a look at, at the way that we've done it in the past and I can shoot you an email. Yeah, why don't we, I don't care. I just don't yeah. know. And, and, and the reason I'm, I'm, I'm I have definite thoughts on this. Those, <laughs> there is one of the worst things. I'll say there's worse things to do. But one of the things that, that sort of holds up or, or upsets the jury, we're here trying to deal with jury instruction and they're just sitting in some, in some room. They're just about all done. I, I said just a matter of cleaning up a few things, uh, copying them, and give, give, giving copies to everyone. If there's no rebuttal, we, we go to jury instruction, closing argument. And if there is rebuttal, it'll probably be pretty short anyway. So, <laughs> Better be. So, uh, <laughs> That's the judge's way of saying it. Better be. Try to be here about eight, eight forty-five, nine o'clock with whatever you propose on your instructions, and I should be wrapping up that that sentence in around nine fifteen or so. All right. All right. So let's be in recess until tomorrow. If you have things you're going to leave in here, you may just want to put them, uh, especially on your side. Okay, you may want to put them over there on uh, on that table because if on this little table, on this smaller table here. If you want to leave any of you, I put them on the smaller table because defense counsel tomorrow will be on, on at counsel table. All right. All right, so we'll be in recess until tomorrow. All right. Interesting. Okay. So in, in my opinion, the jury instruction should be murder and a negative element should be and was not committed in self-defense. And then the voluntary manslaughter negative element should be not committed in self-defense. And then the self-defense jury instruction. And if I were defense counsel, if I were defense counsel, I would urge the jury to start their deliberations with self-defense. Because if you decide it's self-defense, you can be home by lunch. This could all be over. You don't have to consider the other instructions. Because if you decide it was self-defense, they're not applicable. Right. So, so don't start okay. with murder. And go through all that. And then manslaughter. And go through all that. You, to, to get to an answer for either of them, you need to do self-defense first. And you could be home by lunch. Well, the, the thing is, in Florida, we have a renewed JOA at the end of the close of all evidence, which mm. is kind of, you know, and I'm thinking about it because it doesn't sound like they have that in New Mexico. And actually, it's kind of stupid when I'm looking at it from a, as a Florida attorney, because if the judge denies the JOA after the close of, of the state's evidence, he's going to deny it after the close of all evidence. So I, I think it's simply a preservation tool. And actually, I've never really looked at it in depth. But we always yeah. do it renewed JOA at the end of close of all evidence, yeah. and but it but it's never granted. So right. why <laughs> do it except for preservation? Yeah, yeah, that's been my experience as well. You always do it; and it's never granted. Yeah, I mean, it's, if they're uh, going to get a JOA, you're going to get it first up, right on the first one. I I would think so. Um, I don't know. I can imagine weird things happening. Like if maybe you deny it after the state's case in chief, but then then the defendant takes a witness stand and implodes. Or, or well, well, that wouldn't work. Kind of that would be that, the, that would be the opposite. Yeah. Away might be yeah. opposite. What's that? Legal? No, no, I just right. I, the opposite. I, I screwed yeah. it up. That would be the opposite. Yeah, I 
I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I'm going to have to jump to Super Chats at some point. I don't know if you guys want to stay with that, but I don't want to jump to that. If you guys have other thoughts or other comments or other feedback that you, you want to share or discuss or talk about. Oh, I just can't wait to get to the office and uh, go through the replay, starting with the defendant's cross-examination. It's pretty that good. Means. That's good. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's not a it's not a good day for the defense. Uh, sorry, the not a good day for the state. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god, I've been here too many hours. I guess. All right. So well, like I'm going to start. Day, which day was good for the state again, Andrew? <laughs> oh yeah, none, none of them. The day none before. Oh this my god, started. it was terrible from the very beginning. Their first witnesses, those law enforcement guys. That was it. Was just horrific. It was bad from the very beginning. Hey Jeff, listen to this one. I've never heard a prosecutor say that like. Well, your department, you're you know, you're sloppy, right? But but you don't get paid much. You got big budget issues in your department, right? I mean, it's like you're excusing bad behavior for uh I mean it was amazing. Oh yeah, that that is that image, that's one beyond it. binger. I mean, and he he's holding it like he means it too. <laughs> <laughs> You saw that even smell action pose right there. Even better is when she's approaching him, crouched over aggressively with her fist raised. It's like, oh, is that what it looked yeah, like he, in real life? He's, he's scary. on the ground with his gun, and she's like attacking him from above. <laughs> what? They, they went yeah. full recreation. They went full recreation. Yeah. yeah. Oh no. And she's being all snarky and sarcastic, and I'm like, oh yeah, I can imagine that. I might shoot somebody over that. <laughs> if I feel like I had PTSD and just kind of went off on her. <laughs> oh my gosh. All right. I'm going to leave that up as I start going through these uh, member <laughs> questions and uh, let's see, where am I? And then the, the super chat. Like you know, like what do they call the little video, the vignettes when you click on it? That needs to be the video vignette for your, for this live stream, you know, when you post it. Yeah. The thumbnail. The thumbnail. Yeah. yeah. I'll be the thumbnail for tomorrow. For, oh, you know what though? If I put a gun on YouTube as a thumbnail, they, they demonetize it instantly. I'll have to think about it. Um, there's they got these weird rules. Uh, let's see. Uh, Paul writes, This is what's known as grasping at straws as they exit the courtroom. I, I'm, I don't know. Am I looking? Am I doing this wrong? Let me see. I, I think that was the last comment. Uh, oh my gosh, it's so hard to do. Let's see. Oh, let me take a look at the poll. What did I do? So the poll, we have uh, how many responses? About a thousand responses. Uh, guilty, two percent. Not That's guilty, ninety-five percent. Undecided, seven percent. But two percent voting for guilty. So there we go. I'll leave it up a few more minutes. But that's been pretty consistent throughout uh, all the polls we've done for the trial. Has been right around ninety-five percent or higher. Uh, not guilty. Let's see. Judge runs a pretty tight ship from Paul. That's true. Uh, Chuck, I haven't seen the state disprove self-defense beyond a reasonable doubt. No kidding. It, but is it possible? Is it possible? Um, <laughs> uh, Joe, I'd like to give the whole prosecution team the boot. Ha, 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 ha. Uh, let's see, Jim, with this camera placement, we're going to miss the prosecution jaws dropping on the floor when they lose. You think they still think they have a chance at a conviction? I mean, a rational chance at a conviction? I mean, they seem shocked when those when the uh, tampering and the identity charges were dismissed. They can't possibly think they did a good job. Let's see. They're living in a world. Of, I don't know. Uh, All I know is, this, is this picture here is going to be the background for every trial I ever do from now on. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's pretty good. That'll be their Christmas card. It should be like if there was a law self defense calendar, this would be like January. <laughs> you ought to do that. That's a good yeah. idea. Just horizontally for the centerfold between June and July. <laughs> um, binger of this one. Oh, Clay writes. So the prosecutor just increases the expert's money by keeping him there for a long time. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, Charles, obvious the prosecutors don't know a thing about self-defense law. Please don't send them a book. I don't think I'm not. You have to read for the book to be helpful. Uh, let's see. Owning the book is not enough. Right. I mean, that's fine if you want to do that. I I don't really care if you read it. That's up to you. As long as you buy it, I'm all good. 
the lead um, investigator wouldn't remember if you send him the book or not. So don't waste your time. Right. On that one. Right. That's right. I could sell him a new book every day. <laughs> that would be the ultimate break of grift right there. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, Paul says, me thinks the prosecutor is questioning the expert way outside his area of expertise. I concur. That that boot thing is nonsense. Can't tell anything from that photo. Very much dinger, uh, binger, uh, pinch and zoom, extrapolate, enhance. Can't tell. By the way, the first the first place the boots wear out for a working man is the toe because you're kneeling down all the time and scraping your toe on the ground doing doing manual labor. That's what Jeff uh, was saying. Who in New Mexico doesn't have a st scuff on their boots? Right. Uh, Clay writes, I believe there were people who saw Alec fire the shot that killed the victim, but it's possible <laughs> that someone else actually shot her. Is it possible that there was a, a gunman on the grassy knoll? Uh, let's see. Yes, these pro uh, Robert writes, these prosecutors must have lost the coin flip, and that's how they got this case. Maybe. Uh, the judge, Paul writes, the judge has the patience of Job. Patience of Job, indeed. He's been really good. I've been impressed with the judge. What do you think, Steve? Yeah, he's. This is this is a basically. I think this is your standard issue good judge. Yeah, he's kind of yep. calling it like he is. He's, he's letting the parties make their case, however weak they may be, but he's kind of letting the parties run the show. He's not getting overly involved. He's not a drama queen. He's ruling. He's ruling. Every, all the rulings he's made has been good. He's got that typical challenge of how do you rein in unethical prosecutors making dirty arguments on cross? You know, yeah. he did the hey, best he could on that. Here's a good sign. You would never know by his conduct that there's cameras in the courtroom. That's a good right. sign. Right. He's not and, he and he doesn't seem pro defense or pro state. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, Charles asks, is it possible that Mr. Ariola faked his death? <laughs> <laughs> Um, let's see does it uh joe does a burn of a hot casing goes down your shirt yes it does it burns it burns yeah. quite uh been, been there quite done that yeah yep, it's exactly ar uh, barrel does heat up pretty quick though there's a lot of power going on that barrel for sure uh, Paul says, unless the Keystone cops kicked the brass around while moving other evidence, like the pepper spray. Yeah, they took photographs. I don't know if you saw this, Jeff, but they have photographs of the crime scene where they've moved pieces of evidence around the room. That's right where I fell asleep when they had the uh, the mace canister on the bed. On the bed, and they put an yeah. evidence marker next to it like it's a piece of evidence that was found there. They leave their gloves on the floor and then include the gloves in evidence photographs. I mean, it's, it's, oh, no. it's just insane. Yeah, and then they've got the uh, and then the, the the miraculous appearing magazine that nobody can account for. Yeah. Oh, the second magazine. I bet that'll come up in closing. Yeah. The second magical magazine. What else is wrong with this evidence? You have to ask yourself, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, what else is wrong with this evidence? Uh, Charles writes: uh, the prosecution raising numerous possible explanations creates more reasonable doubt. Exactly what the uh, defense wants, of course. Um. Let's see. Uh, Stephen, explain why the defense doesn't object to the questions unrelated unrelated to the expert witnesses' expertise. Well, I guess they felt it wasn't hurting them, and it was hurting the state. Right. This whole line of yeah, you've got your guy up there. He's a he's a qualified answer, and he's he every time he talks, he's helping you. And the other thing is that when you're objecting, see, like it's interesting because the state was objecting to witness testimony trying to shut people down. So the, the, the defense is like, well, we want the truth out there. Talk away. We're not objecting to anything. Let the jury hear the full truth. And the state's trying to shut everybody down and shut them up so that they don't hear the truth. So, you know, there's a strategic, you only object when it really makes a difference. This yeah, Charles writes that no objections from the defense to the expert witness testimony. They know, capitalize, that this cross is helping make their case. Yep. Um. Let's see. Paul writes, shouldn't the judge say something at this point? Like, counselor, is there a point to this line of questioning? Yeah, there wasn't much point. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Does this weapon weigh more if you hold it upside down? Uh, no. <laughs> no. Um, 
Let's see. <laughs> Uh, Jim writes, it's been a while since I've seen a case where the judge seems to be the most thoughtful participant. Uh, I don't know about that. There's there's good judges out there. And the defense, right. the defense team has been great. They're good. Yeah, they're, they've been very solid, very good. I've been very impressed with them. I wouldn't hesitate to recommend them. Um, I, as far as the prosecution, my recommendation would be if you're intent on committing a felony crime, you might want to do it in their jurisdiction. <laughs> So uh, sort of like that see. one weird spot in Yellowstone where there's no law that applies where you could technically murder someone. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Come on, Super Chat. Pull up YouTube. Let me see if I can find where I ended. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, oh, Mike has a $10 Super Chat. It's a question for me. If you're a platinum member, meaning a platinum member of Law of Self-Defense, that's the level of membership where you get my legal services for free. No $10,000 retainer. You get my legal consult for free if you're involved in a use of force event. If you're a platinum member, maybe worth it. Uh, it's the only way to get my legal services, by the way. We don't take outside consults anymore. If you're not a platinum member, I'm not available to consult on your case. You can learn more about that at lawofselfdefense.com slash platinum. But he asks, if you're a platinum member, would the court have access to my post if not using my real name? I guess he means his chat contribution. Uh, folks, I'm not looking to share anybody's post with anybody, but if somebody shows up with a subpoena, they get whatever they want. And if they're not going to get it from me, they're going to get it from the internet service provider or who, however that works for, you know, this is not on some server I have in my basement. This is a, we contract out the service. So don't put anything on the internet. You don't want... What's Dave? You're assuming those prosecutors would be that competent. You know, I, I just see increasingly in this case is the first thing they do is start going after all the social media. They get all the social media records right away. Um, and especially if I'm consulting on the case and they, they, because it's a member, then they know the person's a member. Then they start asking me for server stuff or they just go directly to my ISP to get this stuff. Uh just my advice, as always, folks, is don't put anything on the Internet that you don't want other people to see. Just presume anybody can see it. It never really goes away, even when you delete stuff. In fact, when you delete stuff, it can look worse. It can look like consciousness of guilt conduct because now you're trying to erase things you think are harmful to you. Don't assume that you're anonymous on the Internet. Uh, Coltrane, $5 super chat. Sorry if this has been asked, but the defendant said he didn't mean to pull the trigger and it was an accident. Doesn't that negate self-defense? When, when did he say that? I don't remember him don't saying that. that. Oh, there was a time when some of the shots were fired. Oh, yeah. Okay. So he said he wasn't trying to shoot. He thinks the person was grabbing the rifle. Um, yeah, I guess you could carry. I mean, that's not really an accident. That's the other person making the gunfire. Um, it's, uh, but it wouldn't matter. It's not the fatal shots. He's still defending himself from a deadly force attack. So it doesn't really change anything. It's not like a pure up. Like Alec Baldwin would be arguing pure accident to justify his shooting of Helena Hutchins, that accident meaning he personally had no responsibility for what happened. Uh, that's a ridiculous legal defense for him to uh, raise, yeah. but uh, that's basically what it is. Uh, $5 from Bruce. He's uh, from Billy. The judge is a refreshing change after the Daryl Brooks judge. Nice to see if someone have control of the courtroom. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's a tough situation for the Daryl Brooks judge. I mean, she's dealing with a lunatic who's insisting on being his own counsel I don't well, know. That's a I have a in. critique. I have a grading system. If you want to go to my Rumble channel, I actually did a breakdown of the participants in the uh, Brooks trial, grading them from A to F. Well, and I gave that to her. Uh, gave her C. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. I didn't watch because the trial. She, the so. problem, she wasn't. I understand what she was doing, but her ultimately her strategy failed. And yeah. the other thing is that. She went, she repeats herself over and yeah. over and ever. Well, she makes no a case, ruling right? and then he'd bring up the same objection and then he, right. she'd replay the same justifications over. It's in the record once. You don't yeah. need to repeat it in order for it to be in the record. I agree with that 100% of the time. Yeah. yeah. She, she allowed him to get her into an argumentative loop that was just pointless. When her justifications were 15 minutes long, too. So, where would people find yeah. your Rumble channel, Steve? Oh, it's Crime Law with Stephen N. Gosney. That's the Rumble channel. All right. Since I'm sold go. out of books. Yeah, check that out. <laughs> check that out. You gotta you have to it's very important to have multiple grifts, Steve. Very important. Well, it's not really a grip. It's not really a grip, but it's sort That's of what these a guys hobby. call it. All this stuff is a hobby. <laughs> uh let's see. 
Uh, Five dollars from Michael. He says, gents, the police made these reports. They knew Ariola had a history of mace, drunkenness, fighting. They knew and they still testified as they did. Yeah, they all knew. The state knew all this would come out. Uh, Vincent, twenty dollars. Vincent, thank you so much. That gets you four kachings. Living in Albuquerque all my life, the politics, politics tend to be left leaning, but we have had a few Republican mayors. And most places, especially rural, tend to be pro Second Amendment, even more so in recent years with the rise of crime. Okay, there's something going on here. This is not a rational prosecution. So something else is going on. Uh, shut up. I can cook. Five dollars. Says six hours ago. I'm super late. Hello, all, and thanks. Yeah, we've been going a while. We've been going, holy crap, nine and a quarter hours. Uh, shut up, I can cook. Again, $5. I'm still wondering why a business transaction escalated to murder. Well, it seems, based on testimony we heard today, because the prospective seller of the property, the victim here, uh, becomes violent when he's on drugs and uh, alcohol. Some people and, are and like that. The deal was falling apart. There was some disagreements. This defendant insulted him said he was scamming him because he wouldn't let him have the contract and the guy's high on drugs and alcohol and right. goes after him with his mace and starts attacking him yeah and by the way i bet there was something wrong with this property i bet there was something wrong with the water there was something that if, if you got the contract the lawyer read it the lawyer would say well you know you don't have much protection here in terms of water availability and then they would have checked the water availability it would have been bad and then you can't buy the property i mean if there's no water you can't use it mm. um Let's see where uh, farmhand Tom, where do defense attorneys find their experts? Assuming this. Yeah, I talked about this earlier. There, there's books and associations where you, you can go to find experts. It's it's all normal legal vices. He's right here, but he wrote. Thank you very much for 10,000, whatever that currency is. Korean money, I guess. Uh, still going. <laughs> hey, sounds like nothing changed. Time to go back and start listening. All right. Well, I'm glad you came back on legal vices. Uh, Grunt Medic, $5, uh, does the fact that an Amazon special scope <laughs> factor into your investigation? Yeah, I didn't recognize the scope, but I'm, I'm not a glass guy, so I, I wouldn't really have any idea. Uh, Liberty or Death, $10, prosecutor to witness. Did you take the Coriolis effect into account? <laughs> <laughs> for, for it across the room, you know, almost a contact shot. Uh, let's see. Uh, Joseph Dean Martino, $5, the total... The total of the expert cost will depend how long you keep me here on the witness stand. So ask away. ka -ching. Yeah, that is true. Uh, news from Wyoming, $5. I think you misheard. He made $2,000 for just yesterday with travel and reviewing notes. Yeah, I was unclear. It sounded to me like it was $2,000 all in so far. But, but still um, assuming but no, eight hours a day, that, that's $125 an hour. The chatter was correct. It was, it was a 2000 was for the last two days. Oh, okay. All right. Well, that's, that's better. Uh, let's see. Easy 007, 10 British pounds. Notes, no family for the dead guy. Isn't that alone odd, given the trials we all see? Um, yeah, I mean, he had family in some of these anecdotes, right? He had his cousin or his nephew or whatever with the big knife at that confrontation. Uh, but no yeah, one but showing up. Really be, well, those would be rebuttal witnesses, right? Right. Yep. Uh yeah, and there's been no mention of rebuttal except by the judge wondering if there would be a rebuttal, but the state didn't say anything. I don't think they're going to show up and suddenly want to do a rebuttal in the morning. Uh, I guess it's possible. I don't think the judge would be very happy about that. Uh, and the last one, Steve C., $5. Uh, then he pulled the clip out of his pocket, and we all know the rest of the story. Uh, I actually don't know what that means. Then he pulled the clip out of his pocket. Well, they make it the magazine versus clip because the defendant referred to the oh. magazine as a clip. Oh, yeah, it was funny because the defendant struck me as being genuine when he talked about being a hunter and being pretty good at it and all that kind of stuff. But I guess you can be a hunter and not know anything about gun terminology because he really he really didn't seem to know anything about guns per se. You can be a prosecutor and not know anything about gun terminology too. <laughs> yeah, obviously. Oh, this uh, thingy here. What's that do? Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the pin. You know, the pin on the side. <laughs> Got one of well, all right, gentlemen, on I think that's all I have. I'm going to wrap up. Thank you so much for joining me. I will be covering live again from uh, 930 tomorrow morning. I'll send out inv invites to everybody. Whoever can make it based on interest and uh, schedule is uh, more than welcome to join. Thank you guys for being here cool. so much, especially you, Steve. For someone who wasn't going to be able to show up, you ended up making a yeah. huge commitment to the show. I really appreciate it. And Jeff, thanks for coming back. <laughs> we'll see you soon. All right, guys. Uh, I'll say goodbye to the two gentlemen and to everybody else in the audience. Just remember, remember, 
If you carry a gun, so you're hard to kill. That's why I carry a gun. So I'm hard to kill. So my family is hard to kill. Then you also owe it to yourself and your family to make sure you know the law. So you're hard to convict. Until tomorrow morning, stay safe.